Novak for Hire. Sure, I'm Pat Novak for Hire. That's what the sign out in front of my office says. Pat Novak for hire. It's about the only way to say it. Oh, you can dress it up and tell how many shopping days there are till Christmas. But if you got yourself in the market, you can't waste time talking. You gotta be as brief as a pauper's will. Because down on the waterfront in San Francisco, everybody wants a piece of the cake. And the only easy buck is the one you just spent. Oh, it's a good life. If you work real hard and study a little on the side, you got to trade by the time you get to prison. I rent boats and do a few other odd jobs you can't afford to pick it on. It works out all right if you put your tongue in hock. Because down here, you shouldn't talk. It's like installing a set of drums in a belfry. You make some noise, but it's never the right kind. I found that out a few days ago. Must have been Tuesday or Wednesday night, anyway. I was sitting in the office reading Time magazine when the door opened. I looked up and had to keep right on going, because the guy was so tall he'd have to bend over to see through a transom. And he had a voice deep enough to read out as a bassoon. Good evening, Mr. Novak. I'll take your word for it. You have a small office. I'm small time. What's on your mind? My name is Leahy. I want to hire you. Yeah. Sit down. Are you cold? Yeah. That overcoat around your neck, you're either cold or a priest. Oh. I'm a priest, Mr. Novak. I'm sorry, Father. You got a slow brogue. What do you need? A few hours of your time. I want you to help a man escape from prison. Uh Uh-huh. Father, you'll never get along with a bishop. Mr. Novak, in a curious way, this is an errand of mercy. Well, this isn't my year for mercy. I'm sorry, Father. Maybe you don't like to hear it that way, but if I got the right fee, it wouldn't be mercy anymore. When I say it's an errand of mercy, that's what it is. Sometime tonight, a man is going to break out of Alcatraz. If he's allowed to get into town, he may kill somebody. You want me to stop him? That's right. And if he doesn't kill anybody, he can still be shot down by the police. Well, that's the percentage, Father. If he comes off that rock, he knows that. Stop worrying about him. If you could bring him to me, I know I can talk him into going back. Tell headquarters they'll do the same thing. If I did that, I'd break a promise. This is the only thing I can do. Will you help me? Yeah, I suppose. How do I pick him up? Treadwater in the bay he comes by? He's due in at Pier 19 sometime tonight. When he comes ashore, bring him to me. I'll be waiting at the ferry building. Yeah, well, suppose he doesn't want to come. Suppose he wants to party. How am I going to get him there? I don't ask you how to say the beads. If you're any good, you'll get him there. But you don't want him in sections. I want him all at once, Mr. Novak. I wouldn't ask you this if it weren't important. But i got to help him. He's one of my boys. Yeah, sure. What's his name? Joe Feldman. Feldman? Yeah. If I don't worry about the spelling, you don't have to either. He's one of my boys. Slow down. Nobody's pushing your father. I don't know when he's due, but I'll be at the ferry building from 8 o'clock on. Yeah. I only got one worry. Huh? Is there really a guy named Father Leahy? I suppose you'll have to take a chance on that. Yeah, well, it's a big chance. You come in here with a story anybody can see through like a screen door and I'm supposed to buy it. You could dig up a collar. What happens if you're a fake? Just try to guess right. Suppose I don't. Then you're in the same spot Pontius Pilate was. Good night, Mr. Novak. Whoever Joe Feldman was, he had a good friend. Because when Father Leahy walked out of there, I knew he was all right. You could tell without even testing him. The way when you pick up a pool cue, you know right away whether it's any good or not. He stood at the door for a minute, and then he walked out. And you got a funny feeling that he didn't walk into the night that he was big enough to wrap it around his shoulders and take it with him. I got a last look at him as he turned the corner under a street lamp. He looked even taller now, and you knew if somebody stood him in an oil field, you couldn't tell him from the rest of the derricks. Well, I made a couple of phone calls, and then I closed shop and went down to the end of Pier 19 to wait. The bay looked as dark as a bruised crow. The fog was beginning to drift in over near the piers. 
By nine o'clock, you couldn't see a thing. You felt like a guy trying to shave in a bathroom full of steam. I was about 30 feet from the end of the pier when a small boat pulled in and let somebody out. I was sure it was my boy, so I moved behind a shed and waited. The boat pulled away, and the guy started down the dock. I waited until he moved past me. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. You ought to be glad. How's the rock? Huh? You lonely, mister? What do you care? If you are by a beer and talk to the bartender, I'm busy. All right, you're tough, Feldman. Let's go now. You got dates for us? You're going to see Father Leahy. Come on. Oh, are you doubling for Gabriel? Leave me alone, mister. I don't want to go. Now, look, Junior, if we draw straws, you're going to get the short one. Oh. Is that supposed to be a gun in your pocket? Well, you get a chance to find out. That's what I'm going to do, because I have one, too. If it starts to hurt your stomach, back down. <laughs> Now where's yours, Mr. Timid? It's a bad night for bluffing, so goodbye. Yeah, come here. Go easy, fella. It's a big one. Well, you can let go easy then. Come on, drop it. Drop it in the water. Let go. Now, you want to start again? No. All right, I'll see you, man, Leahy. I got to make a stop first. Make it after. It'll take five minutes. Look, mister, if you want to do it the easy way, let me make the stop. You go with me. All right, five minutes, and then you see Father Leahy. Suit yourself. I doubt if I'll make heaven, but if you want to run interference, it's all right with me. If you need the credits, you need the credits. Joe Feldman wasn't very friendly. He sat over in the corner of the cab and he didn't say a thing. He just kept looking at me and waiting, like a guy feeding arsenic to a rich aunt. A few minutes later, the cab pulled up in front of a hotel on Geary Street, and we walked in. One look at that lobby, and you got the idea. The place was about as cozy as an abandoned mine shaft. Over by the wall, there was an old mohair couch, and the legs on it were so warped, pretty soon it was going to look like period furniture. There were a few chairs, and over by the stairs, a faded calendar of a girl in tights holding a jar of mayonnaise and winking, whatever that meant. And there was a broken clock over the desk. But you knew it was all right, because nobody there cared about keeping track of time. It was something you got rid of in a hurry, like a bent quarter. We went up to the second floor. We walked down a long hall that smelled like an anteroom to a sewer. When Feldman knocked on the door, she opened it right away. The room was full of taboo. She stood leaning there for a minute, a sort of a girl who moves when she stands still. She had blonde hair. She was kind of pretty, except you could see somebody had used her badly, like a dictionary in a stupid family. Feldman seemed to know her. Hello, Anne. Well, the harvest hands arrive all at once. Yeah. It's good for the crops, but tough on a woman. Come in. Who's your friend? A missionary, I guess. He grabbed me down by the docks. Does he talk or just stand there looking healthy? He growls a little. Do you really growl? Come on, hurry up, lady. Your friend's got a date. I'll bet you bite instead. <laughs> Don't worry about him. He can go over in a corner and play fifth wheel. Now, look, he's got five minutes. Use him quick. Yes? I, uh, came up with a message, Anne. The time's been changed. Stay around till ten o'clock. All right. Is that all? Yeah, that's all. You want the other four minutes? Let's go. All right. Open the door. Yeah. Didn't open it fast enough. When Feldman hit me, I wobbled for a minute and went down like the price of winter wheat. If Father Leahy had any loose prayers lying around, now was the time to crate them up and ship them over, because I wasn't going to stay awake long enough to test the varnish. I rolled on the floor a couple of times, and then I took a rain check on the next couple of hours. When I woke up, it was like buying a new Nash and then finding out you can't drive. Joe Feldman was lying next to me with his throat cut like a pound of rib roast. His head was over to one side and his body was twisted over the other way as if he couldn't make up his mind which direction to die in. I got up and rolled him on his back. He was grinning like a Pullman porter at the end of the line and his mouth was half open as if he expected you to drop in a suggestion on your way by. I noticed right then how thin and small he was. About as fat as a shadow and tall enough to scrape his head on a lampshade. Well, there wasn't anything I could do but wish him luck. So I called the check stand at the ferry building and had them page Father Leahy. 
About two minutes later, he answered. Hello? Father Lee here? This is Novak, Father. Yes? Call in the outfield. Your boy's dead. I see. What happened? Somebody didn't like him lots. I wasn't around for the main event. Where are you, on the pier? No, I'm in some cave up on Geary Street. He wanted to come by here first. Father, who's Ann? I don't know. Has Feldman got a girlfriend? He's got two sisters, I think. One of them's named Ann. A tall blonde with lots of speed? That's your definition, but it'll probably do. Now, she was around for a while, in case you ever want to check. What are you going to do? Get on the back stairs and pretend I never heard of Joe Feldman. I'm sorry, Mr. Novak. I'm sorry it worked out that way. So am I, Father. If you liked him, I'm sorry. He may have been a nice little guy. Huh? Oh, I could do without him, but if you like it, I'll say he was a good little guy. How little? I don't know. We could start a picket fence with him. Why? Because you've got the wrong man, Mr. Novak. Huh? If he's under six feet, you've got the wrong man. Whoever you've got up there isn't Joe Feldman. Well, he's happy about it now, Father. Whoever he is, I'm sorry. It's the percentage. Why the percentage? If it isn't Joe Feldman, why? That's the waterfront, Father. If your name's Joe Nobody, you still can't do better than eight to five. At least Joe Feldman was smart. If you're going to get your throat cut, it's a good time to send in a substitute. As soon as Father Leahy hung up, I knew hanging around that hotel was going to be a waste of time, like sending mash notes to a bearded lady. If I couldn't prove the guy was alive, they were going to charge extra down at the desk. And if Hellman down at Homicide ever found out I brought the guy up here, I'd have about as much chance as a bottle of scotch at a cocktail party. So I picked up my hat and started for the door. I looked at him once more, but he wasn't going to say goodbye, so I started out. Boo. Oh. Hello, Hellman. Expecting me, Novak? No, I'd have rolled him first. Yeah. Invite me in. Crash the party, Hellman. You'll be more at home. All right. He sure looks lazy. Who is he? He's supposed to be Joe Feldman. But Feldman let him do the hard work. They must be good friends. You better check. I don't know the guy. Yeah, help me roll him over. Okay. There. Here, here's his wallet. You let me have it. You're going to break your fingernails. Give it here. All right. Yeah. No money in here. You're going to drop the case? Here's his card, Mike Greeley. Oh. Didn't he like you either? You're wearing out the rug, Hellman. I don't know the guy. You brought him up? I checked at the desk. Well, check on who left then. I brought him up here on a phony leave. Why? Because I was hired to tow him around. He liked the room, so we dropped by. And he cut himself shaving? I wasn't around. There was a girl here for the handshakes. Oh. What kind of girl? I don't know, Hellman. How many kinds are there? Her name was Ann. She had a fast pulse. That's all I know. You must know more than that. If you don't, you'll never get a lawyer. I won't need one. You'll save money at least, because you got a real hole this time, Novak. We get a phone tip and find you in the murder room. You got half a story, Hellman. I know, but I'll get the other half. Until then, you're under technical arrest. It's practically the real thing. Oh, you got a technical head, Hellman. I wouldn't tip myself off. Somebody else would. Walk around, Novak, and tire yourself out. Because you'll wind up sitting down. In the meantime, I'll have you tailed. Your men couldn't follow a moose through a revolving door. Now, look, Hellman, I'm going to double back. This guy's a phony lead. I was supposed to meet a guy named Joe Feldman, but he never showed up. He didn't? No. I got a dead copper to prove he did. Your boy, Joe Feldman, killed a sergeant named Grubb at the Gold Rush Club Club a half hour ago. You better start that walk, Novak. Well, there are two kind of raps you can't ever beat. Cheating a woman with kids and killing a copper. So I knew Joe Feldman could put in for reservations right away. And I knew Hellman would stay with him like a February cold. He'd stay with the whole thing, and I'd have a real tough time explaining. <laughs> I couldn't explain it to myself. What about the message up in that room? Why did the little guy tell Ann to stay until 10 o'clock? Why did he get off at Pier 19 instead of Joe Feldman? Once he got there, what was Feldman doing at the Gold Rush Club, and why did they spot him so fast? Well, it pointed to one thing, a police tip-off, but that's as far as I could go. On the way down, I stopped at the desk, and... I asked the clerk to see the register. He pushed it over toward me. It was a dirty brown thing that looked like an old tortilla somebody had left behind. It didn't do any good. The registration was a phony. Well, I had to do something in a hurry, so I looked up the only honest guy I know, an ex-doctor and a boozer by the name of Jocko Madigan. He's a good man, and he used to be a smart one, too. And still he started chasing a jigger of beer with a glass of whiskey. I finally found him in the Pied Piper room arguing with somebody about the words to Annie Laurie. 
Ah, Patsy. A drink for Mr. Novak. Something cheap but impressive. Oh, stop it, will you, Jocko? Are you going to be drunk all your life? Yes, it's only a matter of willpower, Patsy. I'm probably the only man in the world who intends to carry a hangover into eternity. Well, stop long enough to give me a hand, will you? I'm in trouble. Of course you're in trouble. You'll always be in trouble because you can't recognize it, Patsy. You're fuzzy, Jocko. You have the social outlook of a bull with a hot foot, and there's no hope for you because if from time to time a moral feeling does sweep over you, you mistake it for influenza and go to bed. All right, all right. Oh, you try hard enough. You go through the motions, Patsy, but you never get anywhere. You go stumbling through life doing a tight wire act on a rubber band. You're always in the middle. Will you listen to me? It's because there's no variety in your life. You won't allow it. You're a broken down banjo. Not a very good instrument to begin with. And to make matters worse, you allow everybody to come along and pluck the same string. All right. Are you all through now, Jocko? Yes. You sound angry. I think you have a bad disposition, too. What kind of trouble? Well, I tried to help some guy out of prison tonight. You got drunk and thought you were the parole board? No, I did it for a good guy, a priest named Leahy. Yes? The guy was already out, and Father Leahy was trying to hurt him back without getting shot. But this guy, Feldman, didn't want to play. Another drink will clear this up for me? I picked up the wrong guy. I took him to a Geary Street hotel. I napped a while and they cut him up like a piece of parsley. Sounds like a gruesome hotel. The dead guy's name is Mike Greeley. I don't even know who he is. Well, this is no time to start building a friendship anyway. Uh, who is in the room? Some girl. She may be Feldman's sister. Would she kill a man? Well, if she did, he'd be crushed to death. No, I'm sure somebody else came in that room. You better talk to Feldman. Well, he's a hard man to reach. A sergeant almost made it tonight. Feldman shot his way out of the Gold Rush Club. That's one way to get out of a nightclub. Well, Hellman's steamed up, so you got to help me, Jocko. You'd better look up Father Leahy. You'll probably be electrocuted, and if you are, he may have some drag. I want you to go down to the Chronicle Morgue and pull the clips on Joe Feldman, will you? Get everything you can, and then hit the horse parlors. Find out what they know about him, huh? Maybe he's a heavy drinker. I'll check the bar. Jocko, wake up and get down there. If I don't pace Hellman on this thing, I'll be a dead pigeon. What am I supposed to do? I don't know. You might start cooing. Good night, lover. Well, as soon as I left Jocko, I went down to the Gold Rush Club on O'Farrell Street. It was a little nightclub where they charge 80 cents for a drink of whiskey that'd kill a redwood. The floor show was just as bad, and the headliner was an oriental dancer whose only talent was a zipper. I sat at the bar, and I tried to pry some talk loose, but they liked the boss. I finally got a hold of a fat waitress who should have been wearing a harness instead of slacks. She told me a little. The owner was a guy named Charlie Giffen, and he used to make book with Joe Feldman. She told me that Joe's sister worked at the Gold Rush Club for a while, but she got sick a few months ago and quit. I asked the girl if tonight's shooting was a police plant. She didn't know, but she said that Feldman had been in to see Giffen tonight, and on his way out he ran into trouble. I gave her five bucks, and she looked hurt as if somebody had given her a plow for Christmas. She showed me where Giffen's office was, and I walked back there. Giffen wasn't there, but the taboo was. Do you have the right door, Mr. Novak? You seem to be in all of them. Do you mind if I lean in the doorway? No, but I'll bet you need shoulder pads by this time. Where's Charlie Giffen? Why? I want to ask him about Joe Feldman. Ask me. I'm his sister. I'll ask you about Mike Greeley. Who killed him? I don't know. Is he dead? Yeah, he couldn't stand the bleeding. He was all right when I left. What were you doing up there? Waiting for Joe. My sister and I were going to meet him up there. Relax, Mr. Novak. Relax for me. No, when people relax for you, they do it on the floor. I was out long enough for homicide to catch up. They want me for Mike Greeley, but I'm going to send them you or Joe. You're forgetting my sister Norma. Should I? For most things, yes. But she was up in that room tonight after me. I'll ask her. Ask her about the money, too. Well, you're out in front of me on that. You can see me better that way. Joe had a lot of money on him tonight. With the police out, he wouldn't carry it with him. By now, the money's gone, so's Norma. Mm. Do you know where it is? No. Well... You growl, and you bite, and you lie. You must have a full day. Sit down, relax. I want to see Giffen. He won't be back tonight. Now lean back. That's it, Patsy. Well, you really want that money. I can split a motive. Can you split it 90-10? If you can't, you better get your breath back. I won't need it. I don't want to talk anymore. Come here and make me stop. Over close. If I get any closer, I'll be on the other side of you. Yes. Hmm. Patsy, you ought to get time and a half, darling. 
Hello, Anne. Thought you were coming in to curl up with a good book. Uh, Mr. Novak came by full of questions. This is Charlie Giffen, Patsy. I got some questions for you, too, Giffen. Well, ask him down the bore of this gun. Over by the desk, Novak. Did you lose that knife, Giffen? By the desk. That's it. Where's the money, Novak? I gave her the last report. Where's the money? Joe gave it to somebody. Try the Red Cross, mister. <laughs> you got a tender face, Novak. Now get out of this club before I slap on a cover charge. <laughs> I was getting sick of tonight. In three hours, I'd seen more service than a mix master in a cooking school. When I left the Gold Rush Club, I dropped by headquarters. Hellman had nothing to show but his badge. They had a dragnet around the city for Joe Feldman, and they'd lined up the record on the dead guy in the hotel. He'd been a friend of Joe's before his trip to Alcatraz. There wasn't much I could do. If homicide couldn't find Joe, I couldn't find him. So I looked up Norma Feldman in the phone book. She had an apartment out on the avenues, but when I called, there was no answer. So I tagged by my apartment to see if Jocko had left a message. When I opened the door, Norma was there, and she had a gun to keep her company. Come in, Mr. Novak. Yeah. I came up here to kill you. Well, if you're Norma, the rest of the family's ahead of you. What's happened to my brother? I don't know. Please, what's happened to him, Mr. Novak? Well, if he killed a cop, he's hiding out. I know he didn't mean to do that, Mr. Novak. Joe's not that way. Somebody told the police he was going to be there. That's why I came up here to see you. Oh, put down the gun, huh? You can't shoot through the tears. Mr. Novak, if you know where he is, tell me. Make him give himself up. Make him stop hiding like a small, frightened animal. He looked big to that copper. Please. Please find him. You got Uh, Yeah. Hello, this is Jocko. Yeah. You sound ruffled. Joe Feldman's sister just walked in to kill me. Don't argue. It's the best offer you've had. What'd you find out? Feldman has two sisters. I know. They both go to pieces. The Gold Rush Club is owned by Charlie Giffen. He owed Joe Feldman $2,000, and the horse people say Joe collected it tonight. Well, that fits in, Jocko. Everybody in town's after that dough. They'll have to look some more. Hmm? I'm out on Arguello Boulevard. Homicide just fished Joe Feldman out of the gutter. If Homicide finished second, he was a lucky guy. He didn't have the dough on him? No. Well, he stashed it somewhere. Left it with a woman. Yeah? Because he's got a woman's compact in his pocket. You uh, better hit the sister's place. How do we know he got it there? A woman's compact? If he didn't get it there, Alcatraz is getting too social. Well, the minute Jocko hung up, things began to fall into place. But I knew the last piece was going to pinch somebody hard. If the Feldman blood was going to turn bad, Father Leahy was a good man to send in, so I called him. He was out, but I left word for him to get out to Norma Feldman's apartment. Norma and I left, and on the way, we picked up Hellman. When we got out to her place and started up the stairs, we could hear people moving above. There was no point in trying to keep quiet, because Hellman was creeping up the stairs like a stallion with a broken leg. Yeah, if you got a bomb, touch it off too, huh? Well, open it, Hellman. Hello, Novak. Did you find the dough, Giffen? You mean my stolen dough? Yeah. Come on, Ann. No, you and Ann better wait. This is Hellman from Homicide. We're leaving. You better move, Novak. Not until you settle a murder rap. Can you pay it off that fast? I can do it on the way to the door. Oh, wait a minute. Point the gun at Hellman. He's official. I can tag you both, so move away. You too, Norma. Ann and I are leaving. Look, Giffen. Homicide gobbles up nightclub big shots like you. You're nothing to me, copper. Move away. You got the hammer. Use it and come on through. All right, I will, copper. Hey, yeah, hey, you need a refill, Giffen. That's right, darling. Hand him your gun. And, and you couldn't have done that. You couldn't have taken him out. All right, so they fell out. You better take him for murder, Hellman. You little bum. That leaves you all the money. I can spend it, darling. Well, you better do it fast, then. Grab him, Hellman. Yeah, yeah I got him. Oh, you can fucking for both murders. My Greeley and my brother. I'll testify and I'll ride there in a cab on your dough, Giffen. Yeah. Are you going to pose or take me, Hellman? If you're anxious. Sorry about you, Norma. You get nothing out of this, but that's better than I got. Goodbye, Ann. Lots of luck. Thank you, darling. You know what kind. I hope you're rot. Come on, Hellman. I'm ashamed of you, Ann. Leave me alone, Norma. I'm ashamed of you, Ann. 
What you did to Joe, I'm ashamed of you. Leave me alone, Norma. I'm sick, you know that. I didn't know how it was going to work out. Poor Joe was trying to help you when you got greedy. He was trying to help you. That's the only reason he came out. You let this happen. I told you I didn't know how it was going to end. I thought they'd get him and take him back again. There's no good in you, Anne. They couldn't find good in you anywhere. You let that happen to Joe. You stood by and watched him walk into something like that. All right, I stood by. What can we do about it now except weep, and that won't help him. But hating you will. That'll help Joe a little. I'm here at least to hate you for the short time left. Please, Norma. He hasn't told you to spend it fast. Well, you better. You better spend it fast. Ask him at the hospital if that isn't so. What do you mean? Ask him out there what you've got. They told him. You ask them what you've got. Ask them what's staring you to pieces. Ask them, they'll tell you. They'll tell you you've got cancer. Norma, please. They'll tell you cancer. Ask them, they'll tell you you're full of it. Now spend your money. Spend your money and see that it lasts as long as you do. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Novak. Well, did you miss much, Father? No. Feldman luck is running kind of bad tonight. It does for some people, I guess. All they get is unhappiness. They wear it the same way you'd wear a sports coat, only they never seem to get a new one. I'm sorry about tonight, Mr. Novak. I'm sorry it's not a smoother world. Yeah. But if it were, you'd be out of a job, Father. See you later. If you get a bad first break, you never run the table. That's what happened to Joe Feldman. Charlie Giffen owed him dough and wouldn't pay up. But Joe didn't care until Norma showed up and told him how sick Ann was, so he decided to collect from Giffen and divide the dough between the girls. Father Leahy couldn't stop him. All he could do was try and make it work out. Joe was going to get the dough and meet the girls in that hotel room, but he changed his timetable and sent Mike Greeley up to tell the girls. Giffen showed up there and figured that Mike had tumbled to a double cross, so he killed him. Anne engineered the double cross, but she didn't mean to go that far. She wanted all the dough and tipped off Giffen. He was supposed to turn the dough over to her and then have the police pick up Joe, but Joe got there early. He took the dough away from Giffen and shot the copper on the way out. Giffen followed Joe and killed him out in Arguello, but the dough was gone. He finally tumbled to Norma's place, and that's how her apartment filled up so fast. Well, Hellman asked only one question. What did I get out of all this? Nothing. Father Leahy offered me 50 bucks, but I didn't want it. Jocko was with me, and he offered to give it to charity. I guess he did, because where Jocko spent it, the drinks aren't worth money. Pat Novak for Hire was previously released by ABC, the American Broadcasting Company, for listeners in the United States, and rebroadcast for our men and women overseas. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education.
Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. The people who make 76 gasoline and Triton motor oil, Union Oil Company, present... The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. Our detective friend, Mike Shane, solves most of his cases by a combination of clues, shrewd thinking, and daring action. But he's also a great student of criminal files and case histories of famous crimes. This morning, Mike is at his desk, deep in study of the latest exploit of another well-known detective, Mr. Dick Tracy, when suddenly Mike's useful and very ornamental associate, Phyllis Knight, opens the office door. Psst! Mike! Mike! Hmm? Huh? Uh, yes, Angel? Hide that funny paper. There's a client in the waiting room. Oh, just when I was getting to the... Come on, come on. Okay, okay, show him in. Uh, Mr. Shane will see you now, Mr. Carter. <clears throat> this is Mr. Shane, Mr. Nelson Carter. I'm glad to know you, Mr. Carter. Won't you sit down, sir? Yes, yes, thank you very much. Mr. Shane, I'll have to be very brief. I'm an attorney, and I'm on my way to see a client. It's, uh... It's about him, about Mr. Dixon, that I've come here. Mm hmm, I see. The situation is so uh, fantastic, really, I'm afraid Mr. Dixon's life is in peril. I fear for him, I really do. Is it a case that the police department should handle, Mr. Carter? Well, no, no, I, I don't see how the. Mr. Shane, three days ago, when Gregory Dixon walked into my office, I, I screamed in terror. I almost fainted. Fainted? But, but. Yes. What? Two months ago, we had buried Mr. Dixon. Oh, you had buried Mr. What? Yes. Oh, oh, yes, it was a perfectly proper funeral. Hmm. Well, I thought I was seeing his ghost. We'd received word that Mr. Dixon was killed in an accident down in Mexico, in Yucatan. Imagine, imagine my consternation. Here he walked into my office while I'm administrating his estate. Uh Uh-huh, that would make anybody do nip-ups. Yet you say you buried him. Oh, it was a mistake, a horrible mistake. Oh. Somebody died in Yucatan. They thought it was Mr. Dixon. The coffin was shipped to Mr. Dixon's cousin. We held a funeral, and I was appointed administrator of the estate. But, uh, uh, just a minute, sir. You started off by telling us Mr. Dixon's life is in danger. Yes. His heirs have received his bequests. Now, they'll have to refund the money, and, uh, <coughs> well, with all respect for Mr. Dixon's relatives, I must say several of them are extremely unsavory. Well, that's no reason for thinking that they will uh, try to kill him. Well, I think there's every danger they will, Mr. Shane. One of his cousins came into my office yesterday. He was absolutely furious because he was cheated out of his inheritance. Hmm? He asked me about Mr. Dixon's health and how long I thought he might live, and so... So you on. want us to protect your client? Yes. Now, I'm going out to his house right now. I... I'd like you to come along and talk to Mr. Dixon. Well, I would rather prevent a murder than solve one. Then you will come with me? Yes, Mr. Carter, we will. Well, well, Carter, you're an old worrywart. A good attorney, but an old worrywart. Now, now, Mr. Dixon, you don't appreciate the serious danger with your hand. <laughs> Do you, Mr. Shane and Miss Knight, feel that I'm a man about to be murdered? Well, we really don't know, sir. You see... I uh... can understand Carter's feelings. He doesn't want to have to probate your will a second time. Every time you die, you make more work for the poor man. <laughs> Clarence, than you heard. <laughs> As I was coming in from the garden. I'm Clarence Fisher, Mr. Dixon's cousin. How do you do, Mr. How do Fisher? You do? Of course, Carter may be right. I'm worth considerably more to you, Clarence, dead than alive. I can talk like that to Clarence. He's got a fine sense of humor. Not like his cousin Howard. Howard is sober as a judge with a toothache. Assuming Mr. Dixon's life is in danger, who would be the most likely suspect? Why, several. Before I left the office, I made a list of Mr. Dixon's beneficiaries. It, uh, well, if you care to read it now, I... Thank you, sir. Clarence Fisher. Oh, that's me. Oh, yes. Uh, bequest uh, $10,000. Howard Connell, 20000 William A. Wilkinson, 25000 and a farm at Redwood City. Various charities, 200000 Mm-hmm, I see. Apparently, Mr. Carter's modesty made him omit his own bequest to the tune of $25,000. Well, uh, <coughs> but uh, after all, uh, surely I couldn't be a suspect. You know, there's one thing which puzzles me and which none of you gentlemen has explained. Mr. Dixon is here alive and well, but uh, who is buried out in the cemetery? You know, I've wondered about that myself. You see, when I was down in Yucatan, I fell ill of a fever. I'm still about 30 pounds underweight. It ruined my eyes, and I had to get glasses. But that's beside the point. 
When I got up from my sickbed, I found my wallet had been stolen. So had most of my papers. I assumed the thief was later killed. Uh, suppose somebody down in Yucatan received orders to kill Mr. Dixon. Suppose the person who did the killing, or uh, ordered the killing, now realizes that a mistake was made. Yes, he may try again. Mm, that's a grave thought, and no mm. pun intended. May I ask who received the coffin here? Uh, Mr. Dixon's cousin, Howard Connell. Actually, the body was not buried. It was interred in the mausoleum. We followed the instructions in Mr. Dixon's will. Say, you brought up a good point, Phyllis. If we could find out whose body's in that coffin, it just might be a clue. We might even find out if the man had been murdered. Yeah, and if it were murder, we would know definitely that Mr. Dixon is in real danger. Well, then I suggest you have the body exhumed, if that's possible. It is possible, Mr. Dixon. I'll ask the inspector of homicide to use his influence with the coroner's office. Sometimes dead men tell very interesting tales. <laughs> know that I can think of a lot of things I'd rather do, Mike Shane, than visit a mausoleum? Yes, but we'll make it as short as possible, Angel. Now, let's see. According to the superintendent, it should be down this next corridor. All right. Hello. Mr. <laughs> Shane, Miss Knight. Oh, hello there, coroner. Mike, I'd like to know what's going on around here. What's wrong? Take a look in the coffin. There... There's no body in it. You're right, Angel. Nothing but gunny sacks and granite rocks. Mike Shane and Phyllis have dropped in at police headquarters to talk over their problem with the inspector. With them is Nelson Carter, their client's attorney. The whole situation is completely screwy, Inspector. A man is reported dead. Uh -huh. His coffin arrives from Mexico. He has a funeral. His property's divided. Two months later, the fellow turns up alive and kicking. And his coffin is filled with gunny sacks and granite rocks. It's a new one on me, kids. Unless this Gregory Dickler think he was dead. Well, then why would he come back at all, Inspector? He almost lost all his money and property. Uh -huh. Well, I don't see you need worry, Mike. Dixon is alive. There's no corpse in the coffin. Nobody's dead. No, but it's got our curiosity up, Inspector. You know, Mike and I do handle other cases besides murder. This time we've drawn a completely wacky mystery. Well, you can make light of it, Miss Knight. But since finding that empty coffin, I'm more convinced than ever that there's something diabolical afoot. All right. Diabolical what? It's only three days since anybody knew Mr. Dixon was still alive. Several of the heirs would stop at almost nothing to hold on to their inheritances. You said that before, Mr. Carter. Now, let's see, you gave me a list of the bequests. Uh, which man stormed into your office yesterday? The uh, uh, one who wanted to know how long you thought Dixon might live? Yes, that was Wilkinson. William A. Wilkinson. Oh, yes, yes, yes. He's listed here for $25,000 in a farm near Redwood City. Yes, he's living there right now. He was furious because he'll have to turn the farm back to Mr. Dixon. And then this Howard Connell. He's down for $20,000. Uh, what about him? A cousin of Mr. Dixon. He gambles, plays the horses, will do anything to keep out of work, and can't hold a job anyway. Well, I suppose we might interview those men. Though I don't know what we could ask. Ask them. No crime's been committed. Well, you won't be able to get hold of Howard Connell. He left for New York after Mr. Dixon's funeral. Well, we might start him with a little talk with Clarence Fisher, the uh, cousin we met in Dixon's house. Uh, if I were doing it, Mike, I know where I'd begin. Yeah? Where, Inspector? Well, you say Cousin Wilkinson lives on a farm near Redwood City. Yes? Well, it's a very pleasant sunny day outside, and twice as pleasant down country. I know a tidy little inn on King's Road west of Redwood City... They serve swell hamburgers, and there's a cute little Irish waitress with a green apron. Ah, oh, <laughs> say no more, Inspector. Say no more. You've sold us one trip to Redwood City. If you don't mind, Mr. Shane, we'll sit and talk under this apple tree. i uh, got to keep my eye on Alec, the hired hand. Laziest man you ever seen. Whatever you wish, Mr. Wilkinson. Oh, an old-fashioned hammock. That's for me, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir, when I got Carter's letter about Dixon being alive, I couldn't believe my eyes, so to speak. Sort of upset my plans for the future. By the way, it's sort of a warmish day. You folks like a drink? Uh, you, Phil? Huh? Not now, thanks. Maybe some water later on. Well, we'll make it apple cider. 
Water here doesn't taste right to me. Dixon just got done putting in pipe water, bricked up the old well over there, and went modern on it, so to speak. Uh, well, what'd you folks say you came down here about? Uh, we didn't say, sir. Mr. Carter seems to think Mr. Dixon's in some sort of danger. Now, we'd like to ask you if he has any enemies who might, uh... Carter? I told that lawyer yesterday that... Well, I guess maybe he repeated it to you, Mr. Shane. You can see this is a very nice little farm, and I was expecting to make myself a piece of money off it, so to speak. Handing it back to Dixon now is going to hurt like pulling eye teeth, so to speak. Maybe you could buy it back from Mr. Dixon. Did he make much use of the farm? Oh, spent all of his weekends down here, and I haven't got the cash to buy it from him. Mr. Wilkinson, you say that Dixon bricked up the water well? Uh, yes, he did it a couple of months ago. Left it in an unsightly mess. Alec cleaned it up for me, dug a new rose garden, and shoveled the dirt down in the well. Quite a number of stones missing from the coping around the well. Oh, Mike, I know what you're driving at. Yeah. You and I, Angel, have seen those stones before. The identical size and shape in a coffin in a mausoleum. Water. Water, I'd broken through. Mike! Mike, can you hear me? Mike, have you found anything? Yeah. Yeah, plenty. A body. Jiminy. Jiminy Christmas, Mr. Wilkinson. This is bad. Awful bad. Oh, stop your jaw, and Alec. You make me nervous. Mr. Wilkinson, do you know whose body this is? Of course not. How do you suppose I could tell? Mike, there's a ring on one of his fingers. Yeah, yeah, I see it. A gold ring. The band's in the shape of a snake. There. Let me look at it. Mean anything to you, sir? No. This hole in his head means something to me. He was murdered. Mike, we'd better get hold of the inspector. Yeah. Yes, we're heading back to San Francisco and pick up the inspector, and then... Yeah. Then we're going to have another talk with Mr. Dixon. Say, when I suggested that you kids take a little run down country, I didn't expect you to come tearing back to me with a body. Oh, and now that we've found it, the question is, whose body is it? Yes, and until we know that answer, we're not going to spill the news to Dixon. Remember that, Angel. All right. We've got to tiptoe very cautiously. There's Dixon, out in the garden, talking to Mr. Fisher. Yes. Look, Inspector, if you don't mind, I'll do most of the questioning. Mm -hmm. We've got to approach Dixon downwind. Suits me. Shane, Miss Knight. I was wondering what had become of you. We uh, brought along a friend of ours, Mr. Dixon, the Inspector of Homicide. Inspector of Homicide? Yes. You see, if anybody should succeed in killing you, this is the man who will lose his sleepover. Well, <laughs> glad to know you, Inspector. And may your slumbers be unbroken. Uh, this is my cousin, Clarence Fisher. Well, how do you do? How do you do? I suppose we go into the house so we can sit down. Okay, sir. Uh, Mr. Dixon, we just got back from a little drive down to Redwood City. We talked with another of your cousins, William Wilkinson. That's so? Hates to give up the farm, doesn't he? Oh, very much. He's put in a new rose garden. We noticed that the old water well behind the house has been bricked up. Oh, really? Wilkinson changing things around his suit, huh? Then... then you didn't fill in the well yourself? Me? Why, no. Why should I? Uh... Mr. Dixon. Yes? Did you have any people visit you down on your farm from the, uh, the, the past few months? Oh, a few... Howard Connell, Clarence here, Wilkinson, old fuss budget Carter, and a few others. I see. Well, sir, if I'm to properly protect you, I'd like to know what those people look like. Do you have any photographs? Photographs by the hundreds. I've got a scrapbook of snapshots. It's right over there on the wicker table. Uh, this what you want? Oh, that's perfect. How about this uh, group picture here? Oh, that's me wearing the straw hat. Really? Girl, yeah, uh, girls, Joan Brooks. Uh, the man behind, I uh, can't remember his name. No, I can't either. Some chap was on his way to Canada. Uh, the last fellow on the far right is Howard Connell. Howard Connell. He's mm -hmm. the cousin who's gone to New York, isn't he? That's right. Last time I saw Howard was when he drove me to the airport when I went to Mexico. Does he live in San Francisco? Uh, right next door. I'm living in his house till he gets back. And when will that be? Well, I can't say. He left for New York right after Dixon's... Well, funeral. 
The last letter I got from him didn't mention when he'd be back. Hmm. He was one of the beneficiaries under Mr. Dixon's will. I should think he would stay here in town. Not Howard. He's always on the move. No telling where he is now. Here's another photo of you in the scrapbook, Mr. Dixon. A close-up. You're wearing a large, rather peculiar-looking ring. Why, yes, yes. I lost that ring some time ago. Lost it? Hmm. Have you uh, any idea where? Why, no. It just uh, slipped off my finger one day. No idea where I lost it. But I don't see what that matters. (laughs) Hey, it doesn't matter. Well, uh, thanks very much for letting us see the pictures, Mr. Dixon. And now we'll be running along. Oh, but Mr. Shane, you were hired to protect me. You're always running off somewhere. We're working on the case, sir, I assure you. In fact, we're going to police headquarters right now, just on your account. Now, this is the way I dope it out, Inspector. Check me if I'm wrong. Okay. First of all, we may be up against a colossal conspiracy. Mm -hmm. The attorney Carter comes to Phyllis and me and says Dixon's life is in danger. Because Dixon was reported dead and now turns up alive and his heirs hate to part with their ill-gotten gains. Then we find that Dixon's funeral was a fake. Yeah. We find his coffin filled with stones from Dixon's own water well. And we find a murdered man hidden inside the well. And that murdered man, Inspector, I'm convinced is the real Gregory Dixon. The fellow who says he's Dixon is an imposter. Yeah, I know what you base that on, Mike. The fact that the ring on the dead man's finger is the same ring we saw in Dixon's photograph. Correct. But perhaps the ring really was lost, and the person who later found the ring is the man you hauled out of the well. Well, that's possible, Inspector, but I'd like to go one step further. I'll say that the man who calls himself Gregory Dixon is actually Howard Connell, Dixon's cousin and beneficiary. I was beginning to suspect that myself. Connell very conveniently disappears on a trip to New York. Nobody knows exactly where he is or when he's coming back. But Dixon's relative ought to be able to recognize the fake unless they're all in on the deal, too. That may be, too. But there was a strong family resemblance between Dixon and Connell. Mm -hmm. I noticed it in those photographs. Mm -hmm. That's why the story about Dixon falling ill, losing 30 pounds, having to put on glasses. An alibi in case anybody began to suspect. Okay. But who killed Dixon, Phil? Who threw his body down the well and bricked it up? Both Wilkinson and Connell denied they closed the well. Yes, Sergeant? Mr. Shane's call to Redwood City is waiting, sir. Thanks. Take it on this phone, Mike. Thanks, Inspector. Hello? Hello, Alec? You calling me, Mr. Shane? Yes, uh, I want to ask you a question, Alec. How long have you worked for Mr. Wilkinson? Why, about a month or so. Mr. Wilkinson hired me when he took over the farm. And uh, when you were making the new rose garden for him, Alec, did you dump all that dirt down the well? Yes, sir. The well was bricked up anyway. I didn't see no harm. That's all I wanted to know. Thank you, Alec. Well, Wilkinson told us the truth. Yeah. The well was bricked up when he got the farm. Well, then Dixon, I, I mean, Connell lied to us. Practically everything he told us was a lie, Angel. Well, Inspector, what do you say? You make out a pretty strong case, Mike. But we don't have any real proof that Howard Connell killed Dixon and then took his place. Don't worry. We'll get the proof. Okay. I'll take your word for it, Mike. Let's go out and pick up Connell. Mr. Shane, Inspector, I just telephoned for you. Phoned? Why? What for? The very thing I hired Shane to prevent. It's happened. What are you talking about? You don't mean to tell me... Yes, I do mean to tell you. Mr. Dixon is dead. the home of the late Gregory Dixon, Mike Shane, Phyllis, and the inspector have found another body, the body of the man whom they were about to arrest. The dead man lies sprawled in the bushes directly beneath an open window on the second floor. Well, I don't understand. He fell from the window. We, We heard him fall. Mr. Wilkinson, what are you doing in San Francisco? I just got here from Redwood City. Carter and I came out to talk to him. Inspector, take a look at the man's head. Yeah, I see. Deep gash in the back of the skull. He must have hit his head on a rock. Hold on, hold on. Here's something else. A revolver in his coat pocket and a sheet of paper. It's a note. A typewritten note. To the authorities. I cannot go on. You know the truth by now. 
I kill Gregory Dixon. Then a typewritten signature, Howard Connell. Connell, then it's true. I, I, I can't believe it. Good heavens. So he committed suicide. All right, suppose you all tell us what happened. Starting with you, Mr. Fisher. Well, I was next door in my house. Wilkerson and Carter rang my doorbell and asked if Dixon, er, uh, I mean Connell, had gone out. Yes, we'd been pounding on his door and got no answer. Yes, I was sure he was in, so I came over with them and let them into the house with my key. Wilkinson was all excited. He said he had some terrible news. He said the real Gregory Dixon was dead, and we'd all been tricked. How did you know that, Mr. Wilkinson? Yes, we just discovered that for ourselves, but you never told us. I, well, when I saw that body from the well and the ring on his finger, I recognized it. You told us it meant nothing to you. I know, I... I just couldn't believe it. I, I wanted time to think it out. Then I drove up to the city and, and, and told Carter. I thought Wilkinson was crazy. I phoned Dixon, I mean Connell, and told him we were coming right out. I still couldn't believe it. That's why I jumped all over you, Mr. Shane, for letting the man get killed. I didn't know it was suicide and that he was a fake. Believe me, I didn't. Uh-huh, uh-huh. But uh, to get on, uh, what happened after you three were in the house? Well, Wilkinson was trying to tell me his discovery, and Carter was arguing with him. Connell wasn't downstairs, so I went up and called him. He shouted from the bedroom that he'd be down in a minute, and I went back to the living room and started asking Wilkinson questions. He told me about the ring. Yes. And we kept waiting and waiting. The living room windows were open, and I complained about the cold wind blowing in. Fisher went over and started to close the windows. He shouted, and we heard Connell crash to the ground. I saw the body falling past the window. Connell must have known he was trapped. He couldn't face us. Those open windows on the second floor, are they in Connell's bedroom? Yes. Now, let me get this straight. All three of you men were in the room when Connell fell? Yes, yes, sir. Right. Yes, uh-huh. sir. Okay. Now, if you gentlemen don't mind, I'll ask you to step indoors for a few minutes. We want to examine the ground around here before you trample all over everything. Oh, yes. That's all right. That's all right, boys. All right, kids. I know what you're thinking. Yes. One or more or all three of them are lying. Mm-hmm. It was not suicide. It was deliberate murder. Right, Mike. That bedroom window is less than 20 feet from the ground. Ten to one, that fall wouldn't kill a man. If Connell was really planning suicide, he wouldn't take that chance. He'd do it properly. Right. And he wouldn't be so cagey about writing his signature on the, the note uh, uh, on the typewriter. Well, I can't believe he got that deep gash in the back of his skull from hitting one of these rocks. Well, they're not much bigger than pebbles. If you ask me, Angel, that gash was made by the butt of his revolver. One terrific blow. Then the gun was stuck in his pocket. Kids, I'm worried. We know it's murder, but hang it, were those three guys swearing they were all in the room together? We're going to have a devil of a time proving a case against any one of them. Yes, yes, but remember the old rule, Inspector. When all suspects have alibis, none of them have alibis. We've just got to get in and do some good head work. Well, while you're about it, maybe you can explain one thing to me. Huh? Explain what, Phil? Look, these rose vines. Rambling rose vines cover the whole side of this house, clear up to the roof, you see? And yet when you look at Connell's suit, there isn't a single tear or a snag... It's not even a broken rose petal on his clothes. Well, that could be because he jumped or was thrown clear of the vines. Well, then how could his body fall right against the foundations of the house? Wait a minute, wait a minute. The upstairs windows and the downstairs windows both open outwards. That's it, Angel, you've hit it. You're darn right she's hit it. Absolutely, Inspector. Now we've got some business indoors. <laughs> He was killed. Murder? Why, that's impossible, Mr. Shane. We were all here in the living room. We all saw the body fall. Of course you saw it fall, but Howard Connell was already dead. And he did not fall from the second floor. He He did not fall? I'll uh, show you what happened, gentlemen. Now, when you three men were here in the living room, these windows were open. They were open outwards. The body was laid across the tops of both halves of the window. When Mr. Wilkinson complained of the cold, Mr. Fisher closed the windows. That took the support away from the body, and you saw Connell fall past the window. Why, that's idiotic. I'd have seen the body. You did see it, Mr. Fisher. You put it there. You killed Connell with the butt of that revolver. You murdered him because you had helped Connell impersonate Dixon. You were in the deal with him. No. No, he tricked me, too. No, Mr. Fisher. You told us that you'd gotten a letter from Howard Connell in New York. Connell never went to New York. He was right here. All right. All right, I admit it. I killed Connell when I discovered he'd murdered Dixon. He murdered my cousin. That sounds like a very lame attempt to plead the unwritten law. But that was not your reason. You killed Connell because you knew we were closing in on him. You knew Connell couldn't take it. You knew Connell would confess and that he would tie the noose around your neck, too. But I'm afraid that you've done a perfect job of that yourself, Mr. Fisher. Well, how about it, Inspector? (laughs) 
Why are you so quiet, Angel? What are you thinking about? Hmm? Oh, I was just thinking about that whole fantastic scheme. What a cockeyed motive. Yeah, but it almost worked, Phil. Connell and his cousin Fisher saw a way to get a hold of all of Dixon's money, instead of just the amounts he intended to leave them in his will. First, they had to kill Dixon, get his estate distributed, then bring Dixon back to life. All the heirs and beneficiaries would then have to return their bequests to him. Oh, and Connell and Fisher would have the whole estate for themselves. Well, I've heard of killing a man for his money, but never bringing him back to life to get his inheritance. When I see a case like that, I'm almost glad I haven't got any money. Poor but honest and alive. Mm Mm-hmm. Money is the root of all evil. I'll still take plenty of the root. Mm. The uh, correct quotation, honey, is the love of money is the root of all evil. Oh, Yes, it's the, uh, the love that causes the trouble. Oh, love. Well, I'll take plenty of that, too. Tune in again next week at 8 o'clock for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis, with Joe Forte as the inspector. Tonight's story was written by Richard DeGraff and based on the character created by Brett Halliday. Music was composed and directed by Bernard Katz. This is John Lang saying goodnight for Union Oil Company and reminding you once again to get your application for your Union Oil credit card this week. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. The F.W. Fitch Company presents Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. <laughs> Let a song be your style, you Fitch Shampoo. Don't despair, use your head, save your hair, you Fitch Shampoo. The F.W. Fitch Company, makers of Fitch's dandruff remover shampoo and ideal hair tonic, presents Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue. In Rogue's Gallery. speaking. There is something about being happy that I like. And I couldn't have been any happier than I was that night if somebody had been tickling me with a feather. I had a date with Betty Callahan, and the way I feel about Betty hasn't been covered by a word yet. But it's a very dandy way to feel, and I was reveling in it as we sat there in the Club Cuba, drinking our after-dinner coffee and grinning at each other. I was quite annoyed when a gentleman with outraged dignity lurched over, drew up a chair, and made himself unwelcome at our table. I told that you are Richard Rowe, the investigator. Oh, that's right. Why don't you go back to your own table? I uh, just want to tell you, Rowe, that I consider your way of making a living despicable. Mm, Well, thank you very much. Now, Richard, don't start a scene. Look, uh, mister, why don't you go away? You wouldn't like to have me call the captain and have you dragged away, would you? Oh, no, no. I have a few things to say before I leave, Rogue. I understand that my wife has retained your services to spy on me and sneak around after me. Uh, Sit down, Richard. He's been drinking. Yeah, uh, okay, honey. Look, mister, will you please go away? We don't like you. Go away, Scott. Go away, go away. Oh, look, look. You know me, and I know what you're doing here. I just want to tell you, Rogue, that my wife means a great deal to me. I don't even know your wife. I don't care anything about your private life as long as you lead it someplace away from this table. <laughs> Going to lie about it, huh? Haven't even got nerve enough to admit that you're sneaking around watching me. Okay, okay. Manual. Oh, Manual. Yes, Mr. Rogue. Will you take this creep away before I see whether those vitamin pills I've been taking really work? 
Take him away, will you? Of course. Yelling for help, huh, Rogue? Yellow, huh? Well, I'll oh. show you. Here, yeah, Mr. Oh. Webb. Mr. Webb. Let's go of me. I'll kill him, the come sneaking on. Come rat. on, come on, Betty. Let's get out of here before I lose my temper and nail that guy. I'd never seen him before. He looked like a nice little man, but he didn't look like he could poke his way out of a mosquito net. As we got a cab, I looked at Betty. She was blushing like a June groom, and her little lower lip was pushed out in that cute way, which indicated that she was going to tell me just what she thought of me and my profession as soon as she could control herself. Well, she did. It was early, but Betty wanted to go home, so I took her there. Then I went to my apartment. In the hall, I met a woman waiting for me, a beautifully turned out woman, well kept 35, with a baby face, and a full mouth drooped at the corners. Mr. Rogue? Yes, uh, yes. You waiting for me? Yes. Hmm, well, how nice. In just a moment. Won't you come in? Thank you. Uh, have a chair. Have, uh, have we met before? No, I don't believe we have, Mr. Rogue. I've always admired you, though. I've always admired your work. Well, oh, well, thank you. And now, just what is it you wanted to see me about? About my husband. Oh. He's... Uh, oh, he's uh, found a new interest. Yes. Well, uh, well, I suppose you tell me. What's your name, by the way? I'm Mrs. Webb. Mrs. Matt Webb. Webb. Oh, Webb. Oh, well, I'm beginning to see the light. Tell me, uh, has your husband a bad disposition and delusions of grandeur? My husband? Well, he... I, uh, I just met him. He said that you'd retained me for some reason which he didn't explain. Why did you tell him that? I want to retain you, Mr. Rogue. Look at this. Uh huh? Oh, come on over here under the light. Hmm. Bill for a fur coat, $5,000. I want to know who my husband bought that coat for, Mr. Rogue. I'll pay you well for finding out. Oh, I'm really sorry, Mrs. Webb, but I don't get mixed up in domestic difficulties. There are plenty of detectives, though, who will take your case. You won't take it? No, I, I really won't. I'm much too busy. But, Good but, night, Mrs. Webb. Mr. Rogan. I'm I... sorry, Mrs. Webb. I'm tired. I, I don't take domestic cases. Uh, thanks for dropping in, but now, good night. I have to get some sleep. Good night, Mr. Rogue. <laughs> Oh, what's the idea of calling it's me? It's I, Richard. Betty. And it's ten o'clock. Oh. 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 Well, hello, Angel. I I wasn't quite awake, you know. Oh, never mind. I have news for you. Yeah? Your friend, Matt Webb. Remember him at the club last night? Well, sure. What about him? Well, he was found dead in his car this morning, parked in the Hollywood Hills. Shot. No kidding, huh? I just left Lieutenant Urban. He's in charge of the case for homicide. He knows about your argument with Matt Webb last night. Well, he doesn't think I did it, does he? Well, no, but... Oh, there's somebody at the door. How about lunch? Oh, all right. Noon at the Derby? Suits me. So long, honey. Keep your shirt on. I'm coming. I'm coming. Oh. Oh, hello, Urban. Come in. Thanks, Rogie. I don't know anything about it. Don't even know the guy. You're talking about Matt Webb, I suppose. Sure, who else? Don't tell me you just dropped in here for a cup of coffee. How did you know Webb was dead? Did I say he was dead? Pull up a chair. Cigarette? No. What do you know about Webb, Rogue? Oh, nothing. I, I met him at the Club Cuba last night. He wanted to beat my brains out because I was an investigator. Seems he had a strange idea that his wife had retained me to follow him. Or... Okay, Rogue, talk your brains out. But you can't talk away the fact that Webb is dead and you had a beef with him. Sure, but I don't know anything about this case, Urban. And it's early in the morning, and while you... You have know... a genius for getting all mixed up in things you don't know anything about, haven't you, Rogie? I don't get sore. Okay, I'm not sore. Just because I meet a guy who doesn't like investigators, and his wife tries to hire me to find out who he bought a fur coat for, and he turns up dead... That oh... uh, wife angle is interesting, Rogie. Get dressed. Why? Mrs. Webb didn't mention any fur coat when I went out to see her this morning. She didn't. Maybe she's got some more little secrets. Come on, Rogie. We're going to call on her. We'll continue our story in just a moment. 
First, when you want to drive a nail, you can use the heel of your shoe or some other object, but you get better results with a hammer. So, when you want to remove dandruff, you get the best results by using a product made especially for that purpose. Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo. Fitch is the only shampoo made whose guarantee to remove dandruff is backed by one of the world's largest insurance firms. It removes dandruff effectively and quickly because its special solvent action dissolves the dandruff, both the loose dandruff and the dandruff clinging to the scalp. To get the full benefit of this solvent action, you should always apply Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo to the hair and scalp before adding water. Then apply water only after the shampoo has been massaged thoroughly into the hair and scalp. When you do add water, a fluffy lather forms to cleanse the hair of the dissolved dandruff. Try this method of attaining shining clean dandruff-free hair. Use Fitch, F-I-T-C-H, Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo regularly. Now back to Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue... In Rogue's Gallery. It isn't very often that I get tangled up in a case with no more money in it than a busted piggy bank. I operate on the theory that a boy's best friend is a dollar. I didn't know the recently dead Matt Webb from Gunga Den, but there I was in Urban's homicide sedan on my way out to play quiz with Mrs. Webb. During the ride, Urban gave me a quick rundown on the events surrounding Matt Webb's murder. Webb was a very wealthy man, you know, Rogie. Big manufacturer, farm machinery. Well, he couldn't have been very smart or else he wouldn't have been parked up in the Hollywood Hills. That's volunteering for a stick-up. Yeah. What's the widow look like? His daughter? No, I guess she's not quite that young, but... uh, Oh, what the beauty parlor and the foundation can do to keep her young has been done... Very pretty woman. She looks about 30, probably 35. Mm. By the time we get back down to headquarters, we'll know more about her and everything else in the case. I'd like to get it over with. I want to go on my vacation. I'm sick of murders. Hey, so this is... The way the other half lives, huh? Hmm. Must have taken a lot of fire machinery to plop enough dough for this monstrosity. Well, Webb had a million or two. It ain't hay. Now, uh, I'll do the questioning, Rogue. I'm in charge of the case, you know. Oh, sure, 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 sure. I'm just a silent partner. Ring the bell. Thank you, I will. Yes? Police. I want to see Mrs. Webb. Oh, uh, come in. Thank you. Well, go ahead, Irvin. Go ahead. She's in here. My name is Fred Gale. I was sales manager for Matt, uh, Mr. Webb. Lieutenant Irvin, homicide. This is uh, Richard Rogue. Oh, I'm glad to know you, Gale. Would you mind telling me why... Shut uh... up, Rogue. Huh? Well, I... Shut up! Oh, all right, all right. Uh, right in here, please. Well, Mrs. Webb... These gentlemen from Homicide want to talk with you. Why must you talk to me right now? I have nothing more to say. Uh, Mrs. Webb, Richard Rogue here tells me that you called on him last night, uh, attempted to hire him to check on the disposition, the disposition which your husband made of a fur coat. Yes, I did. I didn't tell you about it this morning because I didn't consider it important. Well, uh, Mrs. Webb, Rogue. Hmm? Now, Mrs. Webb, every detail is important in the investigation of a homicide. Whom do you suspect of receiving the coat? Uh, Look, Lieutenant, I hate to get into this. Mr. Gale, if you please, this is my affair. Matt Webb was my best friend. If you, Mrs. Webb, had been a little more understanding... There's no time to fight with me. Maybe we could organize this conversation a little bit. You stay out of it, Rogue. This is a murder investigation. Now listen, all of you. Oh, just a minute, just a minute, Irvin. Look, Mrs. Webb... How about telling us a little more about the home life of you and your husband? Rogue, if you don't shut up, I'm going to throw you out of this investigation. Oh, just a minute. Gail, uh, weren't you you with Matt Webb at the Club Cuba last night? Yes, I had dinner with him there. Then you must have known uh, who he was with and what he did later. I have no idea what he did later in the evening. I left him a little after eight. At that time, his plans were to go home. At least, that was my understanding. Well, maybe you'll feel more like talking a little later, Gail. You can go now. You can get me at the office anytime you want me. Okay. Uh, Better fix that cold. Now, uh, Mrs. Webb, 
You seem to think that your husband was involved with some woman. Of course he was. That's how he got killed. To whom do you think he gave the fur coat? To his secretary, Helen Damon. He's been in love with her for the last year. She's been making a perfect fool of him. Mm, Helen Damon. We'll have a talk with her. <laughs> Lieutenant Urban dropped me by my office, and I took pen and racing form in hand and managed to forget all about killings not made at Hollywood Park until noon when I left and met Betty Callahan at the Brown Derby. She was as full of information as a Chamber of Commerce brochure. Richard, I want you to come with me to the jail. I want you to talk with Helen Damon. Web secretary, why? I feel so sorry for her. Those homicide detectives have been grilling her all morning, and she's so tired and discouraged. Well, wait a while, Helen. Does it look like Helen did the job? Well, yes. A man showed up at the police station this morning, and he said he saw a girl in a tweed coat with a tuxedo collar run down out of the hills last night and drive away in a Chrysler coupe, a blue one, just about the time of Webb's murder, and in the same locality. And Helen Damon has a coat like that and drives a blue Chrysler coupe, right? Yes, but Richard, I don't think she did it. Oh, just because she has big brown eyes, I suppose. Look, baby, cops don't make many mistakes. What did they find out about the gun? Well, it was a thirty-eight revolver that Mr. Webb kept in his desk at the office. There were no fingerprints on it. It was, uh, it was found in the weeds a little way from where the car was parked. Oh, look, Betty, Betty, honey, you're a newspaper reporter, not an investigator. So why don't you let the police take care of finding the killers? If Helen Damon did it, she'll get the book. If she didn't, she'll be okay. Hasn't she got any alibi for the time of the crime? No, she hasn't. Oh, you have to go down there and talk to her. I promised her you would. Oh, now, what business have you promising anybody that I'll take their case? Looks to me like this Helen Damon is as guilty as Engelbach. I don't want to get mixed up in a case like that. I should have known that's the way you'd look at it. Just because she doesn't have much money to pay you. But, baby, that's got nothing to do with it. I have a couple of hundred dollars. I can pay you. I want to see that Helen Damon gets a fair deal. Now, look, Betty. I'm not going to get mixed up in this case. That's final. You understand? Rogue to see Helen Damon. I'll give you ten minutes, Rogie. Thanks, Olson. Hello there, Miss Damon. Betty Callahan, the reporter, told me you were expecting me. I don't see how you can do me any good, Mr. Oak. They've already decided that I did it. Nothing I can do to convince Well, I, uh, I know about the partial identification. Now, suppose you tell me where you were at the time the crime was committed. All right. Last night at 9 o'clock, within a few minutes of 9 anyway, I, I got a call from Mr. Webb. I don't think it was Mr. Webb now, but I thought it was then. He asked me to meet him at his office. Said he had some important letters he had to get out at once. Was he in the habit of having you work at night? No, but it didn't seem unreasonable to me. Mm -hmm. So I put on my coat and went down to get in my car, which was parked in the parking lot next to my apartment building. Mm -hmm. Just as I got into the car, somebody grabbed me from behind and held a cloth over my face. It was chloroform. When I came to, about three hours later, I was in my car. My coat was thrown over me. The car was back in the parking lot, and it had been driven about 15 miles. I know because I had it serviced yesterday, and the service record is on the dash. You live at Hollywood? Yes. Oh. Oh, well, that's just about right for a drive to the Hollywood Hills. You would have trouble convincing a jury with a story like that. Now, look, Helen, I, uh, I'm your friend. Is that story the truth? Yes. Yes, it is, Mr. Rogue. I know you don't believe me. Nobody does. You haven't the slightest idea what happened between 9 o'clock last night and midnight, right? Yes, that's right. There's no way in the world I can prove I'm telling the truth. I couldn't figure out why anybody would do anything like that to me. I got up this morning and went to work. I I didn't say anything to anybody because I... You uh, live alone? Yes. Now, uh, Helen, I I want you to be frank with me. Uh, Were you uh, uh, overly friendly with Matt Webb? I liked him and admired him, that's all. Mrs. Webb seems to think it went a little further than that. Oh, no, no. I hardly knew him at all socially. He's taken me to dinner a few times, that's all. Oh, Mr. Rogue, do you think you can do anything to help me? I'm not a murderess. Uh, Yeah. uh, Tommy, do you know anything about a fur coat? A 
coat that Matt, Matt Webb bought for somebody, not his wife. No, I don't know anything about it. I haven't done anything wrong. Can you get me out of here, Mr. Rowe? I don't know. I don't know. You haven't got much of a case. I'll pay you. I have a little money oh, saved. skip I... that, skip that. I'm doing this as a favor to a friend. Are you, you sure you're on the level with me? I've told you everything I know. I didn't kill him. He was a fine man. When I left Helen Damon, I had a great inquisitiveness about a fur coat. I got in my car and fought all the other crazy California drivers to a standstill trying to park in front of Helen's apartment house. I got her apartment number off the register in the foyer and walked up one flight. The lock was easy pickings. I walked in, closed the door, and... Oh! Oh, I caught it right at the base of the skull. Like a turkey on the first Thanksgiving. My astral body left this world and floated up through eternity like a wisp of smoke. Only paler. I was so glad to see Cloud A. My home away from home. I'm gladder to see Yugor, my alter ego. Yugor was sitting there on a used thunderbolt, his raisin-looking eyes sparkling with glee. <laughs> Hello, Rokey. Welcome home. You forgot to duck again, huh? Oh, let me sleep. I'm tired. Oh, you better snap out of it, Chiefy. You've got plenty of work to do. Yeah, yeah I know it, but uh, I'll take care of it later. Go away. No, can't, Rogi. You need a talking to. You can't lay down on a job now. Come on, snap out of it. Oh, oh, my head. Betty Callahan got me into this. Uh, her and her hunches. You've got the same hunch, and you know it, Rogi. Oh, now you're reading my mind. Look, Midget. <laughs> Reading your mind. Look, Chiefy, I am your mind. Hmm. And I'm telling you to get downstairs. You've got work to do. Oh, later. Now, over you go, Rogie. Oh, stop pushing, Hugo. I'm not well. Over you go. Back to work. So long, Rogie. <laughs> Snap out of it, Rogi. Hmm? No. No, oh, hello. Hello. Hello, hello, Urban. What happened to you? Oh, I, um, I, um, I got hit on the head. I, um, can't you see? What kind of a detective are you, anyway? Now, take it easy. What were you doing here in Helen Damon's apartment? I wasn't doing anything. I, uh, I just opened the door and somebody let me have it. What were you looking for up here? Oh, I got a little bit inquisitive. Oh, why? Well, I, uh, I'd had a talk with Helen Damon and... She didn't know anything about a fur coat. <laughs> That's funny. What's well, funny about it? We just got a murder indictment against Helen Damon. Oh, well, that's a long way from conviction. Mm-hmm. And when I was up here this morning, there was no fur coat in that closet. Yeah? There's a fur coat in that closet now, Rogie. Peculiar, isn't it? <laughs> Return to our story in just a moment. First, every woman can have beautiful hair. So it's a shame for any woman to put up with dull, dandruff-flecked hair when she could bring it back to its glorious, natural beauty with regular use of Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo. There are several reasons why Fitch makes an ideal beauty treatment for all colors and textures of hair. For this clear amber liquid shampoo foams into mountains of rich, cleansing lather. And while it's cleansing, Fitch Shampoo is also reconditioning your hair, giving the hair strands more vigor and elasticity, and leaving them with a lovely, silky sheen. Then, Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo is completely soluble in water and rinses out easily, leaving no dull film to mar the luster and dancing highlights of your hair. Next time, ask for an economical bottle of Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo 
at your drug or toilet goods counter. Or have a professional application at your barber or beauty shop. Now back to Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. Assorted and unrelated facts were whirling around in my massive intellect like neutrons around an atom. And they, were, they were just as, as much explosive in them as I could get, if I could get them properly under control. Holy Christ. I got away from Urban and decided to drive out for a visit with Mrs. Matt Webb. As I pulled up in the same block with the Webb house, I saw Mrs. Webb get into her car and drive away. I followed her over Coldwater Canyon and out into the valley. When she pulled into the driveway of an early suburban white ranch house, I parked up the street. She went in. I took a look at the mailbox in front of the house. The name on that mailbox was F.R. Gale. I got that old familiar chill in the region of my solar plexus. I'd lucked into something and I knew it. I worked my way around to the rear of the house as quiet as fallen snow. The back door was unlocked. I pushed and put it in, flowed up to the doors between the dining room where I was and the living room where Fred Gale stood talking with Mrs. Matt Webb. Well, Marsha, may I be the first to congratulate you on that performance you gave for Lieutenant Urban and Rogue tonight? You did very well yourself with it. Now, suppose you tell me what you're doing out here. Why, I had to see you. I needed a little moral support from you, Fred. Yeah, I know. But this is the craziest thing you could have done, Marsha. Well, you don't act as though you're very glad to see me. Now, look, Marsha, we've gone to a lot of trouble to cover up the fact that we're friends, haven't we? Friends? Is that what we are? Oh, friends? You know I love you, Marsha. It's only that so much depends on us being smart just a little while longer. How do you know you weren't followed? You'll have us both in jail for murder. We've been smart so far. Why ruin it? They don't suspect us. They have a murder indictment against Helen Damon. Aren't you going to kiss me, Fred? Come here, sweetheart. They kissed and then held it. I reached my gun out of my shoulder holster and readied myself for the pinch, but something held me back. You can call it second sight or luck or anything you like, but I couldn't move my feet, and while I was debating, they broke it up and started talking again. It was a very interesting conversation. Everything's going to be wonderful for us now, isn't it? Sure. You'll just stay away from me a little while until the case is settled. Everybody's forgotten the murder. Darling, we'll always be sure of each other, won't we? Of course. Oh, Fred, I know I'm silly, but I worry. I don't know what I'd do if I ever lost you. I want you to do something for me. Promise me that you will. Okay. I'll do anything for you, Marcia. If you'll only promise you'll be a good girl and get out of here and stay away from me until everything's all right again. You've got to be smart, baby. I'll stay away. If you'll just help me. I want you to write a note like this one I've written. Read it. Confession. I alone, unassisted, killed Matt Webb. Signed, Marsha Webb. Marsha, this is utter nonsense. If we can't trust each other now, no. we... I want you to write a note like that in your own handwriting and give it to me. And I'll give you my confession and you give me yours. Then we know that nothing can ever separate us. You and I. Oh, it's a stupid thing to do. Say that note up. What if it got into the wrong it hands? Won't. Sit down here and write me one like it. Then I'll know that everything's all right. <laughs> She kissed him then and walked with him over to the desk, talking love all the way. She got a pen and some paper. She stood behind him with her arms around his neck as he started to write. I saw her free hand come up with a gun in it. As he finished the note, she placed the gun an inch from his temple, and I moved. Gail, duck! You... you shot me! He shot me. Rogue, yeah. You should be awfully glad to see me, Gail. In about another minute, you'd, you'd have been a suicide, and your girlfriend here would have been a wealthy widow. Don't believe him. Don't believe him. It's a lie. Oh, skip it, Mrs. Webb. Look, Gail, you see that gun your lovely co collaborator dropped? 
Uh, Marcia. If I hadn't put that slug through her shoulder, she was going to put one through your head, sucker. She was slipping you the kiss of death. He's lying, Fred. He's lying. Why, you were... You were going to kill me. Sit down, Gail. You... Sit down. I'm running the show from here on out, and the little lady has a reserved seat in the gas chamber. <laughs> Well, it didn't take much to convince Gale that Marsha's planned to kill him and leave the gun in his hand as he slumped over the desk. The don't she ask him to write would have sensed his death as remorseful suicide. And Mrs. Webb would have had all of Matt Webb's money and a dead accomplice. She would have been as safe as an odds-on bet that Dick Tracy catches shoulders. Gale admitted his part in the plot to murder Webb and frame the innocent Helen Damon for the crime. And Gale got away with life. Marcia paid the full charge in the gas chamber. Oh, well, I, I've always said that there should be a little editing done on that old saying. Hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. <laughs> the last word should be deleted. Present company accepted, of course, ladies, but uh, you men, uh, you know what I mean. <laughs> This is Dick Powell again, ladies and gentlemen. Hope you enjoyed our story tonight. Ray Buffum wrote it. Leith Stevens composed and conducted the music in D. Engelbach, produced and directed. Be with us again next Sunday, will you? We have a story for you about a summer resort, a lovely girl, and some newspaper clippings about a murder. We call it Cabin on the Lake. Must be a floating cabin. Thanks for listening, and I here's Jim Doyle. Listen again next week at this same time to hear Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. By the way, Dick will next be seen in his newest Columbia picture, Johnny O'Clark. Clap a while, let a song be your style, you spitch shampoo. Don't despair, use your head, save your hair, you spitch shampoo. After and between Fitch shampoos, you can keep your hair shining and manageable by using a few drops of Fitch's Ideal Hair Tonic every day. Fitch's Ideal Hair Tonic is not sticky or greasy, yet it gives your hair that well-groomed look. Cremel Hair Tonic and Cremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. Starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Well, once again, it's time to keep that pleasantest of all doctor's appointments. Our weekly visit with our excellent host and incomparable storyteller, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Dr. Watson. Ah, uh, there you are, Mr. Bell. Just in time to join me in a glass of port. The decanter's there on the sideboard. Help yourself and then settle down. Fine, Dr. Watson. I suppose you're already with tonight's new Sherlock Holmes story, The Adventure of Moultrie Abbey, isn't it? Yes, my boy, and in many ways I'm inclined to think it was one of the most singular adventures that Sherlock Holmes and I ever had. But before I begin the weird adventure of Moultrie Abbey, haven't you, haven't you got a word for our listeners? Yes, Dr. Watson, I have. Men... Neat-looking, well-groomed hair does so much to give a man that air of success, to say nothing of adding to his good looks. And I'm sure you'll be interested in hearing about this modern trend in hair grooming, which has become such a nationwide favorite. It's called Cremel Hair Tonic. This highly specialized hair tonic contains a combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. Yes, that's exactly why Cremel gives a man's hair such a natural, well-groomed look and keeps it in place longer keeps every hair in perfect order from morning till night. Yet Kreml never gives hair that cheap, greasy, patent leather look. Kreml keeps hair looking mighty handsome with a rich, healthy-looking luster. Yet it always feels and looks so clean on your hair and scalp. Men, if you aren't already using a hair tonic, try Kreml. If you're using some other hairdressing, change to Kreml. Then see if your hair doesn't look better than it ever did before. Better groomed, Better looking when you use Kreml. K-R-E-M-L, Kreml hair tonic. 
Now, Dr. Watson, how about the venerable Bede and the adventure of Maltree Abbey? Well, Mr. Bell, that story began in Baker Street on the December afternoon many, many years ago. It was shortly after tea, I remember, when Sherlock Holmes, who'd been pacing up and down our room, suddenly stopped at the window and looked intently out at the street below him. After a few moments, my curiosity overcame me and I joined my old friend. Looking over his shoulder, I saw that on the pavement opposite there stood a young woman dressed in the height of Edwardian fashion. She wore a fur boa and a broad-brimmed hat, from under which she peeped up in a nervous, hesitating fashion at our windows, while her body oscillated backward and forward. Suddenly, with a plunge like the swimmer who leaves the bank, she hurried across the road and we heard the clang of our front door bell. Oh, took her a long enough time to, to make up her mind in home. Yes, Watson. I've seen those symptoms before in women. Oscillation on the pavement generally means an affaire du coeur. She would like advice, but is not sure whether the matter is not too delicate for communication. Oh, she looked a pretty little thing. Perhaps some scoundrels jilted her. Oh, no, Watson. In such a case, the usual symptom is a broken bell wire. Here, I think we may deduce the young lady is not so much uh, angry as uh, grieved or perplexed. Why not meet her at the head of the stairs, old chap? Yes, I know Mrs. Hudson's rheumatism is bothering yes, her. Yes, sir. Of course I will. This way, young lady. It's all right, thank you, Mrs. Hudson. I'm, I'm Dr. Watson. Won't you come along in? Thank you, Dr. Watson. Uh, this is my friend, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. How do you do? Uh, how do you do? I'm Sybil Carter, and I need your help, Mr. Holmes. Then please be seated, Miss Carter. I presume it is Miss, since I see no ring on your wedding finger. Yes, it's Miss. Though that awful man, Jonathan Davis, would like to make it Mrs. Oh, I can quite understand any man. Won't oh, quiet, you? Watson. Oh, sorry. Oh, please tell me your problem, Miss Carter. Well, I can tell you in two words, gentlemen. Jonathan Davis wanted to marry me, and that was bad enough. But even to save the Maltry fortunes, I couldn't marry him. Now he wants Harold to leave the country and disappear. And when we think of the Abbey and the tenants, what can we do? I know that my brother's dead set against outside interference, but tonight is when we play the music. And if only you could be there. Well, that's, uh, that's considerably more than two words, Miss Carter. I'm afraid I can't make head or tail of any of them. Nor can I. Supposing you begin again and talk more slowly. Oh, very well, Mr. Holmes. Uh, perhaps it'll be better if I ask questions. You mentioned your brother's title. May I ask what that title is? My brother's Harold Carter, the 14th Earl of Maltry, and the poorest. Confidentially, we're in a dreadful way financially. Harold invested in Canadian copper last year. The market dropped recently and we were nearly wiped out. That's when this awful Jonathan Devers came on the scene. And who is uh, Jonathan Devers? Oh, he's a cousin of ours from South Africa. He's a dreadful bore, but extremely wealthy. And he, he wants to marry you, you sir? Yes, but even for the sake of the Abbey and the Maltry fortunes, I couldn't do that. Now he's offered Harold 50,000 pounds in cash if he'll go abroad and pretend to disappear. You see, Jonathan Devers is next of male kin in line for the inheritance. So Mr. Devers is trying to bribe your brother to disappear so that uh, he may inherit the title and estates? Yes, Mr. Holmes. Hmm. In this particular matter, I fail to see how I can help you. Oh, but you can, Mr. Holmes. You see, the first Earl of Maltree, he was created by Henry VIII, you know, left a family motto. It's inscribed in our private chapel at the Abbey. It says, if the Maltrees be in need, seek the venerable Bede. A Bede or some fellow who works in the parish, isn't he? Bede, Watson, not Beadle. Oh, oh Bede. Bede. Yes, spelt B-E-D-E. -E. Oh, Bede. -E. Oh. The venerable Bede, if I'm not mistaken, was an 8th century monk who is revered... Not only as a saint, but as the first great English historian. Yes, Mr. Holmes. We have a statue of him in the chapel. And then we have a family custom that... <laughs> I know this may sound silly to you. Oh, don't worry, Miss Carter. I'm aware that some of these old, crusted superstitions often conceal surprising truths. Pray continue. Well, it's been passed down in the family that if ever the Maltrees were in trouble, they should play a bit peculiar piece of music which he composed. Piece of music? What, a, what an odd idea. Extremely interesting. And uh, you're planning to play the music tonight, you say? Yes, Mr. Holmes. Heaven alone knows the Maltrees couldn't be in worse trouble than they are now. And I want you to be there. Only Harold doesn't. So I thought, if you'd bring your violin, I could pretend that you would just come to hear the music. An excellent idea, Miss Carter. As I remember, Maltry Abbey is in Gloucestershire. Yes, Mr. Holmes, at Chipping Martin. An express leaves Paddington at 5.30. Perhaps we could travel together? Certainly. Oh, so it seems like a wild goose chase, Holmes. 
an eighth century monk and strange music. Sounds like a lot of mumbo jumbo to me. Where's your chivalry, Watson? In any case, shall you recall the singular affair of the Musgrave ritual? There's no telling what these old family customs may portend. So be a good fellow and pack your bag. There's no time to be lost. <laughs> I'll just have time to show you the chapel before dinner, gentlemen. Thank you, Lord Carter. And uh, after dinner, I shall be happy to gratify your musical curiosity, Mr. Holmes. But you mustn't regard my sister's visit today too seriously. Sybil's an overly emotional girl. And quite frankly, I wish that she hadn't approached you. I feel that Maltry Abbey is my duty. I'll find some way to save it and my tenants. I uh, trust that the music will live up to its magical reputation. Well, this is the chapel. Mm, what a beautiful building. Must be very old. Oh, it's 16th century. The Abbey House was built nearly 100 years later. 16th century? Uh, hold your lantern a little higher, Dr. Watson. Uh, that's it. Now, I, I want to show you a prize possession. There you are. Magnificent. Quite magnificent. This, I presume, is the statue of the Venerable Bede that uh, your sister spoke of. Yes, it's an excellent specimen of 16th century wood carving. Note particularly the delicate work on the beads of the rosary. Odd. Very odd indeed. What's odd, Holmes? The fact that the... How many times I have to tell you to keep away from me, you filthy scum? Don't you take your whip to me, sir. I, I'm, I'm not doing nothing. Oh, oh, what the devil's going on out there? Oh, come on. Come down, you dear and Say that. Oh, don't you lay your whip on me. Oh. Jonathan, what's the matter? Harold, I demand that you discharge this groom of yours. You can't whip me, Mr. Devers. I'll have your blood for this, I will. Well, what's he done, Jonathan? He's been following me. Twice today I bumped into him in the grounds. Not half an hour ago I was taking a walk by the bottom of the tarn, and I found him skulking behind me. Now I bump into him sneaking after me here. I say you must discharge him, Harold. But he was only hired today. Ah, I suppose you're right. Wilson, you may collect a week's wages and leave in the morning. I wasn't doing no harm. Just trying to deliver a telegram. That's why I came here. It's one of you gents, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. I am he. Then this telegram come for you. I was only trying to find you when this son of a South African slave driver come? comes to... <laughs> How? Oh, I'll have your blood. you see if I don't. That's enough, Wilson. I clear off. I'm sorry, Jonathan. Oh, by the way, this is Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Mr. Jonathan Devers. How do you do? How do you do, Mr. Devers? Ah, yes. Sybil told me that you were having distinguished company at your musical soiree tonight. How are you, gentlemen? But excuse me. We'll see you at dinner, no doubt. Oh, hey, bully. That poor devil of a groom was half his side. Mr. Devers mentioned that he was walking by uh, the bottomless tarn half an hour ago. What, may I ask, is the bottomless tarn? Oh, it's a lake on the estate, just behind the gamekeeper's cottage. There's a legend that it's fathomless. All I know is that some years ago, a prize heifer of mine was seen to fall in and drown. We dragged the lake, but no grappling hooks we could obtain touched the bottom. Interesting. Holmes, uh, the telegram that fellow brought you. Ah, yes, the telegram. Uh, give me the lantern, Watson. Uh, uh, Thanks. An extremely illuminating message. Read it for yourself, Lord Carter. It says nothing but my cousin's name, Jonathan Devers. And yet the message is quite eloquent. It is in answer to a query I made before leaving London. Who forced that market drop in Canadian copper which wiped out the Maltree fortunes? You mean that Jonathan deliberately smashed me, Holmes? It would seem obvious. Yes, it's perfectly clear the Devers covets the title and stop at nothing to get it. Holmes, what am I going to do? What the devil am I going to do? We must wait until after dinner and hope that the musical composition may give us a solution to your unhappy problem. Now that Sybil's played that rather dull piece of discordancy, I hope you're all satisfied. Naturally, the Maltree fortunes will be restored. Very funny, Jonathan. What do you make of it, Mr. Holmes? It's uh, curious. Very curious. 
Will you repeat that principal theme again, please, Miss Carter? Oh, yes, of course. Thank you, Miss Carter. I think I begin to get a glimmering of the mysterious message. Yeah, blessed if I do. Sounds like a jumble of meaningless notes to Never me. Never mind, Dr. Watson. Your brilliant friend thinks that he saved the Maltry fortunes. In that case, Harold, I suppose you won't need to see Mr. Alexander in London tomorrow. Why, how did you know that? That your solicitor planned to start bankruptcy proceedings at the latest tomorrow? Huh. I, too, have my investigators, Harold. They seem a bit more efficient than your great Sherlock Holmes. Good night, Sybil. Good night, gentlemen. Ah, oh, there you are again. What are you doing listening at the door, you filthy swine? I was just going to the kitchen. Oh! Uh, get to the stables where you belong. I see that groom again, Harold. I'll break his neck. See that he goes tonight. How dare he speak to you like that, Harold? He's not master here. Not yet, Sybil. But I can't hold on to the place much longer, and he knows it. He's a thoroughly unpleasant scoundrel, if you ask me. Mr. Holmes, you said the music gave you some clue to the message? It did, Miss Carter. But uh, it requires thought and a certain amount of uh, musical experimentation. I doubt if this music room would welcome the consumption of an ounce or two of shag tobacco. I think, therefore, that Watson and I will retire to our own room. With the aid of a pipe and my violin, I shall give the matter undivided attention. And tomorrow... Tomorrow, we... Moultrie Abbey will go into receivership. Not while Sherlock Holmes is on the case. Oh, thank you, Watson. A man of my... Uh, Peculiar modesty needs your constant reassurance. Uh, I can finally sleep out. Then why not go to sleep, my dear well, chap? How can I when you keep scraping away that wretched fiddle? Da 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 lot of rubbish. Sit up half the night. We'll get you. Oh yeah, I'm going to sleep. When the mall trees are in need, seek the venerable bee. This music will solve the Moultrie's problems. You can't whip me, Mr. Devers. I'll have your blood for this, I will. Too bad that your solicitor is starting bankruptcy proceedings tomorrow. You must help us. You must. When the Moultrie's in need, seek the venerable bee. I've got it. Watson, wake up, wake up. Uh, oh, uh, what's, uh, what's up, Holmes? I've got the answer, Watson. I've solved the musical message. Before the night is through, I think we shall find the secret of Maltry Abbey. <laughs> In just a moment, we'll rejoin Sherlock Holmes and discover just what that secret is. Leading hair specialists in this country constantly advise us to take better care of the hair we've got. And men, don't forget that if you want your hair handsome and healthy looking, one of the first requirements is a hygienic scalp. And why settle for just any hairdressing when you can enjoy the extra advantages of Cremol hair tonic? Cremol is a highly specialized hair tonic which gives you your money's worth. It contains a unique combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair preparation. It keeps hair attractively groomed at all times, looking so neat and orderly. But Kreml does lots more than keep hair looking handsome. A Kreml massage stimulates circulation right in the surface of your scalp and leaves your scalp feeling so alive and invigorated. At the same time, Kreml removes dandruff flakes. And it's excellent to lubricate a dry scalp. And if your hair is so dry that it breaks off and falls when you comb it, Cremel actually helps condition the hair in that it makes it feel softer and more pliable. So men, take better care of the hair you've got. Buy a bottle of Cremel at any drug counter. Ask for an application at your barber shop. Use Cremel daily for better groomed hair, for a more hygienic scalp. K-R-E-M-L, Cremel hair tonic. 
Well, Dr. Watson, I, I'm just as confused as I'm sure you must have been when Sherlock Holmes awakened you. What was the musical message? Supposing I tell you the story in its actual sequence, Mr. Bell? I quickly dressed, and in the moonlight, Holmes and I stealthily crept down the corridor to Lord Carter's room. A few moments later, the three of us, carrying lanterns, started down the staircase leading to the main hall. Holmes, as we went into Lord Carter's room, I'm sure, absolutely certain that I saw another door down the corridor, half open, and, and then close. Which door was it? The last one on the right. Oh, that's Jonathan Zever's room. Well, I suppose he knows what we're up to, which I must confess is more than I do. Well, if I'm right, not even Devers can stop us now. You're being confined in mysterious homes. Will you tell me why we're heading for the chapel at two in the morning? In a few moments, I shall make the reason extremely clear to you, I hope. Well, yeah. here's the door. Look, 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 look. Through the stained glass windows over there. I swear there's someone with a lantern in the grounds outside. Our immediate problem is here, inside. Focus your lantern on the statue of the Venerable Bede, Watson. That's where the answer to the mortuary legend lies, I think. For heaven's sake, Holmes, I wish you'd be more explicit. Very well. Let me see if I can whistle those notes written in the musical theme. The notes are B E D E E B E A D. These notes were followed by a rhythmically repeated series of the note D four times. Surely now the pattern becomes clear. Well, the notes B E D E obviously stand for Bede, the Venerable Bede, and we're standing in front of a statue here now. But the second four notes are B E A D. You yourself pointed out the rosary on the Venerable Bede statue, Lord Carter. The notes B E A D must refer to the beads of the rosary. That's why I became suspicious on first seeing the statue. The rosary did not come into use till almost five centuries after the Venerable Bede. Yet, his statue had one. Then, what does the repetition of the note D four times mean after the melody? I think it gives us the vital clue. D is the fourth letter in the alphabet, and it's repeated four times. Let's see what happens when we press the fourth bead on the Venerable Bede's rosary. So, by George, I think you're on the right track, Holmes. You are. Look at that section of wall behind the front. It slid back. Come on. Let's see what it takes us to. There's a narrow stone staircase leading below. Well, I'll go first. Holmes, perhaps you have saved the Maltree fortunes after all. I hope so, Lord Carter. I hope so. Watch your head, Watson. Oh, must have built these steps for pigments. Holmes, do you suppose we'll find any hidden treasure down here? I shall suppose nothing, Watson. In a few moments, there will be no need for conjecture. Holmes, I'm afraid we've drawn a blank. What's wrong, Lord Carter? Now look for yourself. Hmm. A deserted crypt? Nothing but a few cobwebby old relics. Yes. A crucifix, a Bible, a gutted candlestick on the table here. Or oh, they may have some small intrinsic value, but nothing else. Oh, I was a fool to have any hopes. I was expecting to find buried treasure. Wait a moment. Something, possibly the treasurer has recently been removed from here. Well, what makes you say that, Holmes? The room is thick with dust, and yet there's a large rectangular space free from dust on the table, as though a heavy folio volume had recently been lying there. By George, you're right, Holmes. And look here on the floor. Fresh footprints. Yes, someone has recently anticipated our discovery. Well, it's not very hard to guess who that someone was. Jonathan Devers. Aha. Observe these curious marks on the floor by the table. Four round dots rectangularly spaced... I should say that a Gladstone bag has been placed here. A bag that was undoubtedly used to remove the treasure. But why, Holmes? Why carry off a heavy book in a bag? Supposing that book were of priceless value, Watson. Suppose it were the heirloom of the Mortar family, and its discovery by the rightful owner might save the estate. Yes. And I'm sure that Bellas is quite capable of stealing it. The question is, though, what would he do with it? Precisely. And to answer that question, I shall try and imagine myself in the shoes of Mr. Devers. I am a millionaire, and therefore I don't need the treasure. Too risky to sell it anyway. All I want to do is to keep it from the more trees, so I'll destroy it. But how? I have the time or the opportunity to burn it. Difficult with a heavy book in any case. So I'm looking for some place to dispose of it where it may never be recovered. A fathomless lick on this estate. That'd be the place. The bottomless tarn. Of course. Remember the devils told us earlier that he'd been walking by it this evening? Then let's go there as fast as we can. I can only pray that we're not too late. Look, 
look, look. There, in the moonlight. It's Jonathan Devers. He's running towards the edge of the lake. Yes, and he's carrying a Gladstone bag, which means that we can run faster than he can. You have your revolver, Watson? Yes, yes, I have. Don't hesitate to use it. This devil's work must be stopped. Come on, faster, faster. Oh, we'll, we'll never catch him. He's at the edge of the tower. Drop that bag, Mr. Devers. You're too late, my friend. Drop it or I'll shoot. I'll drop it in the bottomless tower. There. <laughs> Uh, goodbye to the treasure of the Maltese. You devil. You've ruined me. I'll have the law on you for this. You're a common thief. I don't know how you'll prove it, Harold. That was my own Gladstone bag and I dropped it in the tarn. You don't even know what was inside it. But here comes the man who can tell us. Good Lord, it's Wilson, the groom fellow you discharged, Lord Carter. Well, what are you doing here, Wilson? What's that book you're carrying? I just done what Mr. Sherlock Holmes told me to, sir. I was following Mr. Devers. When he put down the bag and went off to get his coat before coming out here... I thought there might be something valuable in it. I took out this book and I filled the bag with a few rocks. Wilson, I'll No, you sting. won't, Devers. Or you'll end up in the town where you belong. Let me see the book, Wilson. Here you are, Governor. Thank you. Hold the lantern a little higher, Watson. That's it. Aha. These faded pages are written in monkish Latin of the 8th century, and the hand is of the same period. Unless all my researches on the datings of documents are valueless, these may be, they must be, the original manuscripts of the Venerable Bede himself. Good Lord, then they're absolutely priceless. And that means that the Maltrees are saved. And you, Mr. Devers, will have the privilege of inspecting the interior of an English prison. Rubbish. What charge could you make? Common theft. Burglary. The proof would depend on the word of that filthy groom there. And who's going to believe the oath of a servant with a grudge over the word of a South African millionaire? I think it's high time that this uh, filthy groom disclosed his true identity... All right, Mr. Holmes. The gentleman, I'm Inspector Athelney Jones of Scotland Yard. And a great credit to the force you've been, my dear Jones. Yes, indeed, you certainly have. Your impersonation of a country groom was masterly, quite masterly. And now, uh, let's return to the house, shall we? It's nearly three in the morning, and I think we've had enough excitement for one night. <laughs> Very satisfactory case, Watson, don't you think? As we head back for London, I must confess to a certain glow of satisfaction. The fortunes of the Maltrees are restored, the villain foiled and in custody. And, uh, And Scotland Yard will get the credit. You know that, of course, Holmes. Well, they deserve it. Athelna Jones is a very enterprising fellow. Yes, Watson, an immensely interesting case. You see, Maltree Abbey was, uh, from its name, one of the properties expropriated from the monks by Henry VIII, who created the earldom. Undoubtedly, the abbot had hidden the monastery's most valuable possession, the bead manuscript. And then I suppose the first earl discovered the hiding place and left the book there as a future security for the Maltree family. Exactly. Leaving the cryptic verse as a clue. If the Maltrees be in need, seek the venerable bead. Yes, I, I see it all now. You know, Holmes, to me, the whole case was worth it when I saw that girl's face light up as we told her the good news. I fear that I'm less impressionable, old chap. For me, my retrospective pleasure in this case lies in the fact that an irreplaceable treasure has been saved and uh, that a monk who died 12 centuries ago will have been responsible for restoring the fortunes of a fine old family. Yes, Watson, I think that in many ways you might refer to this as uh, our most successful case. Dr. Watson will be back in just a moment to tell you about next week's story. Ladies, you've heard it said that a woman's hair is her crowning glory, and how true this is. That's why you ladies should take the very best care of your hair, especially in shampooing. I'm glad you brought that point up, Mr. Bell, because many popular shampoos have a tendency to dry the hair. Well, here's one shampoo that will never dry the hair, never under any circumstances, and it's Cremel Shampoo. Yes, Cremel Shampoo is simply wonderful. It actually glamour each tiny strand of hair so that it fairly radiates natural dazzling highlights. It leaves the hair simply gleaming with natural glossy luster. And what's more, your hair stays this way for days. Cremel shampoo is not a soapless shampoo. It's not a cream shampoo. It's not a drying detergent. It's entirely different. Cremel shampoo whips up a luxurious active foam, 
even in the hardest water. You can use it as often as you wish over a long period of time, and it'll never dry your hair. In fact, Cremel Shampoo has a built-in oil base, which actually helps keep the hair from becoming dry or brittle. Remember, ladies, that Divinely Beautiful Powers models wash their hair with Cremel Shampoo. They claim no other shampoo leaves their hair more shining bright yet never dries the hair. Why not try it? K-R-E-M-L, Cremel Shampoo. Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, now, let me see. Next week, I think I shall tell you how Holmes managed to trap a fiendish murderer who had terrorized a pretty little English country village. I call it The Adventure of the Tolling Bell. Tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, A Case of Identity. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures. Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. The Sherlock Holmes series is produced by Tom McKnight, with original music composed and conducted by Alex Steinert. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Cremel Hair Tonic and Cremel Shampoo, and inviting you to be with us next week at the same time when Dr. Watson will tell us about the adventure of the tolling bell. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. What is it? Another case for Nick Carter, Master Detective. Yes, it's another case for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Tonight's curious adventure... State's Prison Evidence. Or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Midnight Robbery. Pardon me, uh... Could you let me have a line? Certainly. There you are. Swell night, isn't it? Yes, indeed. It's a pleasure to walk on a night like this. Yeah. Well, thanks. Not at all. Good night. Good night. Yes, even in a big city like this, the stars are just... Oh! Help. What? Help. I wonder what's wrong with her. Help. I beg your pardon, but is there anything I can do? Uh. Can I help you? Is, is something wrong? Murder! Murder? Who is it? My uncle. When did it happen? I don't know. Well, where is he? In the library. In this big house right here? Yes. Oh, it's awful. Now, you shouldn't be out here in your night clothes. It's too chilly. Come. Let me take you back to the house. Come on. Yes. Back to the house. Did you call the police? No. I, I just saw him lying there in a pool of blood. Then I, I came out here to get help. Well, I'm Nick Carter, the detective. I'll be glad to help you if I can. Now, careful going up the steps. <laughs> There we are. Now, if you'll show me the library. He's... He's in there. Oh, yes. I see. He's dead, all right. Who found him? The housekeeper. She came in late and saw a light still on in here. And she looked in to see if he needed anything and saw... Then she called you? Yes. And you are... I'm Ella Jabot, his niece. I... I've lived here with him for the last five years since my mother died. I see. Has anything been touched since the body was found? No. Nobody's been in here at all. Good. Uh -huh. Shot through the head. Close range. Well, it looks as if he did it himself. No. No. Well, here's the pistol that was used right beside him. Did you hear the shot? No. I sleep at the opposite end of the house. 
Oh, Mr. Carter, please find whoever killed my uncle. What makes you think he didn't kill himself? He wouldn't do a thing like that. I know it. Well, that's hardly evidence, Miss Ella. Did you see this note? Note? I, I know. Your uncle apparently left it propped up here in his desk. It's addressed to Mrs. Sarah Jarbeau, 7 Dunner Street, City. Do you know her? I never heard of her. What does it say? Let's see. My dear madam, you've been a widow, in fact, ever since the hour following our marriage. But before day breaks, you will be a widow in name also, for I shall be dead. I have at last learned the truth. The one who told me right after our wedding ceremony that you were everything evil has at last confessed that you were really as good as I believed you to be. It's too late for me to ask you to forgive me for the great wrong I've done you. So I'm taking this way of making what amends I can. The upper drawer of my desk is my will. which leaves everything to you. A repentant husband, Enos Jarbeau. Well, that's a remarkable document. Did you know anything about your uncle ever having been married? No, I, I never heard that before. Well, that note would seem to prove it was suicide. I know better. May I see that note? Of course. Here. I knew it, Mr. Carter. My uncle didn't kill himself, and he didn't write this note either. Isn't that your uncle's handwriting? It looks very much like it, but he didn't write it. Uncle didn't use this kind of pen. What do you mean? Uncle Enos was very proud of his handwriting. And he never used anything but a special type of old-fashioned steel pen point. It has a very fine point. I see. Yes. This note was undoubtedly written with a stub point. Another thing, Mr. Carter. Uncle never wrote anywhere except at his desk here. And this desk has been locked since yesterday morning, and I have the key. How long have you had it? I borrowed it yesterday morning because I had some letters to write. And I've had it ever since. Is there another key to this desk? No. Uncle would never write anywhere else. You're quite a convincing detective, Miss Ella. And if you're right, this can't be suicide in spite of the other evidence. I know I'm right. Uncle would never have taken his own life. I believe you. And I'm just curious enough about this to do a little investigating myself. If I'm as good a detective as you are, I'll find your uncle's murderer in short order. You think this Mrs. Sarah Blake is the woman you want, Nick? I'm not sure, Patsy. But when the maid told me that she never heard of Mrs. Sarah Jarbeau, but that Mrs. Sarah Blake lives here, I thought I'd better talk to her. She might be Mrs. Jarbeau using her maiden name. Here she comes now. You uh, wish to speak to me? I'm looking for Mrs. Sarah Jarbeau. Do you know her? I do. I am Sarah Jarbeau. You were right, Nick. My name is Bill Peters. I'm a reporter. I'm writing a story on the sudden death of your husband, Enos Jarbeau. Oh... The poor man. He died to make up to me for my years of heartbreak. Yes, I I saw the note he left. Would you please tell me what happened? Well, I met him one summer on the coast of Maine. We were married in the fall. We took a train for Boston. And on the way, he went into the smoking car to smoke a cigar. I never saw him again. Why, that's terrible. Why didn't he come back? I only know that when the train reached the station... A messenger gave me $500 and a note. Oh. It said that he had learned I was not a good woman and that I should never see him again. But didn't you try to clear it up? No. If he believed it, I would never seek to persuade him otherwise. I've worked as a governess ever since. I see. Well, uh, thank you very much, Mrs. Jarbo. Come along, Patsy. Goodbye, Mrs. Jarbo. I hope you'll be happy now. Thank you. And Goodbye. Hmm. She certainly got a tough break. You know, Patsy, I was prepared to doubt everything she told me. But somehow I'm inclined to believe her story, even if it does spoil my theory that she's part of an elaborate put-up job. Which way are you going from here? Oh, I think I'll... Pardon me. uh, Would you let me have a light? Yes, of course. Here you are. Thanks. Nice day, isn't it? Yes, very pleasant. Thanks. So long. So long. Oh, come along, Patsy. Uh, Wait a minute. Hmm? I've met that man somewhere before. He asked me for a light just that same way. Where was it? Well, of course. It was outside Jarbo's house last night, right after the murder. You mean you think he... Wait a minute, watch a minute. I want to see if he... Yes. He's going into the house we just left. Right. If he and Mrs. Jarbo know each other, the chances are her story is a phony. Oh, but Nick, she sees... I know it, I know it, Patsy, but this changes things. Patsy, I want you to find out what you can about old Enos Jarbo's past. Find out about that marriage, if there ever was one. But first, call Scubby and tell him to get here right away. Okay. That man leaves before Scubby gets here. I'll follow myself. Otherwise, Scubby can tail him. But I've got to know where he goes and what he does. Right now, he's our one positive clue. His 
it all right to talk in here, Nick? The lobby of the big hotel is probably the safest place in the world to talk in, Scubby. Well, what'd you find out? Well, I followed him over to a saloon over on 3rd Avenue. Yeah? There was a fellow waiting there for him. I tried to hear what they talked about, but all I could get was the name Jarbeau. Yeah, I heard that several times. I thought so. But just as I was really getting in close, a couple of plain clothes cops came along and pinched him. Pinched him? What for? Well, it seems he broke out of state's prison three days ago. I heard the cops call him Barney McCoy. Barney McCoy. Yeah. Jailbird from state's prison. Ah, pardon me, Scubby. Want to speak to the desk clerk? Oh, sure, Nick, but what do you have to... Oh, clerk, I'd like to speak yes. to the governor's suite, please. Yes, Mr. Carter. Uh, use booth number two right over there, please. Thank you. Oh, Nick, what in the world do you want to talk to the governor for? Just have to remember, Scubby. He's stopping at this very hotel for a few days. I want him to do me... Uh... Hello, Mr. Secretary. Well, this is Nick Carter. I'd like to speak to the governor a moment, if I may. Thank you. Hello, Governor. This is Nick Carter. Fine, thanks. Governor, I want to go to state's prison. Oh, no, not as a visitor. I want to go as a convict. Nick, are you nuts? No, I mean it. If you can spare me five minutes, I think I can convince you. Thanks. I'll be right up. Ella, I asked you to meet me here at my office... Because I'm going to be out of town for a few days. And I want to have everything straight before I leave. Uh, has anything further happened? Nothing, Mr. Carter. Except that Mrs. Jarbeau has installed herself in the house as its mistress. She's very unpleasant to me. And I know she'd like me to leave. Well, you stay right there. Did the will leave anything to you? No, Mr. Carter. Everything went to her. I can't understand it. I can. That will is forged. But the will is an uncle's handwriting, and both the witnesses to the will have identified their signatures as genuine. And the will was found where the note said it would be. But nevertheless, I'm convinced the will's a fake. Betsy, what did you find out? Nina Charbeau and Sarah Blake were married right enough. I found the record in a little church on the south side. Hmm. Sarah really is his wife. Forged will doesn't make sense. And neither does a suicide note, which Jarbo didn't write. Maybe he did kill himself after all, Mr. Carter. Maybe he just forgot about me. No, I don't believe it, Ella. I don't either. And Ella, I'm going to prove I'm right, even if I... even if I have to go to jail to do it. Oh, you're the new man. Yeah, Warden. What's your name? Max Herbert. Where were you born? Buffalo, New York. How old are you? Thirty-three. Nationality? American. Married? Nope. Crime? Housebreaking. Very well. The guard will take you to the photographers and then to the laboratory. Well, fella, you've been here three days. How do you like working in this shoe shop? I don't like it. I'm not cut out for it. What are you in for? Second story job. What I get you for? Crack in a safe. There was four of us. Two of them got away. Me and McCoy was nailed cold. McCoy? Hey, you wouldn't mean Barney McCoy, would you? Yeah. Yeah, you know him? Sure, know him well. Great guy. Yeah, sure is. And you know his wife? Yeah, some. He's a darn smart woman, Eddie is. Eddie? Yeah. Thought her name was Sarah. No, oh, no, his wife's Eddie. Sarah was his sister. Yeah, they look so much alike, you couldn't tell one from the other. Yeah. Well, what became of Sarah? I don't know. She married some rich guy for his money, but he left her flat. I don't know what happened after that. And he's still in town waiting for Mac to get out. Yeah, he did break out. A few days ago. He just caught him and brought him back here. Yeah. And yeah, they got him on the rock pile for trying to escape. Hey, cut out that talking, you guys. Get back to work. Okay, okay. So Barney McCoy's on the rock pile now. I rather think I'd like to be transferred to the rock pile myself. Hey, Barney. Yeah. Look, you've known me now for almost two weeks. Yeah. So what? You know, I wouldn't give you a bum steer, don't you? What are you leading up to, Max? I'm working on a way to get out of here. Before I come up here, I heard you on the level. I'd like to let you in on it. Where did you ever hear of me outside this place? Oh, the big town. A girl named Sarah told me about you. What? You married her sister, Eddie. You know Sarah? Sure. About five, six years ago. 
Haven't seen her since, though. Uh, Sarah's, uh, Sarah's in Europe now. Yeah. When are you planning on getting out of here? As soon as I get the necessary people lined up. If I had some dough, we could get out of here tomorrow. How much do you need? About 200 to start with. Okay. I'll have it for you tomorrow. Okay, Max. You get that stuff and we'll be out of here in two days. All right, you get five minutes to talk. Hey, Nick, why don't you... Hold it, hold it. I'm Max Herbert in here. Oh, I'm sorry. I should have remembered. How in the world did you ever get in this place? Well, the governor fixed it so that I was caught red-handed rubbing the home of a friend of his. Yeah. When they caught me, I had the family silver in one hand and the family jewels in the other. <laughs> it was easy. And now you arranged to be transferred to the gang where McCoy's working. Well, have you found anything? Yes, but it's all circumstantial. But Barney McCoy and I are breaking out of here day after tomorrow. And I'm hoping to get some proof then. Are you sure you're getting out of here? Yes. One of the keepers is working with us. Huh. I think this same keeper fixed McCoy's getaway last time. And I also think, from what I've heard, that he may have helped in Jarbo's murder. Yeah? I've learned positively that he was absent from the prison on leave that day. But isn't there danger if you're getting hurt if you try to break out of here? Of course there is. I have to take that chance. I've got to stick to McCoy. Don't worry, Scubby. I'll be all right. I hope... <laughs> All set, McCoy? All set. Everything's fixed. Good. You see that delivery truck over there, Max? Yeah. Well, that's going to break down when it tries to start. I get it. We'll have to help it get out of the yard here. Right. Listen. He's trying to start it now. The guard all set? Sure. Mike's with us all the way. Same as before. Hey! You over there! That's us. Come on. Yeah, give us a hand with this truck. Okay. What's the matter? Motor won't start. Have to give him a push. You two get a hold here and give him a start. Okay, Mike. Rest of you guys get back to work. All right, get your shoulder behind it, Max. Okay. Let's go. All right. Heave. All right, again. Heave. Once more. Oh, come on, get it going. We ain't got all day. Heave. As soon as the motor starts, jump on the truck. Right, I got you. Okay, again. There. Come on, Max. I'm in. Get down so they can't see you. Look, bridge over the railroad tracks is just ahead. When we get over the tracks, be ready to jump. Be right with you. All right, now. Come on. Right behind you, Barney. Jump on the tender of that engine below us. Now. Okay. You all right, McCoy? Yeah. Come on, engineer. Give her all the steam you got. Don't stop the talk. You, fireman, feed the coal to her. I don't want to use this gun unless I have to. Watch out, Max. The outside wall of the prison is just ahead. You'd better duck. There's going to be shooting. Right, McCoy. All okay so far? Oh, here it comes. Watch it. Uh, look at him pour it out. <laughs> well, we're out of jail now. And for good. It's good to see you back in your office again, Mr. Carter. Yes, it's good to be back here, Ella. Now, tell me, have you learned anything interesting since I last saw you? I think so, Mr. Carter. Now, let's have it. A few months ago, our housekeeper spent about a month visiting her son in California. Before she went, she put an ad in the paper for a temporary housekeeper. Several women answered the ad, and uh, Mrs. Martin was given the job. She had light brown hair and wore dark glasses. I disliked her on sight, and I'm sure she disliked me. When our housekeeper returned... This Mrs. Martin left, and I never saw her again until the day my uncle was buried. What do you mean, Ella? On that day, she presented herself as my uncle's widow. Your uncle's widow? Yes, Mr. Carter. When she first came to live in the house after the funeral, I thought there was something very familiar about her. But not until a few days ago did I suddenly realize that Mrs. Jarbeau was Mrs. Martin, with black hair instead of brown and without her dark glasses. Ella, could you swear to that? No, but some of her little mannerisms, certain tricks of speech, uh, a funny way of walking, all make me positive. And that explains the mystery of how the fake will was forged. While Mrs. Martin was substituting for the housekeeper, she could have found out about the will, taken it out, had a new one forged, and then returned it. The night your uncle was murdered, the forged will was substituted for the original one in the desk drawer by using a duplicate key that had been prepared in advance. And it might interest you, Nick, to know that when Ella told me this the other day, I checked at the house where we first met Mrs. Jarbeau. 
The woman there told me that Mrs. Jarbo was away on a visit during the month that Mrs. Martin took the place of Ella's housekeeper. Good work. That settles it, Betsy. Just a minute, Mr. Carter. There's another thing you better know. Something else? Yes, Mr. Carter. Last evening, a strange man came to the house. He and Mrs. Jarbo were apparently old friends because she called him Mac. Barney McCoy. She took him up to her room where I heard them talking for a long time. I tried to hear what they were saying but couldn't get close enough. But I did hear him say it was time to get that girl out of the way for good. Hmm. And then Mrs. Jarbo said that now that Mac was back, it was time to wind up the job. Well, Ella, if everything goes as I hope it will, we'll be the ones to wind up the job, not Mrs. Jarbo. Anything else you want me to do? Yes. Meet me in the rear of your home tomorrow night at 11 o'clock. We'll make our final arrangements then. In the meantime, sit tight and keep your ears and eyes open. Mr. Carter? Mr. Carter? That you, Ella? Yes. Come into the living room here. We can talk better. Okay. Sure there's no one around? Not now. That man, Mac, was here earlier, but he left quite a while ago. Mrs. Jarbeau has gone up to her room. We can talk safely here. All right. Don't turn on the light. Maybe seen. We can talk just as well in the dark. Whatever you say. Now tell me, does Mrs. Jarbeau know you've ever seen this man, Mac? Oh, no. I've kept out of the way whenever he's been around. Good. Do you know what he came here for this evening? Uh, there was talk about chloroform and poison... And then she told him the lawyer for the, for the estate was here this afternoon mm-hmm. and said that she would be in full legal possession of the estate in another few days. I see. And then he said that if that was the case, it was the time to act before it was too late. Well, now it's time for us to act, too. I think we'd better... Quiet. <gasps> Somebody's unlocking the door through which we came. Maybe they won't come in here. Who's in this room? I can't see you in the dark, but I know you're there. Who's there? Who are you? None of your business. Speak up or I'll shoot. If you do, you'll never live to see another What's day. What's going on in here? Why isn't the light on? Mrs. Jabot. Ella. What are you Barnaby doing here? Barnaby Coy, you... Max Herbert, by all this holy. What are you doing here? Why, I, uh... Well, you see, Barney, I, uh... Yeah? I, uh... He's here because he loves me. Don't you know this man is an ex-convict? You ought to be serving a sentence in state's prison right now. Yes, I know that. Well, that's why we had to meet like this, Barney. Is this true, Ella? Yes, Mrs. Jarbo, it is. Hmm. Look here, you. You interviewed me a couple of weeks ago, said you were writing a story for your paper. You said then your name was Peters. Now you say it's Herbert. Well, my real name is Herbert Peters, ma'am. You see, I... And you? I, uh... What are you doing here? I'm a night watchman on duty in this neighborhood. I... Saw this man come in here and followed him. Recognized him as a suspicious character. You're both lying. Get out of here, both of you, immediately. And as for you, Ella, get upstairs at once. I'll deal with you later. Well, that's all the thanks I get for trying to protect your place against thieves. I will get out. Come on, you. Go ahead, Barney. I'm coming. Good night, Ella, dear. And see that you never come back. Either of you. Hey, Max. Yeah? Was that story about you and the girl straight? Why, sure, Barney. Wasn't your story on the level? Well, to tell you the truth, I was going to see if I could find a few things I could swipe. <laughs> I'm flat broke. You haven't got a few bucks on you, have you? Sure, Barney. I can let you have a ten spot. What? Here. Gee, thanks, pal. I won't forget you for this. Forget it. Yeah, we sure were lucky to get out of there so easy. Yeah. I thought the old dame was going to have us pinched. You're under arrest, both of you, so don't try to get me right. There you go. Sit down. Let go of me. Stop. Stop or I'll shoot. No, you don't. You let go of my arm. You made me miss it. So what? Yep. Well, I got you anyway. You won't get away. You're going back to state's prison again, Mr. Max Herbert. Oh, you know my name, do you? I sure do. And I know yours, Ben Lyons. But... You know me. Hey, let me look at you. Gladly. Come over on the street light. All right. You know me now? Uh, well, Nick Carter. <laughs> well, I'll be... Well, gosh, I'm sorry, Mr. Carter, but a, a woman just called the station, said she'd passed two escaped convicts in front of her house, and if we hurried, we could pick them up. Even give us their names, too, well, so I... Now, 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 Ben, listen to me. I'm on the trail of something big. 
Have the lieutenant and eight men meet me at 12 o'clock tomorrow night at the back of the Jarbeau place across the street where they won't be seen. Okay. Be sure to tell them not to fail me, because I expect to capture the murderers of Enos Jarbeau. <laughs> Posted as we agreed, Scubby? Yes, Nick. Outside and inside the house. Good. They have orders to let anybody come up here, but to let nobody go downstairs again. And we're ready for the finale in this case. What's that you've got there, Nick? It's a new type of microphone, Patsy. Oh. I've attached it to the wall between this room and Mrs. Jarbo's room. Mm -hmm. Through the vibration of the wall, it'll pick up whatever is said in her room. Then whatever is picked up is amplified so that it's loud enough for us to hear it. The amplifier also has a recording device which makes a permanent record of the conversation on a wire tape. Gosh, what will they think of next? Quiet now. Let's listen. I'll turn it on. But I tell you, Barney, we can't lose. In a few more days, the whole Jarbeau estate will be mine, legally. I know, Addy, but can you handle that girl for a few days more? Well, That's if I point. can't, we'll give her what we gave the old man. Do we have to? If she's dead, we know she ain't going to bother us. Yeah. So we bet... Hey, what the devil's that? Quiet. How do I know? The housekeeper's answering it. Hey. Somebody's coming up here. Did you tell anybody you were coming up here? Anybody here? Mike! Mike. What are you doing here? Well, that's a fine question to ask me. I'm here because you sent for me. Who sent for you? You did, McCoy. You're crazy. I did nothing of the kind. I got your note this morning. It is. What? Come to Sharpo House tonight, but not before 12. Everything okay? Very important. And it's signed, Barney. Listen, I never wrote that note. Well, if you didn't, it means trouble for us. Somebody else knows about this business besides us three. You, you mean we're caught? We ain't caught yet. But we will be if we don't watch our step. Even now... I was better. afraid of this. I knew I should have kept me out of it. Ah, shut up, you rat. You're not in jail yet. But I'm going to be. I can feel it coming. Well, don't shut up, Mike. I'll bring you. You did it, McCoy. You fired the shot that killed the old man. I just... Shut up, you just get it right off. Come on, kids. That's enough of that. Let's go. Right with you, Nick. Tom, you gotta get out. I'll take it easy, Sarah. Wait a minute, will you? I can't wait any longer. Get your hands up, both of you. And no funny business. Max, what are you... No, McCoy, not Max. Nick Carter. Nick Carter? You ain't got nothing on us. Oh, I Nick's got enough on you three to send you to the chair. Yes, McCoy, we know the whole plot from beginning to end. Tell him what we found out, Nick. What do you mean? It means I know that Sarah married Jarbo, and that shortly afterwards she died. You, Eddie, her sister, married McCoy. When Sarah died, you found her marriage certificate and decided to use your resemblance to her to get the old man's money. McCoy was in prison then. But you arranged with the guard, Mike, here to help McCoy escape when the time was right. Then to pay Mike for his trouble, you cut him in on the deal. Then you, Eddie, got that temporary job here as a housekeeper, which was an unexpected break. While you were here, you had the fake will made. Then when all was ready, McCoy escaped as planned. Mike came with him. And between the three of you, you chloroformed old Jarbeau and then shot him in such a way that it looked like suicide. How do you know it wasn't suicide? The suicide note you left for the old man. Whoever Addy got to forge that will for her did such an expert job that the witnesses recognized their own forged signatures as genuine. But whoever wrote that suicide note was so clumsy that he wrote it with a blunt-pointed fountain pen instead of the sharp-pointed steel pen that was the only pen Jarbo ever used. That ain't proof. That's guessing. We've got plenty of proof, McCoy. And if that isn't enough, to top it all off, the conversation in this room between you three crooks has been recorded in full for the past 20 minutes. And if that isn't practically a confession and good legal evidence in any court, my name isn't Nick and Carter. This was another strange experience of Nick Carter, Master Detective, called State's Prison Evidence, or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Midnight Murder. Another of the curious adventures of Nick Carter, which are brought to you regularly at the same time each week by W.O.R. Mutual. And now, Nick, what about our story for next week? Well, next week's story started off as a simple question of who stole the firm's funds. But it ended up by being the very perplexing question of who killed two men and caused the death of a third. And not the least puzzling part of the case was to find out who fired the fatal bullet which started off the murders. Well, isn't that usually the most puzzling part of a murder story? Well, yes, it is. But in this case, the man who was killed was standing by my side in the corridor of a large office building. And there was no one around at the time who could have fired the gun that killed him. I'm afraid I'm getting more mixed up all the time. <laughs> That's exactly how we felt about it. But Nick cleared it all up in spite of everything. And we'll tell you all about it next week. So long. So long, folks. 
And so long to you, Nick and Patsy. See you next week. In The Strange Adventure You've Just Heard, Nick Carter was impersonated by Lon Clark, Patsy by Helen Choate, and Scubby by John Kane. Original music was played by Lou White. The entire production was written and directed by Jock McGregor. Next week at the same time, another curious experience of Nick Carter entitled... An Angle on Murder. Or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Mutilated Bullet. This story is a copyrighted feature of Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. The Return of Nick Carter is produced in the studios of WOR and is broadcast over most of these stations every Monday evening at 9.30 Eastern Wartime. This is Mutual. Listen while the makers of Rexall drug products and 10,000 independent Rexall family druggists bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, private detective. Good evening. This is your Rexall family druggist, speaking to you for the 10,000 independent druggists who have made the word Rexall part of our own store names, and who recommend and sell the 2,000 or more drug products made by the Rexall Drug Company. Like MI-31, for example, Rexall's popular mouthwash, gargle, and breath deodorant. Full-strength MI-31 kills contacted germs in seconds. Its zippy, tangy quality leaves a happy aftertaste. For a reliable yet refreshing mouthwash, use Rexall MI-31. And remember, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. Now your Rexall family druggist brings you a transcribed half hour with Richard Diamond, private detective, starring Dick Powell. Dick's special guest star tonight is... is, uh... Uh, What was your name again? I'm sorry, but I really can't tell you. You can't tell me. Well, Rexall brings you Richard Diamond, starring Dick Powell. Well, morning, Mr. Diamond. Morning, Charlie. Now, uh, fix me something, will you? Like that, huh? You look pretty good. Oh, you should have seen me when I got up. Both my heads were hissing each other. I'll fix you my special. You snap right out of it. Well, take it easy. I tried snapping out of it this morning and scattered myself all over the room. You relax for a minute. Just getting to work? Yeah. Helen gave a party last night. I think it turned out to be the finals of the roller derby. Have a swallow a roller skate, Charlie. Once on a dare, a mouse... Oh. Sorry. Charlie! Gotta mix it. Oh, that's a horrible machine to have in a bar. Some poor guy's liable to end up with a shell shock. Here, hold your breath so you don't change your mind. What's in it? In your condition, that is a very touchy question. You just drink it, you'll feel better. Okay. Uh, 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 uh. No fudging all the way. Charlie! Uh, all the way? What are you, chicken? Oh, oh! I knew it, I knew it. You snitched this stuff from a fire extinguisher. Tastes terrible, don't it? What are you going to thaw me out with, a chisel? Now I know it ain't that bad. No? A mortician would pay good money for the formula. Well, look what came in the front door. Hmm? Oh, yes, sir. Pardon me, but I'm looking for someone. 
There's nobody here but me and Mr. Diamond. Here's a picture of him. Has he been in here? Oh, lady, a lot of people come in here. No, I mean this morning. Mr. Diamond's my first customer. Oh. Uh, something wrong, miss? I've just got to find him. I don't know where to look. Oh, uh, what made you think he'd be in here? I'm trying every place that's open. I lost him in this block someplace. Lost him? Well, he... Well, he just disappeared. Uh, who is he? My husband. Oh. I stopped to look at some hats in a window. I started talking about how pretty they were, and the next thing I turned around and he was gone. You called home? We're living at a hotel. He hasn't shown up there. I, I've called everyone I know in New York. You're from out of town? Yes. Oh, I'm so worried. Well, honey, from this picture, your husband looks old enough to find his way around. Why don't you go on back to the hotel and... You the... don't understand. My husband had quite a shock earlier this morning, and he was acting strangely. So you figure he might have gone looking for a drink? I don't know what I thought. It isn't like him to wander off like that. I'm so worried. Well, if you're that upset, why don't you go to the law? Missing persons. Oh, I thought about that, but I can't. You can't go to the police? I can't explain why. It, it just wouldn't be good. Would you mind a completely new remark? What? Haven't I seen you before, Miss... Uh... No... Mm, nice name. Mr. Diamond sees a lot of people. Used to be a cop himself. Oh. Private detective now. Private detective? Seems to me I've seen your husband someplace before, too. Is this an old picture? Yes, I carry it around in my wallet. Are you really a private detective, Mr. Uh... Diamond, Miss... Like Sam Spade? Well, no, no. Sam drinks and runs around with women. I lead a rather sheltered life. <coughs> Steady, Charlie. Mr. Diamond, I'm really frightened. I'm sure something awful's happened to my husband. Will you help me? I might, if you tell me two things. What are they? Why you can't go to the police, and if you can afford a hundred a day in expenses. Oh, I can afford the money. You should have answered the first question first. Now I'm almost tempted to forget the last one. But I can't go to the police. Uh, dear. Dear, when people can't go to the police, it worries me. Your old man got a record or something? A record? Well, I've seen both of you someplace. You sure you aren't working some kind of a racket? Oh, 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 oh now, now, lady, take it easy. I lose my husband. I come in here for help, and you think I'm some sort of a criminal or something. Look, dear, I... I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. I don't want to go to the police, and it has nothing to do with breaking the law. Shame on you, Diamond. Here, lady, here's a handkerchief. Thank you. Look, uh, I'm sorry. No, you're not. You're terrible. Oh, please, please. Look, I I'm in pretty bad shape myself. <laughs> okay, okay, I'll help you. Wonderful, Mr. Diamond. Where can we talk? Hey, she turns them off like a hydrant. You'll help me? Oh, yes. Uh, a hundred a day in expenses. Certainly. Get her. Yeah. You sure you didn't dip into one of Charlie's specials? I don't drink. This isn't drinking. It's like diving into an active volcano. Where can we talk? Uh, one of the booths. Good. I don't want anyone else to know about this. You mean after this build-up, I ain't gonna, even going to hear what it's all about? Come on, dear. Oh. Uh, relax, Charlie. Have one of your specials. Who knows? You may be the first one to reach the moon. Is this booth all right, Mr. Diamond? Uh, just fine. Now sit down, dear, and tell me all about it. Well, there's really not much to tell. I took my husband to the... Well, to an appointment this morning. What kind of an appointment? I can't tell you. And you can't tell me your husband's name? No. Not even his first name? Well, I... I guess I could tell you his first name. It's Richard. Richard? Yes. You can't tell me any more? No. You want me to find him and you want me to trust you? If you will. Will you trust me? Yes. Then I'll try and find Richard, but I'll need some help. I'll try. No, 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 please. I'll need some outside help. Who? A policeman. Oh, no, I told you. And I told you. You want me to trust you? Okay, that's what I'm going to do, but you've got to trust me, too. But the police... If you and your husband aren't in trouble with the police, you've got nothing to worry about. But the police... Not the police, a policeman. One man. But he'll find out why Richard disappeared. Well, don't you want to know why? I know why, but I don't want anyone else to know why. You don't want anyone else... You know why, but you... Oh, don't let me do this to myself. I just want to find him. Okay, okay. I promise the policeman won't say anything. I'm trusting that you have a good reason for not telling me any more than you have, but to find a man, this man in the picture, and an old photograph at that, 
To find this man needs a lot of doing. Checking hospitals. Hospitals? Now, don't start crying. Oh, I'm sorry. Go on. When you've got to check hospitals, Marge... Or... Look, 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 dear. You wait here. Oh. No, I'm going with you. Good girl. Charlie, thank you for being so patient. A pleasure, miss. Shall we go, Mr. Diamond? Yeah, yeah. And Charlie... Yeah? I'd like to thank you, too. Anytime. Your hospitality and good manners are only equaled by your loyalty and perspicacity. Huh? All in all, you've been a living doll. Being a person who lives out in left field most of the time myself, I realized that these little disturbances in my life were pretty average. So with cute little anonymous tagging along behind, I left Charlie's fancy bistro and headed for the 5th Precinct Police Station and the good Lieutenant Levinson. When we walked into the squad room, we bumped right into the one thing that science had been working 24 hours a day to find a cure for. Well, good afternoon, Sergeant Otis. Oh, how are you, Diamond? Hey. Oh, unpucker, Otis. Mrs. X will think the lieutenant uses you to unstop sinks. Mrs. X? What kind of a name is that? You want to meet the lady? That's the name. Mrs. X? How do you do, Sergeant? Oh, <laughs> hey, uh, ain't I seen you someplace before? Otis, haven't I seen you someplace before? Now, what are you talking about, Shama? Sure you've seen me before. Uh, Mr. Diamond. Yeah, but this is nothing. Stick around him for a whole day sometime. Come on, let's see the lieutenant. Uh, I'll see you later, Mrs. Oh, uh, uh, yes, Sergeant. It's been a pleasure. Otis. Yeah? Your eyes are hanging out so far they cover your badge. Oh. Hello, Walt. Hi, Rick. I... Ha, 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 this is Mrs. X, Walt. Dear, this is the mighty arm of the law, Lieutenant Levinson. How do you do, Lieutenant? How do you do, Mrs. Uh, Mrs. X? Oh, let's not go into this thing again. The young lady prefers to be known as Mrs. X. Now, Walt, I want you to do me a favor. Yeah, uh, young lady, haven't I seen you someplace, someplace before? before? Yeah, Walt, even Otis is with us on that one. I said the same thing when she found me in Charlie's bar. Now, the young lady's lost her husband, and I'm going to help her find him. Here's his picture. See if you got anything. Oh, yeah. Uh, are you sure I haven't seen you? Walt, we'll solve that one later. The picture. Go make like a policeman. Okay. She got a record. Lieutenant. Oh, uh, well, I, uh, I never forget her face. He's been trying to ever since he got Otis. Now, come on, Walt. Get a report from missing persons. Check the hospitals and the morgue. The morgue. Oh, uh, uh, wait, wait, wait. It's a habit. Uh, honey, we got to do these things just in case. <laughs> but you think he's... Uh... Give me that picture. Lady, lady, please. Now, now, now. What's your husband's name? Uh, she can't tell you that, Walt. What do you mean she can't tell me that? I can't. Now, you look, Diamond, if this is one His of your... His first name is Richard. Richard what? That's something I really can't tell you. I wouldn't have told Mr. Diamond the Richard part, but it... Just sort of slipped out. No way. What are you two trying to do to me? You come in here and ask me to locate this guy in the picture and you won't even tell me his last name? Look, Walt, I promised you'd do me the favor without the questions. The young lady seems to have a very good reason for not wanting to give her name or her husband's. Now, all I want you to do is check the morgues. Uh... What's the matter with her? She wants her husband. Yes, I want my husband. Before we continue with the adventures of Richard Diamond, private detective, here's your Rexall family druggist. It's always a pleasure when a customer herself tells you why she likes your product. And last week one said to me... You know why I really prefer Rexall Milk of Magnesia? It's because one bottle won't be so thick I can't even pour it, and then the next one thin and watery. Somehow Rexall Milk of Magnesia always seems to be just right. Well, ma'am, that's because every bottle of Rexall Milk of Magnesia has to meet an exacting standard of viscosity. Or it can't wear the Rexall label. What do you mean by viscosity? It's the degree of thickness or pourability in a liquid. Rexall conducts scientifically precise tests on every batch of Rexall Milk of Magnesia to be sure it meets this constant standard of viscosity. And that's not done just to please you with its consistency. What's much more important 
it means you'll always get uniform dosage from every bottle of Rexall milk of magnesia. And I thought it was all an accident. Oh, no, ma'am. There are no accidents behind the fact you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. And now back to tonight's adventure with Richard Diamond, private detective, starring Dick Powell. Well, I checked, and no no one that looks like this guy is in any of the more, uh, usual places. Well, that's fine. Now let's start looking for him where I lost him, Mr. Diamond. Oh, swell. Well, Walt, we really just stopped by to say hello. Killing time, you know. Sure. I appreciate everything you've done, Captain. Lieutenant. Of course. Thank you very much. But now Mr. Diamond and I have to go and find my husband. Richard. Yes. I think you'd better wait a few minutes. What for? Yes, we've got to hurry. I've got to find my husband before the 8 o'clock plane leaves this evening. You're leaving tonight? You didn't tell me that. Well, Richard has to be in California by tomorrow morning. Got a little job to do? A very big job, Captain. Lieutenant. Well, what do you want us to wait for? Because I've got Otis checking on this girl, this Mrs. X. Oh, no. Walt, you promised... I promised nothing. You assumed. Oh, you're a fine buddy. Buddy schmuddy. You might be taken in by her sweet innocence, but not me. You double-crossed Mr. It. Diamond, you promised. But I didn't, lady. I just checked the morgues. Uh... Oh, now you shut up. Walt. Well, I never... I've seen this girl someplace, Rick, and I've got a sneaking suspicion she's wanted. Wanted? You can't cross me like this, Fatty. Wanted? Won't tell me her name, huh? No. Won't tell me her husband's name, huh? No. Then you're hiding something. Yes. Yes? Why, yes, meaning of course. Now you stop that, Rick. Rick, is your name Richard, too, Mr. Diamond? No, my friends call me Rick. You ever in Chicago, lady? Of course. Of course? O-F-C-O-U-R-S-E. You stay out of this. You run around with Tony Capone when you were in Chicago? You talking to me? I'm talking to her. Well, I'm glad. Tony never gave me back my elk's tooth. Well, I don't know why you're talking to me, Captain. I never gave Mr. Capone an elk's no. tooth. Oh. It's Lieutenant, dear. You gotta stop promoting him. You'll get a swell head. Oh, you rat! You call me Lieutenant? No! Uh, well, gee, don't scare me like that. I got something on this picture you gave me. Her husband? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Hello, Mrs. X. Hello, Corporal. <laughs> Otis. Uh, oh, oh, yeah. Uh, you won't like it, Lieutenant. I won't like what? What I got on this picture. Something's happened to Richard. Now, take it easy. Well, what did you find out? I'll tell you whether I like it or not. Well, I sent it down to the boys in the morning. No, no. Uh... Oh, no. Look what you've done, you mallet head. Well, gee, what did I say? You said more. Uh... Oh, no, no, no. Now, honey, honey, listen. This morgue is where they keep photographs. Oh. Well, what did they come up with, Sergeant? She sure looks pretty when she cries like that. Oh, there's... Uh, oh, oh, uh, well, I shall quote from the report. <clears throat> uh, person in said photograph resembles one Richard Diamond private detective. What did you say? Come to think of it, you do, Mr. Diamond. I shall continue. Member of the New York police force for seven years. Height six feet one. One hundred and ninety. Eighty. Uh, the general confirmation of the head. Note. Right ear... Order, shut up. Oh, it gets real interesting. You didn't tell me about getting mixed up with that fan dancer back in 39, Diamond. I was simply interested in starting an ostrich farm. Otis. Uh, yeah? Do you think that picture looks like Mr. Diamond? Oh, kind of. Thank you, Patrolman Lovelo. Uh, Patrolman? Yes, and if I ever catch you wearing a sergeant's stripes again, I'll put you on a beat so far out that I'll have to fly food into you. Now get out of here. Sergeant Levinson. Lady, please, it's Lieutenant. Well, I don't care what it is. I think you were just horrible to that nice little policeman. Is that right? It certainly is. And I'm going to write a letter to the governor about you. Now, wait a and minute. And what's more, I'm going to tell him what a horrible, mean, impolite person you are. But... But... I come in here with Mr. Diamond, and simply because I won't tell you my name, you accuse me of being a mop. Mop? Yes, mop. One of those gangsters' girls. Mop. Yes. 
And just because everyone thinks they've seen me before, I'm accused of all sorts of things. But, lady, I... No telling what's happened to my poor, wonderful husband. Oh, 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 oh lady, please, lady. I... <laughs> you big bully. Yes. Well, uh, okay, I'm sorry. I, I apologize. Can Sergeant Loveloon have his stripes back? Yes. No, thank you very much. Come on, Mr. Diamond. We've got to find Richard. Goodbye, Major. <laughs> Well, I was in it up to my neck. Any other time, a client like Mrs. X would have scared me right into four months of hibernation. But she was such a cute little screwball that I just had to go along with it. We took the picture that looked something like yours truly and started making the rounds. Starting with the last place, Mrs. X had seen her husband. We showed the picture to every shop owner within a four-block circle, but no one had seen him. Mrs. X kept uh, checking with the hotel, making me stay at a good distance so I couldn't hear the conversation. But no one had seen her husband. We ended up right back where I first ran into her. Charlie's. Wow. Well, find him? No. Uh, look, dear, why don't you check again with this place that you and your husband went to this morning for his business appointment? Maybe you went back there. Well, I guess I could try it again. Phone in the back on the wall. Thanks. I'll call him. No luck, uh, Diamond? No. How do I get into these things, Charlie? When someone wants to give you a hundred a day in expenses, you get into them. Phone. Brilliant deduction. Hello? A little lady will get it. Mm. Mr. Diamond? Yeah? It's for you. Captain Levinson. You've been promoted? Several times in the last hour. You think he's heard something about Richard? Might be. Yeah. What is it, Fatty? I thought you might be there. What made you think of Charlie's? Well, it's pretty obvious you had a hangover. Well, maybe I stuck a bicycle pump in my nose and pumped up my head just to get a laugh out of Otis. You'll have to do better than that. You told me you met the girl at Charlie's. Shrewd, shrewd. Is it something important? Honey, just relax. I'm getting to it. But if it's about Richard... The girl there? Yeah. What's on your mind? Well, I don't know if it means anything, but we just got a report from the Johnson Sanatorium. Johnson Sanatorium? Never heard of it. Over on 84th Street. The missing husband? I don't know. The report fitted his description, but who knows from that old photograph. Well, it's worth checking. What's the address? 644 East 84th Street. Seems they found this guy wandering around the streets. Johnson Sanatorium, 644 East 84th Street, huh? Did he give his name? Uh, amnesia, loss of memory. Seemed to be suffering from shock. Thought I'd let you get there first. I'm kind of sorry for the girl when I realized the story might be kosher. Okay, Walt, I'll check it, thanks. Meet you there. Well, honey, that might be... Hey. Hey. Charlie. Yeah? Mrs. X, where'd she go? Took out of here like she was shot out of a gun. Something wrong? When are you going to stop asking stupid questions? Well, that tore it. Mrs. X was probably on her way over to the Johnson Sanatorium and with a good head start. So I went out and grabbed a cab for 84th Street and kicked myself a dozen times for getting mixed up in a situation like that. Why not forget the whole thing and get some rest until my head returned to a normal circumference? Answer. Because I'd wasted a whole afternoon looking for the missing husband and hadn't even got a retainer. Yes, sir. Is something I can do for you, Prince? I'm looking for the man you reported. Hello, the... Rick. Oh, Walt. Have you seen Mrs. X? I just this minute got her. She's been and gone. What about the guy you got the report on? Took him with her. Uh, the young lady came in, took a look at the man, claimed it was her husband, paid his bill and left. And you let him go like that? I thought the man had amnesia. Well, yes, he was suffering from some kind of shock and had temporarily lost his memory. But you just let him walk out of here Correct, with... Rick, Rick, let him finish your story. Hmm. Uh, the, the minute the man saw the young lady, he snapped right out of it. She said they had to hurry to catch a plane or something, had a lot of packing to do. Did she uh, give her name? Yes, sir, she signed the release. Uh, here, let me see it. Now, uh, take it easy, Rick. It's signed Mrs. Richard Diamond. She used my name? Is that your name? You're darn right it is. She leave any address? Phony, I checked. Oh, swell. I'll come to the airports if it'll make you happy. Oh, it'll make me very happy. She did nothing for my hangover. She didn't pay me one red cent for my trouble. And I think I may be getting hives. Oh, I'm going over to Helen's and have a complete nervous breakdown. How do you feel now? Oh, I'm all right, Helen, dear, but my ulcer's just had a parade. Any word from Walt? No. Miss Helen? Yes, what is it, Francis? A young lady at the door for Mr. Diamond. I'll get it. I'll bet you will. 
Wow. Hello, Mr. Diamond. Now, look, I've got something to say I can't to stop to talk. My husband's waiting in the car, and we have to catch a plane. Now, you look, I... I want to thank you very much for all you've done, and I want to apologize for running out on you. But your husband... He's fine, thank you. He just lost his memory for a while. Now, I'm not gonna... I haven't got time to tell you anymore. We've got to catch a plane. But you... Oh, I said that. Here's an envelope. But I... It explains everything, and there's something in it for you. But you can't... And here's something else, because you've been so wonderful. But... Mm. I hope if you ever get to California, you'll look us up. Goodbye, and thank you again for everything. You're wonderful. Bye. Well, hmm? All right, Blue Eyes, what was that all about? Hmm? Oh, no, that was her. Oh, uh, she. Uh, the girl. The girl? Uh, uh, Mrs. X. What's that? Hmm? Oh, it's an envelope. Said it would explain everything. I hope it does. Especially that fond farewell. Oh, that. She was just being grateful. Yeah. Go on, open the envelope. Uh, pardon, Miss Helen. Now it's the phone. Lieutenant Levinson for Mr. Diamond. I better tell him about the girl. You'd better read what's in that envelope. Hello, Walt. Uh, Rack, that dame phoned on us. Asked where she could find you. Oh, that's how she's found the place. Yeah, the melon had told her you might be over at Helen's. Gave her... Th she's been there? Uh, just left. And she left an envelope that she said would explain everything. Well, what did it say? I haven't read it. Well, read it. I want to know what this is all about. So does Helen. Well? Well? Five hundred bucks. The explanation? What about the letter? Well, it says, uh, uh, Dear Mr. Diamond, I know that I've caused you a great deal of trouble. So I wish to take this opportunity to thank... to thank you for your patience and understanding. As for an explanation, well, here it is. But I count on your discretion and hope that you will keep my secret. This morning, my husband and I went to a doctor because I hadn't been feeling well. We discovered and were overjoyed to find out that I was going to have a baby. Immediately, I informed my husband that I had decided to give up working until after I had the baby. The realization that I wasn't going to make any more money for the rest of the year was too much for him. The shock made him lose his mind, and he, well, he just wandered off. Although he has recovered his memory, the thought of having to support us both for the rest of the year has left him nervous and despondent. So I'm taking him back to the coast of the family psychiatrist. I wish to thank you from the bottom of my heart for all your kindness and help. Signed, O. Signed, O. Rick! Helen, Helen, what's wrong? He's fainted. What? He looked at the signature on the letter and just flopped over. Well, what about the signature? It's signed... June Allison. Again, here's your Rexall family druggist. Whenever you have a headache, remember this about Rexall aspirin. When taken with water, the five full grains of pure aspirin in every Rexall tablet are ready to go to work for you even before they reach your stomach. Yes, whenever you have a headache, remember that about Rexall aspirin. Ask for it at Rexall drugstores everywhere. And remember always, you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, stars Dick Powell in the title role and is written by Blake Edwards with music composed and conducted by Frank Worth. June Allison appeared through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and will soon be seen co-starring with Dick Powell in the MGM motion picture Right Cross. Featured in tonight's cast were Virginia Gregg, Ted DeCorsia, Wilms Herbert, and Bob Sweeney. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, was transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. This is Bill Foreman inviting you to be with us next Wednesday at this time when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Hiya, 
you're beautiful. Get lost, Bristlepuss. You need a shave. But I have shaved. What else do you want me to do? Silly boy, she wants you to go stag. Go stag? But why? Because stag is Rexall's exclusive line of men's good grooming aids. Like stag brushless shave cream. No fuss, no massage, just smooth it on and presto, you get a clean, close shave. Your face stays smooth and whiskerless all day long. I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll go stag. That's it. Join the stag line now at Rexall drugstores everywhere. Yes. To make girls care, go stag. Bill Bendix leads the life of Riley again Friday on NBC. Time now for Rocky Jordan. Not far from the Musk Sultan Hassan in Cairo stands the Café Tambourine, run by Rocky Jordan. The Café Tambourine, crowded with forgotten men, alive with the babble of many languages. For this is Cairo, where modern adventure and intrigue unfold against a backdrop of antiquity. Tonight's story, the St. Louis Blues. I was trying to wake up over a second cup of coffee in my cafe tambourine, glancing through the morning paper. A picture on the front page didn't mean much at first, but a second look and I recognized the face. It was Ted Polanski, an old friend. I hadn't seen him since the early days in St. Louis. The printing underneath brought me wide awake. U.S. naval hero found lying near the Mahudea Canal with knife in back, victim of an attempted murder. Victim seemed unable to identify assailant. No relatives or friends to be found. Polanski was taken to the Cairo General Hospital. Well, maybe I was just curious, or maybe I wanted to recall old times. Anyhow, I went to the hospital right away to see Polanski. The nurse showed me into a hot little room that had an overhead fan. I found Polanski's bed behind a screen. Hello, Ted. Rocky Jordan, remember me? I remember you. It's been a long time, Ted. All right, it's been a long time. What about it? Well, I'm just sorry you didn't look me up when you came to Cairo. I'd have warned you they play rough with knives around here. I don't need your help. You or the cops or anybody else. What do you want with me? Well, not a thing, Ted. Then leave me alone. Listen, Ted, I know my way around Cairo a little. I don't know what this is all about, but somebody tried to kill you. Maybe if you told me... Why don't me... you mind your own business? I've got nothing to tell you. Okay, if you don't want to. Am I asking you why you left St. Louis? We'll skip that. Then shut up about me. Just leave me alone. Get out of here. That suits me fine, Polanski. Don't bother to come back. I took a good long walk to cool off. Ted Polanski had changed a lot, and that was his affair. That's what I told myself. So I tried shaking him out of my mind. Too many times you try remembering things, and then you get hurt. I was behind the bar at the tambourine early that afternoon when I had a visitor. And for the second time that day, my mind went into reverse. She was American, smartly dressed, but not too much, with just a touch of platine and a soft, clean face like something I'd known before. Mr. Jordan, I'm Mrs. Saunders, Cora Saunders. What can I do for you, Mrs. Saunders? I believe you were at the hospital this morning to see Ted Polanski. That's right. I'd like to ask a favor of you, Mr. Jordan. Now look, before you go any further, I'll tell you I don't know who tried to kill him or why. I just happened to drop in and see him, that's all. You're a friend of his? Uh, I was once, back in St. Louis. I'm from St. Louis, too. Well, lots of people are. I'm, I, I'm sorry I'm bothering you, but... I've got to know about Ted. Why? 
I was once his wife. Sit down, Mrs. Saunders. Thank you. Why not go and talk to him? I wanted to. I've been trying all day to see him, but he won't talk to me. What makes you think he'd talk to me? I was hoping he would, Mr. Jordan. Ted and I were very happily married before the war, but the war seemed to change him. Yeah, wars have a way of doing that. I don't know what it was. Maybe it was that episode in the Mediterranean, but Ted never came home to me and our child, Linda. That was five years ago. I've never seen him since. Maybe you ought to keep it that way. I was able to trace him for a while, the Riviera, Casablanca, Alexandria, but it was as though Ted had turned his back on everyone who had ever meant anything to him before. I... I couldn't wait forever. I... I divorced him and married Evan. All right, you got a husband. Why don't you forget about Polanski? You know things aren't that easy. Yeah. Did you uh, come to Cairo to see Ted? Oh, no, Mr. Jordan. My husband is here on business. He's in textile. He's here to organize a company, a new cotton process, I believe. I had no idea Ted was here until I saw the paper. Mr. Jordan, would would you please get Ted to let me talk to him? Oh, sorry, lady. I don't have any drag in that direction. Oh, but Mr. Polanski Jordan... doesn't want to see me, and I don't want to see him. Let's keep it that way. Please, think it over, Mr. Jordan. I'll be back later this evening. I'm certain that what I'm trying to do is best... Well, I watched Cora leave and tried to wash the thing out of my mind. But somehow I kept thinking of Polanski and kept wondering what would make a guy foul up his life. Trading a sweet little number like Cora and a kid for a knife in the back. Well, my day had been ruined already, so I knocked off and went over to the U.S. Embassy to ask the naval attaché a few questions. Well, there's plenty here on the files about Polanski. Not that I have to look it up. You mean he's been in Cairo before? Yeah, off and on. You say you knew him back in the States? Yeah, quite a while ago. What do you got on him? Yeah, here we are. Sit down, Jordan. Thanks. Now, let's see. Uh, Theodore Robert Polanski, Lieutenant Junior Grade. Decorated March 7th, 1945. Heroism over and above the call of duty. Delayed parachute jump from burning reconnaissance plane to save valuable photographs, which enabled allies to advance on a broad front at minimum loss of life. Anything wrong with that? Uh, for a guy like Polanski, yes. Got too loaded down with metals. He cracked up under the strain. I, I still don't get it. Well, look at it this way, Jordan. Polanski's just a nice guy from the Middle West with a wife and kid. He goes off to war and suddenly he's a hero. Headlines everywhere, big shots hanging ribbons on him, dames with soft shoulders falling all over him. And went Hollywood, you might say. Well, that's the way we figured it. He began to like it too much. So now he's a celebrity. Couldn't he be forced to go back home? We tried. But when a guy gets that big, he can pull strings. Oh, his wife almost drove us nuts for a while. But she's lucky to be rid of him. He's gone from bad to worse, knocking around in scrapes with the police, women, and now they find him on the streets with a knife in his back. Yeah, that brings me up to date. You got any idea why someone would try to kill him? I don't follow him that closely. Well, thanks. I'll be seeing you. Well, I left the U.S. Navy going through a racing form of some sort and went out into the street. One of the big questions the naval attaché couldn't answer, why the knife in Polanski's back? I was working on that, walking up the Sharia Nauru, scouting for a taxi, when a shiny red car with plenty of chrome pulled up to the curb. The back door opened just a little. Step over, Jordan. I knew the native in front with a gun was covering for the voice that came at me from the back seat. The voice must have had a face, but I couldn't see it. All I saw was a shoe wearing spats and a hand filing fingernails. Been keeping busy, Jordan. With my business? Maybe I don't like your business. Forget it, then. Wait, Jordan. We going somewhere? That all depends. Well, let me know when you decide. That's up to you, Jordan. You've been having a lot of conversations today. I know a lot of people. Like Ted Polanski? Maybe. You had quite a talk with him at the hospital. All sorts of questions. He's an old friend. Polanski's got no friends. I'm way ahead of you. What did he tell you? Nothing. Let's keep it that way. He don't want you talking to him. Neither do I. About what? Keep away from him, Jordan. Stop asking people questions that don't concern you. If I don't? You know what'll happen. Come here, Jordan. Little closer. Yeah. Here's a sample. He gave the door a quick shove right into my face. 
I went back and down like a kingpin in a bowling alley. My breath was gone, and for a second I couldn't move. When I got my eyes open again, there were a million sleek red cars pulling away from the curb. Cars that finally narrowed to one and roared down the street and out of sight. And I knew right then and there, Ted Polanski was a hot article. You are listening to the St. Louis Blues, tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan. The day of miracles is not done, and one way to work miracles today without leaving your home is to contribute to your Red Cross. Your contribution will go out doing the yeoman service to your fellow humans that you would like to do yourself but cannot. Your contribution will perform miracles of aid for the homeless, the wounded, the hungry. Send your contribution out today to work miracles. And now we take you back to Cairo and tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan, the St. Louis Blues. When I learned an old St. Louis friend named Ted Polanski turned up in the hospital after a knifing, he didn't want to see me or anybody else, including his former wife. That was the end of the line for me. Till a man with a homemade manicure and spats moved in and warned me to lay off Polanski. Advice like that just doesn't sit well with me. I was back at the tambourine patching up my face when Chris told me I had company. When I came down, I spotted him at one of the tables. Slightly bald, friendly face. Before he introduced himself, I knew who he was. Cora's husband, Evan Saunders, St. Louis. Mr. Jordan... Being frank about my personal affairs isn't easy for me. Well, then maybe we can just have a drink. Why, yes, of course. Thank you. Uh, straight, if you don't mind. Couple straight, Chris. Mr. Jordan, you'll pardon me if I come right to the point. First, I'd better tell you that your wife was here ahead of you. Yes, I know. That's why I'm here. Cora keeps nothing from me. she tell you why? About Ted Polanski. Mr. Jordan, I... I don't want Cora to see that man. She seems to have ideas of her own. Oh, thanks, Chris. Set him down. Then you must understand. Cora's gone through too much already. Waiting all those months. Look, if you're worried about Polanski, you can forget it. No, it's Cora, Mr. Jordan. I've always known that she was never quite able to close the chapter. Never quite sure. She thinks a lot of you. But it's not the same, and I know. I was well aware that she married me, not out of love. But because she needed a home for herself and her child. It was all right for me, Mr. Jordan. I loved her deeply enough for both of us. And we've had a good life. I'm not arguing. Now I found it necessary to come to Cairo on business. Organizing a new corporation. Revolutionary cotton process. Yes, she told me that, too. And now we run across that man again. Stirring up all those old memories. I know you're an old friend of Polanski's. And that you've talked to both him and Cora. And I'll not stand for any meddling. Hey, now, wait a minute. Mr. Jordan, I'll not stand by and allow you to bring them two together again. He has no right to her. There's something good about our marriage. And I tell you, Mr. Jordan, I'm willing to fight to protect it. You better take that drink, Mr. Saunders. Yes, yes, of course. I'm sorry, Mr. Jordan. You understand, I, I feel very strongly about this. I'll protect her against that man at all costs. <laughs> After I got rid of Evan Saunders, I broke my rule and had another straight one during business hours. The more I thought about it, the more I thought Saunders had a point. So I was off again on my way to the Cairo Hospital. This time I didn't wait for the nurse to show me in. I got to Polanski's bed and drew aside the screen. I told you not to come back, Rocky. Maybe I didn't hear you. I've been talking to some people, Ted. One of them is Cora. Oh, don't you remember? I can forget her. Sure, but she doesn't find it so easy. Get out of here. Not yet. Lousing up your life's your own business, Ted. But this concerns Cora. She's got a good thing with Saunders. Best thing you can do is have it out with them and wash yourself out of their lives. Rocky, what do you know about me? Enough. Being a hero made you too good for her. A bunch of medals and headlines meant more to you than a wife and child. You think so? Rocky, I'm going to tell you something I've been living with for the past four years. Maybe it's time I unload. 
I'm listening. Ted Polanski lay back in his bed, closed his eyes and turned his face away. Finally, he started talking. You despise me, Rocky. But not as much as I despise myself. But believe me, I've always loved Cora. That's why I could never go back to her. You see, I, I'm not a hero. I never was. It's not the way the papers got it. Sure, sure. I heard the same story every time somebody pinned a medal on me. I risked my life to save top drawer photographic information from a burning plane. Delayed parachute jump. Want to know why I delayed that parachute jump, Rocky? Go on, Tim. Because my parachute was torn to shreds. The other guy on the plane was wounded. So I took his parachute. He died in a crash. I parachuted to safety. I killed him, Rocky, as sure as I'm lying here. Now you got it all. Yeah. Somehow I, I couldn't go back to Cora and the kid knowing in my own mind I'd kill somebody. Well, you know how I spent my time since then, bumming around. I was never going back because I, I, I just wasn't right for her. All I knew was that the best thing to do was to keep away from Cora. But now it's not so easy. What do you mean? Her life's not what you think it is. That husband of hers, Evan Saunders, a big cotton man, is a crook. He's rotten crooked and so is that phony corporation he's setting up. Where'd you get that? That's what's behind that knife in my back. He's in with a crumb named Vance Marco. Shiny car, West Bats? That's a guy. They're promoting a phony cotton refining process, starting a company selling a lot of stock, and after enough money comes in, Saunders and Marco pull out with their pockets full. How do you know all this? Because there was a third guy in the organization. Ted Polanski. Only I pulled out when I found out that Saunders was Cora's husband. I hoped I could stop the deal before Cora got hurt. <laughs> All I stopped was Marco's knife. Now I'm flat on my back and can't do a thing. But there wasn't anything to keep Rocky Jordan from doing something. I wasn't flat on my back yet. So I started out sporting for trouble. And I didn't mind when a native started tagging me after I left the hospital. It was the same one who had covered me with a gun in Marco's car earlier that day. So I let him follow for a while... I took him down a dark side street a couple of blocks. Then I suddenly doubled back and he ducked into a doorway. This was a good time to let him make his move, so I kept coming. I reached the doorway. There was the flash of a knife, but I wasn't there. I had him by the wrist and twisted it back. I, I killed the kill, my friend. Drop that knife or I'll slap your brains against this wall. Oh, oh, drop it. There now. That's talk. No, 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 no. Let, let me go. That the knife he used on Polanski? No, no. I, I do not know what you mean. Polanski knows. He got a good look at you. No, but he, he, he told you? Yeah, everything. Well, but, but it, it, it was an order. Sure. Vance Marco's order. He sent you to get me, too? Uh, Fendi, Where do I, I find Marco? I, I cannot tell. Uh, think real hard. Come on. Uh, yes, yes. The Athens Hotel, Sharia, Lucky. No, it's better. But, Fendi, what will I do? Marco, he Ah, will... never mind. Where you're going, you'll get all the protection you need. I dragged him back down to the square and turned him over to a cop, along with a message to Captain Sam Sabaya. Then I was on my way to the Athens Hotel. Vance Marco had a big suite on the fourth floor front. I was about to knock when the door opened. Marco was inside with a couple of his men, and coming out was Evan Saunders. Well, Mr. Jordan, I, I didn't expect to see you here. Oh, I'll bet you didn't, Saunders. Uh, Mr. Marco, it's been a pleasure. I'll see you in my suite at the National Hotel tomorrow morning. Goodbye, Mr. Saunders. Goodbye. Uh, goodbye, Mr. Jordan. Yeah. I still don't like your face, Jordan. You did your best to change it. I was just giving you a friendly tip. It didn't take, did it? I forget easy. You got a couple of muscles for help. Want to try again? Maybe I will. What's on your mind, Jordan? Great big deal, Marco. With a lot of little investors pouring their money into a phony corporation. <laughs> Either one of you guys know what Jordan's talking about? Got it, Marco. Polanski told me everything. What happens to those investors when they find out they bought into nothing? A new cotton process nobody can produce. Why ask me? Or better yet, what happens to you and Saunders? The police aren't going to like it. Let them talk to Saunders. He's on top of the deal. President. 
chairman. Yeah, how do you fit in? Me? I just helped out a little on the financial end. Yeah. It always works, doesn't it, Marco? Hasn't failed yet. What's your interest, Jordan? Trying to cut in? I'm giving you a chance to call it off. Well, you got the chance. <laughs> Sorry, Jordan. Corporations closed. Anything else? Yeah, a lot more. Well, I don't want to hear it. Throw him out, boy. Sure, boss. Come, come on, come on, come on. And don't come back, Jordan. Next time we drop you down the elevator shaft. I picked myself up and got out the back way just in case he had somebody waiting for me. Well, even though I knew the deal, Marco felt pretty safe. I figured there was more to it than what I'd worked out. When I got back to the tambourine, it was almost 7 o'clock and Cora Saunders was waiting. I haven't changed my mind, Rocky. Okay, Cora. I think Ted's ready to talk to you. You've seen him again? Yeah. Please tell me, how is he? I think Ted Polanski's going to be all right. Thank you, Rocky. Cora? Yes? How well did you know your present husband before you married him? Well, I... I didn't know him so long before I married him. I met him in a summer resort where I was waiting tables. Oh, what I mean is, what did you know about him personally? All I know is he's... He's been very, very good to me and my child. He's a wonderfully kind man, Mr. Jordan. How about this, uh, this cotton deal he's in? Oh, he has great hopes for it. Evan thinks it'll make a lot of money and help a lot of people. Why do you ask, Rocky? Oh, no, no. Just curious. You better go talk to Ted. What are you trying to tell me? Visiting time's 8 o'clock. Ted will be waiting. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Rocky, maybe you could come along. Oh, no, sorry, Cora, but I'm going to be real busy. I walked Cora to the front of the tambourine and saw that she got a taxi. Then I caught one for myself. I wanted to see Evan Saunders just once more before he pulled out for St. Louis. At the National Hotel, I got Saunders' room number and went on up without being announced. I found his door open. Saunders was there, pacing the floor. Oh, Mr. Jordan, come in. Yeah, that's my plan, Saunders. Where is Cora? Where's my wife, Mr. Jordan? You're real worried about Cora. Aren't Don't you? evade my question, Mr. Jordan. She went back to your cafe this evening. I have her message. She tell you where she was going from there? That's what I'm asking you. I demand to know where my wife is. Where she is at this minute, I don't know. But in another hour, she'll be at the Cairo General Hospital, talking to Ted Polanski. Mr. Jordan, I told you I don't want her to see that now man. Now tell me why. I explained that to you. I made it perfectly clear. He's hurt Cora enough. Any other reason, Saunders? Isn't that enough? Try it my way. You don't want her to talk to Polanski because you're afraid of what he might tell her. Why he got that knife on his back, for instance. What happened to him has nothing to do with... Cut it, what... Saunders. It happens Polanski told me everything. What did he tell you? Everything. The phony corporation you and Marco were setting up. Now, he moved in to spike the deal before Cora got wind of it. So you had to get rid of him. Mr. Jordan, I don't understand what you're talking about. I think you do. Didn't you wonder what I was doing at Marco's place a while ago? Certainly not. Why should I? He admitted the whole deal. The investors have been taken for every cent they put into your crooked racket. I don't believe Marco said any such thing. Ask him. Get me Mr. Vance Mark at the Athens Hotel. I'll wait. Yes? Yes, thank you. Vance Marco just checked out of the Athens Hotel. No forwarding address. Looks like you're on the griddle, buddy. Mr. Jordan, I'm not a swindler. I've been taken in by Marco just ah, like... That's a pretty good act. It's not an act. I'm innocent and I can prove it. Well, Evan Saunders started out to prove his innocence and prove that my thinking had been wrong. Mine and Ted Polanski's. He made another phone call, and then we went over to a building on Abraham Pasha Square. We went through a door marked Allenby and Allenby, attorneys. Allenby, number one, was there waiting, and Saunders told him the whole story. I said, this is a beastly affair, Mr. Saunders, beastly. I brought Mr. Jordan here, Mr. Allenby, to prove that I couldn't possibly have profited by the venture. Well, under the circumstances, perhaps it's wise. I have a folder here. Uh, oh, yes. Here you are, Mr. Jordan. This is a duplicate, of course. The original has been filed. Uh, just give me the quick once-over, Mr. Allenby. What's it all about? Well, <clears throat> with this document, Mr. Evan Saunders hereby assigns and grants all funds and income from his share of the Cotton Processing Corporation to charitable organizations. 
the Association of the United Nations, the International... Oh, wait a minute, Red wait a Cross, minute. And what? Saunders was to receive nothing from the corporation? Oh, absolutely nothing. Mr. Jordan, I hope you're convinced now that I was acting in good faith. Mr. Saunders could have had no possible motive for promoting a, a crooked venture such as this. Uh, just a second, Allenby. Yes? Why didn't you know it was a phony? You're the attorney. Oh, not for the corporation, Mr. Jordan. Vance Marco had that all set up with his own men. And he set it up very well. I was made president. My name was put on everything. And I'm left holding the bag. Right, Allenby? Yeah, fr frankly, you are in a bit of a pickle, Mr. Saunders. Your reputation will suffer and all that. No, I'll not have that. I'll repay every cent of the investors out of my own pocket. Clear up this mess as soon as possible. Well, that sort of makes things look a little different. Forget it, Jordan. We all make mistakes. Going, Mr. Jordan? Yeah. I got some clearing up of my own to do. It wasn't yet 8 o'clock, and I had to talk with Ted Polanski just once more. I got to the hospital a few minutes before visiting hours started, and Cora Saunders hadn't arrived yet. It took a little convincing, but I got to Polanski's bedside right away, and I talked fast. I made him see that Saunders was okay, that he was a good husband for Cora and a good father for their daughter, that if Cora had a chance for happiness, it was up to Ted. And it was 8 o'clock, and Cora was standing at the foot of his bed, her face pale and tight. Hello, Ted. Hello, Cora. How are you feeling? All right. Uh, Cora, I'm glad you came. There are some things we can clear up. I'll wait outside. No, 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 Rocky. That's not necessary. This won't take long. Cora? Yes? I want you to know I'm glad you married Saunders. Oh, but, Ted... The thing that bothered me was that I left you flat with no one to take care of you. Care of me. Is that all I meant to you? Somebody to be taken care of? Yes. But I was your wife, mother of your daughter. What about her? I'm sorry, Cora. The child was just a weight around my neck, too. I stopped loving you long ago. Going away to war was just a good excuse for getting away. After it was over, I just couldn't go back to you. Well, I, I guess there isn't much you can do when there's no love left. I'm just sorry it took so long for me to find this out. Well, now you know. I never felt so good as when I left you in St. Louis. Thanks, Dad. Thanks for what? I, I never realized until this moment how, how fortunate for me it was that you did leave. I see now how lucky I was to find a man like Evan. He's a strong man and an honest one. And he loves me and our child like you never could. Oh, goodbye, Ted. I don't think there's anything more we have to say. Goodbye, Cora. Uh, goodbye, Rocky. I won't be bothering you anymore about Ted Polanski. So long, Cora. Have a nice trip back to St. Louis. Well, Rocky, how did I do? Okay. Sh she'll be all right now, won't she? I think so, Ted. In fact, I'm sure of it. Thanks, Rocky. <laughs> <laughs> After a while, I left him. Later that night, I found out that Marco had been picked up boarding a plane at the Cairo airport. There wasn't much they could do to him about the phony cotton deal. He kept his nose pretty clean. But his knife man had talked, so they salted Marco away for the attempted murder of Ted Polanski. Before I turned in that night, I checked back on my day. Pretty unusual. Not a single dead body. I felt real good about it. Good 
It's CBS again at this same time next week for another story of adventure and intrigue when we take you back to Cairo and the Cafe Tambourine run by Rocky Jordan. Jack Moyles plays the title role with tonight's story by Gomer Cool and Larry Roman. Rocky Jordan is produced and directed by Cliff Howell with original music by Richard Arant. Larry Thor speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Box 13, with the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd, as Dan Holliday. Box 13, Box 13, Box 13, Box. He looked deeply into her eyes, which reflected his mood like twin lakes of azure blue. Azure blue. Why does a woman always have to have azure eyes? Why couldn't they be fire engine red? As his muscular arms tightened around her fragile... Susie. Oh, Mr. Holliday, I'm not fragile, but I'm sure scared. Somebody's been following me. With those legs? Why not? I I was petrified, afraid to look back even. His footsteps kept going click, cluck, click, cluck. Real sinister-like. Oh, I bet that's him now. Mr. Click, cluck? Oh, Mr. Holliday, he followed me all the way from Box 13. And now, Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Well, this is a brand new twist. Besides a message from Box 13, Susie has brought a mysterious caller. Somebody who wants in, but definitely. Don't answer it, Mr. Holliday. Now, now, Susie. You didn't see this person, huh? No, I, I just felt him following me like a, uh, like a phantom. Except his heels went click, cluck, click, cluck. Oh. That doesn't sound so dangerous. Let's take a chance. Come in. Oh. <laughs> Silly me. I ought to be ashamed for being such a fraidy cat. Look who it is. Well, Susie, who is it? I don't know. Who are you, mister? My name is George Flitt. I'm a, a detective. And you're Dan Holliday, the writer. It's, it's on the door. A detective, huh? <laughs> Why, isn't any bigger than me. But I have nerves of steel and the heart of a lion. Oh, oh, I see. And what brings you here, Mr. Flitt? Well, who? <laughs> Nerves of steel. Heart of a lion. <laughs> that was no fair, girl. You took me by surprise. Susie. Now, Mr. Flitt. Why don't you open the envelope I put in box 13? Here it is, Mr. Holliday. Oh, thanks. Open it. I'm all goose lumps. Okay. Well, what do you know? Why, there's nothing written on the paper. Hmm. How about that, Flick? See how clever I am? I put that envelope in box 13 as bait. As bait? Yes, I knew it would lead me to the person who put the ad in the Star Times, Adventure Wanted. We'll go any place and do anything. Very clever, Mr. Flick. Oh, what made your footsteps go click, cluck, click, cluck? <laughs> oh, that. I lost the metal cleat off of one of my heels. Oh. Well, now that you've discovered me, Mr. Flick, What? Mr. Holliday, I'd say you're just the man for the job. Job? Something exciting, you hope, huh, Mr. Holliday? I'd handle it myself, only I'm so tiny. Besides, I've done mostly divorce work. 
Just the right height for keyholes. But uh, about the job. Well, I'm coming to that. Uh, Mr. Gilbert Bolton sent me $50 just to attend the party tonight. $50? I should have been a detective. Oh, you can be. I'll split with you if you'll go to the affair in my place as me. I got the money. What's the catch? Oh, there's really no catch. Uh, only thing Mr. Bolton said was there might be a little um, bloodshed. <laughs> Well, 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 this holiday is the wackiest situation yet from good old Box 13. Yes, holiday, you must be hard up for story ideas. Hard up for brains, too. Otherwise, why are you riding with George Flitt, detective, in his hot rod jalopy? Destination, bloodshed. And you've never met this bold who's having the party. No, but he phoned and explained that the party is going to be at his nephew's place, at Kenneth Bolton. Kenneth, huh? Uh, what about the bloodshed? Well, as I understand it, Kenneth's father, that is, uh, Gilbert Bolton's brother, committed suicide not so long ago. Oh. Gilbert said the boy is suffering from neurasthenia, I, I think he said. Psychoneurotic, huh? Uh, yes. On account of the way his father died... Uh, Gilbert's afraid the boy may take his own life tonight. Why tonight, especially? Well, it seems that Kenneth drinks a lot at these parties and gets depressed. And my job is... To see that he doesn't commit suicide tonight. I've looked forward to more pleasant evenings. I, I think that's the place up ahead with all the lights on. Yeah, that's the address you mentioned. Hmm, we must be about 15 miles from town. Uh, 14 and 7 tenths by my speedometer. yeah? Well, Flit, I may as well take off. What are you going to do? Oh, I'll sit here in my car and listen to the radio, sort of keep my eye on things from the outside. Good idea. See you later, then. Here we go again, Holiday. Oops, the name's George Flit, detective. Remember? Beyond this door, who knows? But it's a beautiful house. A beautiful night. And a beautiful girl. Good evening. Oh, good evening. I'm looking for Mr. Gilbert Bolton. Won't you come in? And you are... Uh, uh, George Flitt. You say you're George Flitt? That's right. I'm Rita Martin. How do you do? Now, let's go in and find Gilbert Bolton, Mr. Flitt. <laughs> Holiday, here's a jungle cat. A vampire right of, of Terry and the pirates. That jet black hair, those heavy lidded eyes. That glistening crimson mouth. And something else. Yes, heavy, cloying, sensuous. A perfume such as you've never known before. That's something to remember this Rita Martin by. Mm hmm. Oh, there you are. Oh, Gilbert. Yes, Rita. Gilbert Bolton, this is George Flitt. George, how do you do, Mr. Flitt? Mr. Bolton? If you'll excuse me, gentlemen, I'll see you all a bit later. So, you're George Flitt, the detective. Yes, that's right. Your voice seemed, well, different over the phone. Well, you know, detectives, many disguises, many voices. <laughs> Got to keep them confused, you know. Somehow I pictured you differently. Oh? Well, no matter. You know why you're here. Yes, to keep my eye on your nephew, Kenneth Fulton. More than that, to keep him from chilling himself. The way this man looks at you, Holiday. So cool, so calculating. With piercing eyes that thud against the back of your skull. He could be one of two men. A man of distinction or a man of extinction. Okay, Mr. Bolton, I'll keep your nephew alive. That's your job. But what makes you think the boy wants to commit suicide? Well, since his father, my brother, took his life, Kenneth has been extremely upset. It's only natural, Mr. Bolton. I know, but I've heard Kenneth threaten suicide, and it's got me worried. Anyone else heard him? Yes, Miss Martin. Uh, anyone else? What do you mean, anyone else? I just wondered if anyone else had heard him make these threats. I really wouldn't know. It's enough that Rita and I know about it. 
How does Rita figure in this picture? Aren't you being a bit presumptuous, Mr. Flitt? A detective likes to know these things. Yeah. Miss Martin is an old friend of the family. Oh, there's Kenneth now. I'll bring him over. Just as Gilbert Fulton passed me, there was something familiar about him. What was it? Who was it? Come on, think, Holiday. It may be an important clue. But here they come. The man of extinction and a typical boy from Princeton or Yale or Harvard. George Flitt, my nephew, Kenneth Bolton. Glad to meet you. How do you do? Enjoying yourself, Mr. Flitt? Very much. How about you? Oh, so-so. These parties get to be a boy, huh? Kenneth hasn't been quite himself since the tragedy. Must you always bring that up, Uncle? But you know you've been terribly upset, Kenneth. So I've been upset. Why talk about it? Oh, uh, Mr. Flitt. Yes? Will you come with me for a moment? Oh, I sure. It's so close in here that I thought a breath of air. That suits me. In the garden. The garden, it is. Hmm. Nice. A moon, too. Mm-hmm. Lovely, lovely night. Ah, the scent of those flowers. Exquisite, isn't it? Uh-huh. But not to compare with your perfume. You noticed it. Yes, it was so unusual. It's called Whispering Gown. Whispering Gown? Mm, I like the name. Say. Yeah? I know where they got that name. Oh? From Cerno de Bergerac. The passage where he describes Roxanne. Across my life, one whispering silken gown. That was lovely. You're quite literary, aren't you, Mr. Blake? Well, yes and no. Just what do you do? Gilbert Bolton didn't tell you? No. No, but let's sit on this bench and you tell me all about yourself. As you come close to her, you get another whiff of... And suddenly you've got it. That's what bothered you about Gilbert Bolton. Her perfume rubbed off on him. It is an old friend of the family. She's young and a close friend of Gilbert Bolton's. She's brought you out here for a reason. Well, aren't you going to sit down? Oh, I sure, but uh, just a minute, I want to buy some cigarettes. I've got plenty of cigarettes. I'll be right back. Something about this whole setup is as phony as a china egg. And as the crooks in your story say, better case the joint before you go inside. There. There's a window. Just pull the bushes back. Let's take a gander. Well, everything looks on the up and up. Kenneth with a drink on the table beside him and... There's his uncle coming up. Hmm. He set another full drink right beside Kenneth. Hey, what else is he doing? You'd better get in there, Holiday, and fast. Mind if I, I join you, gentlemen? No, not at all, not at all. You appeared quite uh, suddenly. Care for a drink, Mr. Flitt? Here, I haven't touched this one. No, no, let me fix Mr. Flitter a fresh drink. <laughs> I think I'll just have one of these hors d'oeuvres. Here, watch it, my drink. Oh, I'm... I'm sorry. Flit, you... you awkward idiot. Oh, excuse me. Yes, Uncle. Accidents will happen. I didn't really feel like another drink. It was your idea, remember? Well, Mr. Flit, were you able to borrow some cigarettes? I was ambushed by hors d'oeuvres. Glad you're here, Rita. I have a proposal to make. Yes? What say we all run up to my penthouse for a while? Oh, sounds good. What do you say, Mr. Flynn? Fine. I think a change of scenery would be nice. Well, you'll enjoy the view overlooking Green Hill Park from the penthouse, Mr. Flynn. Oh, good. What's the address? Uh, I tell you what, Mr. Flitt. Rita, Kenneth, and myself will go ahead in my car. Then you can follow us in yours. Well, maybe I'd better go with Mr. Flitt. Keep him company. No, I'd like you with me, Kenneth. There's something I uh, want to discuss with you. Important. Well, per- perhaps I should have the address in case I lose you. you that know, but... won't be necessary. Uh, just follow me. Of course, Holiday, you could be wrong, but it looks like Gilbert Bolton isn't too anxious to have you find his penthouse. Uh, but you're a suspicious lad, Holiday. You've created so many diabolical characters for so many fiendish plots. Maybe you, maybe you've become a little touched. Time's a waste on holiday. Get to a phone. Huh. There it is, end of the hallway. Now, if Max on duty in the morgue of the Star Times, we'll ask a few questions. 
Dar Turner's reference room. Hello, Mac. This is Dan Holliday. Ah, Danny. What can I do you for? Say, you got anything on the Bolton suicide? Just filed those clips away yesterday. And even if this is a clips joint, I won't charge you a penny. <laughs> clips joint. You get it, Dan? <laughs> yeah. yeah, 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 I get it. What about Bolton? Poison himself. Left all his dough to his son. Name of Kenneth. Anything else? Well, there was something about Bolton's brother, uh, Gilbert. He sort of taken over and helping the boy. It was pretty broke up. Hey, Dan. Hey, did you hang up? No, but someone did. Someone was listening on another extension. Hey, this is the fastest hot rod I've ever driven. We're keeping right up with the Bolton. And he's doing 70. <laughs> Wait until you shift into high gear. Where are we going? To a penthouse, I hope. Gilbert Bolton's. Hmm. Now, what happened at the party? Oh, Rita Martin tried to get me into the garden, and I got suspicious. Trying to keep you away from your job, wasn't she? Yeah, so I rushed back into the house, stopping to case the joint through a window. Case the joint? <laughs> a detective talk. Yeah, then I got into trouble with Bolton. Well, how? By knocking a drink from his nephew's hand. Huh? Uh, what did the uncle do? He got insulting. And all of a sudden, he suggested going to his penthouse. Watch it, watch it. He, he's slowing down. Yeah, I wonder what his idea is. Oh, he's just slowing down for that train. But he only slowed down for a second. Look at him go. I know what he's doing. He's trying to beat that train to the crossing. He's trying to lose us. Step on the gas. Step on the gas, Mr. Holiday. Okay. Mr. Holiday, are we going to make it? He made it, but I don't know about us. You are listening to Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. And now, back to Box 13. Starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Uh, uh, oh, next time I want such a close shave, I'll see my barber. Yeah, me too. Gosh, Mr. Holliday, I thought I could handle this hot rod. But the way you whipped her off the road just short of those tracks, I... Not a scratch on her. Lucky us. Uh, that train must be a mile long. By the time it passes, Bolton can be in Alaska. What's the address of this penthouse? You're asking me. All I know is it overlooks Green Hill Park. Our next stop. Well, George, Green Hill Park. <laughs> I bet all these buildings have penthouses. We'll try them all until we hit the right one. I'll go around this side of the park. Okay, and I'll try the buildings around the other side. Bolton's got to be in one. Do you have a Mr. Bolton in your penthouse? No one here by that name. A Bolton in the penthouse? No, but uh, we have a Botsford in the basement. Why, yes, Mr. Gilbert Bolton came in a short time ago. Hello? No, with a lady and gentleman. Want to go up? Oh, please. Did Mr. Bolton say anything about expecting more guests? No, sir. Do me a favor. If a little fellow with a squeaky voice shows up asking for Bolton, tell him I'm here, will you? Dan Holliday. Yes, sir. Oh, here you are. Thank you, sir. Your floor, sir. Uh, that's the penthouse door over there. Right. I've got a sneaking hunch I won't be welcome. Flip, how did you get up here? You, uh, you didn't expect me? Yes, yes, of course, but uh, you've earned your money. You can, well, you can go home now. I'm sorry, Miss Maud, but Mr. Bolton hired me. It's up to him to fire me. But he's not here. He and Kenneth both went out. May I come in and wait? No. Goodbye. Now what? Now what does the intrepid hero of my stories do? Hmm, he looks for another door. 
like that one. He tries it. It's open. It leads into a hallway. And there's yet another door. The service entrance to Bolton's penthouse. And ten to one, it's locked, bolted, and barred. Maybe even nailed shut. Here's some gambler holiday. Offer ten to one and lose. The door's open. Well, here we go again. Quiet holiday. Ah, there's a door leading to the terrace and voices. I'll get your ear up, Holiday. But don't let them see you. Don't you think it's a little chilly out here, Uncle? Let's go inside. Chilly, Kenneth? I'm really very comfortable. Here's the view I was telling you about, Kenneth. Better lean over the rail a bit to see around that turret. Oh, don't push against me, Uncle. That's a ten-story drop. Now... Look over there, Janet. Uncle Gill. Janet, let's get away from that rail. Oh, Flint, you don't have to throw me back. Better than having your uncle throw you forward. What's the meaning of this outrage? How did you get in here anyway? I'm going to call the police. Fine, and save me the trouble. Look, Kenneth, I was hired to keep you from committing suicide. Suicide? Who, me? Yeah, but instead I'm keeping you from being murdered. Feel in your coat pocket. Ignore him, Kenneth. He doesn't know what he's talking about. A bottle? It's marked poison. Yeah, I saw your uncle plant it in your pocket through the garden window. He wanted to make it look like you poisoned that drink I knocked from your hand. Stop right there, Holiday. This isn't a cap pistol. You too, Kenneth. Don't move. Oh, you must be crazy, Uncle Gill. And you knew I was Dan Holiday all along, huh? Of course. I've seen your picture in the book review pages. And I caught you a telephone conversation at the Star Times. On the extension. You get around. I can't believe this. You, you, my uncle... What's the play now, Bolton? Well, first I walk over to Kenneth and knock him out with his gun. Nope. Don't move, Holiday. I've still got you covered. Oh? And now that you've knocked out your nephew, what's your next move? Mr. Holiday, before I heave him over the rail to make it look like suicide, I'm going to shoot you. Oh? Why? Then I'll wipe my fingerprints off this gun and press my nephew's hand around the butt. Hmm. His fingerprints on the gun will prove he shot me, huh? What about a motive? Very simple. You tried to stop him from jumping off the terrace. And you're supposed to invent plots, Mr. Holliday. But they'll trace the gun to you, Bolton. Oh, no. It's Kenneth's gun. I took it from his room. And you wanted a detective on hand to throw off suspicion. Yes, Mr. Holliday. Who'd suspect Gilbert of murder when he'd hired a detective to protect Kenneth? But why? Why do you want to kill your nephew? Let's say I borrowed quite a large sum I can't make good. Oh. Embezzlement, huh? And you need Kenneth's inheritance to keep out of jail. Wouldn't he lend you the money? Not the amount we need. We? Obviously. So, we're taking it all. Clever, eh, Holiday? You're killing me. You're so right. Get rid of whoever it is, Rita. If that isn't help, Holiday, forget about writing the great American novel. No room in a coffin for typing. I tell you, you really can't. I'm such a fantasy. I know. I tell you, you can't. Never mind, speaking. Rita. I couldn't stop him. I've got plenty of bullets. Welcome to the party, George. Hello, Mr. Holiday. Uh, a gun. Let me out of here. Stop. Stop or I'll shoot. Hey. Hey. Watch out. Thanks for the distraction, Flip. Now, Mr. Gilbert Bolton, you know how your nephew feels. Well, I know how it feels to be on the right end of this Smith & Wesson. You knocked him out. What are you going to do? Do? Well, since the party's getting dull, let's invite a few more boys. Say, from headquarters. This is Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Come in.
coming in. Hello, Mr. Holliday. Hello, Susie. Ah, Mr. George Flitt, detective. How's the arm, Mr. Flitt? Oh, it's uh, healing up fine. One of the bullets just grazed me. You know, I bled quite a lot. Say, wasn't that awful, them trying to kill that boy? And he really wasn't psycho whatchamacallit at all. Uh, Bolton cooked that up to support the suicide story. Oh. What's going to happen to them, Mr. Holliday? Well, they've got Bolton for embezzlement and attempted murder. They're holding Rita as his accomplice. And she was such a beautiful girl and so sweet, too. Yes, George, you can say that again. H- how's the rod hot these days, Mr. Flip? Hot rod, Susie. Hot rod. Rod hot. Red hot. Oh, how is it anyway? Red hot. <laughs> oh, it's fine. And Mr. Holliday, hmm? even if I did run away from that gun, I really do have the heart of a lion. But of course, George. Only thing is, <laughs> it's a scaredy cat lion. <laughs> Next week, same time, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. Alan Ladd appears through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures and may currently be seen in Wild Harvest. Box 13 is directed by Ted Hediger. Original music is composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager, with an original story by Larry Kraft. The part of Susie is played by Sylvia Picker. This is a Mayfair production. The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. People who make 76 gasoline and Triton motor oil, Union Oil Company present The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. It's just before noon on a bright but blustery day in San Francisco. And Mike Shane, San Francisco's favorite detective, instead of chasing criminals, is sitting peacefully in his office, academically discussing crime and its detection with his able and attractive associate, Phyllis Knight. And, oh yes, the inspector of homicide who has come to take them to lunch. You see, Inspector, I'm not criticizing the police department when I say that uh, I'm not bound by the rules that... Well, you, for instance, are bound. I realize that, Mike. I have to be pretty sure of my ground before I make an arrest. I have to have evidence enough to convince the district attorney, and he has to have reasonable prospects of obtaining a conviction before he goes to the grand jury. Plus the fact that you, Inspector, can be sued for wrongful arrest, whereas we, Mike and I, never arrest anybody. (laughs) We pass the buck to you. (laughs) I know. I know all that. But what I'm getting at is this. Mike has something in the way of, well, being able to nose out a suspect that we, well, that is most of us in the department, either don't have or else don't apply. The answer is simple. Proving it is difficult. Let's hear it in all its simplicity. Well, you and every other member of the department are so busy taking notes, which you have to do, that you get into the habit of reading what witnesses and suspects have to say. Whereas I, uh, I listen to their tones, uh, to their delivery... I strain my ears for the meaning behind what they say instead of the mere words. I'll admit all that. I think there's something else, Inspector. Although I hesitate to say this. (laughs) Don't spare my feelings, Phyllis. (laughs) No, I'm not thinking of your feelings. It's Mike's. Oh, don't spare mine, Angel. You never do. Hmm. Well, in spite of the fact that Mike hates criminals and hates crime, I think he has a criminal mind. Angel, what you just said. I mean it. Mike seems to be saying to himself... If I had committed this crime, how would I go about it? Or if I were the important clue, where would I be found? Well, that's not a criminal mind, Angel. That's just that I... Michael Shane, private detective. Hi, Phil. Is the inspector there? Oh, sure thing, Sergeant. For you, Inspector. Uh Uh-oh. Hope this doesn't break our lunch date. Hello, Sergeant. Report a homicide, Inspector. 
A man named Porter called up and said he found a body at 323 Foothill. Any idea who the murdered man is? Porter said the man's name was Beatty. Didn't give much more information. He seemed pretty upset, not too coherent. Okay, Sergeant. I'll meet you there as soon as I can get there. Homicide, huh? Yeah. Well, what do you want? Murder or lunch? Oh, don't be silly, Inspector. We'll pass up a whole week's meals for a murder any time. This is the street. Yeah. And that looks like the apartment. Right there, with a man standing on the steps. Yeah, that's it. No signs of your boys yet, Inspector. No, but then we were closer than headquarters. That must be Porter. Looks all upset. Well, wouldn't you if you just found a body? Are you, uh, Mr. Porter? Yes, yes. I've been pacing up and down these steps waiting. I thought you'd never come. Where's the body? Upstairs, on the couch in his living room. This isn't your house, then? Uh, no. No, this is Mr. Beatty's house. Oh. You were visiting Mr. Beatty? I called to take him to lunch. When? Just before I called the police. Not more than uh, 20 minutes ago. In this way, please. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, I, I, I went in, and there he was lying on the couch. There was a knife sticking out of his chest. I ran over to him, felt for his heart, and got my fingers all sticky with blood. You shouldn't have touched the body. Well, I didn't know it was a body. He might still have been alive. Had he been, I would have called a doctor before I called the police. That makes sense. Where is he, in this room? Uh, on the couch there. He, uh... Oh, but... But he must be. Body? There's no body on this couch. But no. he was there. Maybe you were mistaken. Maybe he wasn't dead. Oh, but he was dead. He was cold. He was bleeding. His, his heart wasn't beating. Ugh. What's the matter, Angel? Oh, there's blood on the couch. I just got my hand in it. So you're right. Here, here's my handkerchief. Thank well, you. if he was dead, someone must have removed him. But they couldn't, Inspector. There's only one entrance to the apartment through the front door. There's no back door to the apartment? No, and I've been here all the time. I... I haven't been out of the sight of that front door since I discovered his body. I, I... I feel sick. I've got to sit down. Okay, okay, now calm yourself, calm yourself. I don't blame you for being upset. But we'd better get this straightened out. Mr. Porter, tell us what you did from the very start. Well, I, I told you. I, I came to take him to lunch. If he was dead, how did you get in? Well, the door was open. Uh, and that's funny, too, because he was always careful about locking and bolting it. Go on, go on. The door was open, so you went in. I found him, and... When I saw he was dead, I, I, I phoned the police. You'll probably find my bloody fingerprints on the phone. Yes. Then what did you do? Well, I, I walked up and down, and I went to the front door. I came back and... Oh, I, I remember. I saw the mail lying in the hallway. I absently, almost unthinkingly, picked it up. Where did you put it? On the table there. Mm-hmm. Huh? Oh, the wind must have blown it on the floor. There. That's it? That's it. Uh, then you did what? Well, that's all I... I walked back and forth, and I'd walk downstairs to the front door to look for the police, and then I'd come back. And you were never out of sight of that hallway and front door? No, not for one second. Well, it's a cinch that even Houdini couldn't take a body out this back window. That window was open? Yes. Oh. No signs of anything on the sill. No, and even if there were, Mike, look there. Workmen working on that building would be bound to see anything like that. Yeah, you're right, Andrew. You up there, Inspector? Yeah, come upstairs. Well, what do you think, Inspector? I don't know what to think. What's more, I don't know what to do. Well, what do you mean you don't know what to do? Well, to put it bluntly, how do I go about finding a murderer when I haven't even got a body? But there was a body, and there has been a murder committed. You can't talk like that about not doing anything. The man's right, Inspector. I know perfectly well he's right. But why don't you suggest something? All right, I will. What? Let's go hunt a body. <laughs> Return to the adventures of Michael Shane in just a moment. You know, you hear a lot about magical post-war products and how easy they're going to make your life. Well, friends, one such product is here already. Yes, that's right. It's Union Oil Company's Luster Wash, a product that makes washing your car just about the easiest, simplest thing you've ever done. All you do is empty a small package of Union Luster Wash into a pail of water. Using an ordinary rag, apply the mixture generously over the car. Then, just rinse off with a hose, and you're all through. 
In 10 to 15 minutes, your car is clean from radiator cap to taillight. No fuss, no bother, no mess. Union Luster Wash is harmless to the car finish and to your hands, yet cleans as fast as you can apply it and without the usual elbow grease. Luster Wash is not a soap, but a special detergent compound which dissolves road film and traffic dirt on contact, leaving the surface clean and smooth. You'll be amazed at how fast it works and how clean it makes your car. A package of Luster Wash sells for only 10 cents and is enough to wash any average car. Remember the name, Luster Wash, for a new, easy way to wash your car. You can get Luster Wash at any Union Oil Minuteman station. Just drive in wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76. Thank you. Mike, Phyllis, and the inspector have been confronted with a murder, a man who saw the victim, but so far, no corpse. They've finished searching the apartment and stand looking at one another. Well, if there's a body in this house, it must be in small pieces and hidden in cracks in the walls. Uh, there's certainly no body in this apartment. But, Inspector, Mr. Shane, I, I, I saw it. We know. We know, Mr. Porter, but it isn't here now. Look, we've all had our say on the body. Let's change to something else. We've pretty well covered the apartment. Not only us, but the sergeant and his boys. We couldn't find a thing amiss. Ah, uh, granted. So, let's take a look at the murdered man's mail. Oh, h- here it is. I put it on this end table. Oh, thanks. Ad from Flower Shop. Oh, open this one, Inspector. Okay. Here's another ad. And uh, you open this one, Angel. All right. I'll tackle this one. Hey, Mike. What? Hmm? Listen. I warned you for the last time. Settle up or else. Signed. I can't read the initials, but the signature looks like Reynolds. Oh, that must be. Yeah? Tell us more. Well, I, I, I don't know very much, but Reynolds and another man by the name of Weaver went into some sort of a deal with BT. They felt that BT had swindled them. Well, not in the way that they could go to law, you understand, but in such a way that B.T. didn't lose his money, but they lost theirs. And B.T. told me that he'd been threatened by them. He told me he was worried, but that was all. Why the Dickens didn't you tell me this before? Oh, because I, I, I didn't think it was important. You surely don't think that either Reynolds or Weaver would kill B.T. Over, over a thing like that? We don't know, but it's our only lead so far. Wouldn't you say so, Mike? Oh, not exactly, but it's one we've got to follow up, of course. You'll return home, Mr. Porter? Yes, yes, of course. I'll be there if you need me. Okay. Let's go, Phil, Mike. We'll go in my car. Let's see. The address on this stationery of Reynolds is Stats Building. I'll stay behind, Inspector, just in case any phone calls or anything like that. Right, Sergeant. Um, doesn't anybody want to know what was in the letter I opened? Huh? Why, you little... I wondered why you were so quiet all of a sudden. What is it, Phil? Well, I didn't want to read it while we were in the room. You think we'd better wait till we reach the car? Oh, no, no, huh? We're out of earshot. Okay, shoot. It says, I don't suppose I should care what happens to you, but just the same, you are a fool. I've told you before that I don't trust Porter, and I'm more sure of it now than ever before. What's the signature? There isn't any. But although it's written on a typewriter, I'll make you a bet. What? What? I'll bet you this warning was sent by a woman. Eighth floor, please. Yes, sir, eighth floor. Number eight, sir. There's Reynolds' office right down the hall. Yeah, there's a man just going in. Yeah, we might be in luck. That might be Weaver. Something tells me that this isn't going to be very profitable. Well, we'll soon see. Yes, may I help you? We'd like to see Mr. Reynolds. Mr. Reynolds is busy just now. If you'd care to wait, he has someone with him. The someone with him isn't by any chance Mr. Weaver. Well, well, yes, it is, but how... Oh, you saw him come in just before you did. Then if it is Mr. Weaver, that's most fortunate, because we want to see both gentlemen. Well, I, I don't know. I'll ring Mr. Reynolds. Please don't. We're on police business, and we'd rather go in unannounced. Oh, but I... I... Well, and to what do I owe this intrusion? Isn't my receptionist out there? Your receptionist isn't at fault, Mr. Reynolds. I'm from police headquarters. We'd like to ask a few questions. Police? What on earth for? You sent this threatening letter, Mr. Reynolds? Let me see. Uh, Yes, yes, I did. And I'll send more if I don't get satisfaction. Uh, Satisfaction for what, sir? I don't think it is anyone's business. It's police business, Mr. Reynolds. Now, we can all be very comfortable and save a lot of time by getting our answers here. But, of course, if you prefer headquarters... Then that's your privilege. Oh, well, 
If Beatty has been fool enough to report this letter to the police, I'll tell you all you want to know. We'd like to know why you wrote the letter. Well, briefly, uh, Beatty, Mr. Weaver here and I, uh, put up equal amounts of money into an enterprise. It was at Beatty's inducement. Uh, Beatty had the inside track on the thing. He knew before we did that the venture wasn't going well. He withdrew his money without giving us a chance to withdraw ours. And the venture folded. It did, and, uh... Go on, sir. Reynolds and I feel that Beatty should share the loss with us. In other words, you feel that Beatty should split what he got out of the deal three ways with you two. Yes. Uh, legally, of course, we can't compel him. Morally, we feel entitled to it. Uh, where does Mr. Porter fit into this scheme? Porter? <laughs> he doesn't fit in at all. He's just a real estate man who helped Reynolds find a warehouse. A personal friend of Reynolds? Well, yes. You said warehouse. Is uh, the warehouse being used, Weaver? No, no. We still have a lease on it, but the business folded three weeks ago. And the warehouse is empty? Yes, uh, quite empty. You have the keys. Uh, I do. Uh, You want to borrow them? Yes. Thanks. Now, one more question. Where is the warehouse? It's at 2200 Key Street. Beatty, Weaver, and Reynolds is on the signboard. What a rat trap. Yeah? Well, here's hoping it's more than just a rat trap. A man trap. Yeah, this looks like the key. Well, yeah, here we go. All right, now careful where you walk. Remember, they said the business folded three weeks ago. There should be enough dust on the floor to show footprints. Place is empty enough. There are footprints leading to that cubbyhole of an office. Well, leave us have a look, see. There's not a blessed thing in here, except this old table. Take a look, Phil, Inspector. Hmm? Yeah. You notice how the dust is disturbed on the edge of the table next to the wall? That means that table was moved. Yeah. No, it may not mean a thing, but keep it in mind. Outside of that rickety chair out in the warehouse, that seems to be everything. No loose boards or hidden closets or anything? No, pretty much of a blank. Mike? Yeah? Inspector? Yeah? Take a look at this chair. I, I may be wrong. But... What is it, Angel? Oh, oh, look, that spot. Dry, shiny. It, it looks like brown paint, but it... It could be blood, huh? Mm-hmm. It does look like blood. One single drop. If it is a blood spot, it dropped from quite a height. You see how it's spread out like a... like a seal? Inspector. Yeah? That table. Let's get it out here, right in the center of the floor. Okay. Now, the chair on top of the table. Yeah. Mike, that ventilator in the roof. Right, Angel, right. I didn't notice it till now. Oh, it's a common failing. People never lift their eyes high enough. Now, give me a hand, Inspector. Okay. I hate to twist an ankle, even on a murder case. There. Any luck? Yes. Yes, blood on the edge of the vent. You need a flashlight, Mike? Uh-uh. Uh, the body's here, all right close to the eaves and lying along the rafters. That'll do till the police surgeon gets here. Yeah, okay. Phil, will you make an inventory of all the stuff as we search it? Mm Mm-hmm, shoot. Okay. Leather wallet, identity card, J.J. Beattie. Driver's license, age 52. Mm-hmm. I think... Yeah? I think he was stabbed twice, Mike. Once in the back, and that was the stab that killed him. Stabbed again in the chest, eh? Looks that way. Autopsy will tell us definitely. Mm-hmm. Uh, pocket handkerchief. Okay. One or two? One in trouser pocket. One folded in breast pocket of coat. Mm-hmm. Got it. Checkbook. Balance, $800.30. Any stubs to Porter, Reynolds, or Weaver? No, Mike. Seems to be all for light bills. Gas bills, department store purchases, things like that. Pipe, tobacco pouch, and book of matches. Yeah. Bill clip with $25 and loose cash. Three silver dollars, 90 cents, and two streetcar tokens. Old-fashioned gold watch and chain. Watch and gray, J.J. Beatty from fellow workers, Wadsworth Plant. Kansas, 1913. Uh-huh. Fountain pen and pencil. 
And that seems to be it. Okay, then. That's all. Got it? Got it all down in my own inimitable shorthand. So, that's all, is it? What do you mean, Mike? Yeah. Why that cat that ate the canary look on your face? <laughs> Once before, I told you that something was so blamed obvious that I wasn't going to tell you what it was. Oh, we remember, Daddy. Okay. The same thing applies here. Now, come on, let's get going. I don't know where you'd like to go, but I'd like to put in a phone call. Who to, Phil? First, to Mr. Beatty's wife, if he has one, ex or otherwise, to see if she wrote that warning note to Beatty. One run. Go ahead. If no Mrs. Beatty exists, then to the little receptionist at Reynolds' office for additional... Two runs, no errors. I'm with you. Good. And I'd like to use a police teletype. I'm with you on that one, Mike. We'll teletype Kansas to see what associates Mr. Beatty had in the days of his past. But I'm still puzzled about what you seem to know that we don't. <laughs> I don't know a thing that you don't know, Inspector. I'll give you one hint, just one. But you mustn't ask any more questions. I'll bite. Go ahead. Just put your hands in your pockets, Inspector. That's all. Just put your hands in your pockets. In just a moment, we'll return to Mike and Phyllis. Ladies and gentlemen, a few minutes ago, we told you about a sensational new way to wash your car. Now, if you think that there can't be anything new about washing a car, well, just try Union Luster Wash. You see, Luster Wash is a special detergent compound that makes washing a car just about the easiest, simplest thing you've ever done. All you do is empty a small package of Union Luster Wash into a pail of water. Then, with an ordinary rag, apply the mixture generously. To finish, you simply rinse the car with a hose. That's all. No rubbing or elbow grease is necessary. In 10 to 15 minutes, your car is clean from radiator cap to taillight. Luster Wash cleans glass and chromium, too, which means you don't have to use a chamois afterwards. It's harmless to the finish and to your hands and leaves no film to dull the surface. No matter how dirty your car may be, Union Luster Wash will wash it as swiftly as you can apply it. A package sells for just 10 cents, one dime, and is enough to wash any average car. Remember the name, Union Luster Wash, for a new, easy way to wash your car. You can buy Luster Wash at all Union Oil Minuteman stations. Just drive in wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76. Thank you. Mike Shane, Phyllis, and the inspector are at headquarters. Phyllis is on the phone. Mike is looking at his notes, and every few minutes, the inspector guiltily puts his hands in his pockets, pulling them out again when he catches Mike's eye. Doggone you, Mike. You got me as self-conscious as a giggling schoolgirl. <laughs> it's your own fault, Inspector, your own fault. If the solution of the murder depended on it, I'd tell you right now, but, well, it's only hush, one hush, link. Hush, kids. Huh? She's on the phone. Oh, who? Oh. The ex-Mrs. Beatty. Oh. Hello? Uh, Mrs. Beatty. Yes? Mrs. Beatty, don't hang up when you hear my question, because if you do, you'll be called right back, and that will be by the police. Yes. Go on. Uh, did you by any chance send a note of warning to Mr. Beatty? Well, Mrs. Beatty? Yes, I did. Why? Well, it's, it's hard to explain, but there was something about this Mr. Porter I didn't trust. Oh, I haven't seen much of Mr. Beatty these last few years, but... I've met him socially several times when he's been with this man, Porter. Mm -hmm. Go on, Mrs. Beatty. Well, that's all. I have only a woman's intuition for not trusting Mr. Porter. He, he reminds me of someone. I can't remember who, but someone not to be trusted. And that's all? Honestly, that's all. Thanks very much. Well, there's not much there. She sent the note. But just womanly intuition made her distrust Porter. You think she was telling the truth? Well, yes, don't you? Uh, not entirely. Not the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes? A boss from Kansas, sir. Bring it in, Sergeant. Yes, Inspector, I'll get it typed up. Doggone, if there isn't something in the Kansas report, we're going to have a regular unsolved mystery on our hands. Wouldn't like to call in Sherlock Holmes or Father Brown, would you? Oh, Mike, this is serious. This is murder. I know it is, Inspector. Now, look, both of you. Yeah? Yeah? When we burst in on Reynolds and Weaver... 
they didn't show any signs of knowing that Beatty was dead. I mean, they were wholly taken up with the idea that Beatty had brought the police into it because of the threatening letter. That's right. Yeah. As a matter of fact, Reynolds said that if that letter didn't bring results, he'd send more letters. Right, Angel, right. And although that could be cleverness, I'd be inclined to mark it down as truthfulness. You may be inclined to mark it down that way, Mike, but until we have the murderer in our hands, everybody who ever knew Beatty is a suspect in my little list. Granted, Inspector, but Weaver didn't hesitate to give us the uh, keys to the warehouse. Mm, you can't lay too much stress on that, though, Mike. B both Weaver and Reynolds knew that we could get into that warehouse without keys. True, true, but to be able to carry off their interview with us uh, with such savoir faire would indicate that they were very clever and very experienced crooks, which I, for one, don't believe they are. Yeah, yeah, but Mike, murderers don't have to be crooks. Many a killing is a criminal's first and last crime. I know that, Inspector. I'm thinking out loud to convince myself. You see, what I... Yes, yeah, sir. Not much, I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. Let's see what this says. Only connection Beatty ever had with police was his witness in the robbery trial. His testimony was essential in proving guilt of defendant. And the defendant's name was Porter. Yes, Phil, the defendant's name was Porter. Well, what are we waiting for? That's it. No, no, not quite, Phil. You see, Porter died in a penitentiary in 1936. Oh. Oh, well, then, of course, it isn't the same Porter. That hmm. report doesn't say whether or not Porter had a brother. No, Mike, it doesn't. But I'd be almost willing to bet that he had... What so many women like to call woman's intuition is uh, nothing more or less than a half-forgotten incident or something half-heard and half-forgotten. You think that Mrs. Beater's instinctive dislike for Porter is because of the name or a likeness between the Porter who found the body and the Porter who went to jail? Yes, Inspector, that's exactly what I do Ooh, mean. Well, that shouldn't be hard to find out. But it still isn't the stuff that convinces district attorneys or grand juries. No, Inspector, but on the face of it, I think another interview is justified. Interview? Who with? All of our suspects, Weaver, Reynolds, Porter, and Mrs. Beatty. All right, Mike, we've got nothing to lose. We have everything to gain. You see, our chief suspect holds the key to this little mystery, and we'll find that key at 323 Foothill. Will I get a standwise? Quiet, please. Quiet. Now, to some of you, this is going to be somewhat of a shock. But Mr. Beatty has been murdered. What? We found the body in the warehouse you used, Mr. Reynolds and Mr. Weaver. But Mr. Porter had the distinction of finding it first. Although he lost it again. Uh, will you take over from there, Mr. Porter? Well, uh, I, I came here this morning to take Mr. Beatty to lunch. The door was open, which was funny because he was very careful about locking and bolting the door. Mm -hmm. I came upstairs, found him lying on the couch, stabbed through the chest. I, I ran over and felt him to see if he was alive. Found he was dead and called the police. And got your fingers all sticky with blood? Yes. Uh, then I, I, I wandered about the apartment. Went downstairs to the front door to watch for the police and came back upstairs and picked up the mail. The mail which contained the threatening letter from Mr. Reynolds and the warning from Mrs. Beatty. Uh, I don't know about that, but uh, anyway, when you arrived, we all came upstairs and the body was gone. It uh, couldn't have been taken out the front door because I was never out of the sight of the head of the stairs. And we know it wasn't taken out the back because there's no back door. Would uh, you have any explanation for that, Mr. Reynolds? Uh, no, no, I, I can't see how. Or you, Mr. Weaver? No, no explanation. And I'm sure that Mrs. Beatty hasn't. Oh, no, it's completely baffling to me. It was to us for quite a while. The reason it was baffling was because we were stupid enough to believe Mr. Porter. What? If you picked up the letters after you examined the body and after you phoned the police, how come there are no blood-stained fingerprints on any of them? But I... And with the wind blowing so hard that it blew the mail off the table, how come the front door was open? It would have blown shut. And if the body couldn't be taken out the back window and you never lost sight of the front door, how could the body be spirited away? I don't know. I don't know. That's the mystery. No, no mystery, Porter. Just a tissue of lies well rehearsed. The body never was here. But the blood on the couch. Put there by you after you had hidden the body in the warehouse rafters. Oh, this is absurd. You can't throw accusations around like that. We can and we will. Give me your keys. My keys? Yes, yes, the keys in your pocket. There, you see. When we searched Mr. Beatty's dead body, we found everything a man usually carries. A wallet, pen and pencil, watch, checkbook, handkerchief. But, uh, but, Inspector... Yes? No keys. No keys to get into his house or anything. Now, what Porter did with the rest of Beatty's keys, I don't know. But here's the key to the warehouse. Uh, F-24 is its number. It checks with the number of your keys, key, Mr. Weaver. Yes, that's right. And one of these two keys is the key to Beatty's apartment. This apartment. Shall I try them, Porter, or do you admit it? I... 
I admit it. Okay, Inspector. I guess that takes care of that. Well, here it is, early in the evening, and we're on our way home. Ha ha! But we're not on our way home, Angel. No? Where are we going? We're going to meet the inspector and have a late snack at Fisherman's Walk. Oh, good. Mike, I-, I wonder if Porter is a brother of the man who died in the penitentiary. Oh, I'm sure of it. He'd better be. Why? Because if he isn't, we'll spend the evening talking to the inspector about motives. Oh. And what would you rather do, Mike Shane? Are you asking me or taunting me? Well, I just... Uh, Mike. Huh? No. Not here in the car. I mean... Why not, Angel? I can drive with one hand as well as the next. Tune in again next week at 8 o'clock for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis, with Joe Forte as the inspector. Tonight's story, based on the character created by Brett Halliday, was written and directed by David Taylor. Music was composed and directed by Bernard Katz. This is John Lang saying goodnight for the people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. Beat it, you two. I don't talk to strangers. Well, uh, we're not strangers, exactly. I- I'm Mrs. North. Beat it, I said. Well, you don't have to get tough about go it. Go on, go on. Scram and don't come back. The only place I want to see you is in the morgue. Mr. and Mrs. North, starring Joseph Curtin and Alice Frost. Listen as Pam and Jerry solve the mystery, The Death Trap. A few miles uptown from where the Norths live, in the cellar of an old brownstone apartment house, a woman sits at a table playing solitaire. Her hair is blonde, platinum blonde, and her eyes are sultry. Behind her, an anxious young man is nervously pacing the floor. You're going to wear out those shoes, Benny. Won't be the first time. What the devil is keeping Nick? Give him a chance, will you? He's got to check the whole setup before we can lift a finger. What for? Don't he think I know how to case a job? Look, Beanie, Nick don't trust anybody when it comes to a kidnapping job. It's the way he works. Careful. You like it, I suppose. I like staying out of jail. I like a meal ticket that's nice and steady, too. What's the matter with me? I'd be the best meal ticket in the world if you'd only let me. I'd give you anything you wanted, Flo. Anything. Sure. For a while, you would. For as long as you wanted me. Ah, oh, stop it, kid. You're dreaming. And what are you doing? Using my head. When you get to be my age, you don't run off with the little boys that fall in love with you. You stick to somebody solid. Somebody that's been around for a long time. Like Nick. And how long are we going to go on like this? Making love behind his back. Aching to be alone together and having him put his fat paws all over you. Watch. <laughs> He's back. That's you, Nick? Yeah, it's me. Well, how'd, how'd you make out? Set up okay? Looks pretty good. Looks like you had it figured right about the old man's money, too. Well, what kept you? He was getting worried. About me or your share of the setup? Well, don't say that, sweetie. You know you're the only guy in the world for me. Sure, I know. Got a kiss for Papa? Mm. Well, let's not stand around smooching all night. Let's get the car and put this show on the road. Car's outside, Beanie. We're rolling 20 minutes. What are you carrying? Automatics. One upstairs and one on the hip. Ditch him. Huh? Ditch him, I said, and take the silence. Uh, I don't think we'll have any trouble with this old guy. But if we have to shoot him, we'd better shoot him quiet. <laughs> Oh, 
I'm glad we decided to go to the early movie, Pam. I don't think I could have sat through the late one. Well, if I'd have known you were so tired, dear, we wouldn't have gone to the movies at all. Uh, have you got your keys? Mm-hmm. Mr. North. What's that? Oh, uh, Mrs. Rowland, dear, across the hall. Mr. North, did you happen to see my husband when you came upstairs just now? Why, no, Mrs. Rowland. Is he outside? Well, I don't know where he is, Mr. North. He said he was just going down to put the car in the garage, but he left here almost an hour ago. Well, maybe he stopped off someplace on the way back. Oh, no, I'm sure he wouldn't do that. You know, he hasn't been well lately, and with all the work we've been doing these past few weeks, selling things and making arrangements, to live down in Florida. He's been getting to bed very early. Oh, I'm sure nothing's happened to him, Mrs. Rowland. It's only a few blocks from the garage. Oh. There. I'll bet that's him calling now. I hope so. Will you wait? I'll see who it is. Yes, yeah, sure. Mrs. Hello? Mrs. Rowland? Yes? Are you alone? What? Yes? Who is this? Never mind. Just listen and don't do any more talking. It's about your husband, and it's important. What? Don't talk, I said. Your husband's with me. He's been kidnapped. And as soon as we can get together on the door, we'll let him go. In the meantime, keep your mouth shut. But he's not... I told you to keep your mouth shut. Don't say a word about this to anybody. And if you call in the police, we'll kill him. No. Remember what I told you, Mrs. Rowland. Now sit tight and wait for my call. I'll be in touch with you later. Hello. Hello. What's wrong? My husband... My husband, he's been kidnapped. <laughs> shouldn't have done it, Mr. North. You you shouldn't have asked Lieutenant Wigand to come here. They warned me not to call the police. Well, you didn't call them, Jerry, dear. Oh, if they find out, they'll kill George. No, no, don't you worry about that, Mrs. Rowland. I was very careful about coming here. And I made sure that no one saw me. Well, what's the next move, Bill? Tracing that phone call? Well, no, you can't trace a local call, Jerry. Not after it's completed. That's why I was so anxious to know when your husband left this apartment, Mrs. Rowland. Well, I, I told you as near as I could remember, Lieutenant... He left about 9.30. And the kidnappers didn't call till about 10.30. Which means that it took them almost an hour to get where they were going. If they called as soon as they got there. Oh, wouldn't you? Now, if you wanted to keep Mrs. Rowland from getting anxious and going to the police about her husband, wouldn't you call as soon as you could? Yes, I suppose so, Bill. But I, I still don't know what you're driving at. Well, figure it out, Pam. The call was local. The driving time was at least a, a half hour or more. Uh-huh. And with a kidnapped man in the car, they wouldn't dare risk going over any big bridges. Well, this is, so what does that mean? That their hideout is probably in the Van Cortland area or, or Upper Manhattan. That sounds like a good lead, Bill. Well, it's only a hunch right now, but bright and early tomorrow, my men are going to check every public phone booth from Dykeman Street up. What are you doing, Nick? Why don't you turn the light off and let the old man get some sleep? He'll get sleep when the ransom door is in. And so will we. Well, what are you fiddling with those bandages for? You taking off the adhesive tape? I'm not taking anything off. I just want to make sure he can breathe underneath the gag. You all right, Grandpa? I'll take this thing off. Sure, he's okay. Well, he don't look so good, Beanie. Maybe that thing's choking him. Oh, quit babying him, will you? You shut up. You want this old guy to croak on us? Okay, okay. I'll take it off for a while and give you a whiff of fresh air. There. You better pop. Yes. Yes, thank you. Maybe we ought to give him a drink of water. Oh, for crying out loud. Ah, look, why me? Huh? Why me? Why did you have to pick an old man like me? I I'm sick. I've worked hard all my life, and now that I've got enough money to live on for a few years, you're going to take it away from me. Oh, listen to him. I just want a little place where we can take it easy for a while and have a little fun until we die. All right, Pop, that's enough talking. We've sold everything we own. He said that was enough talking, No, I've Pop. got to tell you, because I, I don't care what happens to me anymore. If you take that money, there won't be anything left. Are you going to shut up? No, I'm going to fight you. Even if you kill me, I'm going to fight you every way I know. Baby. You had it coming to him. Now maybe he won't talk so much. 
Darling, I wish you'd tell me what you expect to gain by all this snooping around. We've been in every diner, bar room, stationery store, and soda fountain. Now, now, don't be discouraged, dear. We've got to cover all the public phone booths in this uptown area. Why? Bill Wagon has 30 policemen out doing this job. Well, it won't hurt to have 32. Oh, don't you see, darling? There's so much territory to be covered, and there's so little time to do it in. If anything should happen to Mr. Rowland, I'd never forgive myself. Okay, I... let's try the next one. Only if we keep going into all these bars, pretty soon I'm going to have to have a drink. Well, not in this one, dear. It doesn't look sanitary. Pam, he heard you. Cleanest bar in the town, lady. Oh, wow. I wash every one of these glasses with my lily white hands. Well, uh, we, we didn't I'm mean to... I'm not kidding you, mister. I'm a bug on killing germs. I got disinfectant all over the place. Yes, I, I smell it. It smells good, don't it? Nice and clean. I put it in the mop water all the time. Believe you me, this place, this place here, gets a good going over. Well, uh... As soon as I close up at night, I chuck all them bums out of here. I wipe off the tables with ammonia, sprinkle cockroach powder in all the corners. Mm. You, you'd be surprised at all the dirt and filth that accumulates in just one day. And if you don't do nothing about it, well, you get mice. Oh. Now, uh, what do you have to drink? Uh, we don't care for anything to drink, thank you. We're looking for some information. About a phone call that might have been made from here about uh, 10.30 last night. Do you happen to remember if anybody walked in here and used your phone about that time? A, a man with a slight accent. A, a Greek or, or Italian. Gosh, you, you got me, lady. Uh, at uh, at 10.30 last night, we was all watching the fights on television. Oh. Wait a second. Uh, was this bird a short, stocky guy with black hair? Oh, we don't know what he looks like. We just know that he speaks with an accent. Well, now that you mention it, I, I think this guy did talk kind of funny, and he, uh, he, he acted kind of funny too, like, um, like he didn't want nobody to see him, you know? No kidding. Do you yeah. know where we can find him? No, no, I don't even know what his name is. Hey, wait a minute. What's the matter? That guy looking in the door. You see him? He's the one I was just telling you about. The one who made the phone call. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Richard, you've got to find out who it is. Oh, excuse me. I, I didn't mean to bump into you. That's okay. You looking for someone, mister? No. Are you? Well, not exactly. Hey, where are you going? What business is it of yours? Uh, well, uh, we're strangers around here. We thought you... Sorry, lady. I'm in a hurry. Oh, wait a minute. Take your hands off me, bud, or you won't have any. Well, you don't have to get tough. Don't I? I don't like your looks, mister. Now beat it and beat it fast, or you'll wind up with a slug in you. <laughs> Nick should have been back by now. It don't take this long to walk down the block and put in a phone call. What's he telling that old lady? How we want the ransom, I guess, and when to have it ready. Even so, it don't take no 40 oh, minutes. Oh, sit down, will you, Beanie? You're wearing out the floor again. What else is there to do? Want me to play nursemaid, old man Roller? You might go in there and see if he's okay. It was a pretty hard sock you gave him last night. Ah, he got over it. Yeah, he got over it. You didn't. You're just as jumpy as you ever were. Oh, well, you can that stuff. The old man had nothing to do with it. I'm, I'm jumpy on account of you. What did I do? What do you always do? Sitting there with that tight dress on, blowing smoke rings in my face. I'll, I'll jump right out of my skin if you don't put your arms around me. Don't, honey. Nick will be back in a minute. Oh, you're a great one. You say you're nuts about me when we're alone. You say I make love to you like nobody in the world, but you still won't run out on him. We need him, be For what? We'll net at least 15 Gs from this hall, and with that kind of roll, we can go anywhere we want, baby. Just the two of us, we could burn up the whole world. Oh, honey, if you get me stuck. Oh, don't push me away, sweetie. You know you've got a yen for me. And you know you're going away with me, too. Just as soon as we finish this job. Hmm. Baby, if you just wouldn't lose your head all the time. Don't worry, Flo. I'll take care of you good. <laughs> uh -oh. What took you so long, Nick? I thought you were coming right back. I couldn't. I ran into trouble. What kind of trouble? With the old lady? No, I didn't call the old lady. Didn't get a chance to... What are you talking about? The job. The whole job. It's no good. Somebody's on to us. Are you kidding? Sure. I'm laughing my head off. Now, get ready. Pack up some of your stuff, Flo. We're all pulling out wait of here. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. What's going on here? Try to make a phone call on Dykeman Street. You'll find out. Cops? All over the place. 
Ask it a million questions, too, in every bar room, drugstore, and soda fountain. I almost got picked up. That don't mean nothing. Don't be a chump, kid. They're too close for comfort. We're getting out of here. What about the old man? Leave him. Let him go back to his wife. I don't care where he goes as long as we get away. Nick, you're crazy. This job is practically in the bag. All we got to do is set up... Stop a... arguing, will you? We got to beat it, I tell you. And lose all the dough we could get from the old lady? You'll lose a lot more if we don't get a move on. Dough ain't important to us right now. No, huh? Well, it is to me. It's the most important thing there is, and I'm going to get it, too. You'll get it in the neck if you don't do like I tell you. Put your head on and go on down and get the car. I ain't leaving the old man. Okay, then, stay. Come on, Flo, you ready? She ain't going, Nick. Huh? She ain't going. She's staying with me. What did you say? Ask her. What's this all about, Flo? What do you mean you're staying with him? Well, I didn't want to tell you this way, Nick. But if you're walking out on the job, maybe Beanie and me can swing it ourselves. I'm not talking about the job, Flo. I'm talking about us. Well... Four and a half years, Flo. Four and a half years, and you'd split up with me on account Nick. of... Get away from me, you lousy Take lousy it easy, lousy. Nick. Yeah, I'll take it easy, all right. I'll take it so easy. Uh, put that gun down. It's okay, Flo. You just wanted to make it plain to me. Now I know you ain't going with me. That's him, Bill. I know it is. I'd recognize that face anywhere. Are you sure, Pam? Uh, are you sure this is the same man you bumped into at that bar uptown? Because mm -hmm. this picture was taken several years ago. It's the same man, all right. Have you got a record on him? Oh, yeah, we've got a long record. His name's Hadris, Nick Hadris, alias Joe Nicholas, alias Nick Haynes. Well, if you've got a line on him, the rest ought to be easy. We know he's in that uptown area somewhere. And if you pick him up, you can make him tell you where they're holding Mr. Rowland. That's right, Bill. All you have to do is locate Nick Hadris. Well, uh, I'm afraid that's not enough, Pam. We've located Nick already. Oh, a and he won't talk? He can't talk. By the time my men got to him, he was dead. No. Murdered? Mm-hmm. They found his body on the bank of the Harlem River. I don't know why, Lieutenant. I don't know why you can't find out where their hideout is. With all the men you've got working on this case, you'd think... Well, now, we're doing the best we can, Mrs. Rowland. I... I don't know how I can make you understand that. Bill, let me talk to her. No oh, use talking, Mrs. North. They've done something to my husband. Something must have happened to him. Otherwise, they would have called me. Almost a whole day has gone by, and they haven't even tried to reach me. Well, you did get that postcard this morning telling you how much money they wanted. And they asked you to draw it out of the bank and have it ready. I know, but that postcard was mailed last night. Mrs. Rowland, let me call the no, doctor. No, no, please, I'm all right. It's just that I keep thinking about him, if he's warm enough. They let him rest. They give him enough food. You know, there's certain things that he can't eat. Starchy things. They just don't agree with him. Well, I'm sure that they'll... Wait. Oh, no, wait a second. Don't answer that phone yet, Mrs. Rowland. I want to switch on the recording machine and flash my boys on the line downstairs. Now, yes. if that's one of the kidnappers, keep talking as long as you possibly yes, can. Yes. We may be able to trace the call. All right, you can pick up the receiver now. Hello? Mrs. Rowland? Yes? you get the money in small bills like we told you on the postcard? Yes, I... I went to the bank this afternoon. Okay, then get this straight. Follow these instructions and nothing will happen to your husband. Is he all right? You haven't heard him, have you? Listen, you are run a knife through his back if you don't get these orders right. Now, this is your last chance, lady. All right, all right. I I'll do anything you say. Okay, listen and listen careful, because I'm only going to say it once. Stick that money of yours in the shoebox and take the white plane subway out to the end of the line. And come alone, do you hear? After you get off the subway, go two blocks north and one block west. Wait there on the corner for me. I'll drive by in the car at two o'clock this morning. Now, you got it? Well, Two uh... o'clock sharp, end of the White Plains line. Two blocks north, one block west. But my husband, how do I know that he... Hello. Hello. No, it's no use, Mrs. Rowland. He's hung up. What about the call, Bill? Was there time to trace it? Uh, just a minute. I'll check with the boys on the other end of this line. Hello, Eddie. That tracer come through yet? Was there time? Oh, good for you. Have they got it, Bill? Do, do they know where the call came from? Yeah, but I'm afraid it won't do us much good. 
This call was made from Grand Central Station. Now, look, men, this is a big job, but it's got to be done to protect Mrs. Rowland. I'm staking out this entire area around where she'll be meeting the kidnappers. Now, no cars are to be stopped, but if anybody drives past this red line on the map after a quarter of two, nail him. If we don't catch him going in, we'll grab him going out. What are we going to do about the old man, Bean? He looks to me like he's getting ready to pass out. What do I care what he's getting ready to do? As long as his old lady shows up with that dough. You think she will? She better, or there won't be nothing left of him. All right, come on, kid. Time to get ready. Ready for what? It's only 12 o'clock. You don't have to meet Mrs. Rowland until 2. Well, I'm going to change the plans around a little. Just be on the safe side in case there's cops around. She's expecting me to drive up to that corner at 2 o'clock, only uh, I'm going to fool her. I'm going to have the car parked there instead, an hour ahead of time. Hey, that's a pretty smart dodge. Mm-hmm. I got another one, too. I ain't even going to be there to pick up the dough. On account of they might be expecting me. Huh? Well, if you don't pick up the dough, how are we going to get it? That's simple. You're going to get it for me. going to get soaked waiting out here in the rain just to see what's going to happen. Did Bill tell you we could stand on the side of the street? If we keep in close to the building, we can. We can't be seen from the corner. Well, I hope that kidnapper shows up early. I'd like to get this over with. So would Mrs. Rowland. Is she there yet? Yes, yeah, she's just coming up to the corner. Where's Bill? He's down the street away. If we see anything funny going on, we're to call him. Say, there is something funny. What? A parked car over there. I never knew there was a woman sitting in it. Neither did I. She must have been slumped down in the seat or or we'd have seen her. How long do you suppose she's been there? I don't know. But I'm going to find out. Pam. Hurry, Jerry. She started the motor. Hey, wait a second. Just a minute, young lady. What's the matter? Well, that's what we'd like to know. Uh, How long have you been parked here? Just a little while. I had a dizzy spell while I was driving, so I pulled over to the side to rest for a minute. Is this your car? Of course it's my car. Who are you? Why are you ask me all these questions? Because there's a police officer down there. Police and there... officer? Hey, what are you doing? Help you! Get away from that Jerry, door! Jerry! Oh, brother, she almost knocked us down. Well, oh, don't stand there, Jerry. Get Bill Wagon. Hey, Bill! Uh, that car, Bill! Go after that car! Hiya, baby. Did you get the dough? Oh, nothing. We're hot, beanie. Red hot. What are you talking about? That place up there was a trap. Cops were waiting for us. cops? How did you get through them? How do you know they didn't tell you here? I don't. I just drove as fast as I could and left the car right out front. You crazy half-wit. What's the idea of leading them to me? What the devil did you come back here for? I don't know, honey. I was scared. I wanted you to help me. How can I help you if you bring the cops? I ought to bust you in the nose. Shut up and get out of the way. What are you doing? Looking outside. Got to see if we can make a break for it. Anybody out there? I don't see anybody. Not yet. Hey, wait. Wait, two cops come around the corner. Two more up the street. I told you, you shouldn't have come back here. Well, where else could I go? What could I do? Anything, anything at all but what you did. Hold it up. Hold it up in there. They got us, Beanie. They got us for good. Not me, they ain't. I still got an ace in the hole. The old man. Roland. You heard me. Go on back in the kitchen. Bring him out here. Quick. Hold that up, I said. Hold it up or we'll break right through. Get away from that door, copper. You try to bust in here and I'll kill the old man. I'll blow his head off. I'm warning you, copper, if you want the old man to live back up from that door. Get your men out of here. Don't be crazy. I haven't got a chance. Get him out, I tell you. Get him out or I start shooting. Flo, where are you? Coming. Come. Where do you want me? I haven't you done enough already. Shut up. Yes, Mr. Rowland. Come on, copper. Quit stalling. Either you get your men out of here or I plug Rowland. Now, which is it? Make up your mind. Wait. I'll wait three seconds. One. Now, look. Two. Beanie. Three. <laughs> Mr. Rollins, okay, lady. It's Beanie that ain't so good. Good heavens, what happened? Listen, no, she shot him. Shot him again and again. I'll take that gun, young lady. Go ahead. I don't need it no more. Mr. Rollins, are you all right? Here, let me help you. No, no, no. I, I just want to get out of here. You will, Mr. Rollins. We'll all get out. 
Bill, is it all right if we take Mr. Rowland out to the car? Sure, sure. His wife must be worried sick about him. Well, we'll see you out there, Bill. Yeah. I just want to talk to this young lady for a minute before we go down to headquarters. He was no good, Copper. No good at all. Is that why you killed him? Yes, it must be. Funny thing about Beanie, he could just touch me and I'd feel like I was on fire. But he was just no good. No good at all. <laughs> We're on the front page of this morning's newspaper, Jerry. Oh, really? Does it say something about the kidnapping? Of course. Tells the whole story, dear. About the way we tracked down the first clue up in that bar room where we bumped into Nick? Well, uh, no, it, it doesn't say anything about that, dear. No? Oh, I suppose it plays up the car angle, the way we found that flow woman and tipped off the police about it. Well, uh, no, it, it doesn't say anything about that either. Well, that's funny. Let me see that paper. No, don't be disappointed, darling. After all, they had to give the police some credit. Some credit? Well, I don't see our names mentioned at all. Oh, oh we're there, darling. Huh? Where? Uh, down at the bottom. Uh, uh, see? Oh. After a harrowing experience which lasted some 32 hours, the victim, George P. Rowland, and his wife, Margaret, returned to their apartment at approximately 3 a.m. They were driven home by some neighbors across the hall. Next week, more adventure of Mr. and Mrs. North. Starring Alice Frost and Joseph Curtin. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio Service. It's another case for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction, Nick Carter, Master Detective. Tonight's curious adventure, The Flying Duck Murders, or Nick Carter and the Gold Thieves. Carter, unless you think more of a large fat fee than you do of your life, I advise you to throw up the case at once. Apparently, we don't look at this in the same light, Mr. Del Ripple. I expect danger, and I'm prepared to meet it. I suppose you know the two other detectives have come out to this wild Montana country where the flying duck mine is located trying to find the trouble. So do you know that neither of them live to tell what they found? How were they killed, Mr. Del Ripple? They went crazy, Miss Bowen. Kessler, the San Francisco man, fell over a cliff. While Riley, the man from Chicago, dropped 600 feet down the main shaft of the mine. Very interesting. I feel quite sure that Nick won't share their fate. May I inquire for whom you're acting, Mr. Carter? You may. For Mr. Cecil Trenwick, an old friend of my father's and a large shareholder in the Flying Duck Mine. He said that you'd cooperate with me in every possible way. I shall do what I can, certainly. Good. I should like you to give me a letter to the superintendent of the mine, telling him that I'm a good workman and that you promised me a job. I shall disguise myself as a miner, using the name Dave Jarvis. Very well. Uh, you said your name will be Dave Jarvis? Right. Uh, well, that'll do what you want. Give it to Mr. Nate Crosby, the mine super. He happens to be here in town this morning. Unless you change your mind and decide to return to New York. Thank you, Mr. Dalrymple. But I'm staying here until my work is finished. Good morning. Goodbye. Good morning. Wait a minute, Patsy. I wonder if Mr. Dell... Give me 431, operator. Yeah. Yes. Hello? I want to speak to Nate Crosby. Okay, I'll wait. Crosby? He's the mine superintendent. Yes, things are beginning to move already. Yes. If I open this door a crack, we'll hear better. Nate, this is Dalrymple. Frenick has done what he's been threatening to do for so long. He sent Nick Carter out here to investigate. Yes, Nick Carter. 
No one man in the world I'm afraid of. They've got to market the stuff right away. We can't wait any longer now. I give him the note. Give him the job he wants and then take care of him. Yes, if you don't, it may mean curtains for all of us. Right. So long. And that will settle your future, Mr. Nick Carter. I very much doubt that, Mr. Dalrymple. <laughs> Thanks for the attention, Mr. Dalrymple. But I intend to take care of my own future. <laughs> Oh, Mr. Dalrymple is in on the deal. He certainly is, Gubby, up to his neck. Well, at least we start off with one good hot prospect. What do we do now? Get into your miner's office. Then take this note down to this address and give it to Nate Crosby, the mine super. Now remember, your name's Dave Jarvis and Crosby's to give you a job in the mill. Okay, Nick. Then what? Well, first and foremost, keep your eyes open. Crosby will believe you're Nick Carter. So watch out for him. He'll try to put you out of the way. And don't forget, Scobby, the detectives from Chicago and Frisco both came to grief. Well, it's going to be different with the guy from New York. Now, Patsy, you wait here at the hotel where we can get in touch with you if we need you. Sure, Nick. All right, get going, Scubby. I'm going out to the mine right away. You wait, though, and ride out with Crosby. And watch out for him. Right, Nick. I'll keep one eye on him and one on the mine. <laughs> Thanks for the lift, bud. That's okay, pal. That's the super's office right there. Thanks. I'll be seeing you. Hey, you looking for someone? You the super of the Flying Duck Mine? No, I'm the assistant super. Clem Hendricks is his name. Well, my name's King. I'm writing up an article about the mines of Montana for the Miners Times of Kansas City. Any objection to me sticking around a while, looking things over? None at all, Mr. King. Just so long as you say something good about us in your article. You want me to show you around? No, thanks. I'll just drift around and see what I can pick up. Well, if anyone stops you, tell them I said it was okay. Thanks, I will. You seeing you? Now, find the boss of the day shift and get some information on how this place operates. Well, these are the most camping machines, Mr. King. They crush the ore very fine, and it is then loose through the battery boxes and carried over the plates. I see. The plates are coated with quicksilver or mercury, and the quicksilver picks up most of the gold and from the crushed ore. And this combination of quicksilver and gold we call amalgam. And you scrape this amalgam off the plates and take it to the refinery? Yes, Mr. King. The refinery separates the gold from the quicksilver and casts it into bars. Very interesting. Well, thanks very much. I'll roam along and look the rest of the place over. See you later. That's where you belong, you old hag. Down there with your fat your face in the dirt. You try to kill the man. I get you old Indian witch, and I'm going to finish the job right now. Put down that knife. I'll drop it between your ribs. You Never mind, drop fool. that knife, I said. You, ah, you're the fool. Knock me down, will you? I'll show hey, you. Ledger. Put up that gun. Uh, but, Nate, this fella... Put up the gun, I said. What are you trying to do? Well, I was trying to make Zolander behave. This fella interfered. It made me mad. Zolander, where is she? Ah, she's right. Well, I'll be darn. She must have run away while me and him was arguing. Ah. So you interfered, did you, mister? Uh, certainly I did. You're king, the newspaper man, aren't you? That's right. I'm here to... I've been looking for you. I am Crosby, mine superintendent. I'll give you just 15 minutes to get out of this camp. So you're Nate Crosby. I am, and I'm the boss here. And I say, get out. All right, Crosby. I'll get out. But I'll be back. I never leave a job unfinished. All right, pick them up. You can carry them. I know they're heavy, but they have to have a solid lead lining so we can ship bodies in them. Put them in the old powder house and shut the door when you're through. Okay, boss. Come on, fellas. Okay. All right, get it up there. That's a... oh, boy, they're heavy. That does it. Now okay. well, we're going to have to move some of these empty powder kegs to make room for all three caskets. 
Jarvis, you stay here and pile them up out of the way. The rest of you get the other caskets. Okay, boss. All right, hop to it. Hey, Scubby. Scubby. Is that you, Nick? Where are you? Behind these cakes. Start piling them up. You can talk while you work. Oh, sure, Nick. What happened, Nick? Why are you hiding in here? Crosby ordered me to get out of camp immediately. But the assistant super suggested I hide here until he get me a ride back to town. Seems he doesn't like Crosby any better than I do. What with you? Well, I got a job as crusher man on the night shift at the mill. What are these boxes you're bringing in here? Caskets. Crosby told the teamster the bodies of the two detectives who got killed were to be taken up and shipped to their friend. Right. Come the men with another box. Get it in here. All right. Well, let's get it in Okay. Nick, there were only two detectives who were killed. Who do you suppose the third box is for? For you, I imagine, Scubby. What? Remember, they think you're Nick Carter. I'm only Mr. King, newspaper reporter. Uh, well, I'll certainly see that that casket stays empty. Scubby, you know where the detectives are buried? Well, the teamster told me that Crosby knows because he and a couple of the mill hands took the bodies away. I see. Scubby, yeah. I've got an idea. When the men bring in the other casket, you go out with them. Then make some excuse to come back in here again. Okay, Nick, I'll fix it. Quiet. All right, fellas, right here. All right, that'll do it, I think. Oh, hey, boss. I must have dropped my knife inside the powder house. You mind if I get it? Do what you want, so long as you're not late for your shift at the mill. Okay, boss, I'll be there. Oh, Kerr, Nick, they've gone. No. What's your idea? First, shut the door, Scubby. Oh, sure, Nick. Now, Scubby, I want to see what's in these caskets. Here, I've got a screwdriver in my knife. Oh, so have I. Look, I'll help you. Good. Well, I'm glad they only use four screws to fasten these covers down. Makes it simpler. But why do you want to see what's inside, Nick? Got a hunch, that's all. Yeah. There, it's got it. You all ready? Yeah. All right. Let's stick her up. Give me a hand. Yeah. All right. There. Uh-huh. My hunch is right, Scubby. The caskets are not lead-lined. The extra weight is due to this scrap iron in the bottom there. Like Crosby said, they had to have lead lining so they could be kept with the bodies in them. These caskets figure in this game more than just as caskets, Scubby. Well, Crosby told the teamster to have a fresh team hitch to the large wagon for him at midnight tonight. I thought so. Scubby, he's going to take these caskets somewhere tonight. And I want to know where. Yeah, but how are you going to find out? I'm going with him. Hidden in this casket. I'll get in it and you put the lead, uh, lid back on. Oh, but Nick, you'll smother in there with the lid down. Scubby, you can put four small pieces of wood under the coffin lid before you screw it down. Oh, but Nick, I wish you would. All right, now hurry up. All right. Pretty good fit. All right. Now hurry up. Okay, Nick. Keep your head down while I put the lid on. Okay. Now we have it. Have you learned anything yet, Scubby? Well, the only place in the mill where the gold could be stolen was the room where the battery boxes and the plates are. Well, have you found out how they did it? No, not yet. I hope to learn tonight when I'm on duty in the mill. Good, Scott. You take care of that end. Now, what's this end? Yeah. Well, here's good luck to us both. I suspect we both may need it. the great Nick Carter doing tonight, Ledger? You mean Mr. Dave Jarvis? Yeah. He's doing swell. Look at him. He's taking another drink. He's been hitting the water bucket steady for the last half hour. Is the loco working? I'll say. The bees are in his bonnet already. Uh. A famous Nick Carter will go the way the other two did. <laughs> Hey, what are you fellas doing dancing around like that? <laughs> you can't fool me. There are a lot of billy goats. Oh, <laughs> 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 well, I'm thirsty. You gotta get me a drink. Keep your eye on him. If he starts fighting, lay him out with a crowbar. Uh, Don't take any chances. Okay. okay. Did you see that? He's heading for the cliffs. Just like the others. The lander's mixture hasn't failed yet. What's next, Crosby? Ledyard, 
Get my team from the stable at midnight tonight and meet me at the old powder house. Now we can put Nick Carter's name on the third casket. They're the only fresh team in the stable. We got a hard run tonight over rough country, where no truck could possibly go. All right, Sam, let them go and then climb up here with me. Here they go. Watch them. Okay. Loco is done for Carter. We can bring this business to a successful finish. Oh, oh, oh. I hope we're not going far at this rate. You mean we're going to quit? We sure are. We'll market the stuff and make a clean getaway. Ah, this is the roughest ride I've ever had. Hey, 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 market the stuff. Uh, uh, leave that to me. I'll see that each of you gets... Stop them, what? Stop them! Hold them in! Hold them in! They're running away. One of the rings is broken. Running away? I didn't count on this. They're going to smash! Jump for your lives! We got off just in time, boy. Yeah. Hey, look at that casket, Crosby. The one with the lid torn off. Huh? Oh, that's the infernal reporter I ordered to get out of camp this afternoon. What was he doing in that casket? Never mind that now. Get him while he's only half conscious. Come on, Sam. Now you get... Oh. 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 Good work, boys. That fixes Mr. Reporter. Ties hands and feet with that rope. Okay, boy. You won't fight no more for a while now. Hey, look, Super. Here's a pair of handcuffs in his pocket and a couple of guns. Hey, what kind of reporter are you? Going around with handcuffs and guns in your pocket. You'll have to draw your own conclusions, Crosby. I've drawn them already. You're here to help Nick Carter. But by this time, Carter's where neither you nor anyone else is going to help him. He's loco. Plum loco. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you never can be sure about Carter, Crosby. I can this time. And I can be sure of you, too. All right, put him back in the casket, boys. Put the cover on. Nail it down if you can't find the screws. Here, here's some nails. Come on, you. In you go. I got out the last time I was in here, Crosby. But you won't get out this time. Get the lid on, boys. That does it. That's, well, that's enough. He can't do anything with his hands tied. Lydiard, you and Sam get the shovels that were in the wagon and dig a nice deep hole. We'll bury our reporter friend with our blessing. <laughs> I get here. Just before sun come up, they chase crazy man through wood. Then me hear gun shoot. See you run. You come fall down by the lander. Hurt in head. So the lander hurt. Well, certainly glad you were around when I passed out. Husby, you enemy. <laughs> certainly is now. You say you were chasing a crazy man? Mm. Him drink local. 
Like two other men come before. I wonder if that could have been Scubby. Hardly said he was loco. So, Lander, what did you want to find him for? Me want to save him life. Give medicine. Make him well. But, but, but why did you want to save him? Crosby give him loco, this man. So, Lander, he Crosby. One save man. Crosby one kill. Zelanda, listen. I think this crazy. No, Scubby! No, cut down that knife, Scubby! No, Scubby, no! Give me that knife! Give it to me! There! No! No! I hate to do this to you, but I have to bring him this way, so... No! No! Scubby, no! Quick, Zelanda. Get me some rope. I'll tie his hands and feet while he's unconscious. Ah, poor Scubby. Looks as if he'd been through the war. Oh. Here, rope. You tie it. Thanks. Now. Make it medicine. Make them all better from local. That's Scubby. That should hold you now. Here, you come with. You come drink. Thanks. All right, Scubby, old boy. Come on, I'll drink it. Come on, drink it. Come on, drink it. Come on, drink it. Come on, there you are. Come on, that. Now, you sleep a little while. Be all right when him wake up. Poor guy. I'm not on tie your arms anyway. Take this coat off you, and you'll be more comfortable. <laughs> hey, what this? One coil of wire with a lot of metal discs attached. That's, what? That's the answer. Of course. The mystery of the flying duck mine is a mystery no longer. <laughs> Scubby, oh. feeling better now that you've had some sleep? Yeah, I feel pretty good. Why? You don't remember what happened to you yesterday morning? Well, the last thing I recall is going to the water bucket and taking a long drink. Seems as if the more I drank, the more I wanted. Well, that water bucket was loaded with local weed juice. What? Surprised you didn't notice it. Oh, I'm surprised at myself now. But both the amalgamators, even Crosby himself, kept drinking. Or pretending to from that same bucket. Well, they certainly had me fooled. Hey, look, Scubby. You remember seeing these discs strung on this coil of wire? Oh, well, yeah. Yeah, I recall seeing one of the amalgamators have it last night. Why, did I bring it here? You did. And it breaks the case wide open. Well, good for me, even if I don't didn't know it. Hey, tell me, Nick, what are those discs used for? Here, I'll show you. Yeah. Now watch. Now you see? This stuff I'm scraping off is amalgam. A mixture of quicksilver and gold. The men who worked in the battery boxes in the mill, the amalgamators, hung these discs and a lot more like them in the battery boxes right where they'd catch the best of the gold before it flowed over the other plate. They took out over half the gold that flowed into the boxes this way. So that's where all those thousands of dollars worth of gold disappeared to. Yes, Scubby. A very clever method of stealing the gold. Now, if we could only find out what Crosby and his gang do with the amalgam after they scrape it off their discs. Hmm. You want to catch Crosby? Well, I'll say we do if we... Can... Hey, Nick, who is she? Oh, that's Zolanda. She saved my life. Oh, and yours too, incidentally. Saved my life? How? Well, that local weed juice you drank is fatal. Well, Zolanda gave you a nice antidote for it. Oh, gosh, thanks, Zolanda. She, I'm sure, much obliged. Crosby tried to kill me. Me, it's him. Zolanda know all about Crosby. You come with me. Well, where are you taking us? Mm. Crosby got cave inside mountain where he hide stuff. Come. Me show you. So this is where Crosby hides out, huh? Yeah. Too bad there's no one here now. But they've been here today. Look there, Scubby. Well, that looks like the scrap iron we took out of the casket in the old powder house before you hid in it. Right, Scubby. And this scrap iron was in the other two caskets. So they brought them up here. I wonder why. There's the answer. Over there in that corner. And the fire is burning. And it's still warm, Gubby. So we must have scared them off before we came up. Wait. Let me take the cover off this retort. There. Nick. Is that gold in there? That's just what it is. Out of the gold stolen from the mine. This is where the gang refined the amalgam they scraped off their discs. 
Much easier to handle gold this way because it weighs so much less. Now, since we know from what Dalrymple said that they never disposed of any of the stolen gold, they must have eight or nine hundred pounds of it by now. Hey, maybe they've got it hidden around here somewhere. They did have, Skelly. But not now. Well, what makes you think so, Nick? Here. Take a look outside there. They've been digging there very recently. Oh, but of course, Nick, they had to dig up the bodies of the two detectives to ship them back home. No, 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 Scubby. The way it looks to me is this. After I got away from them last night, Crosby and his men took up the casket they tried to bury me in and tried brought to all the... bury you in? Hey, you didn't tell me about well, that. i about it later, Scubby. Right now, I'm interested in what happened here. They brought the three caskets up here early this morning. Loaded them up. How could they load three of them? They only had two bodies. No, Scubby. Three caskets were loaded up. Don't you understand yet? No, Nick, I'm afraid I don't. How could they be Scubby. loading up? How good are you at riding a horse? Riding a horse? Yeah. Well, I used to ride years ago. Why? Good. Zelanda, can you get us a couple of good fast horses right away? For you, me, get two good horses quick. Good. Come on, Scubby. Let's get the horses and ride to the railroad station before the eastbound train gets in. What's all the hurry? Well, unless I'm wrong, Scubby, these three caskets are going east on the next train. We've got to get there in time to stop them. Oh, even Crosby himself would recognize us. These Indian costumes are on the leather. Well, we may need to be disguised before we get through. Hey, you didn't finish telling me how you got away from Crosby and his gang when they started to bury you alive. What did happen, Nick? Well, they dug the hole, and they put the casket down in it. I tried to pry the lid loose, but my hands were tied behind me. I worked on them, and just as they started throwing the dirt back on top of the casket, I finally got my hands free and untied my feet. Just then, I heard shooting and some female screaming. A female? Out there in the wild? Yeah. It was Zoland, I found out later. But I managed to loosen the cover and push it up enough to see that Crosby and the men were watching something across the clearing. So I seized my chance and climbed carefully out of the hole on the opposite side. I started to run, but they saw me and started shooting. Fortunately, though, they were bad shots, and I was almost free when a bullet grazed my head. It must have stunned me, because I remember nothing more until I woke up in Zolanda's hut this morning. Well, do you know what it was that distracted the men's attention? Well, Zolanda told me that you were chasing her, trying to shoot her, and she was screaming. You chased her around the other side of the clearing, and then went off after something else. It was just about then that you saw me running toward her. When Crosby saw me drop, he gave up the chase. Zolanda waited until they went back and then dragged me to her hut. Gosh, Nick. We owe a lot to Zolanda. Right, Scubby. And the best way we can pay that debt is to see that Crosby and his murdering pals end up where they belong. Behind bars. Or in the electric chair. Of course, Nick. You want the police chief to meet you at the station in ten minutes. And you want Mr. Dalrymple and the president and treasurer of the mine to meet you in the chief's office in an hour. That's right. I'll be sure you get them all. Don't worry. I'll take care of it. These are the ones, Nick. These three here on the baggage truck. Did you notice the names on them, Scubby? Yeah. Joe Briley... Phil Kessler. Oh, look. Nick Carter. Hmm. I'd rather be out here dressed as an Indian than in there dressed as a corpse. One side there, <laughs> rain in the face. We got to get these caskets into the baggage car. Oh, just the... a minute. You see this badge? Special agent. So what? What do you want me to do? Just leave these caskets in the baggage truck for now. But they're supposed to go on this... staying to... here, quiet. Hey, look here, baggage master. Get these boxes on the train and be quick about it. No be in hurry, mister. Why, you Indian meddler, what the deuce are you... You look behind you. What do you mean? Take your hat off, Scubby. Sure, Nick. There you are, Mr. Crosby. Dave Jarvis. Why, you... Don't try to start anything, Crosby. I've got my gun on you. Hey, where are you getting these boxes off? Hey, your man, officer. These three right here. Get your hands up, all of you, and pass. Hey, you can't do this. What is it? Quiet, all of you. You three men are under arrest. Charged with robbing the Flying Duck Mine and with the murder of Detectives Riley and Kessler. How 
promised to Dalrymple. I asked you and the officials of the Flying Duck Mine to meet me here in the office of the chief of police because I want to show you what's in the casket that Crosby was taking back east with him. Uh, Now, the first casket is supposed to contain the body of Phil Kessler. All right, Scabby, open it. Sure, Nick. Gold. Gold bullion. Yes, Chief. In these three caskets, you'll find the entire amount of gold stolen from the mine. Stolen by Dalrymple, the mine manager, Crosby, the mine super, and four of the workmen who worked in the amalgam room of the mill. They stole the amalgam, refined it in their own furnace, and buried it in two holes in the ground, which was supposed to be the graves of the two dead detectives. Mr. Carter, that much gold would make the caskets pretty heavy. Wouldn't that extra weight be noticed? No, Chief. Because when you ship a body by train, the casket has to be lead-lined and hermetically sealed. That means it weighs much more than the usual casket. Crosby, Ledger, and Perkins were each going to take one of the caskets east with them as a personal baggage, which would prevent anybody from examining them too closely. One of the cleverest schemes I've seen in a long time. But it wasn't clever enough, not with Nick on the job. You have to get up early in the morning to beat Nick. This was another strange experience of Nick Carter, master detective, called The Flying Duck Murders, or Nick Carter and the Gold Thieves. Pat Novak, for hire. Sure, I'm Pat Novak, for hire. That's what the sign out in front of my place says, Pat Novak, for hire. It's the easy way, because... Down here on the waterfront in San Francisco, you can't afford to wait your turn. If you're going to make a living down here, you've got to do everything you can. And you've got to be out of the hen house by sunup. Even then, it doesn't work out always. Because you get trouble tax-free. It's like leukemia. There's nothing you can do about it. There's no way to duck it. You might as well try to start a conga line in the cathedral. I found that out Monday night when I met an old friend. It was the night before elections, and I was sitting in the office scratching married women out of an old date book when Sam Tolliver showed up. I hadn't seen him for years, but it was a nice, easy meeting. What other way is there when you're good friends? You look just the same, Patsy. Yeah, it's good to see you, Sam. Sit down. Sure. Sure. Doing well, I guess, huh? Oh, you get different stories. Where have you been? Oh, all the hard luck stops. Syracuse for a while and Joliet. That's where I come from now. Yeah? That's where they got a big prison. Uh-huh. When you came too far, Sam, you should have stopped in Oakland. Huh? That's right. If you're out here to play small robbery, you better think it over. It's a tough town. All right, me, Patsy. I'm not, Sam. But once you start losing them, it's hard to win again. I just thought you might want to know about San Francisco. Thanks. Thanks, but you don't have to worry, Patsy. I got a smart streak. Uh, I'm here mostly to ask a favor. Yeah? Can you spare me one for old time's sake? Medium-sized. Go ahead. I want to borrow one of your boats. <laughs> Did you come all the way from Joliet to borrow a boat, Sam? If it's going to hurt that much, forget it. I just asked. All right. When do you need it? Tonight? It's to pick up a package in the bay about 9 o'clock. Sure, I'll run you out. No, it's, uh, it's a little different, Patsy. I, I can't make the trip. You'd have to do it for me. The favor's getting bigger, Sam. You'd have to pick up the package and bring it back here. I'll, I'll be waiting at 10 o'clock. I guess you won't buy, huh, Patsy? I'm not impressed. It'd mean a lot to me, Patsy. It really would. And you couldn't get hurt, honest. Nobody gets hurt, honest. It's the other way I'm worried about. 
Well, I wish I could tell you, Patsy, but I can't. You know how it is. Sometimes you can't, but... Well, it's that way now, but... You'd be doing me a real favor and you wouldn't get hurt. That's what Henry used to tell his wives. All right, Sam. But you put out a bad story. Well, Patsy, you have to go by the China Star. She's out in the stream. Just tell them you came for that package. They won't ask. Just tell them you want the package. Yeah. Talk to the captain. I'll be waiting here at your place about 10 o'clock. And, Patsy, it's important. Don't let anybody else have it. All right. I'll see you here at 10. Thanks, Patsy. It's a big favor. We're old friends. Yeah. We're old friends. Nothing wrong with them, huh? No, there's nothing wrong with old friends, Sam, except sometimes they wear out on you. When Sam Tolliver walked out of there, I began to worry. I don't know why, because he was always a good guy. But if you leave good silk out in the rain, it'll shrink. Well, it was too late to change my mind now. I was going to get that package and say goodbye to Sam Tolliver. Only things didn't work out that way. You start with trouble and it never stops. It's like offering to buy aspirin for a two-headed boy. About 8.30, I took a boat and I started out into the bay. Halfway out into the stream, I had to give way to a tanker. After she throbbed by, I picked up the China Star, tied up at buoy 327. It was a broken down old barge, so old I expected to find Noah hiding out in the bilges. Well, I went aboard and they took me into the captain's cabin. It was going to be tougher than Sam thought. The old man had some questions, and he was about as smooth as a bag of fingernails. Right away, I got the idea. What do you want? I came out for a package. Who are you? What good will a name do you? Who are you? What do you care, mister? This isn't our dance. Just give me the package, and I'll leave. Keep shouting, tough boy, and when you're all through, tell me your name. Now, look, I'm not out here to haunt your boat. you got the right face for it. I'm just passing through. <laughs> if you're running a small boat, you got papers. Let's see them. Yeah. You're too handy in your own cabin. Novak, huh? You a Polak, Novak? Yeah, and it feels fine. How's it being a pig these days? Don't get jumpy. I just asked. Who sent you here, Novak? I'll forget you asked. Just keep the package. I'm going home. You can walk home on the bottom, then. Now, look, Novak. Somebody steered you wrong. Maybe it was no questions once, but it's not that way anymore. Just want to keep the book straight. Who sent you? Sam Tolliver. You need a pencil? No, that's enough questions. You see, Novak, all you had to do was answer. You can have the package now or talk some more. I'll take it now. Where is it? On the desk behind you there. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> You're welcome, Novak. The captain didn't like company. When he hit me, I dropped down to the floor like a piece of hard-working lint. The last thing I remember was Sam Tolliver sending me out to this boat. I knew then I had no more business here than second trumpet in a string quartet. I could hear voices and people moving around, but it didn't help much. You can get that kind of service in a tomb. Somewhere along the line, they moved me. Because when I woke up, I was lying in a cloud of platine on a couch in a different cabin class of people that improved. She was bending over me with a cold towel and a warm look. And from where I was, she had a figure like a shot of brandy on a winter night. When she said hello, you knew that all you had to do was send up a flare and relax. Good evening. Welcome back. Yeah. How do you feel? A little used up. I need recharging. Here, put your head on my lap. Mm. There. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Forget the towel. I'll struggle along this way. By the way, whose lap is it? I'm Ellen Morrow. Where's your friend? The captain? I guess so. The brave guy, Axel Arm. He's down getting your boat ready. What's he doing? Punching holes in the bottom? He'll be back in a minute. The package will be ready and you can leave. No, you keep the package. The last time I got a headache. I'm sorry about that. It was a mistake. That's what they told Marie Antoinette. By that time, her head was 40 feet down the street. 
What's in that package? It wouldn't help if you knew. You let me work that out, huh? Work out the answer, then. How about Sam Tolliver? Slow down, Betsy. I'm not going that fast. You're going the wrong way. I'll help you lick your wounds, darling, but I'm not going to get talky. What do you got to lose? What have I got to gain except your gratitude? I can get that any night with a couple of drinks. How is he, Ellen? How does he look? Too comfortable. On your feet, Novak. <laughs> yeah. You ought to rent that out, sweetheart. I'd sign a lease myself. I'll finish this sweet talk, Novak. You get on your way. Here's the package. No, I changed my mind about the package. You keep it. Your boat's ready. Unless you want to get tossed in like a mackerel, take the package and beat it. What's in it and where does Sam Tolliver fit? You asked once already with your head in her lap. You want me to sit down? Well, you got brains after all. Yeah. Sorry, I thought they were all in your fists. <laughs> yeah, you're still smart. Take this package. Show him the boat, Ellen. I'm going to remember you, mister. Ellen's going to lead you by the hand through the dark. Stop beefing and settle for the simple pleasures. I will. I'll remember you. Concentrate on Ellen. You'll get a better memory. I went out on deck with a girl. And as I got to the starboard side, I noticed her hair for the first time. The way you're liable to suddenly notice a flower after a hard rain. Her hair was red, and as the orange lights of the bridge reflected against it, it seemed like a prairie fire, away down in the valley, flaring up quick and then burning low again. The rest of her would have made a good prairie fire, too. It was the only good thing I could think of on the way across the bay. The water was as quiet as a drowsy caterpillar, and I had a chance to think. Why had they changed their mind about giving me that package, and how wet were Sam Tolliver's feet? Well, it must have been about 11.30 when I pulled into the pier and started on the run for my office. The lights were on, and I burst right in because I had a lot to ask Sam. But it wasn't Sam. What's your hurry, mister? I came here to meet a friend. That's the guy laying in the corner. You don't have to hurry. No, this isn't my friend. He doesn't look like one. I'm Sergeant Grimes from Homicide. If you're Novak, you're in trouble. Why? A guy lying under your desk, dripping like a broken ink. Well, and you trot out a question like that? Well, it's a bum caper somewhere. I was supposed to wait for a guy named Sam Tolliver. It might as well have been a streetcar. I'm not going to press you, Novak. I don't care. I'm just going to take you downtown. Well, this boy quit too late. I've been in the bay the last two hours. You can check. I went out there to pick up a package. The one you got in your arm? Yeah. It's for a guy named Sam Tolliver. Let's see. Okay. It doesn't say that. It says Mr. John Reedy, 720 Post Street. Hmm? I wonder what that means. Let's find out. We'll take it by Reedy's place. I got it for Sam Tolliver. You can buy him another. We're going by Reedy's before we get downtown. What's the matter with you? Do you want it on an 18-foot screen? I didn't kill the guy. I don't even know him. I don't even know this John Reedy. Wait a minute, Novak. I believe you. I believe every word you're saying. Except this is one time you'd be better off lying. <laughs> When we left my office, I felt as if somebody had walked through my stomach on stilts. Oh, there were loose ends bobbing up everywhere, and you couldn't get to any of them. It was like chasing a spider with a bowling ball. With all this new stuff, I forgot about the ship. Who's going to worry about blood poisoning if he's busy having hemorrhages? I began to wonder more about Sam. Where was he? And how was I going to palm off that dead stand-in? Grimes didn't seem worried. We got into his Nash and headed for 720 Post Street. It was an apartment hotel, and Reedy lived up on the third floor. On the way in, Grimes picked up a key at the desk, and we rode up in the elevator with one of those shifty-eyed little guys who'd sell his mother if he didn't have to fatten her up. When we got to Reedy's door, Grimes took over. Open up! Maybe he can't hear you, Grimes. Nobody home. Let's go in. Why? We don't know him well enough to sneak in. I rate a hunch, Snowbank. Okay. The light's on your side. Leave it out. Let's look around. Okay. The stray bodies belong to you, Grimes. You go look in that set of bedrooms. I'll check over here in the library. Give me a yell if you see any. All right. Two of them. 
I got one by the desk. The other started down the fire escape. I'm going down in front. Take this gun and stand by the fire escape. He may get trapped and start up, so keep your eyes open. I walked into the library. The window was open and the curtains were blowing over the dead man's face. It was a good thing, because you can't split the difference with a service 45. I took him by the heels and dragged him away from the window. His eyes were rolled back as if he expected somebody to tap him on the shoulder and tell him it was all a mistake. His face was contorted and frightened, maybe a little embarrassed, like a deer caught in a traffic jam. Well, I stayed at the window about ten minutes and watched the fire escape. There was no action there, and Grimes wasn't back, so I started for the door. I had company right away. Hello, Novak. You move? Oh, Hellman. That's a big gun you got. I'll ask Junior here on the floor. He thinks it's even bigger. I'll check myself. Sure, and it's going to be easy because it's right in the family. Yeah? Yeah. Belongs to one of your boys down in Homicide. Go ahead. A sergeant by the name of Grimes steamed in here and knocked down Junior, and then he beat it down to get the other guy. Uh, I don't believe it. Well, talk to him. That's why I don't believe it. There's nobody on the force named Grimes. On this one, you're all alone, Novak. There's got to be a Grimes. The guy had on a uniform. I don't care if he had on a play suit, Novak. The guy's a phony. He's not from homicide. He's a killer. <laughs> That's what I meant, Hellman. I knew Hellman was right. If Grimes was on the level, he'd have booked me instead of coming up here. He came up to Reedy's with murder in mind. Even if they believed the story about Grimes, I was still on a spot. That made me accessory to murder. And I was going to look worse when Hellman found the guy down in my office. On that one, I had star billing. Oh, everywhere I turned, things were worse. I knew it was going to take a low-budget miracle to bail me out. It was like trying to give nose drops to a herd of elephants. Hellman seemed to like the idea. Hellman rolled the guy, and there was no identification. But he never works for nothing. Yeah, a few bucks in the guy, I'll put it in the safe. The only safe you got has suspenders on it. I don't like that, Novak. Oh, you'd do anything for a buck, Hellman. If you got the right bid, you'd sell the tomb of the unknown soldier. <laughs> Thanks, Hellman. I'm getting a big list tonight. I can do all of that I want, Novak. Because you're in the corner pocket now. I got a tip off from the Chronicle to come up here and I find you holding last rites. You got a bigger headache, Hellman. There's another stiff down at my place. Huh? That's right, Grimes again. He was sitting there when I walked in. Where were you? Out in the bay, picking up a package. It's right there on the desk. What's in it? I don't know. It was for a friend of mine named Sam Tolliver. He's disappeared and Grimes brought the package up here. Uh, I'll take it downtown. You better tag by the China Star. That's where I picked up the package. It's out in the bay, so you'll need a boat. Even a guy with your complex needs a boat. I'll touch all the bases, Novak. You just stay ten cents away from headquarters. You can pay your own way into the can. Yeah, well, that's what'll happen if I wait for you. I'll be standing out in the downpour. That's right, Novak. If there's a chance I want to see you, get first prize. Yeah, well, I'm going to be stuck unless I shop around myself because you got locked jaw of the brain, Hellman. Yeah? That wouldn't hurt you so much, but if it spreads, you're going to be in trouble. That's what I'm waiting for. <laughs> If something didn't happen soon, I was going to be about as embarrassed as a hostess with leaky plumbing. I was counting on Hellman to shake down the skipper of the China Star. If that didn't work, I could close shop. I didn't have any leads. There wasn't anything I could do but sit on my hands. It was like taking your niece to a nightclub. I had to stumble around until something showed. So I looked up the only honest guy I know. An ex-doctor and a boozer by the name of Jocko Madigan. Oh, he was all right until he found out sometimes you can feel as bad the next morning without a hangover. I toured the town and finally found him at Lupo's trying to put the vineyards out of business. Ah, Patsy, you're just in time to start the day off right. Mama Lupo, some wine for Mr. Novak. You can only have a quart. We're running low. Look, it's almost midnight, Jocko. I got to talk to you. We're not going to turn into pumpkins. You need some wine. No, I don't. Patsy, when you die, the artwork is going to be simple. On your grave, they'll chisel a picture of a pair of slacks, a hamburger, and a double malt. All right, Jocko. The final symbols of a decayed civilization, because that's as close as you ever got to civilization. A remote connection at best. Like a bookie, they love horses, but they die on a stock farm. It's the same with you and civilization. You all through, Jocko? Uh, I won't fight against your sober babble. What's the matter? There's a dead guy down in my office. A uh, friend of ours? No, 
Oh, that's too bad. We'll miss the wait. I'm going to get half hung by homicide. The other half is dead up in a Post Street apartment. Hellman thinks I'm the boy. Hatchy, I wish you wouldn't hang around me when you've just killed somebody. You tarnish my declining years. I went out to the bay to pick up a package. When I got back to my place, instead of a friend named Sam Tolliver, there was a dead guy there and a phony cop called Grimes. How do you make the distinction? He grabbed the package and we took it up to Post Street. After a quick hassle in the dark, I'm standing over a dead guy in John Reedy's apartment. John Reedy? Yeah. Do you know him? Most people do. He's running for office tomorrow. Is he the dead man? No, I don't think so. What about Reedy? He's running for a board job. Yeah? Would anybody have a reason to work a plan on him? Maybe. What's he like? Oh, a sort of liberal by marriage. Hmm? A reactionary with a rich wife. Supposed to be a good man. How about the opposition? Oh, a lot of them are running. Uh, one is Simpson. He couldn't beat an asthmatic turtle across a tennis court. Well, we're getting somewhere, at least. If Reedy's good, the gambling dough would frame him to lose. Yes, if politicians can ever lose. A murder in his apartment would look too phony, though. Yeah, but maybe that package wouldn't. Jocko, you got to help me. I want you to check on the registration of the China Star and then nose around to find out what you can about tomorrow's election, will you? If we lived in a monarchy, this wouldn't happen. That fast double play has got something to do with this election. Now, hurry up, Jocko, and when you're through, tag by my place. I'll call you there. Have you a bottle in the house? There's a tap in the kitchen. That'll have to do. No, thanks. Outside of a child in pain, the most pathetic sound in the world is running water. Good night, lover. I left Jocko and ducked into a phone booth. When I called Hellman, he poured out news like a rotary press. They broke open that package down at headquarters. It was full of dope. Plain garden variety. The kind of man uses to forget either his wife or secretary. I was sure then the package was a plant on Reedy. Hellman didn't see it that way. He said the two dead men were Gunsel's, last address before San Francisco State Prison at Joliet. I needled him about that phony cop Grimes. Hellman said they just got a tip off by telephone. Grimes was an ex-sergeant in homicide whose real name was Vic Rothery. I asked him who phoned in the tip off and Hellman said he didn't know the guy. His name was Sam Tolliver. I got out of the Chronicle morgue and looked up everything I could on John Reedy. All politicians' children sit on the floor. There was a picture of Reedy there with his family grouped around him on the floor. I pulled the clips on Vic Rothery. It was Grimes, all right. Well, that gave me something to work on, so I went on the prowl for Ellen Morrow. I found her running a dice game in a little after hours joint on Eddy Street. You want chips, Novak? You don't want to play against yourself? Yeah, give me some. All right. See how good you are. Okay. Eight's your point. Yeah. You seen Sam Tolliver? Make your point, Patsy. That's it. Where's Sam Tolliver? Five. You're not even warm. You're not warm on Sam, either. He left me hanging with a murder rap. Your friend double-crossed you. He double-crossed you, too. Another five. You're in a rut, Patsy. He turned in Grimes. That's right, baby. They know he's Vic Rothery now. You still like Sam Tolliver? No. Keep rolling, darling. Is Grimes your boyfriend? He used to be. I'm sentimental. Where's Sam Tolliver? The Herrick Hotel. When you see him, tell him I sent you. I will if we talk that long. There it is. Eight. That's right. I guess I lose, Patsy. I guess you do. Be seeing you, baby. changed when I left. The first time out, she was alive and breezy like the main coast in July. But now she was broken up and lonely looking. And as I walked out, I thought of an old Dixie cup somebody had used up and thrown in the alley. Well, I got down to the Herrick Hotel, but Sam Tolliver wasn't there. Maybe it was better that way. I left a note for him, a short note that even a Mongolian idiot couldn't trip up on. If Sam was going to show his hand, he had to do it soon. When I got back to my apartment, Jocko was already there. He was giving a concert for the mice. Oh, she pushed a baby carriage, she pushed a baby carriage in the merry, merry month of May. All right, Jocko. She pushed a baby carriage, she pushed a baby carriage, she pushed it for a Williams man who's far, far away. Oh, stop it, will you? Patsy, I wish you'd get rid of that radio and buy a good harpsichord. What'd you find out, Jocko? Nothing from the China Star. She weighed anchor and went to sea at a quarter to twelve. How about Reedy? Well, there's heavy gambling money against him. 
And there's talk about a last-minute scandal. All the newspapers had tip-offs. Where was he tonight? At a rally in the Mission District with his whole family. Well, that'd leave time for a plant. They broke open that package. It was full of dope. Oh, that makes sense. He was once under treatment for malaria. The drugs found in his apartment would make it look bad. Yeah, I'll get it. Hello, Novak talking. I hope so, because you got a lot to do. What's on your mind, Hellman? A girl named Ellen Morrow. Who killed her? Did they? About 20 minutes ago. Vic Rothery's picture was all over the place. Yeah, they were chums. You better pick up Sam Tolliver. He's at the Herrick Hotel. I'd rather have Vic Rothery. Haven't you picked him up yet? No, we're on our way out. Well, you better hurry, Hellman. There won't be any voters left. I thought Sam Tolliver was a friend of yours. Well, that's the trouble with close friends. You give them the shirt off your back so they can see where to put in the knife. <laughs> After Hellman's call, I knew we were coming up for the last hand. I met him, and we rode down to Vic Rothery's hotel. It was early morning, just about the time dawn is too sleepy to get out of bed. In the pale light, Geary Street looked like a shabby old lady with a snootful, and Rothery's hotel was worse. Hellman flashed a badge on the night clerk, who reached over and handed us a key. It was a funny thing to notice then. But the guy's hands were short, and his fingers were peeled and stained yellow as if they'd been dipped in weak acid. Well, we rode up to Rothery's room. As we got out of the elevator and turned the corner, somebody ducked into Rothery's room. That was enough for Hellman. He started down the hall. Open up in there! Well, you got another customer, Hellman. Open up! Come on in. You're going to wake everybody up. Hello, Sam. Come on in. Don't mind the gun. It's loaded. You're a handy cop, Hellman. That's it. I'll close the door. All right, over near the window. Yeah. Go on. Sure. You got an answer for Rothery here? You too, copper. Over near the window. I ask you. You got an answer for Rothery here? You're looking at it, mister. You know, Patsy, I'm sorry you came. I could bounce a few off of this guy with no pain at all, but it's going to hurt on you. Don't kid me, Sam. I don't know why you came, Patsy. You could have left me alone. I didn't mean to put you in for this. Things went wrong and you were in, that's all, but I didn't mean to do it, Patsy. Give the man your gun. You were a good guy to me, Novak. I'm sorry you drew the deuce. I'm really sorry because, well, you were a good guy to me. Well, I'm not anymore, Sam. You got five feet to make up your mind. I got it made up, Patsy. Now stay back. Let me try it out on him first. You've had practice. Stay back, Patsy. I'm in a hole and I'll burn my way out. You know that. Patsy, I'm in a hole. I gotta get out. Don't kid me, Sam. I was your last friend. All you got now is the road. Stay back, Patsy, please. Patsy, stay back. I'll let that, Sam. Uh, I must have prayed wrong, Novak. Yeah. Sorry, Sam. I'm a tough loser. Yeah. You were right, Patsy. It's a bum down for a small robber. For a while, you looked big. Not for long, though. No. You're a small-time bum, Sam, and you're better off dead. I, I wouldn't argue. I'm sorry, though. I doubt it. I guess that's right. I... I didn't try very hard. How's your friend, Novak? Let's go. The friendship's over. Hellman finally pieced it all together. He got that skipper back and put him under the lights. The story was damp, but it fit together. They were all in on a deal to railroad John Reedy. Vic Rothery headed up a bunch to plant the dope in his apartment. But Sam Tolliver got anxious and decided to get the stuff for sale. He talked a couple of buddies into it and sent me out to the ship to pick it up. The captain smelled a switch and knocked me out long enough to get word to Rothery on the beach. Rothery got the guy in my office and the other guy that Sam posted in Reedy's place in case anything went wrong. That left only Sam on the other team. Rothery wore the uniform because it was an easy way to plant the stuff in Reedy's apartment. 
But the timetable went haywire, and he got tripped up by that tip-off call to the Chronicle. That's about the way it was. Well, Hellman asked only one question. How come Sam Tolliver headed for the girl's place and then Rothery's? I don't know. Except maybe that note I left Sam. How'd I know he'd believe a lie? Oh, it worked out for everybody except John Reedy. He lost the election anyway. Jocko forgot to mention the guy was a Republican. Novak for Hire was previously released by ABC, the American Broadcasting Company, for listeners in the United States, and rebroadcast for our men and women overseas. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education. National Broadcasting Company presents Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. E A O O E E A O O E E A O O E A O E A O E A O E A O E A O E A Okay, okay, just let me get a robe on. Coming, coming. Yes. Yes. Yes, there's nothing like stepping out of a nice warm shower into a nice hot murder. The only thing in sight was the body of a man lying on his face. I didn't have to get any closer to see that he was very dead. Then I heard someone running down the front steps and out of the street, so still being the kind of guy who's always interested in seeing what a killer looks like, I went down the stairs and out into the street. I landed on the sidewalk just as the sedan pulled away from the curb and dove into a hole in the traffic. I only had time to see that there were two people in it. Didn't even get a chance at the license. Well, a white terry cloth robe can be a little conspicuous at 11 o'clock in the morning on East 51st Street, right off Madison... So I shuffled back up the stairs, put in a call for Lieutenant Walter Levinson, 5th Precinct, Homicide. But it seems as if I was a little late. A neighbor on the way to the... uh, Well, a neighbor on the way down the hall had stumbled on the dead one in front of my doorway. Now, generally, a body in front of my door would be left alone to sober up. But this one seemed to be bleeding, so just as a precaution, the neighbor had called the police. All I could do was just stand around and wait for them. 
wouldn't you know it? Finally got to be right in his own building. Yeah, Lieutenant, and she said it was right in front of his own door. That's around this corner. Uh, what'd you say the name of the woman was who turned in the alarm? Uh, Myrtle Tibbles, the apartment next to his. That's right, Otis, and she's a big snoop. Huh? I heard that. What's that? Myrtle Tibbles. Now listen, Rick. And if you've got any questions, officer... Ask me no questions, I'll tell you Oh, no... shut up. Otis, go question her. Me? Yes, you. Go ahead. I... Lady, I know everything you're going to say. And a lot more. Oh, then come in, Captain. Hey, did you hear that, Lieutenant? Get in there, Sergeant. And question the big snoo... Uh, lady. Uh, yes, sir. Snoop, eh? Well, Rick. Well, Rick. What kind of a bit is that? I suppose you're going to tell me you had nothing to do with this killing. Walt, I was in taking a shower when this gentleman decided to get himself shot in front of my door. I was singing, too. Would you like to hear what I was... No, thank... Hey, wait a minute. If you were in taking a shower, how did you know he was getting himself shot? He rang the doorbell first. Oh, sure. He wanted to let you know there was going to be a murder. Listen, Blubbermouth, I was taking a shower. I stopped taking a shower. The doorbell rang. I went to the door. I opened the door. Dead man. I ran down into the street after the killers. What about the shots? I didn't hear any. Must have used a silencer. Well, you say you ran after the killers. Was there more than one? Two. I don't know who pulled the real old trigger, but I chased two people down into the street. Did you recognize them? No, they didn't leave any calling cards. Ah, descriptions. Man and woman. Oh, now, that's helpful. License number? Too fast. Got lost in traffic. In other words, all you noticed about them was a little less than nothing. Mm. I'm surprised you didn't forget and leave your head hanging in the shower. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, now, by George, Lieutenant, that was a real dandy, that was. Oh, cut it out, Rick. Come on, let's take a look at the corpse. Well, have you forgotten? You just sent it in to question Myrtle Tibbles. Not Otis, I mean this one. You better be specific. I've known a lot of coroners to get pretty confused when Otis was covering a homicide. Mm, some kind of a messenger. Yeah, band on his cap says speed messenger service. Here's his receipt book. Only one entry, Richard Diamond, apartment E, 53 East 51st Street. Nothing else. Would you want any more? I'm honored. Now, what the devil could he have been delivering? The reason he got shot, probably. Uh, huh? Yeah, yeah Myrtle. Uh, oh, oh, Lieutenant. Yes, Sergeant. Uh, Go uh, ahead and ask him, Otis. Uh, <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, young love. Uh, Myrtle, uh, uh, Miss Tibbles wants to know if it's all right if I stay for lunch. Why, I think that would be real nice, Sergeant. How long do you think it will take? Uh, how long, Myrtle? Really? <laughs> uh, not long. Well, that's fine. But before you sit down and start feeding that fat face of yours, what would you suggest we do about this body in the hall? Well, I'll tell you, Lieutenant. Otis! Uh, uh, yeah, Lieutenant. Get out here. Uh, coming, Lieutenant. Uh, thanks anyway, Myrtle. Uh, well, where to, Lieutenant? Oh. Uh, how, how about the speed messenger service? Right. Just as soon as the coroner and the boys get here and take over. Uh, you want to come along, Rick? Well, sure, sure. The dead man was trying to deliver something to me. I'd like to know what was important enough to get him shot. Sure, let's get going. Uh, Diamond, don't you think you ought to change that robe? Uh, Walt... Yeah, I know, but what are you going to do? Oh, gee, I only made a suggestion. You don't have to get sore. Oh, we're not, Sergeant. He can wear the rope for all I care. I only... Oh, thank you, Sergeant. I don't give a darn if he looks silly. Otis. Just because I make a suggestion... Sergeant. Yeah? Will you do me a favor? Well, sure, Lieutenant. Shut up! So, while Walt tore Otis to pieces, I did a quick change. And when the coroner arrived, we climbed aboard the squad car and headed for the main office of Speed Messenger Service. While Walt was getting the address from headquarters in the car radio, Otis sneaked on the siren. So in less than ten minutes, we pulled up in front of a building at 31st and West End Avenue and barged in. You on duty here, miss? Yeah. Trouble? What makes you think there's trouble? When a cop car pulls up in front and you two jump in here like a couple of bill collectors, it figures. Trouble, see? Ah. A woman's intuition. <laughs> wonderful, simply wonderful. Tell me, dear, did your service send a messenger over to 53 East 51st Street, Apartment E? About an hour ago. Why? What was he supposed to deliver? I don't know. I don't remember that good, see? Oh, well, try. I don't get this. What's wrong anyway? Well, dearie, your messenger ain't anymore. Yeah, shot to death. <gasps> What? Mm, now try to remember what it was. Oh, that... Mr. Cartwright! Hey, hey, Mr. Cartwright. Well, let her get Cartwright, Walt. Maybe he can tell us something. Yes, now what in the oh, world? Mr. Cartwright, Johnny, he's dead. He's... Dead? 
Those are police officers, see? They said he was shot to death. No, no, just be calm. Let me get this straight. But I told you, see, it's Johnny. All right, all right. Now go in the back. Get a drink of water or something. Well, yes, sir, but I just can't believe that it's... I am Mr. Cartwright, gentlemen. Well, that's nice. Are you in charge here? I am the manager. Now, what is this about one of our messengers being dead? That's right. Have you any idea what he was delivering to 53 East 51st this morning? Well, I... Why, no, but it, it should be in our record book. You'll have to forgive Miss Ogilvy. She gets very emotional. Hmm, does she? Well, let's see the record book. Oh, it's right here. Uh, here you are. Now, let's see... Uh, uh, there, it, it was the first delivery this morning, as you can see. Fifty-three... We'd uh, like to know just what he was delivering. Oh, well, I really couldn't say. I, I don't even remember what the item looked like. Well, who sent it? Uh, uh, yes, yes, that I can help you with. Uh, here it is. Uh, last name Clark, first name Paddy. Uh, in other words, a man named Paddy Clark. No. Yes, uh, odd first name, isn't it? Mean anything to you, Rick? Oh, something. It's a little vague. Name seems familiar, that's all. How about you? I don't get a thing from it. Any return address? Uh, no, uh, just his name with instructions to deliver it to a Mr. Diamond at this address. Well, uh, don't you remember whether it was a package or a crate of bananas? Oh, dear, we what? get so many things in here to be sent out. Uh, uh, yes, Otis, what do you want? Uh, 201 over on East 48. Thought you might like to know. You better take off, Walt. 201's your department. Fine, fine. Two homicides in one morning. I'll finish checking here and go over to my office. You can get in touch with me there. Okay. Come on, Otis. Let's go. Uh, uh, Lieutenant. Yeah, yeah. You can use the siren. My, you officers certainly are busy, aren't you? Yes, we officers sure are. Now, uh, how'd you like to trot out that girl again? Maybe she's calmed down a bit. Oh, certainly. Uh, certainly. Feel any better, Mr. Ogilvy? Oh, yes, sir. Much better. Uh, this gentleman would like to ask you a few more questions. Oh, the good-looking one? Oh, sure. Uh, if you're through with me, officer, I have some... Uh, you go, go right ahead. Go on. We'll get along all right. Alone. Only beautiful. Honest, dearie, I, I can't help you a bit. I don't know nothing. Oh, sure you do. Weren't you here when this Patty Clark came in? Well, honest, I, I don't remember, but... Gee, you got the most... But uh, you do remember what the messenger was supposed to deliver, don't you? Mm-hmm. Well, what was in it, I don't. It was just a thick envelope. Why, well, could... Listen, honey, I'd Anything like Anything unusual about the envelope? I wish I could remember for you, but I really can't. We deliver so many things every day, but let's talk about something else. Gee. <clears throat> well, after all, there was no reason in the world why she should remember one particular envelope, so... Making like a good cop for Walt's sake, I scribbled down her name and address. Then headed for my office at the corner of 51st and Broadway. I stopped in the lobby for my morning supply of cigarettes and was about to step in the elevator when a big fat hunch, that's right, hunch, grabbed me by the arm and turned me back into the direction of the tobacco shop. That's the place I've been stopping at every morning for the last six years. And it was run by a little guy with a twitch in his right eye. A little twitch and a last name, Clark. And the first name, Patty. Uh, back for something else, Mr. Diamond? Yeah, yeah, Max. Uh, where's Patty? Oh, he called up the other day and says he was going out of town for a couple of days or so. Oh, is that it? I missed him the last couple of mornings. Well, you know, he got three stands to look after. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Say, hey, tell me, uh, where's Patty live? You want to see him? Mm-hmm. Got a little business deal I want to talk over with him. Oh, sure. You know Patty. Anything to make a buck. Here. Yes. Yes, this address. Uh, read it. Oh, fine, yeah. He got a phone? Yeah, yeah. It's uh, Skylar 49970. Oh. There. Thanks, Max. One of these days, I may even buy a cigar from you. <laughs> Funny how things like that can happen sometimes. The name of Paddy Clark had seemed familiar, but I couldn't place it. Only because I'd been doing business with him every day for six years and didn't think to look that close. I grabbed the elevator, went upstairs to my office, and put in a call to Mr. Clark. Uh, Patty? Who wants him? Oh, no. Rick. Hello, Walter. What's new? You know perfectly well what's new. What do you think I'm doing over here? Well, now, let me guess. Riddle homicide? You know that's why I come over here in the... Now, wait a minute. Yes, Lieutenant. How did you get this phone number? Patty Clark dead? The deadest. Now, how'd you get the number? I, uh, looked in the book. It's not in the book. It's a hall phone listed under the apartment name. I asked my Ouija board? Pow. 
Groucho. Okay, okay, Groucho. Patty Clark owns a cigar store in my building. Well, why under the sun didn't you tell me that in the first place? You said you didn't know him. I said the name was vaguely familiar. All right. How was Patty killed? Shot. Coroner's on his way. Look, I'm not far from your office. I'll be over as soon as he gets here. Mm. I'll have a candle in the window. Bye. Mm -hmm. You're the happy people. Something wrong? Oh, no, 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 no. Come in. Just filling my lighter. Okay, Agnes is alone. Hello, Mr. Diamond. Well. And in came Agnes. And this was the type of girl easily recognized. About five feet five with more curves than the World Series. And the one thing that really set her apart from the rest, a great big 38, complete with silencer. Her boyfriend took out a cute little forty-five and leaned against the door while Aggie swayed over to my desk like a mull cobra. All right, Diamond. Let's have the envelope. Honey, honey, could you point that thing the other way? My skin is beginning to crawl out of my shirt. I want the envelope, Diamond. And if you refuse to give it to me, I really wouldn't mind killing you. You know, I, I think I'd like to give it to you if I, if I knew what you were talking about. I hope we're not going to have to play games, Diamond. Well, uh, something like post office might not be so bad. I, I... Drill him, Aggie, and we'll search the place. He's got to have it somewhere. I'll handle this. I want the white envelope Patty Clark sent you this morning. And I thought you too got it after you killed the messenger boy. Now, I don't know what you're talking about. Seems to me I chased you into the street. Saw you climb into a car and take off. The guy in the white robe. So if you two knocked off the messenger boy, you must know I don't have the envelope. Too bad, but I didn't, didn't even get to the door until after you'd shot him. We didn't shoot the messenger. What was in the envelope? You know what was in it. Go on, Aggie. Show him we ain't kidding. Oh, shut up. We didn't shoot the messenger, Diamond. But we are going to get the envelope. Where is it? Hey, that siren's pulling up out in front. Uh, why didn't you search the messenger? You had a gun. You didn't have to worry about me if I showed at the door. Well, we got an envelope off him, all right. Empty. Hey, what are you doing, Paul? Taking a look out in the street. Hey. Police. Call car. Two guys coming in this building. Some of your friends, Diamond. You say the envelope was empty? What if they are some of his friends? What if they found Patty? I told you to shut up. Why'd you kill Patty? You knew he'd already sent the envelope. Knock him off, Agnes. Quiet. Hey, somebody getting out of the elevator. You keep your face shut, Diamond. Paul, get over behind the door. What are you going to do? Diamond, you stay right there at the desk. Say one wrong thing and you and a couple of more get dead. My, my. Hello, Rick. I got over here just... Good night, Lieutenant. Good night. Good night. Oh, what you mean is good afternoon. Ooh. Believe me, Walt, I meant good night. <laughs> NBC is bringing you Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Yes, dear sweet little Agnes had slipped out from behind the door and let Walt have it right behind the ear. He went down like a 16-pound shot in an elevator shaft. Then Aggie and her playmates started backing off. They opened the door and Aggie, darling, pointed the business end of the silencer about halfway up my hand-painted tie. Whether or not she would have shot is anybody's guess. But along about that time, a very dear old friend stepped up behind her. Drop it, lady. The other cop. You can drop yours too, Sonny. Oh, Otis, bless your little pointed head. You fool. Why didn't you look first? Oh, well, I forgot. Forgot? Okay, over against the wall. Keep your hands up high. Hey, how's the lieutenant? Oh, uh, oh, he'll come around. Walt. Mm. Oh, Walty. Mm. Which one let him have it? Agnes. The dame? The other one's named Paul. Come on, Walt. Oh. oh, come on, Walt. It's spring again. You know, birds and bees and all that sort of rot. Ah, that's a good boy. Now, now try and sit up. Oh, my head. What happened? What happened? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Walt, you've been crowned queen of the 5th precinct. Who did it? No, no, no. Don't look at Otis. He's been reading his Tom Swift, Rived in the Nick. Look, there. Huh? Them? Them. And Otis saved the day. What did he do? Wander in without his collar and scare them to death? Agnes, uh, he, uh, she's the one with the sweater. Agnes crowned you. Look, uh, where did these two figure, huh? Oh, there the pair ran out of the building after the messenger was killed. Put the cuffs on the motors. Yes, sir. Okay, you put out your right and you put out your left. And I'll be in Sing Sing before you. And I'll be in... Th to get him. Now bring him over here. Go on, ladies. 
Okay. Keep your hands to yourself. Here's the artillery, Lieutenant. 38 Special with a silencer. This 45 auto. Mm, silencer? That's enough to book him in itself. All right. You kill the messenger? No. How about Patty Clark? We don't know who you mean. They know. That's your story. Well, we'll take him down and book him. Happy now, Rick? No. I want to know who has the envelope and what sent it. Envelope? Yeah. The girl at the messenger service finally remembered. Come on, let's take these two down to headquarters. <laughs> Still not talking. Did you find anything in the files? Uh, both have records. Guy's Paul Barrows, Agnes is his wife. One conviction apiece, May 1938, suspicion of passing counterfeit money. Uh-huh. Convicted, did time, parole. Oh, you got a fresh address on them? They've been living in Flatbush. Otis went over with some of the boys to check. Good. And here's some fancy news. Just yesterday, the FBI started watching all of Patty's cigar stores as possible fences for phony money. Yeah? Well, then it ties. Come on, I want to take a look at Patty Clark's room. There, beside a couple of bags he'd packed for the trip. Oh? Four slugs in the chest, no struggle. Anybody in the building hear the shots? No, and the 38 your little girlfriend had wore a silencer, remember? Hmm. When did the coroner say Patty was shot? About six this morning. What's that? Oh, a little address book. Patty must have used the speed messenger service more than once. Look, see here? Hmm? Here's the address and phone number. Hmm. Now, Walt, let's go over and take a look at Agnes and Paul Barra's place in Flatbush. See what Otis has found out. Oh, oh, hi, Lieutenant. Hello, Detective. Well, thanks, Otis. You drop your watch? Turn up anything? Uh, no, nothing much. What do you mean by nothing much? Well, nothing. That's what I was afraid of. Hey, is there an address book around here anywhere? Over by the phone. Why? Just getting my jollies, Otis. Love to look at new numbers. Now, see if Speed Messenger Service is listed. Yeah? Hmm. Yeah, right here on the back page. Well, Yeah? Patty was killed at six this morning, huh? Right. Six this morning. You know, I wonder when he gave the Messenger Service that envelope. You know, the one addressed to me? Well, the place wouldn't have been open at six this morning, so it must have been sometime yesterday. That's right. And back in his room, his bags were all packed. Well, I think he wanted to make sure he'd be out of town before I got that envelope. I'm way ahead of... Hello, Henderson? Levinson. Plan any plane or train reservations for Patty Clark? Well, if you didn't, I'll show you where I keep that bottle of lighter yes. fluid in my office. Uh, does that include me too, right. Diamond? There's only one bottle, Otis. Rick, Patty had tickets for a plane to California and then a boat to the Philippines. Well, I'll lay you even money that Agnes and that Paul character didn't knock off the messenger or Patty Clark. What? All they wanted was that envelope. Envelope? Envelope? That's why they came after me, and Patty didn't have it. No? Then who has? Otis, stop sneaking up. Now, Rick, what about the counterfeiting angle? Otis, uh, Otis, go over and check on the speed messenger service. Mm. See if anybody could have pilfered that envelope and put another in its place or something. And be sure to call me. Why don't we do that? On account of we're going back to the precinct and talk to Agnes Barrows. got them waiting outside. Good. And here's something you like. Ballistic says the 38 your Aggie was carrying is not the gun that killed Patty Clark or the messenger. Swell. Okay, show them in. Hello, Aggie, darling. I'm sorry I didn't shoot a hole in your head. <laughs> Isn't she a doll? What do you want out of us? We ain't got nothing to say. Uh, we'll see, we'll see. Now, we know that Patty Clark was fencing counterfeit money for you two. Now, ain't that peachy. Mm-hmm. I, uh, Walt, get the phone. Yeah. Hello? Uh, Lieutenant, I'm down to Speed Messenger Service. Well, congratulations, Otis. We thought you'd get lost. Walt, let me talk to him. Sure. Otis? Yeah? Mr. Cartwright there where I can talk to him? He's right here. He isn't? Yeah. I mean, no. I mean, he's right here. Well, if Cartwright isn't there, put the girl on. Cartwright is here. He's standing right next to me. She isn't? She? No, he. Cartwright's a he. Can't you get anything straight? They've skipped? Huh? Whole place cleaned out? No, there's plenty of people... Oh, now, wait a Hold minute. Hold the phone a second. Uh, They've skipped, Walt. I'll pull out a general. Said, said, skipped? Why, Cartwright, those dirty... Oh, shut up. Didn't you hear it? Didn't you hear what he said? They skipped. How do you know? You're gonna take his word? 
Anderson, put out a general on Cartwright and his girlfriend. That dirty, no good, double crossing Cartwright. Look, kiddies, that guy's framed you two from the very first. Why don't you talk? The state will make it easier for you. Agnes? I don't know. I don't know. Sure, tell him. We've been getting the run around ever since he got Hello? us in this deal. Hello? Okay. Okay. Hey. Hold it, Otis. But, uh. I said hold it. Go on, Agnes. Well, I. I don't know whether Cartwright killed him or not, but. But Paul and me sure didn't. What about that envelope the Patty Clark sent to me? What was in it? Counterfeit dough. Some of the stuff we made with Cartwright. Why send it to me? Oh, because Patty got sore at Cartwright and wanted to blow the racket wide open. He was crazy to send it through the speed messenger service. Sure he was. Yeah, I think I get it now. When Cartwright found it out, he killed the messenger and had you two there just to make it look like you'd done it. Sure, the lousy... Uh, Otis. Hey, listen, how long can a guy hold Otis, for? Otis, Otis, Otis. You want to be a hero? Huh? How close is Cartwright standing to you at this minute? Uh, you... he's about a foot away. Well, just reach out oh. and slap the cuffs on him. Really? Yeah, and something else, Otis. What? You may use the siren all the way home. <laughs> It's nice to have you here with your face in one piece. Yeah. Lucky, ain't I? <laughs> That's pretty. Why don't you sing it? Well, I... Oh, no. Mm, let me get it. It's got to be Walt. Yeah? Rick, I just wanted to let you know that Cartwright was behind the whole setup. Printed the stuff right down the basement of the Speed Messenger service. Rick? Uh, Harold Abernocker speaking. Owner of the largest hog ranch of South Little Rock. You don't say. Sure, Dad. What's the matter? You need an ear horn or something? Rick, so help me if you don't stop this. Her name's Harold, bud. Harold. That's that. That's my name. Now, you just hang on and let you mash your molars with a missus. I don't want to mash my molars with a missus. I want to talk She talks to you. louder than I do. Used to call hogs herself, you know. Lula Bell? Lula Bell. Howdy. <laughs> Having trouble with your hearing, huh? Now, Helen, listen. Calling me, Harold? No, no, friend. My name's Lulu Bell. Maybe you got the same trouble like my Uncle Zeke. Used to stick a plug of tobacco in his ear overnight and always forgot it. Oh, my God. Yeah, we thought he's plumb deep till I started calling the hogs and it shook the tobacco loose. Now, you just relax and I'll unplug you. Oh, this is ridiculous. Work for Uncle Zeke. Hold on to your teeth. Sweet! Pee, pee, pee. <laughs> Find any loose tobacco? <laughs> he hung up. <laughs> Give me the phone, Good old Walt. I'll drive him out of his mind. Fifth Precinct, Lieutenant Levinson. Walt? Oh, no. Now, you listen to oh, me. Don't get loud with me, Grouchy. I just called up to find out what happened on the case. Huh? Now, look, I just told well, you... you don't want to tell me, okay, be a sorehead. I'm not going through that apple knocker routine again. What are you talking about? Lula Bell called Otis all the way in from a stake out in Flatbush. Look, I don't know what you're talking about. If you don't want to keep me in on the nose, just forget it. Gosh. What's the matter now? Maybe, maybe I did have the wrong number. What a bunch of idiots. Okay, so you had the wrong number. What about the case? Oh, uh, yeah. Well, it, it seems that Cartwright yeah, was Helen really Hollis. the one behind the whole setup. Killed Patty Clark. We've got to stay with the happy people. Have your fun, live in the land of joy. Stay with the happy people. Face the sun, life is a Christmas toy. Down through the endless ages, tears have been contagious. And take it from me, that misery is looking around for company. So stay, stay, stay with the happy people. Don't wrinkle your brow, it's strictly out of style. Just stay with the people who love to wear a smile. Helen, is Walt still talking? Wait a minute, Oscar. That really had blood on his hands. He's been cleaning yeah, up that comic for years. Well, I might as well sing another chorus. We've got to stay with the happy people. Have your fun, live in the land of joy. Stay with the happy people. Face the sun, life is a Christmas toy. Down through the endless ages, tears have been contagious. And take it from me, that misery is looking around for company. So stay, stay, stay with the happy people. Don't wrinkle your brow, it's strictly out of style. 
Just stay, stay, stay with people who love, love, love to wear a smile. We arrived at, Otis says there must have been more than 100,000 in phony bills. We got the plates and everything. You don't say. Yeah, that just about ties it up. Well, Walt, I'm sure glad to have heard all that. Oh, uh, wait a minute. Uh, someone wants to say hello to you. Oh, yeah? Oh, no. Oh, no. You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Lieutenant Levinson was played by Ed Begley. Also in the cast were Virginia Del Valle, Wilms Herbert, Lucille Meredith, Michael Ann Barrett, Carlton Young, and Frank Gerstle. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Tonight's show was written by Blake Edwards, and the entire production was under the direction of Jack Johnstone. Dick Powell currently may be seen in the motion picture version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. There's more thrill-packed listening for you throughout the week when NBC presents other great adventure mystery dramas. Nightbeat and Dangerous Assignment are two action-filled shows you'll want to make a steady date with every Monday night over most of these NBC stations. Yes, on Monday, travel the nightbeat of the Chicago Star with newsman Randy Stone. There's poignant adventure as Randy searches the city at night for an unusual and intriguing story. Also on Monday, join Brian Donlevy in Dangerous Assignment. As Steve Mitchell, soldier of fortune, Don Levy journeys to the corners of the earth in search of adventure, fortune, and fair play. Yes, now on Monday, hear two great adventure mystery programs, Night Beat and Dangerous Assignment, on NBC. This is Eddie King inviting you to be with us next Wednesday at this same time, when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. <laughs> Green Gill Theater stars Ginger Rogers tomorrow night on NBC. Time now for Rocky Jordan. Not far from the Mosque Sultan Hassan in Cairo stands the Café Tambourine, run by Rocky Jordan. The Café Tambourine, crowded with forgotten men, alive with the babble of many languages. For this is Cairo, where modern adventure and intrigue unfold against a backdrop of antiquity. Tonight's story, Everything Shipshape. There's nothing very exciting about the postman's morning visit to my cafe tambourine. The usual stack of bills, an ad for a new brand of Bola Nachi, maybe, a copy of the St. Louis Post Dispatch. But this particular mail delivery brought something else a business sized envelope bearing a Syrian stamp. The letterhead inside carried the heading Ship and Shape Enterprises, Beirut, Syria. And below, a curt message Arrive in Cairo Thursday. Please arrange appointment at your cafe, 3.45 p.m. that day. Signed, Joshua Ship. So I wasn't a bit surprised when at exactly 3.45 p.m. the following Thursday, a little man sporting a cane and wax mustache darkened the tambourine's front door. He gave the place a quick once-over, nodded his approval, and he came directly back to my office, put down his briefcase, and wiped the sweatband of his derby hat with a silk handkerchief. Mr. Rocky Jordan... Yeah, that's right. How are you, Mr. Ship? Ah, you are right, Mr. Jordan. Joshua Ship. Excellent, thank you. Wonderful air trip from Beirut. Hey, you're right on time. Never keep a man waiting. Policy. Well, now that we're off on the right foot, shall we get right down to business? Oh, it depends on what you're selling. Selling, my man, selling. I can see you don't realize the importance of my visit. I suppose we get at it. Sit down, Mr. Ship. Thank you, Mr. Jordan. Uh, one moment, please. Oh, by the way, uh, how's Mr. Shape? Shape? Of ship and shape. Oh, the letterhead, of course. Old stationery, Mr. Jordan. Unfortunately, Mr. Shape is no longer with us. Hmm. 
Carry on, Mr. Shipp. Ah, yes, of course. Now, Mr. Jordan, I represent a client, one A.K. Kessack. Kessack? I don't recognize the name. Quite true, Mr. Jordan. New in Cairo. I'm sure you will find doing business with my employer most profitable. Just what does A.K. want? Ah, now we get to the matter at hand. At A.K. Kessack's authorization, I am commissioned to buy your cafe tambourine. Who said I wanted to sell? We have discussed the matter with no one. Sorry, Mr. Ship. Just tell A.K. I like the place. Tambourine's not for sale. Top, top, my good man. You just go ahead and take a thorough inventory, your equipment, spirits, food, tangible and intangible assets, set your price, and then double it. Just like that. But we must have your answer quickly. I'll give you 24 hours to think it over, sir. 24 hours. Not a minute more? That is my deadline, sir. Ah, my address, of course. Joshua Ship. 394 Esbekia Plaza, Bungalow 6. Good day, sir. Joshua Ship hoisted his derby, thumped it with his finger, and set sail through the tambourine and out into the street. Well, I figured I'd had my kicks for the day and settled down to some paperwork in the office. It was just a few minutes later when I noticed somebody else coming through the tables toward my office. She could have been pretty, only her thin face was too tight, like a knot that needed untying, and her eyes had that wild look. I knew right then she was the kind of company I didn't want. Chris moved over from the bar. Hold on, lady, where you going? Where did he go? Where is he? Just take it easy. We don't want no trouble. Don't you touch me. Keep out of my way. Okay, Chris, I'll take over. Better watch the bar. Sure, Rocky. Guess she had one too much. I more. have not been drinking. I know what I'm doing. Where is that man? There are no customers in the office, lady. I know he came to see you. Tell me where that man is or I'll... Look, the door stays open. Now listen to me. You will listen to me. Hey, what's the idea? Put away that Don't gun. Don't you dare touch me. Now for the last time, where is he? Where did he go? It depends on who you're looking for. Joshua Ship. He's not here. What do you want with him? I'm going to kill him. Oh, get some sense, will you? And I'll kill you or anyone else who tries to stop me. I will shoot. I don't argue with hysterical women holding guns. But suppose you tell me what this is all about. I followed them all the way from Beirut. And I won't stop till I get them. You're from Beirut, too? Yes. Now, do you believe that I know what I'm doing? Maybe I do. Who are you? Ask Joshua Ship who I am. Ask him if he remembers Drina Ritar. And then tell him. Tell him I'm going to kill him. Tell him. He left here just a few minutes ago. Where did he go? I don't know. Now listen, Drina. Maybe you're no better than he is, and I don't care. But I'll tell you this, Rocky Jordan. No, stay back. Sorry, Drina. Give me that gun. Not a chance. Give it to me. Oh, please, please. Yeah, that's better. Now suppose you sit down and tell me what this is all about. Rocky, don't sell the tambourine to that man. You know a lot, don't you? What's your interest, Drina? Just... Don't sell. They'll do the same to you as they did to my husband. Your husband? All right, let's have it. What are you talking about? I... Oh, I can't. I... Jonathan, he's... What about Jonathan? He's... Oh, please. I... I can't talk. I... Getting sense out of an hysterical woman is not one of my big points, so I stopped trying. I kept her gun in my pocket, got her address, and put her in a taxi for home. But it made me want some more conversation with Joshua Ship. So I sat down and figured out a price I was sure no one in their right mind would accept. Then I went over to his place on Esbikia Plaza. It was a real nice setup. Big fountain out in front, acacia trees along the tile walk. I found Bungalow 6, and Ship answered my buzz. Well, well, Mr. Jordan, come in, come in. Thanks. Sir, I've been thinking over your proposition, Mr. Shep. Fine, my man, fine. You came even sooner than I expected. Oh, I do lots of surprising things. Well, now, if you'll name your price for the temporary... Uh, just we... a minute, Mr. Shep. I'd like to deal directly with a client. Well, uh, A.K. is very busy, you know, very busy. Too busy to swing an important deal like this? And so am I. Oh, oh no, uh, talk, talk, my man, don't be hasty. A.K. happens to be waiting in the next room. And just tell the big boss, I want to ask a few questions. Oh, yes, of course. One moment, Mr. Jordan. Joshua Shipp stepped into the next room and spoke a few words. I waited just a few seconds. Then I met A.K. Kessack. Naturally, I expected A.K. to be a man. I was never so wrong in my life. She was all woman from the tips of her lacquered fingernails to the French perfume that rocked the room and Rocky Jordan. 
She let the doorway frame her sleek figure, and I wondered if she mightn't have been the shape of the firm of Ship and Shape. Any minute, I expected a rye crisp sign to light up over her head. She looked me over like a champ looks over the contender in the first round. Rocky Jordan. Oh, this is a pleasure. Uh, unexpected pleasure, Miss Kessack. Yes, isn't it? Oh, please, sit down. Thanks. After you, lady. Now that we've met, Rocky, I'm quite sure we can do business. Yeah. We ought to get along real cosy. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, now then, my dear, shall we get on with the deal? Mr. Jordan has... Joshua, there is no hurry. But I'm sure there is, my dear, you see. By the way, Rocky, Joshua told me you were not interested in selling your cafe. Why did you change your mind? Well, a lot of reasons, maybe. Including a couple of people named Drina and Jonathan Rittar. Friends of yours? I was about to ask the same question. Well, neither here nor there. Now, Mr. Jordan, your price for the tambourine. Ten thousand pounds, cash. Well, my dear? Write him a check, Joshua. Wait a minute, I said ten thousand pounds. That's forty thousand American dollars. You add very well, Rocky. Uh, what else can you do? Uh, <clears throat> I will prepare a bill of sale. We want to take possession of the tambourine immediately. Uh, why the hurry? Oh, don't be surprised, Rocky. Your cafe is ideal for our purpose. Your price is high, but we'll make it back quickly. On the dice tables alone. Dice tables? Of course. <laughs> don't tell me you object to the tambourine being used as a gambling casino. Oh, not especially, as long as I'm out of it. Out of it, Rocky? Oh, but surely you told him, Joshua. Hey, wait a minute. Told me what? Uh, perhaps I didn't make myself clear, Mr. Jordan. A necessary part of the deal is that you uh, remain at the tambourine. We supply the money and the know-how. You supply your good name, Rocky. You mean I front for your gambling setup? <laughs> Not in your life. At a good salary, of course. Say, 100 pounds a week? No deal. Not so fast, Mr. Jordan. Refuse and you get nothing. Okay, let's keep it that way. We do not like our time wasted, Mr. Jordan. Wait, Joshua. Rocky changed his mind once. I think he will change it again. I wouldn't count on it, lady. As I said, I'm quite sure you and I can do business. Goodbye, Rocky. <laughs> She said it like she expected to see me again real soon. I walked out to the street wondering if she actually thought I was a sucker for that sort of a deal. I wondered something else. Neither Joshua Ship or Miss Kessack had batted an eye when I mentioned Drina and her husband's name. But I still wasn't sure. I couldn't go back to the tambourine till I'd satisfied my curiosity about Drina. So I dropped in on Captain Sam Sabaya at Cairo Police Headquarters to see what he knew. Jordan, uh, how do you manage to pick up such unusual friends? Uh, what have you got on her, Sam? Only what the Beirut police authorities have told me. The police? What's their interest? A dispatch from Beirut arrived this morning. They suggest that we keep an eye on her. She is a wild one. Uh, what else do they say? Jordan, what possible interest do you have in this case? Mm, just curious, Sam. Curious. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> Very well. This Drina Ritar became involved in serious trouble in Beirut. Her husband is now in prison. For what? Murder. What's the lowdown? They, they didn't go into detail. It seems that Drina and her husband Jonathan ran a cafe on the Beirut waterfront. There was some talk of gambling in connection with it. Gambling? What else? Well, there is little more. There was a fight there. A man was killed. Jonathan Ritar was convicted and sent up for several years. Who'd he kill? Well, the dispatch does not say. But be that as it may, we suspect that Drina is in Cairo to make trouble. She is being watched. Uh, well, if that's all you have, Sam, thanks. Oh, uh, Jordan, one moment. Hmm? Could it be that you are in danger from this lady? What gave you that idea? <laughs> well, Jordan, it, it is most unusual for you to be carrying a gun. That uh, bulge in your coat pocket. Oh, Oh, sure, yeah. It's, it's a gun. I've got a permit. Oh, yes, of course, of course. Please let me see it. Sure, yeah. I'll look it over. Oh. Rather light for you, Jordan. Italian make. Where'd you get it? Why, oh, Sam, 
Is this a shakedown? I, too, am a curious man, Georgia. Yeah. Needs oiling. And so does that chair of yours, Sam. How about the gun? Mm, oh, yes. Here you are. Thank you. And about this Drina, Georgia, remember, if she makes trouble, the police will take care of her. Well, Sam didn't give me much, just enough to help me decide to drop Drina, Kessack, ship, and the whole business. I had a few things to do at the tambourine, so I wandered back that way. When I got there, a side of Turkish beef stood blocking the entrance. You'll stay outside, Mr. Jordan. Move the body, mister. I warn you, I am a very mean man. I'd get tough someplace else. I am instructed to get tough right here, so don't try to go in. That's right, Tonoff. We don't want Jordan around the tambourine. Oh, Joshua Schiff. This knuckle boy working for you? Quite right. Then get him out of my doorway. Not your doorway, Jordan. What are you driving at? You just sold the tambourine to A.K. Kessack and me. You don't live here anymore. We don't want you around. Look, I told you the deal was off. Now get this overgrown camel out of my door. Stop it, Thomas. I will do. I'm very dangerous. Man! Uh, uh, now, Jordan, get it straight. The deal's closed. We dep- deposited the 10,000 pounds in your bank account, and the bill of sale is complete with your signature. Oh, a reasonable facsimile. It'll do for now. So give me a forwarding address, and I'll send you your clothes. What makes you think I'm going anywhere? I took care of that, too. Here's a bonus, Jordan. A plane ticket to Rio de Janeiro. For me? That's right. They say it's wonderful there this time of year. Supposing I like Cairo better. Cairo can get hot, Jordan. Extremely hot. You are listening to Everything Shipshape. Tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan. The Accused is coming to CBS listeners Monday night. Loretta Young, Robert Cummings, and Wendell Corey will bring this unusual psychological drama to life in all its stark reality. Don't miss the hour-long absorbing story on CBS Radio Theater at 6 Monday night. Now we return you to Cairo and tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan. Everything ship After I refused to front for a gambling setup in my cafe, a couple of characters from Beirut named A.K. Kessak and Joshua Ship got real busy. They faked a bill of sale for the tambourine, deposited a lot of money to my account in the bank, and planted a big Turk in front of my place to keep me out. To top it off, Ship handed me a plane ticket to Rio de Janeiro, told me to clear out. Ordinarily, that'd be a nice, juicy job for the police. But first, there were a few angles I wanted to handle myself. So I got moving. Not to Rio, but to see Drina, the girl who had warned me not to sell the tambourine. Sabaya had given me part of her background, but I wanted the rest from her. She had a clean room in a little hotel along the Sharia Najim. When I knocked, she cracked the door and then opened it. Oh, Rocky, come in. Who are you hiding from, Drina? The police? Oh, I know they're following me, but I'm not hiding from them. Let them wonder what I'm doing in Cairo. I'd like to know myself. I told you to kill Joshua Ship and that woman with him. Why? Didn't I explain? Well, you never got around to it. Suppose you cut out the dramatics this time and set a few things straight, huh? What are you trying to find out, Rocky? Who did your husband kill? He killed no one. Jonathan is no murderer. The root police could give you quite an argument. Get out, Rocky. Go on, sell the tambourine to whoever you like. See what happens. Oh, I'm sorry I tried to warn you. Wait, Drina. Why not give it to me your way? Oh, you wouldn't believe me. Maybe I would. Let's have it. Oh, very well. Now, Jonathan and I had a little restaurant near the Beirut waterfront. One day he was approached by this Kessock woman and her two associates, Joshua Ship and Aaron Shape. Ship and Shape. Yes. Shape was the number one man with her then. They offered my husband a large sum of money for our cafe, for a gambling setup. Jonathan was well known and liked in Beirut, so he was to front for the syndicate. Mm. <laughs> Does this all sound familiar, Rocky? Yeah. Go on, Drina. Well, a short time later, Aaron Shape was killed in our cafe, but not by my husband. Who did it? A.K. Kessick. I'm sure of it, Rocky. Only they planted it on your husband, right? Yes. Yes, both the woman and Ship testified that they saw my husband fire the gun. Well, he didn't have a chance. Why would Kessick want to get rid of her top man? He was getting a little too big. Besides, she was tired of him. You see, she always gets tired of him. After that, Joshua Ship moved in. And you're out to get them both. You think that'll help get your husband out of prison? Well, all I know is I, I've been able to think of nothing but killing them. 
Oh, now I... I don't know what to do. Look, Drina, I've got some things to settle with them, too. The best way I can check on them is to go along with the deal. But I, I told you what would happen. Uh, not if I keep ahead of them. Now, you better stay right here. I'll let you know how it's going. She put up some more argument, but she agreed to my plan when she learned how Ship had moved in on the tambourine. Sam Sabaya might have worked out my end of the deal without too much trouble, but not Drina's. So I went back for another chat with A.K. at her bungalow on Esbikia Plaza. Somebody must have expected me because the side of beef wearing a fez was right outside the door. Ah, uh, so, Mr. Jordan, you not smart and fly to Rio. Delay takeoff, Turner. Look, you're still in my way. I stay in your way. You not go in. Want to take bets on that? Uh, you find out I'm a very dangerous man. Well, we compare muscles sometime. Move over, man mountain. I not. <laughs> so now we make big fight. I get me. Turn off. Uh. Let him come in. Mr. Ship say keep this kill bow. I wish him to come in. Run along now, turn off. Im ship. Listen, AK, my dear. Do you think this is best? I have no objection to Rocky's visits, Joshua. Yeah, you're here too, Mr. Ship. That's fine. Now we can all talk. Everything is settled, Jordan. You wanted out of the organization. We left you out. Why did you come here? To return the plane ticket. Plane ticket? What is this, Joshua? Why, I, I, I didn't think it necessary to tell you, my dear. Save the cover-up, Ship. Anyhow, you got me convinced. I'm ready to team up with you. It's too late, Jordan. You had your chance. Wait, Joshua, let me decide. So now you want in, Rocky. I think you are very smart. Yeah, smart. Okay, I'll front for your racket. But get this. I'm no patsy for either of you, the way Jonathan Rattar was. Mr. Jordan, what are you talking about? Cut it, Ship. You know who killed your partner's shape just as much as I do. And it wasn't Jonathan. Just don't try setting me up the same way. Talk, talk, my man. If you are in... Joshua to... Rocky's only being frank. I like him that way. Now run along like a good boy. I have a few private things to discuss with Rocky. Now look here, my dear. I see... Don't, don't forget your gloves and cane, Joshua, and hurry along. Very well, my dear. I'll see you later, Mr. Jordan. Well, Hakey? I just thought we might drink to our new partnership. Bourbon? Straight. But easy on the knockout drops. Hmm? <laughs> Are they necessary, Rocky? I wouldn't know. Now, to you and me. Just where does your uh, ship come in? He doesn't. Not anymore. Drink, Rocky. Yeah, beats the liquor at the tambourine. We'll change that, too, won't we? Yeah. Another? No, no, save it till we have more time. Going so soon, Rocky. Yeah, a few things to clear up at the tambourine, A.K. See you later. When I got outside, just as I expected, Joshua's ship was waiting for me up by the fountain. He stood there tapping his cane on the tile walk till I was alongside. Then ship tacked to the starboard, full sail, and stood with his feet wide apart. One moment, Mr. Jordan. Well, we've got everything settled, Mr. Ship. Not a thing to worry about. There's plenty for you to worry about, my man. Oh, tut, tut, Enough, Mr. Mr. Jordan. I demand to know your intentions toward Miss Kessack. Well, we all take our turns, don't we? It was your partner's shape first, wasn't it? Before she killed him? I'm quite aware that Aaron Shape held her affections. I'm also aware that A.K. tires quickly, as she did of him. Why confide in me? Because I want you to know that I will not give her up so easily. Look, Joshua, this is all very interesting. You will keep away from her, Mr. Jordan. This is a warning. Yeah, maybe this is something for her to decide. Why not go to A.K. and talk it over? I most certainly shall. I'm going to lay down the law to her immediately. We'll have it out once and for all. Ah, good boy. And when you talk to her, be sure to take off your hat. I couldn't resist the temptation, so I reached over and thumped his derby with my finger. He grabbed for it and gave me a dirty look. It was just a little insurance to keep him in a fighting mood. Well, I did want to get back to the tambourine, but Drina's place wasn't far out of the way, so I stopped by to keep her posted. Well, Rocky. I was hoping there'd be a weak link in the setup, Drina, and I think I've found it. Oh, Joshua Ship? Yeah. He's got something in his mind besides gambling. Her name is A.K. Kessa. Yes, yes, I know. He's insanely jealous of her. Well, I'm going to go work on that. Sooner or later, he'll do something to break it up. Maybe try to get me out of the way. Well, what happens then? We'll just wait and see. So far, my plan seems to be working. 
Rocky, do you trust me? Sure, Drina. Why? Then perhaps you'd uh, let me have my gun back? Sure, you can have it. Uh, well, wait a minute. Don't you have it? It's gone. Well, the only way I could get out of my pocket was for somebody to take it out. But who, Rocky? A.K. Kessock. See you later, Drina. Where are you going, Rocky? To get your gun back. I wasn't willing to concede even the first round to A.K. Kessack, but right then it looked like she'd scored all the points. Why she had slipped the gun out of my pocket was something I wanted to find out quick. This time, no one tried to stop me at the bungalow, and the door was unlocked. Come in, Rocky. Close the door. It was A.K. Kessack waving me in with Drina's gun. Across the room, against the wall, stood Joshua Ship, beads of sweat dripping from his wax mustache. From where I stood, my little plan had backfired right in my face. I knew you'd come back, Rocky. Well, uh, don't let me interrupt an argument. Oh, you won't. We'll settle it, the argument, very shortly. Jordan, talk to her. Tell her she can't do this. Please, Jordan. Stop crying, Joshua. You better brief me, A.K. Very simple, Rocky. I'm going to kill him. No, my dear, no. Just like you killed Aaron's shape? I think I know why. I'm through with him. He's getting too big, giving me too much trouble. You see, I don't think he likes you, Rocky. You don't need much reason, do you? What makes you think you can get away with this? You can't just Oh, shoot. can't I? Do you see this gun, Rocky? Only two people have any motive to kill Joshua. You and Greena. This is her gun. You took it from her. Do I make myself clear? Sure. You can lay the blame on either one or both of us. Not necessarily. You can both keep quiet. We'll dump Joshua's ship in the Nile. Okay, my dear, you can't And do no this, one you? will be the wiser. Will they, Rocky? Well, make up your mind. I can't speak for Drina. Then bring her here. Go to the phone there and call her. Tell her to come at once, but be careful. I never hesitate when it is necessary to kill. At an order? A.K. always gives the orders. Call Drina at once. Uh, give me Drina Ritar. Hello, Drina. Rocky Jordan. Listen, I'm at 394 Esbekia Place, Bungalow 6. You got that? Yeah, I've got to see you right away. It's very important. Now, don't ask questions. Just come right over. Yes, right away, Drina. Goodbye. Thank you, Rocky. Now we have a little wait. Then it will be all over. What then? Just you and me, Rocky. Yeah, but for how long? Until I'm tired of you. I'm tired of you already. But there isn't much you can do about it. Is there, Rocky? You're listening to Everything Shipshape, tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan. There are more treats for CBS listeners on Tuesday night when you'll find as many chuckles as clues on the Mr. and Mrs. North program. Meet Jerry and Pamela North at 8.30 Tuesday night. Yes, you'll find mystery better on CBS. Now we take you back to Cairo and tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan. Everything shipshape. A.K. Kessak held the gun with a right hand and an Egyptian cigarette with the other. And we waited for Drina to arrive. There wasn't much doubt in Joshua's ship's mind or mine what would happen once Drina got there. A.K. was lighting her fourth cigarette when the buzzer sounded. Rocky, ask who it is. A.K., my dear, for the last time I beg you... Be quiet. <laughs> Go on, Rocky, quick. Who is it? It's Drina, Rocky. No. Tell her to come in. Come in, Drina. No! No! Stand still, Rena. Don't move. Oh, Rocky, she, she's killed him. <laughs> Surely you're not sorry, Drina. You wanted Joshua's ship dead, so I took care of it with the last two bullets in your gun. Here. Pick it up. The most charming confession, Miss Kessar. What? Come in, Sam. Thank you, Jordan. I appreciate the opportunity to be on the scene of a murder for a change. So, Drina, you brought the police here. You little... Do not move, Mr. Sark. It is I who hold a gun now. Greco, Ali, 
Take care of this man quickly. Au revoir. I should have killed Rina, too. Let us have it understood, Miss Kessock. I did not bring the police, but I knew they would be following me. And for once, I didn't mind. I'm quite sure Jordan knew I was following you, too. That's right, Sam. But it's okay now, Trina. They won't be telling you anymore. Jordan, the next time perhaps you will be kind enough to tell me of these things beforehand. You might have prevented a murder. You know, Sam, you're absolutely right. Well, the way things worked out, A.K. Kessak figured two more murder raps were no worse than one. So she finally confessed to the killing of Aaron Shape. I now have a standing invitation to visit Drina and her husband at their waterfront cafe in Beirut. Oh, about my tambourine, I decided to let the phony sale stand. Anyhow, the $40,000 in the bank was mine, so I bought the tambourine back from A.K. for half that amount. She didn't care. For me, $20,000 profit for the day wasn't bad. And you know, looking back, it's been quite some time since I made anything out of one of these deals. CBS again at the same time next week for another story of adventure and intrigue when we take you back to Cairo and the cafe tambourine run by Rocky Jordan. Jack Moyles plays the title role with tonight's story by Gomer Cool and Larry Roman. Rocky Jordan is produced and directed by Cliff Howell with original music by Richard Arant. Larry Thor speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Presents Dick Powell as Private Detective Richard Rose. In Rogue's Gallery. Rogue speaking. Well, I've got a man bites dog title for my story tonight. Blondes prefer gentlemen. Hmm. How do you like that? But before we get into our story, here's Jim Doyle, the man from the Fitch Company. It's no trick at all to get a smooth, comfortable shave with Fitch's no-brush shaving cream. You just wet your face, apply the cream with your fingers, and you're ready to shave. The instant you apply Fitch's no-brush to your face, the special skin conditioner ingredient goes into action to prepare your skin for the shave. It gets right next to your skin to hold the whiskers up until the razor comes along and mows them down. The lubricating qualities of Fitch's No Brush actually help your razor glide easily without nicking or scraping your face. Then when your shave is finished, your face will feel cool, relaxed, and refreshed. Fitch's No Brush is the easy-to-use shave cream that's fast becoming a favorite with men everywhere. Get it at your drug counter. Or if you prefer a lather cream, get Fitch's Brush Cream. It also contains the special skin conditioner, Leaves your face feeling soft and smooth when the shave is finished. Fitch's No Brush and Fitch's Brush Cream come in 25 and 50 cent sizes. Thank you, Jim. And now I'd like to tell my story. Okay, here's Dick Powell as Private Detective Richard Rogue in another personally conducted tour through... Rogue's Gallery. I was really as busy as a cat in a kennel when this little old lady walked in. I was on a retainer from a theater chain to find who was tapping their tills. About as exciting as going to the races broke, and I needed more business like a canary needs an arranger. But I've got a weak spot for little old ladies, especially when they look like this one. Apple-cheeked, a little on the pudgy side, with curly snow-white hair showing beneath the black bonnet. 
Oh, she was a picture. She took me back a lot of years, and I liked being back there. Barefoot boy with cheeks of tan. Mm. Oh, good Lord, could that have been me? Well, anyway, there she stood, just inside the door, with a little scared smile on her lips. Are you Mr. Roque? That's right. Well, could I see you for a moment? Why, of course. Come in and have a chair. Oh, here, take this one. It's the most comfortable one in the office. It has a back. Oh, thank you. I know you're a busy man, Mr. Rogue, but, well, I've been so worried and... Look, uh, Mrs... Mrs. Echo. Mrs. Echo, you've got trouble? Well, you don't look like the type. It's my granddaughter, Mr. Rogue. Oh. Oh, she's really a lovely girl. You'd just be crazy about her if you knew her. Everybody is. I don't know what's the matter with her. She's worried, distracted, and... Well, she's just not herself anymore. Sounds to me like she's in love. Oh, no, Mr. Hoke. It isn't love. Debtor's in some kind of trouble. I know she is. You see, her letters were so distressing that I came up to see her. Oh, you don't live here in town? Oh, my goodness, no. I live in Fairfax. Yes, that's where Debtor went to school. She came up here to take a job singing. Oh, she was so happy at first. What happened uh, when you came up here to see her? Well, she got me a room in the Bellevue Hotel. She has a roommate in the apartment with her. I knew she was in trouble the minute I talked with her. She acted frightened and... Well, I I just can't sleep for worrying about her, Mr. Rowe. Now, now, please don't cry. If I can help you, I will. Well, if it's a matter of money, I... Well, it, uh, it isn't. You know something? When I was a kid, I spent all my Thanksgivings and... Christmas is at my grandma's house. Oh. She was the greatest person in the world to me, and, you know, she looked just like you. And talked just like you, and worried just like you. You think I'm just a nervous old lady. You think I'm just making all this up in my own mind. But I know Detta so well. She's so helpless and uh, unworldly. Of course, Graham. Yes. Uh, you just leave everything to me and don't worry. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, what's your granddaughter's name and where can I find it? Her name is Detta Eckel, and she lives at the Clybourne Apartments. Apartment uh, 403. Here's a key to it. She doesn't know I have it, but I stole it for you. Okay, yes. okay, Graham. <laughs> now, now, you just give me all the details, and I'll try my best to find out what it is that's bothering that little girl of yours. <laughs> Well, that's me, the boy volunteer. Never so busy that I can't neglect a steady client to take on a case that wouldn't mean a dime to me. You think I hated the sight of money, which is less than the truth. Well, I just sat there for a while, thinking about my grandmother in those dear, dead childhood days. Me, the guy who wouldn't bet eight to five that tomorrow's Friday. Well, it uh, suddenly dawned on me that I had work to do, so I pulled the emergency cord on the dream train and made a few calls on theaters. And then about 7 o'clock, I remembered my new client, and I dropped in at the Clyburn Apartments. They were nice. A self-operated elevator whizzed me up to the fourth floor, and I knocked at the door of 403. Nobody answered, so I unlocked the door and walked in. And there, across the room from me, was a young girl. She was lying on the floor. And there was a little pool of blood around her head. I just stood there for a split second while that still, small voice within me talked sense. You'd better get out of here, Rogi. That dame's dead. Oh, brother. Right in the back of the head. (sighs) The poor kid. Yeah. Okay, don't tell me what to do. Oh, this is too bad. Sweet-looking kid. Nice face. Cute figure. Dancer's legs. She was writing something when she got it. There, on the desk. 
Yeah. To the chief of the police, I have some information. That's as far as she got. Sure. She knew too much. That's why she got bumped. What makes you so inquisitive? You tired of living? Snapshot. Hmm. Brother. Like the looks of that little blonde in the bathing suit, Rogie? Miss Universe of 1940 anything. Somebody's coming in, Rogie. Better get behind the door where the killer hid when you stuck your skinny neck in here. You better be ready for anything. <laughs> quiet, quiet. You want the cops to come up here? Wait a minute, Dom. Yes, I'm afraid she is. You know who killed her? You did, of course. I did? What would I kill her for? I don't even know her. Stop pointing that gun at me. If you're going to shoot me, go ahead. I don't care. I'd rather be dead. I would. I would. Have you any idea who might have killed Miss Echo? I'm Miss Echo. That... That... Was Francie McCall. She was my singing partner. You killed her thinking it was me. Look, would you mind straightening me out a little bit? If you are dead or Echo... I am dead Echo. Look, here's my driver's license, my initial on my person. There on the mantel is a picture of me. You killed the wrong girl. I'm the one who was supposed to have been killed. You better go back to Mooney and tell him you made a mistake. Look, baby, I'm Richard Rogue, the private dick. I'm not a killer. Now, why is this Mooney guy trying to have you bumped? If he's responsible for killing your friend, we have to get him for it, don't we? Go away from me. Go away. Go away. Don't you touch me. Don't touch me. with a dead dame and a hysterical dame in my hands. I like the dead one best at the time. I couldn't shut this other one up. She was a little blonde from the bathing suit snapshots. She looked like one of those composite pictures Hollywood press agents get out combining the best features of all the stars in one deluxe edition. It was a pleasure to take tender care of her. I put cold claws on her head. I rubbed her hands. I talked to her. Finally, I convinced her I was a friend. And then she cuddled up to me, like a little kid. I called Urban at headquarters and reported the murder. Daddy kept right on bawling. I couldn't stop her. <laughs> oh, look, look, baby, are you going to tell me what this is all about, or do you want to wait and tell the cops? They'll be here any minute now, and there's no use going... I won't tell anyone. I can't. If I do, I'll be killed just like Francie. Don't ever go away and leave me, will you? Well, of course not. You think I'm crazy? You just take it easy now and tell me what this is all about, will you? Take it easy? With my best friend lying there dead? Oh, it's all my fault. Oh, look, doll, nothing's your fault. Stop beating yourself to death. What are you mixed up anyway? Come on, tell me. Let me help you. I will. If you get me a drink of water. All right. Yeah. Now you try to get a hold of yourself, little one. You're going to need all the brains you have when the cops get here. Hey! Why, that dirty little double crossing. Oh, brother, that's all I need for her to run out on me. I tried to beat that elevator down and almost broke my pretty little stuck out neck doing it. I missed a stair between the third and second floors and flew blind for a while before I caught my balance again. I hit the front door like I had the Notre Dame team behind me and ran across the sidewalk just in time to see Detta pulling away in a cab. She had too much of a start on me for footwork, so I ran for another cab. Follow that cab. Huh? What'd you see? Follow that cab. There's 20 bucks in it for you if you catch it. Okay, for 20 bucks, I'll drive you over that cab. Watch this, Mr. Put out, put out. Hey, had an accident, didn't you? No, no, no. Just trying to cure my hiccups. Get out of the way. Just a minute, bro. Where are you going? Oh, hello, Urban. I wasn't going anyplace. I was oh, just he was in the cab. He was going someplace, all right. Oh, take that driver down and lock him up, Olson. Maybe we can teach him not to pull out in front of police cars. Look, Lieutenant Urban. I've got to make a call. If you I understand there's a dead girl on the fourth floor of this apartment building. Yeah, and you know how you know? I told you, remember? Then you try to run out. 
You're smarter than that, Rogue. Come on, boys. Push the button there, will you? For... Now, who is this thing that got the business, Rogue? I don't know. You don't know? You just happened to drop in because you heard she was dead, eh? No, I... Well, I was working on a case and I... Okay. You go first, Rogie. This is it. Try the door, Stacy. It's open. Oh, you know everything, don't you? I try to keep in touch. Shot from a distance of over two feet, right at the base of the brain. Never knew what hit her. That's right. Who did it, Rogie? And why? I don't know. What's her name? Fancy something or other. I, I don't know her last name. Where'd you meet her? I never met her. Alive. First time I saw her, she was lying right there, dead. You're going to be difficult, eh? You bullhead. Stick around. You mean I'm pinched? Did I say so? Now look. You're not talking to some correspondent school pickpocket, you know, Lieutenant. Either pinch me or let me go and make up your mind which right now. Shut up. I didn't like the way Urban talked to me. I thought of that elevator. It was practically an escape hatch. I edged over toward the door, and while the boys in blue were chortling over the corpse, I made my break. <laughs> I could hear the cops running down the stairs as I ran out through the door and jumped into a cab and got out of there. Deputy driver, there's a double saw bucket in for you if you get me out of here without picking up a tail. Okay, mister, hang on. Oh, what's the matter? Can't you get this corn cellar out of low? I'm doing the best I can. The rest of the people won't get off the street. Oh, oh, we're being tailed. There's a cab following us. Lose him. Take a quick turn at the next corner. He's still with us. Come on, step on it. I had a good driver. He pulled every trick in the book to lose that shadow, but none of them worked. I was being followed. I didn't know who was following me, but I did know it wasn't the police and that it wasn't a friend. We'll return to our story in just a moment. But first, I'd like to tell you about the thousands of smart women throughout the United States and Canada, including glamorous Bess Meyerson, Miss America of 1945, who are now using Fitch's saponified shampoo to keep their hair lustrous, soft, and silky. These smart women have discovered that Fitch's saponified shampoo gives a rich, abundant lather even in hard water. And what is more important... They've discovered that this rich, billowy lather carries away all impurities from their hair and scalp, leaving the scalp clean and refreshed, the hair sparkling and lovely. After the fragrant lather has done its work of cleansing the hair and scalp, the patented rinsing agent goes into action. This rinsing agent acts with the rinse water to remove every tiny particle that might remain to hide hair beauty. No special after rinse is required. You'll find Fitch's saponified shampoo is economical for use by the entire family. Buy that big economy 16-ounce size that sells for $1 or the generous 6-ounce size for 50 cents. If you prefer, ask for a professional application at your barber or beauty shop. Fitch is spelled F-I-T-C-H. <laughs> Turn to our story. Richard Rogue is in a cab, having just eluded the police who want to question him about the murder of a young girl. He looks out of the back window of his cab and sees that he's being followed. He urges his driver to greater speed, but still the shadowing cab follows him. Rogue is worried. <laughs> Maybe I'm just the sensitive type, but every time I thought of that little girl lying up there in that apartment, dead, and looked back at the cab that was following me, I got a little more lonesome for a large crowd. I told my driver to speed up and pull around a corner fast. He did. 
I jumped out and he kept going. The other cab kept right after him. I hopped in another cab and joined the parade. Now I was doing the tailing. I got a good look at my ex-shadow when he got out of the Club Modern and went in. That's all I wanted right at that point, so I told my driver to take me to the Bellevue Hotel. I wanted to talk with Grandma Eccle on a matter of life and death. Oh, hello, Mr. Rogue. Good evening, Mrs. Eccle. I, I have to talk well, to you. Well, come in, won't you? You know, I've been trying to reach you at your office. I'm very anxious to get in touch with your granddaughter, Mrs. Eccle. Oh, yes. <laughs> I was a silly old woman this morning, Mr. Rogue. I've been trying to reach you to tell you to forget my visit. Oh, I see. Have you talked with your granddaughter? Yes, yes, I have, uh, by phone. Oh? Hmm. She hasn't been up here? No, no, she hasn't. She's been very busy. And, uh, well, uh, will $50 be enough for you? I mean, for my wasting your time? Just a minute. Uh, look, Graham, uh, you've been smoking too much. Hmm? Uh, I beg your pardon. Oh, look at this ashtray. It's full of cigarette butts, fresh ones. Covered with lipstick. Oh, yes. <clears throat> you aren't wearing any lipstick, Graham. Where'd they come from? Well, I, I guess they must have been there when I took the room. Oh, no, no, yes. no, Graham. Now, here, sit down there. You know, you're not a very good liar. Your granddaughter has been up here, and she hasn't been gone long. She told you to get me off the case, didn't she? No. No, you're wrong. I want you to drop the case because I found that there was nothing the matter with my little girl, and that I had imagined the whole thing. Yeah? Did you imagine a murder? Murder? Mrs. Echo, please take my word for it. I have to find your granddaughter. Now, what did she tell you? Well, she told me that if I didn't get you off the case, she'd be killed. That's just what she told me. Who does she know by the name of Mooney? Ever hear her mention that name? Yes, yes, let me see. Now, that. think, Graham, think. Who is Mooney? Mooney, he's the man that Detter has been keeping company with. Well, what do you know about him? Where can I find him? What does he do for a living? He's a, he's a gambler. He has the gambling rooms above the club where Detter's been singing. Where's Detter now? She went to meet him. She went someplace to meet Mooney? Yes. She called him from here. She was going to meet him at the club. The Club Modern? Is that the name of the club? Yes, that's it. The Club Modern. Oh, please take care of her, Mr. Rogue. You know, she's all I have in the world. I was a mightily worried little man as I grabbed a cab and took off to the Club Modern. This kid, this Detta Echo. Oh, she should have never left Fairfax. Poor little dumb dame. I, I just hoped I could, I could get to her before Mooney got another chance at her, that's all. I walked into the Club Modern and stood for a moment in the foyer looking around for Detta and moaning. That's a gun in your kidney, Rogue. Just keep moving. Oh, you couldn't get away with knocking me off here. Are you kidding? Well, I'm willing to gamble if you are. Now move. Up those steps over there at the right. Go on. Okay, okay, tough stuff. You're calling this dance. Get to the head of those stairs. Turn right. To the red door over there. You see it? Yeah, yeah, I see it. You have to poke the heart of that gun, Junior. I'm very ticklish. I'm dying laughing. Keep moving. Rogue here just walked in, Mooney. Oh, come in, Rogue. Sure. Are you expecting me? More or less. Thanks, Maxie. Ah, nice little place you have here. You like it better than tailing me around in a cab, Mooney? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know Miss Sackle, I believe. Yes, we've met. Uh, hello, Dutta. You left in such a hurry last time I saw you, honey, that I didn't have a chance to say goodbye. What are you doing here? How did you find me? That's a secret. I came in to tell you not to worry about Mooney. You're quite a talker, aren't you, Rogue? Well, sure, yes. Let's talk about murder, Mooney. No, let's talk about money, Rogue. You're a guy that burns up a lot of it, I understand. Uh, would five grand affect your memory? What am I supposed to forget? A little incident at the Clybourne Apartments, remember? Vaguely. You killed a girl up there, didn't you? Me? No. But that's beside the point. You want to play ball? I didn't say no. Where's the dough? Oh, oh looks very pretty. Count it out, Mooney. Sure. While I'm counting, you make up your mind. You want five grand alive or floral wreaths dead? 
My hero blood was reaching the boiling point, and I could feel a foolish move coming on. I nerved myself up to my desperate Desmond personality, and then while Mooney had both hands busy counting money, I made a dive for him, right across the desk. Bullseye. He went over backward in his chair with me on top of him, and we went from there. Oh, you sneak around. Oh, you want to fight that way, huh? Well, okay, mister. Yeah, yeah, and here's a kiss for you, hard guy. I'll kill you for this road. Oh, yeah? Uh-huh. <sighs> okay, Dada, here. Hold this gun on him while I call the cops, will you? Sure. I was feeling pretty proud of myself when I put in that call to the cops. Richard Rogue, the demon detective, good sleuthing, done cheap. As a matter of fact, I think I was whistling when I heard Dennis' footsteps behind me. I was just half turned around when I got it. Oh, the Washington Monument fell on me and I took a dive in the midnight. When I opened my eyes, Mooney was still out. I put my fingers up to the side of my head that felt like it wasn't there, and they came away sticky. I got up and looked around. The five grand was gone, and so was Detta. I threw some water on Mooney and brought him up to date, and then the two of us had a little talk, which was full of surprises for me, and then I ran out of there. The cab starter in front of the club had called a cab for Detta. He'd heard her say, Metropolitan Airport and step on it. I got a cab and said, Metropolitan Airport, and step on it. When I got to the airport, I could hear the loudspeakers announcing a flight leaving for San Francisco. I ran through the building and out onto the field, and there she was, just starting for the plane. Hello, Dada. You leaving again? Oh, Take it easy, baby. I've got my heater pointing at you, and I'd hate to have to shoot any holes in that lovely dress. How did you know I was out here? You know, you're not very smart, baby. The cab started at the club or you tell the taxi driver where you wanted to go. <laughs> you should never have taken up murder as a hobby. Murder? Yeah, please don't be coy. Just explain something to me. Where did you get a ticket for the plane so fast? From a Marine. I, I told him I had to get back home. Well, thanks. I- I'm glad to know that Mooney and I aren't the only guys in the world that are suckers for blondes with your uh, appeal. I'm not going back. They'll kill me. They'll execute me. I didn't mean to kill anyone. You have to listen to me. It's a little late for that. You'd better be thankful. They can only fry you once, lovely. Come on. You've got a date with the DA. He wants to see you about a couple of murders. <laughs> well, I turned the luscious dead over to Irvin, thereby winning his undying affection for about 20 minutes. Cops are very unconstant personalities. And then I muscled my poor, tired body back to my office. Oh, I was so tired I couldn't have raised my eyebrows with a block and tackle. I opened the door and wished I'd gone straight home. Grandma Echo was sitting there, straight as a Roxy Usher. Well, Mr. Rogue, have you seen Detta? Why, uh, uh, yes, I, I, uh... She's in jail? Oh, uh... Now, don't, don't take it too hard, Graham. I was at her apartment. The police were just removing the body of Francie McCall. Well, you, you know that Detta was in... Are you trying to tell me that Detta killed that girl? Yes. She did, you know. Why? Why did she do it? Well, uh, a couple of months ago, Detta ran over a little girl and killed her in a hit-and-run accident. She told Francie about it, and that's what she's been worried about. Oh. Francie was going to tell the police today. That's why Detta shot her. Oh, believe me, I, I'm sorry to have to tell you this. I believe I owe you some money, Mr. Rogue. Oh, no, no, please. I insist. I retained you to do a job, and you did it. I mail you a check in the morning. No, 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 please, no. I'll tell you, if you, uh, if you really want to do something for me, how about inviting me to your house for Thanksgiving dinner? You, you know, Graham, they, they don't make money big enough to buy things like that. Will you come? <laughs> Just ask me. All right, son. And we'll never mention this again, will we? Never. Now, if you'll excuse me, I... 
I think I'm going to, to cry a little. Well, that's the end of the story, except that they didn't burn Detta. The jury was looking at her when they should have been listening to the evidence. Mooney and I got to be pretty good friends. I learned that he had been waiting downstairs for Detta while she was busy killing Francie. She told him what happened, and he was trying to catch me to butt my lip with hush money. <laughs> he was in love with the gal. The Marine that got talked out of his plane ticket was suffering from a touch of the same malady. Well, who wasn't? If there's anything in the theory of reincarnation, I want to come back as a blonde with Detta's equipment. Then I can get away with murder. Unless there's a guy here around as smart as Richard Rogue, and that doesn't seem possible. Now, does it? This is Dick Powell again. We all hope you like our show tonight. Ray Buffum wrote it. The music was composed and conducted by Leith Stevens, and production and direction was by D. Engelbach. Next week, we're going to do a real thriller entitled Murder in Drawing Room A. Lots of excitement. Don't miss it. Good night, all. And now, here's Jim Doyle. Don't forget to tune in again next Thursday, same time, same station, when you will again hear Dick Powell as Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. Remember, if dandruff is your problem, ask for Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo. Removes dandruff the first time it is used. Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo is the only shampoo whose guarantee to remove dandruff is backed by one of the world's largest insurance companies. This statement can be made by no other shampoo. Ask for Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo at your drug counter, Barbara Beauty Shop. Fitch is spelled F-I-T-C-H. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. W. Fitch Company, makers of Fitch's saponified coconut oil shampoo and Fitch's shaving creams, presents Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue. In Rogue's Gallery. Rogue speaking. You know, there's something about me that is to trouble what molasses is to flies. I never go around looking for trouble. Trouble goes around looking for me. Now, take that afternoon a few months ago when I walked into the press room of the Hall of Justice and found, among others, Clark Ames, the young city hall reporter for the Chronicle, expounding on his favorite subject, a deep hatred for a man named Fred Curtis, nicknamed the Alibi Master. Ames and the other newspaper men had watched Curtis win acquittals for a dozen different clients and always by the same route, unbreakable alibis. This made the clients very happy and the district attorney very miserable. The Chronicle, a crusading newspaper, had, at the instigation of Clark Ames, been running an anti-Curtis campaign, bordering pretty close on libel. And Curtis, who was sharper than a razor's edge and harder to catch up with on the horizon, hated Ames with a wonderful passion. Curtis had won the last round... And Ames was telling me about it. So, Curtis goes to Williams, my managing editor, and threatens a libel suit. Well, I had gone a little overboard, I guess. And Williams had to let me go. Temporary layoff until the heat died down. But now I'm back on the job, Brogue, and I'm solid. And you wait until that phony Curtis sees me sitting here. Wait till he finds out I'm back on the job. Huh? Now look, Ames, uh, I've been around this town for a while, and if I'm picking out a guy to buck, it won't be Fred Curtis. How come you decided to make a career of locking horns with the smartest mouthpiece in the business? How do you expect to win? Oh, don't worry about it, Rogue. I got that phony right where I want him. You wait a couple of days, that's all. Mr. Alibi Master Curtis is going to be nailed to the Chronicle's masthead. Uh, hello, Ames. 
Did I hear you taking my name in vain? Could be. How uninteresting. What are you doing sitting around in the press room? It's reserved for the working press. Hello, Rogue. Hi, uh, how's your trial going, Curtis? Oh, my client will have dinner at home tonight. Jury just retired. Your client is guilty as the devil, Curtis. What's his alibi this time? Now, you know he couldn't have committed the crime. I've just proved to the jury that he was in San Francisco at the time the murder was committed. How are you getting along on your unemployment insurance, Ames? <laughs> it was a pleasure getting you fired. Too bad it didn't last. Well, I'm back on the job, which means I'm right back on your trail. That's bad news for you, Curtis. Uh, do me a favor, will you, Ames? When you call in the report of the not guilty verdict the jury's about to bring in for my client, tell your stupid managing editor I'm filing a libel action against him the first thing in the morning. Uh, look, uh, Curtis, let's go in the courtroom, will you? I'm going to be there when the jury comes in. Okay, Rogue. Oh, here, Ames, here's ten bucks. Go get a haircut, will you, kid? And have your suit pressed. And don't forget to spell my name correctly when you phone that story in. Here's your ten right in your face, Curtis. I'll see that your name is spelled right. In the biggest type in the shop, right at the top of the page, when you're tried for falsifying evidence. And that's going to happen to you awfully soon, wise guy. Here, here, here. Take it easy, Ames. Oh, let him talk. Let me give you something to kick around in that warped mind of yours, Curtis. You remember a guy named Don Thompson? Your alibi witness for Ed Harris a year ago. I'm sure you remember Thompson. What about him? Would it put a crimp in that famous poise of yours if you knew that Thompson had given the Chronicle a signed and witness statement admitting that he had perjured himself in that alibi statement for Harris? That is preposterous. Is it? Well, you'd be in quite a spot if the Chronicle happened to have a statement like that, wouldn't you, Curtis? A statement that swears that you paid Don Thompson a thousand dollars for the perjured testimony that kept Ed Harris out of the gas chamber? That'd sure stop your clock, wouldn't it? Have you been drinking, Ames? <laughs> you sound even a little more illogical than usual. Oh, that's right. You like logic, don't you? Mm -hmm. Well, figure this one out. I've been trying for some time to get convicting evidence on you. You got me fired for trying. The Chronicle was scared of a libel suit. But all of a sudden, my managing editor, Williams, doesn't seem to be very afraid of your suing the paper. Now, what could be the reason for him giving me my job back? It could be that that statement from Thompson did it, couldn't it? All right, now, sweat it out, Curtis. You'll be seeing your picture in the Chronicle with bars in front of you and a number on your chest in about 48 hours. Not even one of your phony alibis can keep you out of this rap, big shot. I suppose I should be annoyed by such juvenile threats. But I just don't seem to be able to take you seriously, Ames. And the next time I give you my attention, you'll never work on a newspaper again. Coming with me, Rogue? Uh, no, not now, no. I think I'll stay here and use the telephone. You could see and feel the hate that hung in the air in that press room like a cloud of poison gas after Fred Curtis left. Clark Ames went all to pieces as soon as we were alone, paced the floor, said he'd talk too much. He was as worried as a man with a three-horse parley and two winners. Pretty soon, though, he, he left, and I used the telephone to call a couple of girls I know. They, uh, <clears throat> they weren't home. I was about to give up and go to dinner by myself when I turned around and saw Betty Callahan standing there behind me, looking like a million dollars, which is a nice figure, which is what she has, if you know what I mean. Betty had a funny little quizzical smile on her face. Hello, Richard. What's the matter? Aren't you having any luck? Well, honey, honey, I was just going to call you. You mean that if Alice isn't home and Liza doesn't answer, I'm next in line? Oh, now, you know better than that. You're always first on my list. Remember, Richard, I was standing here when you were phoning. Sure, sure. I was just, uh, just trying to get a substitute, that's all. Uh-huh. Well, what do you want? The names of some girls and a few phone numbers? Now, don't look at me like that, Betty. The only reason I was calling those other girls was because I couldn't find you. Well, I'll forgive you if you'll take me to dinner and then to the theater to see Cholula Banker. Oh, my goodness, you have such expensive taste. Oh, really, my dear man. I have something infinitely better. I have two passes for the shelf. Well, good. I've got two passes for a drive in. Oh. Come on, I want to see if I can walk through that door without eating the jam off of it. Oh, really? I'm hungry. <laughs> so am I. That's the only reason you have a date with me tonight, Richard. Well, then come on. <laughs> All through that hamburger, I kept dividing my thoughts between how such a little girl could eat so much food and that scene in the press room at the Hall of Justice. I knew Fred Curtis for what he really was, cold-blooded and completely ruthless. I remembered that look in his eyes as he left the press room. A little puzzlement, a little fear, and a great deal of malice. 
Even if nobody else believed the story Ames told, I was sure that Curtis more than half believed it. And that meant trouble for somebody. Betty and I finished our dinner at last, and in spite of everything she could eat, I still had money enough to pay for it and a cab to the theater. We were just back in our seats after the second act intermission when I heard my name being paged. If Richard Rogue is in the audience, will he please report to the lobby? Mr. Richard Rogue, please report to the lobby. Isn't that a sort of obvious piece of publicity, Richard? Well, how the devil did anybody know I was here? You better go see what's so important. Would you hurry back? I'll be right back, baby. <laughs> I had a bad hunch as I walked up that aisle. Those little chills that always race up and down my spine when I'm walking into trouble were acting up. I didn't know what to expect as I walked out into the lobby. Then I saw Clark Ames standing there. His face was as white as a dove's wing, and his eyes had the strained look that is the aftermath of seeing violent death. Rogue. Yeah, what's the matter, Ames? You look like you've seen a ghost. I've seen something worse, Rogue. You gotta come down to the Chronicle with me. Now get a hold of yourself. You're shaking like a dice cup. What's the matter? Williams, my managing editor, was just killed. Huh? Murdered in his office. Well, that's the beginning of our story. We'll continue in just a moment, but first, here's Jim Doyle. Romance and soft feminine glamour are back in style. Women are taking off the bandanas they donned in war plants and are again letting their hair reflect moonbeams and stardust. That's why Fitch's saponified coconut oil shampoo is in more demand now than ever. Because Fitch's saponified shampoo brings out the radiant beauty of your hair. Its fragrant, creamy lather cleanses so thoroughly and rinses out so completely. Fitch's saponified shampoo contains its own patented rinsing agent, so no special after-rinse is needed. And best of all... You can wash your hair as often as you like with Fitch's saponified shampoo, and it will never become dry or harsh feeling. That's because this shampoo is made from pure, natural oils that keep your hair ever soft and lustrous. Ask for Fitch's saponified shampoo the next time you're at your beauty shop, or buy an economical bottle at your drug or toilet goods counter. And now we return to Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. <laughs> Well, I was working. The publisher of the Chronicle was paying me a grand for putting the long, cold finger on the murder of Williams, the managing editor. I was pretty sure I knew who the murderer was, so it looked like a soft buck. When Ames and I arrived at the Chronicle, homicide was already there. My friendly enemy, Lieutenant Urban, was in charge, as usual. He walked over from where he was ex examining the remains of the late Mr. Williams. Hey, Sam, help me with this. What are you doing here, Rogue? Now, Urban, you know whenever anything comes along you boys can't handle, they always send for me. Who's paying you? The publisher of this paper. Now, shall we go on with the third degree or shall we get the work of the murder? What do you know about it? More than you do. When was he killed? The medical examiner says he got it about two hours ago. Mm. Stabbed the death of his own copy shares, huh? Yeah. Yeah, the last edition had already gone in. No one else was in the city room when it happened. Found a motive? Well, look at the office. Every file's been emptied. The murderer was looking for something, Rogie. Yeah, I wonder if he found it. Uh, you wouldn't know what it was, would you? Mm, yeah, yeah, I might. I might at that. I heard the Chronicle had a signed confession from Don Thompson. I will go to run it tomorrow. Now, what was Thompson's confession? Come on, Rogue, you might as well give me all of it. Well, it seemed Thompson was confessing that he had been paid a, a, quite a sum of money for a job of perjury by Fred Curtis, commonly known as the alibi master. In words of one syllable, so you can understand it, Irvin, Thompson... Uh, Sold the Chronicle information, which would have put Curtis away for about ten years. Curtis, eh? Well, looks like this is going to be a simple case. Could be, yes. Hey, Ames, you know where Williams kept that Thompson confession? It was in the top drawer of this file. It's gone. Uh-huh. Well, I guess that settles that, Urban. Ah, uh, it's too easy. Curtis knows every trick in the book. Hello, Urban. May I come in? Yeah. We were just talking about you, Curtis. You're very welcome. I figured I would be. Why did you kill him, Curtis? You knew you'd be the number one on the suspect parade? Oh, that's not very smart, Rogue. If I had killed him, I would have been much more clever about it. 
I wasn't within a hundred miles of here when he was killed. Well, that sounds familiar. I, uh, I know I'm wasting my time asking this, Curtis, but, uh, you can prove that alibi, can't you? Of course. I was on my ranch in Antelope Valley when I heard over the radio that Williams had been killed. I suppose my friend Rogue has told you of the fantastic story a drunken reporter named Ames was shouting in the press room at the Hall of Justice today. Yeah, I told him. He knows all about it. Oh, incidentally, uh, Thompson's little composition is missing. The man who killed Williams lifted it. Very convenient for you, wasn't it, Curtis? Convenient? Oh, there never was such a confession. There couldn't have been. Because there wasn't the slightest background of truth for the wild tale Ames told today. Okay, Curtis. We'll let you know what we think of the story after we've checked your alibi. You were on your ranch in Antelope Valley when you heard the report of William's death. Yes. That's about a hundred miles from here, right? Approximately. As soon as I heard the report of the death, I knew I would be a suspect. So I started to town. I stopped in a bar in Palmdale for a drink on the way in and then came directly to the Chronicle office without stopping. My car's at the curb now in front of the building. Ryan, check those alibis. Oh, they'll check, Lieutenant. I'm sure they will. The alibi master would never slip up on his own alibi. That's right. I'm sorry to disappoint you, Rogue. Uh Uh-huh, and uh, I'm sorry to be disappointed, Curtis. You sure you don't know anything about this murder? You... You didn't hire someone to do it for you, did you? Of course not. I had nothing against the man. Why should I want to kill him? You can go, Curtis. We'll try to break that alibi or find the boy you hired. Until we do, take it easy. Thank you, Lieutenant. Oh, you can reach me at my office if I can be of any further use to you. Oh, uh, Curtis, are you going back toward the Biltmore Theater? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. I got to get back there. I left my car there. And, oh, brother, Betty. Ooh, she'll massacre me. (laughs) I'll give you a lift. Come on, Rogue. This Curtis guy was strictly the deluxe type. His car was a long, sleek, black job a few sizes smaller than the Queen Mary, but with approximately the same amount of power. We got in, Curtis turned on the ignition, and the gas gauge swept clear across to full. Curtis had said he drove directly from the bar in Palmdale to the Chronicle office without stopping. Uh About 70 miles. Mr. Curtis's carefully planned alibi was not so carefully planned. I was enjoying a short ride with a murderer. He saw my eyes on the gasoline gauge, followed them with his own, and then put his hand in his coat pocket. I knew there was a gun in it. As we drove away from the curb, I picked up a copy of the Chronicle, which had been lying in the seat beside me. I thought perhaps if I could hide my thoughts... Uh, a little better I, uh, if I pretended a great nonchalance with no part of which I felt. <clears throat> Curtis was not sure that I'd attached the proper importance to the story the gas gauge told. He, uh, he was being nonchalant, too. <coughs> I, uh, had a little dough riding on prevaricator at 7th today when I came out. Ought to be in that paper. Final results. Where'd you get it? I bought it in Palmdale. Then? Huh. This is the Bulldog Edition. Oh. The Bulldog Edition is sold only on the streets in Los Angeles. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I'm afraid I made a mistake, huh, Rowe? Yes, I'm afraid you've made two of them, Curtis. This paper and that full gas tank. You didn't drive 70 miles in this gas eater without stopping and arrive here with a full tank, did you? You're very observant. Looks like you're cracking my alibi, huh? You killed Williams, didn't you? Yes, I had to. I had to get that confession of Thompson's that would have ruined me. I owe that impetuous reporter a great debt for tipping me off to the Chronicle's plans for crucifying me. You, uh, have any plans for me? Yes. Yes, I think I have it worked out. I'm going to drive you out to the suburbs to a spot I know that's probably deserted by this time. Now, if you were found there, shot. Aren't you overlooking something? If I'm found there, shot, Urban is going to pick you up fast. (laughs) You're going to do better than that, Curtis. Well, if there were signs of a struggle and your wristwatch had been set an hour ahead and smashed to set the time of death, and I was at Lincoln Heights Jail talking to a client at the time the police would figure the murder took place, that might do it, don't you think, Rogue? No. It's no good, Curtis. You're slipping. In the first place, there's always the possibility that a shot would be heard. The district I have in mind is deserted by now, or will be, before I consummate my plan. And Urban is no fool. He'll be awfully suspicious. Might give you the paraffin test on your gun hand. You know, I, I, I don't think you're going to handle the situation that way, Curtis. As a matter of fact, I'm going to be kind of hard to handle, even for you. You know, Rogue, 
It's amazing how fascinating crime, I mean the actual act of committing a crime, can be. Have you ever killed anybody? No. Now look, Curtis, I suppose you know that you're going to get caught. I know nothing of the kind. Successful crime is nothing more than planning, careful planning. Oh, I'll grant you, Rogue, that I'm going to be suspected of your murder. But I'll never be convicted for it. I won't take any chances. You're wrong, Curtis. You talk like a sick man. You can't beat the law. If you commit a crime, you're going to pay for it. Let's go down to police headquarters and talk this thing over with Urban. What do you have to win by adding another murder to your score? Mr. Rogue, I love life too much, and I love success too much to let anything stand in the way of my life as I live it. You, you just can't understand that, can you? You think that a man of my background and position must be horrified at the thought of taking the life of another human being. Well, you're wrong, Rogue. I have my own code, my own ethics. You know and I know hundreds of reputable businessmen in this town who spend their days and nights, their lives, grasping for money, for power over the lives of more and more people. Yeah. Well, when one of them wrecks another man's life or his business, it amounts to a victory, which is celebrated by the wrecker at his club that evening. If the victim commits suicide, and he often does, they're sorry. That's all. It's just business. What are you trying to prove, Curtis? I'm explaining why I killed Williams. Why I have to make sure that you and the knowledge you have of my affairs are disposed of. It's a matter of business, Rogue. Now you're crazier than a coach. You know that, Curtis. You're not talking like a rational person. You're going to pay for this crime. Don't move. Put your hands back in your lap. I think you know that I won't hesitate to kill you here on the road if it becomes necessary. Set your watch up an hour. One hour, Mr. Rogue. Okay. You got a new plan? Yeah. We're on the outskirts of town. I'm going to stop the car when I come to an advantageous place. Then I'm going to knock you unconscious with a tire iron, smash your watch, throw you onto the road and run over you. To all appearances, your murder will be the result of a hit-and-run accident. I will have an alibi which will make it impossible for me to have been in the vicinity at the time of the accident. That, I think, is a perfect plan. Ah, oh, it's full of holes. In the first place, Urban will check the tread on your tires, and in the second, he'll never fall for that smash watch trick. You'll never get away with it, Curtis. You've been buying up juries and alibis and evidence for so long that you've forgotten that they're honest people. People who can't be bought. Urban's one of them. He'll stay with you until he gets you for killing me, Curtis. Now, you'll have to come up with a much cleverer scheme than what you've thought of so far. Maybe you're right, Rogue. What are you doing? What I'm going to do now, Mr. Rogue, won't need any alibi. Look out, you fool. Curtis! Curtis! Give me that wheel! Sit back there, Rogue. Get your foot off that accelerator. You're going to hit... Turn that wheel! Give me that wheel, Curtis! Goodbye, Mr. Rogue. Let go of that wheel. Let go or I'll shoot! We'll continue in just a moment. But now, here's Jim Doyle. Time is a valuable thing these days, and no man wants to spend any more of it than possible on shaving. So you busy men who want to cut down on your shaving time... Use Fitch's No Brush Shaving Cream. This swell cream gives you a close, comfortable shave in a hurry. It's an expert blend of three important shaving ingredients. These ingredients enable your razor to fairly sail along without nicking or scraping. The creamy, non-greasy texture of Fitch's No Brush saves you time, too, for it won't clog your razor or the drain. And with all your speed in shaving, you'll find that Fitch's No Brush leaves your face feeling smooth and cool. You men who prefer a lather cream will find Fitch's Brush Cream also gives quick, comfortable shaves. It makes lots of rich lather that stays moist all during the shave, then rinses off easily. Both Fitch's Brush and Fitch's No Brush Shaving Creams come in generous 25 and 50 cent sizes. For shaving speed and shaving ease, switch to Fitch. Now back to Dick Powell as Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. When I saw what that madman Curtis was going to do, I knew I had nothing to lose. He had that big, powerful car wide open and heading straight for a stone wall. I tried to grab the wheel and turned it. He fired at me just as we crashed into the wall. I only remembered turning the wheel enough to deflect the shock a little. And then, oh, then I was on cloud number eight. 
Hugo was there, waiting for me. <laughs> oh, Chief, you had a close call there. Hey, hey, Hugo, where have you been? Well, I had a little trouble with the OPA about Cloud 8, and I had to go and see them. Oh. Then I had a tough time getting a reservation back. <laughs> but I'm glad to see you, Rogi, with your usual bump on the head. Oh, am I dead? <laughs> Only the good die, young Rogi. Hey, you got company. An old friend of yours is up here. Look, over on Cloud Nine. See him? Oh, Curtis. He isn't dead either, huh? Oh, no. But I sure thought I was out of a job when I saw you slamming into that wall, Rogi. You ought to take better care of yourself than me. Yeah. Look. I gotta get out of here, you go. How badly am I hurt? Oh, you're okay. That car was built to take it. <laughs> you won't be playing any gin rummy for a while, and you can't collect on your insurance. Give me a little boost over the side, will you, Hugo? I gotta get downstairs before Curtis does. Sure, Chief. Here you go. So long, Rogie. <laughs> Rogie. Rogie. Uh, hello. Hello, Irvin. Mm, chance of meeting you here. Receiving hospital? Yeah. What have you been up to? What were you trying to do? Kill yourself? No. 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 Is, uh... Is Curtis here? Yeah, yeah. Now, I'll ask the questions. What happened? How badly is, uh, Curtis hurt? Leg broken, that's all. He's still unconscious. Look, uh... Irvin... He, uh, he killed Williams. He, he, uh, tried to kill me. Yeah. He admitted it, eh? Yeah, after I caught a couple of flaws in his alibi. You got enough dope on him to make it stick? I don't know. I don't know. It would, uh, be my word against his. But I got an idea. An idea that might sense the deal. Every once in a while, you do have a good one. Get the, get the chief surgeon over here, will you? I'm going to need his help. Okay. Here, here, here. Lie down there. I, I don't want anything to happen to you, Rogie. I was worried about you. You're such a pest. I'd miss you like the devil. I'll get the doc. When I outlined my scheme to the chief surgeon, he looked for a minute like he might call him the head of the psychiatric ward. But with Urban's help, I finally got him to agree to play it my way. He bandaged Curtis from head to foot, put constricting straps across his chest, and sensed him down like a saddle on an outlaw horse. Then they put him in an oxygen tent and brought him out of shock. Urban pulled out all of the stops as he stood by the side of the hospital bed and talked to the murderer. Like a father. Curtis, can you hear me? Yes. Who is it? Lieutenant Urban. Did the doctor give you the bad news yet? Yeah. Crushed chest. Nothing they can do, I guess. No. You haven't got long to live. Anything you want to tell me? Might as well go with a clear conscience. Did you kill Williams? Yeah. Yeah, I killed him. I had to do it. I killed him. I killed him. Well, that was the end of the case. Brilliant piece of work on my part, I, uh, I thought. Going through that little tableau of making Curtis believe uh, he was on his deathbed and had nothing to lose by confessing the murder. And, uh, <laughs> oh, I love that urban... He's so proud of the fact that he confined his remarks to the truth when he was talking with Curtis. All he said was, you haven't long to live. Remember? Huh? That, uh, that was true enough. Curtis was executed a few months later. Which proves that the theory about perfect crimes is as foolish as a sure way to beat roulette. And, uh, Betty... Well, I, uh, I left her in a theater when I started out on this case. It cost me about, uh, oh, just about what I made, a thousand bucks, to get her over her peeve. So, 
I broke about even on the deal. Oh, well, you know the old saying, a fool and his money are some party. <laughs> you know what I mean? This is Dick Powell again, ladies and gentlemen. Hope you enjoyed our story tonight. Ray Buffum wrote it. Leith Stevens composed and conducted the music, and D. Engelbach produced and directed. Don't forget, you've all got a date with us next Thursday night. We have a story for you about uh, the last time Rogue saw prison. So make a date with us, will you? Thanks for listening. And now, once again, here's Jim Doyle. Be with us again at the same time next week. Oh, and be sure to see Dick Powell in his latest RKO picture, Cornered, at your local theater soon. Remember, tune in next Thursday, same time, same station, when you will again hear Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. Remember, if dandruff is your problem, ask for Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo. It's the only shampoo made whose guarantee to remove dandruff is backed by one of the world's largest insurance firms. No other shampoo can make this statement. Ask for Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo at your drug or toilet goods counter, beauty or barber shop. Fitch is spelled F-I-T-C-H. The F.W. Fitch Company presents Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. W. Fitch Company, makers of Fitch's saponified coconut oil shampoo and Fitch's shaving creams, presents Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue. In Rogue's Gallery. For the benefit of those who tuned in hoping to hear Cass Daly, may I introduce myself? My name is Richard Rogue. I'm a private investigator. <laughs> I said it and I'm glad. Private investigator. That's the Harvard way of saying I'm a guy who has parlayed a hard head and a great curiosity about other people's affairs into a career. At least that's the way the homicide squad's Lieutenant Urban, who shares my interest in unalive bodies, feels about me. And I'd also better tell you now that I have a certain personal idiosyncrasy. I hold audible consultations with my alter ego once in a while when I'm confused and in need of advice. His name is Ugor, which is rogue spelled backwards, and he's a very fresh little spook. Of course, I wouldn't have known I had an alter ego if Betty Callahan, the girl I would rather be marooned on a desert island with than not, hadn't browbeaten me into reading Sigmund Freud. Betty, who is the sharpest newspaper woman in town, extends upward about five feet from the floor, has hair the color of cordovan leather and firelight, and a tip-tilted Irish nose shying away from the most kissable mouth in the world. She's, well, she's wonderful. And on this day I'm going to tell you about, she and I had had lunch together. She had an hour to kill, so she walked back to my office with me. You know, Richard, this is much too nice a day to work. Look, Betty, if you can get rid of that assignment you have for this afternoon, we'll go to the races, huh? Oh, I haven't been out this year. I got some information from Herb Hyde at the cigar store in the lobby. He gave me two horses who gave him their word they were ready today. Talking horses? Only to Herb. They don't speak English, but fortunately he speaks horse. <laughs> now get on the phone and ask that slave driver at your city desk for the afternoon off. Tell him you have to go to your grandmother's wedding or something. Well, I'll try it, but it's not going to work, and I know it. Just sit right down there and pay no attention to that sign asking you to leave a nickel in the cigar box for every call. Oh, thank you. Oh, it's nothing. It's nothing. I'll do anything for the girl I love. 
Better think of something better than my grandmother's wedding. I know. I'll tell him I want to go to the race. Okay, but you're, you're, you're Richard Rogue? Yeah. A detective in New York named Clement Cohan referred me to you. My name is Charles McDonald. Yeah, I got his letter. I got to see you. Right away. Uh, go on in that office there. I'll, I'll be in in a minute. All right. Please, hurry. What was the matter with him? He looked sick. Oh, probably been drinking. I, I noticed that from the... Oh, wait a minute. Hello, give me the city desk, please. Now, make it a good story. Tell him that your grandmother... Hello, Walter. This is Betty Callahan. Look, um, can you put somebody else on that Struble story this afternoon? I want to go to the races. Uh, but, Walter... Yes, but... Uh, okay. What did he say? No. Oh. He told me to get right back to the paper, and I like my job, so here I oh, go. Oh, well, then wait a minute, wait a minute. I'll go in and talk with this guy, give him a quick brush and go over with you. Maybe I can talk Walter into letting you take the afternoon off for the betterment of racing, huh? Well, you'll have to hurry. Walter's mad. Well, just take it easy. I'll be right back. Hey. Hey, what's the matter? Oh, good Lord. Betty. Richard, what happened? Oh, he fell out of his chair. Yeah. Get Herbert on the phone and call him for an ambulance. Oh, Rich. He's dead. Yeah. Yeah, very dead. We'll continue our story in just a moment. First, impressions often count a lot. And remember, the appearance of your hair is an important factor in impressing people favorably the first time you meet them. Fitch's dandruff remover shampoo can be a real help to you in attaining the well-groomed hair that people admire. For Fitch shampoo removes every trace of that enemy of good grooming, dandruff. It's the only shampoo made whose guarantee to remove dandruff is backed by one of the world's largest insurance firms. There's nothing magical in the way Fitch shampoo removes dandruff. It's simply that it has a special solvent action that penetrates the thousands of tiny hair openings on the scalp, cleansing them thoroughly and dissolving every trace of dandruff. That means not only the loose flakes of dandruff, but the kind that clings to the scalp as well. Then Fitch forms an abundance of fluffy lather that carries away the dissolved dandruff flakes. It rinses out easily and leaves the hair sparkling clean, completely free from dandruff. Try Fitch's dandruff remover shampoo yourself for the appearance that impresses. Now back to Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. <laughs> I should be inured to the sight and smell of sudden death by this time, but it always does something to me. It freezes my stomach and gives me a dull ache at the base of my brain. When I left Betty Callahan on the phone in my reception room and walked into my private office, I found my mysterious visitor falling forward out of his chair in death. I knelt by his side and loosened the long top coat he was wearing. The front of his suit and his shirt were red and there were two bullet holes. One to the right of his heart, and one a little below it. I tried to blame myself for not talking to him at once, for not understanding that his staggering, shuffling gait was not caused by drinking, but by loss of blood. I looked in his billfold for identification. His name was Charles McDonald, and he was assistant manager of a Park Avenue jewelry store in New York. There was a piece of paper in his hand. I looked at it. It carried an address... 1392 Squirrel Hill. I put the paper in my pocket. Then I heard the outer office door open and the feminine voice said, Is this Mr. Rogue's office? I jumped to my feet and ran out there, closing the door behind me. There was a girl standing by the desk talking to Betty, a dark girl. She had a, she had a figure with enough O's in it to put it in the million dollar column. And it faced a match. Betty said, This is Mr. Rogue. Where's my husband? Well, I'm sure I don't know. What's his name? Charles McDonald. He's here. I saw him come in. Well, that's very interesting. Excuse me, Mama. Betty, are they on their way? Yes, both of them. Thanks. Now, uh, Mrs. McDonald, what makes you think your husband is here? I saw him come in here. You were on the elevator with him? No. I just happened to be passing on the street. I saw Charles and spoke to him. He didn't even look at me. He walked right by. I couldn't understand it. He looked sick. I saw him come into this building. I followed him in. Oh, where have you been all this time? I missed his elevator. 
Why are you questioning me like this? I know he's here. I want to see him. Well, if you missed his elevator, what makes you think he's here? This is a big building, you know. I waited for his elevator to come back to the ground floor. I talked with the operator. He remembered my husband and told me that Charles had asked for your office. Where is he, Mr. Rogue? Where is he? Uh, Mrs. McDonald, would you uh, just please have a chair? He's, uh, he's here all right, but he's busy. You'll have to wait. Oh, hello, Lieutenant Urban. Come in. Well, Rogue, what goes on? Where's the... Urban, uh, I want to see you in the next office. Follow me, will you? Well, he sure did. How did it happen, Rogie? I'll tell you all I know. He came in here looking pretty sick. I, I thought he'd been drinking. That long top coat he had on covered the fact that he was bleeding to death. I told him to come in here and wait. I came in about two minutes later, just as he pitched forward out of his chair and died. That's when I called you, or uh, had Betty call you. She was here when he came in, saw the whole thing. Mm, looks like a thirty-eight caliber job. Two around the heart. His name is Charles McDonald, and he's from New York City. Oh, that's interesting. Who's the girl outside with Callahan? Uh, his wife. Well, where does she fit in here? Well, she... Mr. McDonald, you can't go in there. I want to see Mr. Rose. Sit down. I'm going in there. No, Mr. McDonald, no, you can't go in there. I know he's in there. I'm going in. Huh? Charles! Charles! Well, when that girl saw Charles McDonald lying there, as dead as yesterday's beer, she folded up right over him like a dropped piece of string. Urban and Betty and I were still working over when the medical examiner and the technical squad from Homicide showed up. We picked her up, carried her into the outer office. As soon as she came to, Betty gave her a glass of water, which she sipped nervously when Urban started throwing questions at her like baseballs. Mrs. McDonald, I'm sorry to have to question you at this time. Will you please put that glass down and listen to me? Now, your husband was obviously murdered. I have to have the information. I don't know who could have done it. My husband was a businessman. He wasn't mixed up in anything that could have caused his murder. Now, what kind of business was your husband in? He was in the jewelry business. Manager of a big store in New York. Mm-hmm. Richard, what was I your address to get in back New York? to the paper. Mm-hmm. I have to get the story in. Okay, wait a minute and I'll walk out of the hall with you. All right, come Where on. are you going, Rogie? Uh, I'm taking Betty to a cab. I'll be back. See that you are. Come on. What are you doing pulling me along like this? I have high heels on. I'm in a hurry, baby. But you told Lieutenant Urban you'd be right back. I told him I'd be back and I will. My rent's paid for another month. Well, where are you going? To do a little investigating. That's what it says in my card, investigator. Now, look, honey, when we get downstairs, I'm going to have to leave you. I'll see you tonight here at the office at 7 o'clock. Going down. Hello, Mr. Rogue. Hi, Shorty. Drop this thing, will you? I'm in a hurry. I shot out of that building like a bat out of a belfry and jumped into a cab. I slipped the cab jockey a bill that made his eyes pop open like dropped eggs and told him he could keep it. If he could get me to 1392 Squirrel Hill in five minutes. That's the address I found in Charles McDonald's hand. We broke every law but the 18th Amendment the next four minutes and 50 seconds. And I jumped out of the cab, hit the front steps of that big deserted looking old house in the dead run. The door was ajar... So I took my gun out of its shoulder holster, put it in my side coat pocket, and walked right in, into a blackjack. Oh! My glazed eyes told my brain there was a dead man lying there. And then my head hit one of the stars which were surrounding me, and the star exploded with a blinding flash. I felt myself flying upward at a speed that made me dizzy. I was grabbing at the tails of comets, trying to break my speed, but nothing could stop me. I looked down at the earth, and it seemed I seemed to be looking through the wrong end of a telescope. It was a little round ball, that's all. I couldn't get my breath. I fought for it, fought for it. And then my lungs seemed to explode, and everything was peaceful. I opened my eyes... And I was on cloud eight, my home away from home. Ugor was sitting there, dangling his little short legs over eternity and combing his long white beard with his stubby fingers. <laughs> Hello, Rogie. Been using your head for a blackjack back stuff again, huh? Oh, never mind the cracks. I feel awful. Who did it? <laughs> Some big guy, 
I never saw the boy. Uh, but why would he want to hit me? Well, you must have been interfering in his business, Chiefy. There was a dead man in that room, you know. Yeah, uh, I know it. What was I doing there? I'm a little foggy. Well, you went there because it was the address that was printed on that piece of paper you found in Charles McDonald's hand. Remember? Oh. Oh, yeah. Hey, I, I, uh, I better get downstairs. I, I got a work to do. Help me over the side, will you, Hugo? Oh, look, Rogi. There's no dough in this case for you. Why don't you get out of it? You want to get yourself killed for free? I'll get out of it if I ever get back downstairs. Give me a shove, will you? I'm going down there. Okay, Chiefy. But take care of yourself now. So long, Rogi. <laughs> Opened one eye carefully. Then I closed it again so fast that I was afraid the guy who was watching me would hear it snap. He was a big man, and his eyes were the blue of ice cubes. Ice cubes with floodlights behind them. Hot ice. One of his hands was holding a gun, and the gun was pointed right where my heart would have been if it hadn't been in my throat. No use playing possum now, Mr. Rose. Mm. No, indeed. Mm. I am aware that you have returned to consciousness. Oh, now, now, who are you? My name is Moore. Now come, Mr. Rogue. I realize that you undoubtedly have a headache, probably a splitting headache, and I'm regretful. But we can finish our business in just a moment if you'll sit up and talk with me. Okay, uh, I'll try. Excellent, excellent. Now, Mr. Rogue, where is it? Where is what? Now, now, time is of the essence. Let us not waste it. You know what I'm speaking of. The Star of Savoy. Where is it? You, uh, you have to believe me. I, I don't know whether you're talking about a burlesque dancer, a passenger liner, or a military decoration. What is the Star of Savoy, and why am I supposed to know something about it? You're jesting, of course. Oh, believe me, I never jest with a head like this. Look, uh, Messi, you got the wrong number. Do you think I killed this man here? Oh, indeed I don't. He was killed by a man named Charles MacDonald. Uh, you know Mr. MacDonald, of course. Oh, vaguely, vaguely, yes. He, he was dead when I met him. Uh, delightful sense of humor. I always admire a man with a sense of humor. Good. Well, then, look, I am going to get out of here. Well, that's possible. Entirely possible. After you tell me where I may find the Star of Savoy, Mr. Rogue. I don't know. I don't know anything about it. Don't even know what it is. It's a large diamond, Mr. Rogue. One of the largest in the world. Formerly owned by the Hohenzollern family. Recently the property of a New York collector of famous jewels. It's a magnificent jewel, Rogue. Magnificent. Where is it? I don't know. I suppose you think I came here after it. Oh, I wouldn't know about that, Mr. Rogue. But you say you met my friend Charles MacDonald after he was dead. Very cleverly put. But when MacDonald left here, he went from here directly to your office. He was carrying the Star of Savoy in his coat. I know that to be true. I was following him. Uh, we, we searched him, the police and I. He didn't have the Star of Savoy or any other diamond over a carrot any place on him. That's the truth. Only thing I found on him was this address. That's why I came here. That's very strange. Yes, quite baffling. Uh, have you met a strikingly beautiful girl... Tall, dark black hair, brown eyes, uh, very appealing. You, uh, you mean MacDonald's wife? Uh, well, yes, MacDonald's wife. Uh, you've met her? Uh, yes, yeah, she, uh, she was at my office when he died. Uh, who is this stiff here? Oh, uh, a former partner of mine. He was attempting to double-cross me, poor fellow. You see, Rogue, he and I had a market for the Star of Savoy, a very fine market. That's why we hope to get it from Mr. MacDonald today. MacDonald was most unreasonable, most unreasonable. Of course, I intend to continue in my efforts to acquire the Star of Savoy. Uh, this dark young lady, Mrs. Uh, MacDonald, was she alone with him at any time? Either while he was alive or after his death? Oh, no. I, well, she came into my office and saw that he was dead and fainted. Oh, I see. Well, Mr. Rogue, I'm inclined to believe your story about knowing nothing about my diamond. I think I'll be running along. But just to make sure that you don't use your meager talents to pursue me, I'll have to... Oh! (laughs) 
We'll return to our story in just a moment. First, one often hears that a woman's eyes, the window to the soul, are her most expressive features. But did you ever consider that a woman's hair can be very expressive, too? It can tell the world whether the woman is fastidious or careless. That's why so many millions of smart women depend on Fitch's dandruff remover shampoo to make their hair express good care and exquisite grooming. For Fitch's dandruff remover shampoo is a thorough cleansing agent. And while it cleanses, it also reconditions the hair. This reconditioning action perks up drab and tired hair strands, gives them more elasticity and a bright, gleaming texture. Then, since Fitch's dandruff remover shampoo is completely soluble in water, it leaves no dull, soapy film on your hair. It rinses out quickly and leaves the hair shining and lustrous. Let your hair be an expression of loveliness. Ask your beauty operator to give you a professional application of Fitch's dandruff remover shampoo or buy an economical bottle at your drug or toilet goods counter. Fitch is spelled F-I-T-C-H. Now back to Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. Well, what had started out to be a lovely, lucid day had certainly turned out to be as ugly and mad as a giraffe with a sore throat. The date I had with Betty Callahan had been interrupted by a stranger walking into my office and dropping dead of pre digested murder. I got knocked silly and came to to find a guy named Moore politely annoyed with me about a diamond I'd never seen. So annoyed with me, in fact, that he was determined to kick my teeth out. I saw that big shoe swing from my jaw, and I ducked right into it. Oh, it would have been so easy for me to pass out again. But I fought it. I couldn't. I needed the time. I vaguely heard the fading footsteps of Mr. Moore through the aura of pain which was surrounding me like a fog. And after he'd faded out, I, I sat there for a while. Then I got to my hands and knees and crawled until my head cleared a little. When I got to my feet, I ran out of the house, grabbed a cab for the Park Crest Hotel. I thought I'd find more there looking for Mrs. McDonald. Oh, I must have looked like a hit-and-run victim as I approached the very proper clerk. He backed away, but I reached across the counter and grabbed him. Let go of me! I want some information. I want it fast. What room is Mrs. Charles McDonald of New York City in? Mrs. McDonald? Stop stalling. What's her room number? We have a Mr. McDonald, but there is no Mrs. McDonald. His wife is in New York. How do you know that? I... I sent a wire to her for him last night. There's no Mrs. McDonald out here. And now let me go before I call the house officer. I remembered then... Mr. Moore had hesitated when I pegged that tall, dark girl as Mrs. McDonald. That girl was an imposter. My head was still doing the Virginia reel with variations on the turns, but I couldn't slow up now. In spite of the racket inside my skull, I was thinking straight and clearly. I ran to my office. It was only a block. And I got that glass that Mrs. McDonald had been twirling in her fingers as Urban questioned her. I took it down to police headquarters and asked the sergeant of the fingerprint bureau to dust it for prints and tell a photo of the prints to the FBI in Washington. I told him he could find me in my office. I went back to my office and sank into my swivel chair and let sleep take over. Wake up, Richard. Mm-hmm. Huh? Richard, what has happened to you? Oh, mm. honey, you look so awful. Oh, oh, hmm. Oh, Betty, how? Oh. Mm. Hello, baby. What are you doing here? It's seven o'clock, Richard. You told me to meet you here at seven o'clock. Seven? Mm-hmm. Oh, seven it is? Oh, hey. What about those fingerprints? Fingerprints? Yeah, excuse me a minute, baby. I, I gotta call the identification bureau. You should be in a hospital. Oh, Richard, you can't take me to dinner looking like that. Well, honey, I think how I feel. Mm. Mm. Identification Bureau, Sergeant James. Uh, Sergeant, this is Richard Rogue. Did you get an answer from the FBI on those prints I gave you? Yeah, it just came in, Rogue. They belong to a girl named Alice Ryan. Three years ago when they took them at the aircraft company where she worked. 
She lived at 4435 Ethel Avenue in North Hollywood. Any criminal record? Arrested once in a competence rep four years ago. Dismissed for lack of evidence. Thanks, Sarge. I owe you a cigar. Come on, Betty. We're going to go to North Hollywood. I'll explain why in a cab. Come on. No, Alice does not live here anymore. She moved into Los Angeles about uh, seven months ago when she quit her job at the airplane factory. Uh, did she leave a forwarding address? Oh, yes. I'll get it for you. Just a minute. You think she has the diamond, don't you, Richard? Sure. She lifted it off McDonald's body when she fainted over him. Oh, how awful. Here it is. It is a long drive from here in Los Angeles. Thanks. <laughs> Alice Ryan? No, she doesn't live here anymore. She came into money or something. She lives in Hollywood now. You know uh, her dress there? A uh, big guy around here after an hour ago. It's uh, North uh, Serrano. No, wait a minute. I'll get it for you. A big man? That's the man? Yeah, who... yeah that's the man. He has an hour's head start. Uh, here, here it is. I wrote it down for you. Oh, thank you, sir. <laughs> Okay, now, Betty. Now, ring the bell and then stand back. Clear back against the wall and stay away from the windows. All right, Richard. You take care of yourself now. I always do. Now stand where you are, and I'll go knock on the door. All right. You stay right there, Betty. I'm going to try the door. Now stay where you are. I will. Come in. Come in, Mr. Rogue, and don't attempt to be clever because you present a beautiful target there in the doorway. Where's Alice Ryan? She's here. Drop your gun, please, Mr. Rogue. I can see you, you know. I have a bit of advantage. Drop your gun, Mr. Rogue. Close the door, Mr. Rogue. Now that I've turned the light on, you can see that you have found Alice Ryan. Oh, brother. Yes. I'm sorry. I was forced to eliminate her, Mr. Rogue. She was most unreasonable about giving me the Star of Savoy. She chose to pit her ordinary brain against my genius in this race to see who would be the possessor of the stone after Charles MacDonald was eliminated. And now, Mr. Rogue, you find yourself in much the same position. Yeah, I guess I'm not very smart. You, uh, you have the diamond? Indeed, I have. And I think perhaps you deserve a glimpse of it. There. Is that not the most inspiring sight you've ever seen, Mr. Rogue? Look at it, glistening there. A hundred people have died, I would imagine, Mr. Rogue, in the history of this stone. Yes, at least a hundred. I have spent the last ten years scheming, contriving, bribing, stealing to get this lovely thing. And now, Mr. Rogue, it's mine. Yeah, you got it. What are you going to do with it? Just sit there and look at it? I can get a million dollars for it. A million in cold cash and no questions asked. A million dollars. I'm not at all sure that that is enough, Mr. Rogue. And now, I'm afraid I'm going to be forced, regretfully, to remove you. There was cold murder in the ice blue eyes that were looking into mine. Moore was enjoying every breath of my last few minutes on Earth. He was waiting for me to break. And all the time, he was talking in that cultured iceberg voice. Then I saw Betty. She was hugging the wall in the next room, creeping silently toward the killer. I wanted to shout at her. To shout at her, to tell her to go away. And then... Richard! Richard, are you all right? Yeah, yeah, I knocked his gun up in the air when you scared him silly. Oh, Betty, Betty, bless your little pointed head, but why did you do it? Oh, Richard. Betty, well, of all the times to faint... Isn't that just like a woman? Well, the police took it from there, and the story was pretty plain. Moore was the head of a gang of international jewel thieves, consisting of the man I found dead on Squirrel Hill, Alice with the dark black hair, and himself. They uh, had offered Charles McDonald a fortune to steal the Star of Savoy from the Park Avenue establishment where he was employed and where it was on exhibition. They planned to kill him when he delivered the stone. But the trio triple-crossed themselves, and finally only Moore remained alive, which was a temporary thing, because Moore soon paid the final score for the murders he committed. And, uh, well, I got a $5,000 reward for breaking the case. 
$5,000 for just getting batted around a little. <laughs> Isn't bad, is it, huh? I, uh, I split the reward with Betty Callahan, who certainly saved my life. And she went right out and spent her half on a fur cape. You know, women should never have money. They don't know how to handle it. Of course, the first time she wore the cape, she looked so lovely that I took her to the races and lost my half on a horse named Investigator. Oh, well, money isn't as important as true love, but there's a lot more of it. You know what I mean? This is Dick Powell again, ladies and gentlemen. It's awfully nice to meet you on a new network. I hope you enjoyed our story tonight. Ray Buffum wrote it. Leith Stevens composed and conducted the music in D. Engelbach, produced and directed. Be with us again next Sunday, will you? We have a story for you about a triangle, a rendezvous, and a plan that failed. We call it Lady with a Gun. Thanks for listening, and now here's Jim Doyle. Listen again next week at this same time to hear Dick Powell as Private Investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. Laugh a while at a song be your style, you stitch shampoo. Don't despair, you your head, save your hair, you stitch shampoo. After and between Fitch shampoos, you can keep your hair shining and manageable by using a few drops of Fitch's Ideal Hair Tonic every day. Fitch's Ideal Hair Tonic is not sticky or greasy, yet it gives your hair that well-groomed look. Box 13, with the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd, as Dan Holliday. Box 13. Box 13. Box 13. They stood in the warm rays of the autumn sun while the wind played in the girl's hair. Oh, no, not that. Susie. Hello, Mr. Holliday. Oh, no, not what? I'm referring to the story I'm writing. Better forget the story, Mr. Holliday. I've got mail for you. So? What's new in Box 13? Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Now for Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Uh, let's see. Where was I? Oh. But Betty forgot her dignity as she fell and bumped her head against the tree which stood nearby. Oh, brother. Mr. Holliday. Uh, what's that, Susie? I said that maybe the mail from Box 13 might give you an idea. Today there were two letters. Two? Yes, mm-hmm. One of them is a big, fat envelope. Now, who in the world would send me a big, fat envelope? The police department. It's a block of tickets for their annual ball. What's the other one? Mmm, this one smells all romantic-like. It has the odor of Christmas night. Or, uh, maybe it's Easter morn. Or maybe it's Tuesday afternoon. Here, let's have it. Hmm. If you will really do anything, what I have to ask is very, very little. Please meet me in North Park at 10 o'clock tonight. I'll be waiting at the bench near the entrance to the bridle path. Signed, Anonymous. It couldn't have been very romantic, Mr. Holliday. Oh, why not, Susie? I don't see stars in your eyes. Well, take another look, Susie. Tonight at 10 o'clock. An anonymous note A rendezvous in the park at night Well, I must admit it's better than the yarn I was writing At least it's got a good start The question is, what's the ending? 
Well, this is the park, and the clock says ten. There's the bench at the end of the bridal path. And that's all there is. Hey, wait a minute. Is that? No, it couldn't be. A little girl, sound asleep, nobody else around. What's she doing out here alone this time of night? Little girl. Wake up, little girl. Wake up. Oh, I'm sorry. The Sandman came and I was supposed to stay awake. Now, what are you doing here? Waiting. Well, aren't you cold? No, I'm not cold. I have a nice new coat. See? <laughs> yes, it's very pretty. But for whom are you waiting? I'm waiting for the man. What man? He comes out of a box. It has a number. Oh, no. You don't mean box 13? Yes, that's it. How did you know? Because I'm the man. Oh, I'm so glad. You're nice. I like you a lot. Well, thanks. Who told you about the man from box 13? One of my mothers. Mothers? You've got more than one? Of course, I got two. You're a very remarkable little girl. How do you happen to have two mothers? I don't know. Just happened, I guess. What's your name? Janie. I mean, uh, what's your other name? I promised I wouldn't tell. Now, whom did you promise? My mother. Oh, your mother. Uh, the first one or the second one? The first one, naturally. Forgive me, I, I'm so stupid tonight. Where do you live, Janie? I had two homes. I couldn't find either one. Mm, that's great. Look, Janie, what are you going to do? I'm going with you because I like you and I promised I would. Mm, so that's it. Oh, no, you're not. I'm going to take you to the police station. My mother said you wouldn't. Why wouldn't I? My mother said you were a nice man who was smarter than any policeman ever was. Janie, flattery will get you nowhere. What flattery? That's something you've probably already learned from your mother. Now, do you know where you live? Sure, I live in the house. And do you know where the house is? Well, first you have to walk down this block to Jack Black's drugstore. Well, come on. And then if we get to the drugstore, we turn left and walk a block. Oh, that's where you live? No, no. That's the corner where Johnson's toy shop is. Now, Janie. And then we turn right and go two blocks. <sighs> That's home. That's where the ice cream fire is. Now, stop that, Janie. Tell me how to get to your home. Well, you walk half a block up that street. That's home. Oh, that's your home. No, that's David's home. Hmm. So you're not going to tell me where you live, is that it? I think maybe you'd better look at my book first. It's grim fairy tales. Only they're not grim at all. They're nice. You want me to read to you? At ten o'clock at night? You know, young lady, it's way past your bedtime. No. No, I want you to read the letter that's in my book. Mommy said to tell you about it. Letter? Well, let me see uh -huh. that. Well, how do you like this? Please take care of my little Janie for me. I shall communicate with you in a little while. Let no one, even the police, take her away. Believe me when I say you're doing nothing illegal. Just helping out. Her mother. Hmm. You're not. I like your voice. What's your name? Dan. A sucker if there ever was one. <laughs> This is not good. A small girl left in your care with no more authority than a letter. Suppose the woman who wrote this letter isn't Janie's real mother. Hmm. Then, Holiday, you're in trouble. But suppose she is the real mother. Why should she leave her child with a perfect stranger? Why? Well, there's only one thing to do. Take her to your apartment. Come on, Janie girl. Let's go. Let's hope that the neighbors won't see you bringing home a little girl. Because that happens to be one item you don't win at a bingo game. Uh, put it down on the couch, Holiday. Mm, that's it. Never knew a kid could have so much strength in her arms, did you? Uh, feels kind of good, too. Better get a blanket to put over. Better yet, stupid, put her in your bed. 
Well, Holiday, it looks like you're sleeping on the couch tonight. I wonder who she is and what this is all about. Hello? Dan Holiday? Yes? The man from Box 13? Yes? How's my little girl? Did you get home all right? How did you get my phone number? That's not important. How do you know who I am? Please, how is my little girl? She's asleep. Oh, thank heavens. I heard the bell ringing. Uh, she just woke up. Is she all right? She's fine, but... I'm on a fairy tale. Just a minute, honey. How long will it take you to get over here? Oh, I can't come over there now. I'm afraid to. Uh, lady, which mother are you? I don't understand you. She says she's got two. I'm her real mother. Well, then get over here and take her. I can't explain now, but please, Mr. Holiday, keep her just for a few days. A few days? And don't give her up to anyone, not even the police. Now, how do I know this is on the level? You don't. You just have to trust me. I promise you, you'll never regret it. I don't like any part of this, except Janie. You'll understand soon, Mr. Holiday. And remember, be very careful. Both Janie and you are in danger. You're right, our Holiday. How do you like this plot? A mother gives a little girl to a strange man, warning him not to give the child up to anyone. Not even the police. And then she admits there's danger. Janie. That's all right, baby. Are you hurt? I didn't want to. I wanted my very temple. No, don't cry, honey. That was a nasty old lamp anyway. All it did was throw off a lot of light. Are you a night man? Are you my daddy? No, Janie. My daddy went away when I was a baby. Why can't you be my daddy? Hmm. It's getting late, honey. Aren't you sleepy? Not anymore. Read me a fairy tale, Daddy. In the morning, Janie. Now you'd better get to bed. Have you got a doll? No, I'm sorry. No doll. Teddy bear? No teddy bear. You must be awful lonesome. Maybe you've got something there, little lady. Daddy? Hmm? All right, honey. Let's see now. Once upon a time, there were three bears. The papa bear, the mama bear, and, and the... the baby ba- bear. I know that story. Hmm. Okay, uh, let's see. Once upon a time, there was a little girl named Red Riding Hood, and, and the... And the wolf ate up her grandmother. I know that one, too. Uh, Janie, maybe you should tell me the stories. Oh, let's see. Once upon a time, there was a boy named Jack who planted a bean seed. And it grew up into a mighty tall vine. And, and he, he climbed into the sky and killed a bad giant. I know that one, too. Whew. Saved by the bell. Hello, Holiday. Oh, Lieutenant Kling. Holiday, you're in a jam. Lieutenant Kling of the police department doesn't drop in on people unless there's trouble. Watch your step, boy. Well, aren't you going to ask me in? Oh, uh, sure, sure. Come in, Lieutenant. That's better. Uh, anything wrong? Well, that's what I dropped in to find out. When you stay out of the department's hair for more than two weeks, I begin to worry. Hmm. Haven't been doing a thing, Lieutenant. Not a thing. Besides, I want to know if you got those tickets to the ball. Hello. Yeah. Well, what's this? A little girl. Oh, thanks, Holiday. Uh... What's your name, young lady? Vicky. Uh, uh, Vicky Preston. Oh, no, it isn't. It isn't? <laughs> uh, holiday. Great little kid. Her dandy sense of humor likes to pretend she's somebody uh, else. <laughs> uh, all children do. Who is he, Daddy? Daddy? Holiday, my boy. See what I mean? Who is he, Daddy? He's a cop. A policeman, honey. Lieutenant Kling. Oh, I like policemen. And I like little girls. Got two of them myself. The writing business slow these days, aren't they? How do you mean? Oh, I thought you might be picking up a few bucks babysitting. Oh, oh yes, just helping out a friend. No, I could use you sometime. My wife and I like to get out every now and then. What's your price to sit with my kids? Well, that depends. Uh, are your children anything like you? No, holiday. Oh, I'm just asking, just asking. Glad to accommodate any time. Yep, see you around, holiday. Yeah, I'll see you. Your hand is shaking. Never mind, Jane. 
It's time you went to sleep. There's something about a kid asleep. Maybe I'm glad this happened. Hmm. Got to use more kids in my stories after this. You know, it wouldn't be a bad idea to have one around all the time. What am I saying? Now what? Lay off. You'll wake the kid. You Dan Holliday? Yeah, that's right. And I'd like to come inside and talk with you. If you don't mind, I'd rather talk out in the doorway. Very well, I'll, I'll be direct. You have a little girl here named Janie, about five years old. Why? My name is Sam Parker. That mean anything? No. I've got a letter here authorizing me to take the little girl away. You're her father? Read the letter, then hand over the child. No. Very well, I'll call the police. I wish you would. Can I use the phone down the hall? I'm sorry about this. But get inside, then. Keep your hands over your head. Put down that gun. What do you think you're pulling? Uh, shut up and get inside. Oh, there she is. Put down that gun, I said. You come with me, Holiday. Just keep those hands high. And I said you're staying here. Move over to that wall. Stay away from her, I said. One more move and you... Think so. Harry! Harry, help! Hit him with the gun, Harry, now! I got him! <laughs> You are listening to Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Nice going, Holliday. Very nice. You advertise in the newspaper for adventure and you get a little girl. Then you lose her to a man with a gun. You don't even know the mother's name or where she is. Now what? Mr. Holliday, I'm Wanda Parker, Janie's mother. Is she all right? You're the woman who called me on the phone? Yes. My baby, where is she? You're a fine one to be asking that after you leave her alone on the park bench. I was there hiding. I saw you take... Where is she? You shouldn't have let her go in the first place. Mr. Holliday, where is she? She's not here. Not here? What have you done with my daughter? You're her real mother? Of course I am. Where is she? What's happened? The man came in. And you let him take the child? I'm sorry. There was nothing I could do. He had a friend and a gun. They knocked me out. When I came to, Janie was gone. This, this man, did he have black hair and very thick eyebrows? Yes, he said his name was Parker. Oh, no. No, it couldn't be. Mr. Holliday, we've got to get her back right away. Before I do anything, you're going to tell me a few things. Then we'll decide. Who's that? I don't know. Right now, I wouldn't even care to guess. Is there a back door? Can I get out without being seen? Yeah, through the kitchen. There's a door leads out into the hall. What are you afraid of? Harley, open the door. Do you know who that is? Yes, yeah, a police officer, Lieutenant Kling. You must have seen him. I'll call you later. All right, all right, I'm coming. What took you so long to open the door? Uh, can a man get some sleep? With your shoes on? My feet are cold. Get inside. All right, Miss Hatton. Are you sure this is the man, Lieutenant? Do you think he could have taken Janie away? I'm not sure of anything, but what you told me, he's just the type that could dream up a little nightmare like this. Lieutenant, mind telling me what this is all about? Oh, I'm Mrs. Hatton, and I'm Janie's mother. I want her right this minute. Janie's mother? You're Janie's mother? Lieutenant Kling, if this man has my little Janie, make him give her up right this minute. Come on, Holiday, where is she? Or who? You know what I want, that little girl you had here half an hour ago. Janie Parker. Me? I had a little girl? Up here? Holiday. Yes, Lieutenant? I came up here to see you. I was worried about you. I didn't know how right I was. And I appreciated your interest. Shut up. When I came up here, there was a little girl around. Now, where is she? Kling, you have my word. I, I don't know. Maybe you can remember down at headquarters. I can't remember something I didn't know in the first place. He doesn't look like the type who would have taken Janie. Oh, thank you. Now, Mrs. Hatton, if you'd tell me what this is all about, maybe I could help you. My little girl disappeared tonight. I was frantic. I called the police. I got the report right after I got up here to see you, Holiday. From the description, I'd say you had Janie Parker right here. But you're not sure. Maybe you'd like to prove to me where you got the little girl I saw up here, eh? Come on, come on, tell me. Lieutenant, you'd never believe me. 
Now, where is that little girl now? Can you tell me that? No, I can't. But suppose I produced the girl and you found out it wasn't the same one. Holiday, what are you driving at? I just want a chance to produce the girl. How about it, Kling? I think you're pulling another one of your fast shenanigans. I ought to lock you up. But I'm inclined to give you a chance. What kind of a chance? I'm giving you three hours to find that little girl. Three hours? Then I'll be back, Holiday. So don't try anything funny. Lieutenant, at the moment, I have practically no sense of humor left. At least you're not in jail, Holiday. The good lieutenant walked out with Mrs. Hatton. You're as free as a bird on the wing for three hours. If you were as smart as that bird, you'd wing out of town until this blows over. Mr. Holiday. You. They're gone. You've been listening? Yes, at the kitchen door. Now, look, if you're Janie's mother and Mrs. Hatton is Janie's Mr. mother... Mr. Holiday, can... there's no time to explain. Wait a minute. Then who is Sam Parker? He's not Sam Parker. He's... He's Sam Clark. Oh, I see. Because Janie has two mothers, Sam Parker turns out to be Sam Clark. What are you giving me? I can clear up the whole thing, but we've got to get Janie away from Sam Clark first. Otherwise, I may never see her again. How do you go about finding a man named Sam Clark in a city this size? He doesn't live here. But I heard he drove his car down. That means he's probably staying at Brown's Motel. Uh Uh-huh. I think I'll drop out and pay him a visit. I'll go with you. No, no, I don't think that's wise. I'm going alone. Mr. Holliday... He carries a gun. You stay here. We'll get her. We'll bring Janie back. I'll try my best. I'll be waiting. After that, I'll spend a quiet weekend with a psychiatrist. This is it. Brown's Motel. Now to find a man named Sam Clark or Sam Parker. Ask the manager. That's logical. So he is here. Well, what do you do now, Holiday? You knock on the door, Sam Clark will stick a gun in your ribs. There'll be a fight and Janie might get hurt. The telephone. That's how to do it. Remember to thank the man who invented outdoor phone booths. Motel. This is one time you'd better be right, Holiday. Because if you're wrong, you're dead. And that's so permanent. Brown's Motel. I want to speak to Mr. Clark. I don't know. He, he said he didn't want to be disturbed. It's a matter of life and death. Get him to the phone. Uh, who is this? Hurry, man. I've only got a couple of minutes. Okay, I'll see. Quick, Holiday. Out of the booth and around the corner towards the back. Wait. Now. Take it easy. Here he comes. Now, Holiday, just step around to the side of the booth where you won't be seen. Hello? 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 What kind of gag is this? No gag at all, Mr. Clark. Oh. That'll take care of him long enough for me to straighten this all out. Honey, I want you to tell me the truth. You know what the truth is? Of course I do, Daddy. And tell me quickly, that man who brought you here, is he your real daddy? Oh, no. He's not my real daddy. Besides, I don't like him. Well, come on, Janie. We're getting out of here right now. I hope that's Lieutenant Kling and Mrs. Hatton. So, Holiday, you brought her back. Yeah, I, I brought her back. Oh, Janie, my baby. <laughs> I thought I'd lost you. I thought I'd never see you again. Mr. Holliday, I saw these people come in. Did you... Janie. Mommy. Janie. No, no, no. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. What is this? These are my two mommies. Holliday, would you mind explaining this little two-mother soiree you've cooked up? Lieutenant, I think you'd better listen to what Mrs. Parker has to say. I'd like to listen to anyone who can make sense out of this highly confusing little situation. Anyone but you, Holliday. Thanks. Go on, Mrs. Parker. She's Janie's mother. Well, then, who are you, Mrs. Hatton? Kling, let Mrs. Parker explain, will you? Yes, please do, Mrs. Parker. My husband's been dead for some time. I've been working out of town so I could take care of Janie. I placed her in a foundling home for the year I'd be gone. And I'm a foster mother, Lieutenant. The foundling home paid me to take care of Janie. But you two have never met, eh? That's right, Kling. Is it beginning to make sense? No. If neither of these two ladies had the child... 
Who did? A man. Named Sam Parker, who turned out to be Sam Clark. Holiday, will you cut that out? Sam Clark is my husband's cousin. He's been trying to take Janie away from me legally. That bothers me, Mrs. Parker. Why would he do that? Because there's an inheritance coming to her from her grandparents. He hopes to prove me negligent and get her custody. That way he can control the estate. And that's where I came. You see, I took Janie from Mrs. Hatton's house. I wanted to hide her. I read Mr. Holiday's ad. I gave her to him. You gave her a child, a holiday? Oh, lady, you didn't know what you were doing. No, no, just to keep until it was safe, until I could get matters straightened out with the court. Well, now I'm beginning to see the light. Uh, you satisfied, Mrs. Hatton? Of course. I'd never try to keep Janie from her mother. Mm, thank heaven for that. So I guess it's all wound up, eh, Holiday? Oh, no, not yet. There's more. Holiday, if you've got one more ramification up that sleeve of yours... I could hardly get Sam Clark up my sleeve. But I've got a hunch he should be here any minute. Oh, no. Oh, yes. Answer that all, Holiday. I'd suggest a gun in your hand, Lieutenant. A gun? What for? Oh, don't ask silly questions. Come in, Mr. Clark. Get your hands up. We've got something to settle. Meet Lieutenant Kling of the police department. What? Oh! <laughs> That's a nice right you've got, Holiday. Uh, pick up his gun. Thanks, Lieutenant. It's a pleasure. <laughs> Mr. Holiday, how can I ever thank you? Very easily. Just bring little Janie up to see me occasionally. I certainly shall. Oh, by the way, I have a suggestion for you two ladies. I think I know how you can both keep Janie. But how? What do you mean, Mr. Holiday? Suppose you, Mrs. Parker, continue with your work. Janie could stay at Mrs. Hatton's, and so could you. Oh, Mrs. Parker, if you only would. I think that's simply wonderful. Well, yes. yes. He fixed it so I can see my two mommy, didn't he? Yes, he did, darling. And would you be my real daddy? Well, now, Janie, you see, it's like this. I... <laughs> Let's see you get out of that holiday. <laughs> and would you tell me a fairy story? Oh, no, you don't catch me on that one. I'll write you one. Mr. Holiday, I think you ought to know that... Oh, what a cute little girl. Who are you, little girl? I'm Janie, and this is my daddy. Why, Mr. Holiday, you never told me. Now, look, Susie, Janie means I'm her daddy. Well, just sort of imaginary. What's imaginary about being a father? Sit down, Susie. I'll tell you all about it. I'm going to tell you a story. Boy, oh, boy. I'll bet this is going to be good. Next week, same time, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holiday in Box 13. <laughs> Alan Ladd appears through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures and may currently be seen in Wild Harvest. Box 13 is written and directed by Ted Hediger. Original music is composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. The part of Susie is played by Sylvia Pickard. This is a Mayfair production. Yukon 28209. Yes, this is Candy Matson. The National Broadcasting Company presents Candy Matson, Yukon 28209. Candy? Candy, over here. What? Why, Myra Fisher, what are you doing here in a department store with your work clothes on? I work here, dear. I'm a wage slave. Well, I must say on you, it looks good. What do you slave at? I'm head of advertising and promotion. Well, quite a spot, hey, girl? No, it was until this morning. Oh? Now my neck is in the fire. What'd you do? Forget to proofread one of your ads? Nothing so trivial, dear, believe me. But am I glad to have bumped into you? Maybe you'll change your mind when I tell you I've been shoplifting. No, I'm serious, Candy. Uh, could you spare a moment and come on up to my office? Why, sure. And wipe that frown from off your brow. It's wrinkling your makeup. Well, yours would wrinkle, too, if you had a missing Santa Claus helper on your hands. Well, well, now, there's a situation. And it almost broke Candy Matson's heart when someone told her there was no Santa Claus's helper, one Jack Frost. 
Listen, here she is now to tell you about it. That's right, what the man said. I ran into a deal where we had a missing Santa Claus helper, Jack Frost. The gent with the icicles was supposed to talk to the tiny tots at the Brownstone, one of San Francisco's larger and classier department stores. I'd gone down there that afternoon shopping. I wanted a bow tie for my old pal Inspector Ray Mallard of the San Francisco Police Department. A bow tie that lit up and spelled Cossack when you pressed the button on the battery. That was when I bumped into this gal, Myra Fisher. We went up to her office on the sixth floor and she sat me down. Cigaretted me, too. You think I'm fooling about this Jack Frost thing, don't you, Candy? Well, now, look, dear, we all have our little peccadilloes. Yours just merely happens to be a missing Jack Frost. You'll get over it. I refrain from hurling this ashtray at you, Candy, only because of our long acquaintance. Good. Now, listen to me. We've had a Santa Claus helper here for almost a month, and a darn good one. The kids were crazy about him. This morning, he didn't show. You don't suppose Jackie boy got in the mood and caught the Christmas spirit, do you? The kind that comes in pints? No, he wasn't that sort of Joe. Well, your answer's simple. Hire a new one. They're hired through an agency. I called the one we do business with, and they're fresh out of Jack Frost. And I've got to get one, Candy. Otherwise, I come down ten notches in the opinion of the brass. I don't want you to think I'm unsympathetic, Myra, but what can I do? Well, you get around, you know people. Find me somebody, anybody, who'll take over the job of being Jack Frost. <sighs> well, okay. I'll do the best I can, Myra. Candy, you're a deer. Yeah, one of Santa's deers. Okay, I'll try and find you a Jack Frost, Myra, but don't hold it against me if he turns out to look more like Humpty Dumpty. I went home and looked up the Webster definition of soft. It said soft, easily yielding to pressure. That was me, Candy Matson, girl dope. Here I had all my Christmas shopping to do, and I agreed to find a substitute for Jack Frost. I had no idea where to start, so I changed into something red and green for a stop and go, also for Christmas, and went over to see my friendly advisor, Rembrandt Watson. Rembrandt is a photographer, and excellent, too, now that he doesn't have the sherry shivers or the port palsies. He lives on California Street, just kitten rompers from old St. Mary's, with a statue of Sun Yat Sen for company in a park next door. Candy doll, how delightful. Do come in, won't you? Thanks, Rembrandt. Oh, Pat, you're acquainted with my friend Diogenes Murphy, aren't you? Oh, yes. Hello again, Mr. Murphy. Oh, well, good afternoon, lad. You look pretty at the need of the left type, I saw you. Uh-oh, here comes the blarney. Uh, young lady, Diogenes Murphy, the honest Irishman, never says a word he doesn't mean. Now, how do you think I managed to sell so many used cars at me place out on Venice Avenue? <laughs> because you're an honest Irishman. <laughs> oh, 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 you're so right, lad. <laughs> Uh, incidentally, if you need a good car, I can get you one at a very reasonable... Diogenes? Oh, sorry, I got handed away. <laughs> well, I didn't mean to barge in on you like this, Rembrandt. Well, don't be ridiculous, dear. No, don't be. Think nothing of it, lad. I'm on my way now. Uh, Rembrandt and I were only discussing the situation of the world. And to what conclusion did you come? Uh, it stinks. <laughs> the bottom of the afternoon to the both of you. <laughs> oh, he's quite a boy. Yes, I'm very fond of Diogenes. What brings you around this way, dear? Jack Frost. <laughs> yes. Now, getting on with our conversation, what brings you around this way, dear? Jack Frost. Maybe the needle's bad. Shall we try again? I know how you feel. I reacted the same way myself. I'll give you the pocket-sized edition. The Brownstone Department Store is without a Santa Claus helper, Jack Frost. He didn't show up for work this morning. I said I'd find him a new one. Well, that's very sweet of you, Dove. Very dumb of me, Dove. I know of only one character who even remotely looks like Jack Frost. I met him up in Alaska when I was traveling with the USO. Won't do you much good down here with it. No, that's why I came to see you, Rembrandt. Don't you keep a, a cross file on models you've used in photography? As a matter of fact, I do. Here in this little book. Let's see. Mm -hmm. Men, thin, extremely. I have just one, Pietro Tarantello. Would you care for a Sicilian Jack Frost? In Sicily, yes. Hey, what's that? Where? On that chair next to you. Oh, that's the afternoon paper, dear. Diogenes left it, I imagine. Yes, but on the front page. Here's the whole story about the missing Jack Frost on the front page. Ooh, what he got in his Christmas stocking. A slug through the head. That's no way to treat Jack Frost. And here's a picture of the guy without his false icicles. What the ham... Looks like he stepped right out of an 1890 Shakespearean play. I hate to say this, Rembrandt, but he resembles you. I take back what I said. 
Rembrandt. Divorce yourself from that tone of voice, Candy. I don't like it. Rembrandt, I've got an idea. You usually do. You like little children. Can't stand them. You like to talk to people. I abhor conversation. You like to be charming. Lost me charm. Gay. Lost me gay. With the help of a few icicles, Ducky, you're going to be Jack Frost. <laughs> Rembrandt fought, he argued, he paced the floor, he had the vapors, he fainted. I brought him too. I won the argument. I got my friend Myra Fisher on the phone and informed her that one R. Watson would assume the role of Jolly Jack Frost on the morrow. She was delighted. I couldn't say the same for Rembrandt. Then I went home. I was greeted by a sound very much like that of a phone ringing. Using my keen instincts, I figured it was the phone. It was. Hello, Candy Matson. Uh, how do you do, Miss Matson? Uh, allow me to introduce myself. Allowed? Uh, my name is Burke, Prentice Burke. I'm the first assistant vice president of the Brownstone. Brownstone? Oh, yes, that's a store of some kind, isn't it? Uh, yes. Uh, now, the reason for my call. Uh, there has been, uh, shall I say, a rather unfortunate occurrence in our store today. Mm, so I read. I need the help of a professional sleuth. Uh, you were highly recommended by the head of our advertising department, Miss Myra Fisher. Aha, uh -huh. the thick platen. I beg your pardon. Oh, no need to. You didn't do anything. Okay, care to talk to me now, Mr. Burke? Oh, I'd much rather have you come down to my office, Miss Batson. Uh, this matter is uh, of an extremely confidential nature. I'm your girl, then, figuratively speaking. How long will you be there? Uh, as long as necessary. Uh, that's up to you. Very well. I'll be there in half an hour if I can find a place to park. <laughs> I only had time for a fast change, so I made it from Andescray to Taboo. I sniffed at it and felt I was on the right scent. Then I climbed in my car, drove down Kearney Street, waved a crisp single under the nose of a hotel doorman and had my car taken care of. Then into the brownstone and up to Mr. Prentice Burke's office. I flipped a hip past the girl's secretary and walked on in. Burke was waiting for me. That was obvious. I could tell by the expression on his face. It was worried look number 12B. How do you do, Mr. Burke? I'm Candy Matson. Uh, oh, uh, sit down, won't you? Thank you. Now, our subject is what? Uh, a man named Jordan. That's on another network. I beg your pardon? Oh, that's all right. Uh, now, about this Jordan. Uh, yes, uh, Ralph Jordan, to be exact. Well, that's a relief. For a moment, I thought you wanted to talk about Jack Frost. Uh, that's just it. He was Jack Frost. Uh-oh, me and my big mouth. He was working here up until yesterday afternoon. And maybe you read about it. He was found shot today. Yes, yes, I read about it. That's the reason I've called you. Why didn't you have your own store detectives take over, Mr. Burke? Uh, no, no. Uh, that would never do. I want no one in the store to know what's going on. Ah, intrigue. Uh, quite possibly. I have reason to suspect that Jordan was killed by someone in our employ. I want to find out who that someone was before the police do and get it splashed all over the front pages. Publicity, can't you say? Well, uh, business has been off for uh, a whole year, and any bad breaks in the press would hurt us that much more. Maybe you've got a point there, I don't know. I know I have. Okay, I'll take the job. You say you have a suspicion. What is it? Well, nothing tangible. It's just a feeling I have. Oh, that's a big help. Well, I'll mush around and see what I can pick up. I'll bill you tomorrow for my first day's work. It's much easier to sustain a friendship on a daily basis. I left Burke looking as though someone had just called his store a bazaar. It was closing time, so I hefted my way through the crush and retrieved my car from the doorman. The Hall of Justice is right on my way home, so I decided to drop in on my old pal Mallard, Inspector Ray Mallard of San Francisco Homicide. A nice guy to serve coffee to on Sunday mornings if you could ever lasso him. I never could get strong enough rope. Candy, what brings you around here? I hate to have my Christmas ruined so early. What about that Jack Frost character? Oh, yeah. Poor guy got it good. Where'd you find him? In his apartment over on 17th. He lived near Seal Stadium. Why so interested, Candy? Rembrandt's a dead ringer for the guy. I still don't get the... The gal who's head of advertising for the Brownstone was going out of her head for another Jack Frost. I talked Rembrandt into taking the job. Oh, <laughs> does sound funny, doesn't it? Bring me up to date, Mallory. Did you get any dope on the killing? Nothing but a forty-five slug out of the guy's wall. Ballistics is checking it now. Nothing else? If I did, I should tell you. No, no, oh, I guess not. This goes beyond just a normal curiosity, Candy. What are you drilling for? Oh, it's only that I'm worried about Rembrandt. I got him the job. I'm responsible. I wouldn't want anything to happen to him. Ask a silly question, Mallard, and you get a silly answer. Okay, let's forget it. 
How's about dinner tonight? I've fought this thing long enough. Okay. Uh, Candy. Uh, yes, Ellie? We've known each other a good long time, haven't we? That's right. Ever since the fair on Treasure Island. We've had our little quarrels, little misunderstandings. Oh, but they never seem to last long, though, do they? No. That's why I feel I have every right to ask you a question. Wait, yes, I'd say you do, Mallard. Maybe I'll ask you tonight. No, 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 go ahead. Now's as good a time as any. Perhaps it is, Candy. You get around a lot. You meet people. Do you know where I can get a couple of tickets to the Rose Bowl game? My brain lit up like a Roman candle. I stormed for the door, turned back, stood there, my jaw waggling helplessly. Then I stuck my tongue out at Mallard and left. It was the only thing I could think of doing. Oh, he can make me so mad. But inside half an hour after I got home, I started to laugh. <laughs> Felt much better. Just as I was puttering around getting ready, the apartment buzzer buzzed. That Mallard, much too early. But I was wrong. It wasn't Mallard. Well, Myra, what a surprise. Do come in, won't you? No, thanks, Candy. A friend of mine's waiting in his car outside. He's driving me home. Oh, I'm sorry. You can't stay for a moment? So, my dear, I just dropped by to leave this. Merely a little token of thanks for getting me off the hook. Oh, Myra, th there wasn't any need to do that. Just a few pair of old stockings, dear. Getting me my new Jack Frost means more than you know. Here, please take them, oh. along with my very deepest thanks. Oh, thanks so much. A girl can always use them. Are you all set with my friend, Mr. Watson? Oh, yes. He came in this afternoon and filled out his withholding tax and so on. Very nice. I think you'll find him very efficient, Myra. Oh, what's the matter? Uh, pardon me. I didn't mean to frighten you. Oh, Mallory. <sighs> Silly of me. I must have jumped a foot. Oh, that's all right. He frightens me, too. Myra, I'd like to have you meet Inspector Mallard. Inspector, Miss Fisher. How do you do? Oh, fine, thank you. Now that I've caught my breath. Do forgive me, Candy, but I must rush. See you soon, I hope. Tomorrow, Myra, I'll be down to see how my lad's doing as Jack Frost. Thanks for the stocking. Well, aren't you going to invite me in? No, I'm not. Here's my coat right here. What's our hurry? Come on, let's go. I'm starved. I thought we could have a cocktail here before we left. You thought wrong. Two tickets to the Rose Bowl. From now on, you earn your cocktails, Mallard. We went downstairs, and as I locked the front door, a car was just driving off. It was Myra, and she waved. And driving, if these tired old eyes hadn't deceived me, was Mr. Prentice Burke, vice president of the Brownstone. Well. Oh, well. Mallard and I climbed into our car and drove out to the cliff house. It was that kind of an evening. We had dinner, and after, I suggested we walk a bit. The night was crisp and clear, and the evening star was hanging out above the dark waters of the Pacific like an iridescent Japanese lantern. We cut across a little road above Sutro Baths, where an old car barn had once stood, and worked our way over the cliffs and stood high above Land's End. It was exhilarating. <laughs> Penny for your thoughts, Candy. Inflation is still here. All right. I get two pennies. Well, I was just thinking, Mallard, dear. When you see a star in the sky, soft water below, feel Christmas in the air, how can there be violence in the world? An age-old question, pal. One I can't answer. I'm too small. Hey, you're cold. I'd better put my arm around you. Mallard, no. What's the matter? The headlights from that automobile are shining right down on us, and we... Mallard. Sandy, what's wrong? Got your flashlight with you? Sure. Also, my gun and my handcuffs. Anything else we need? A mortar, maybe? The lights from that car. They shone on something. Down there, under that tree. Oh, Candy, just for once, can't you stop digging up a mystery? Be human? I am being human. Come on, Mallard. I want to see what's under that tree. <laughs> We scrambled around through the brush, slipped into some sliding sand, and rode the crest down to the tree. It wasn't easy to get around some of those brambles, but get there I fully intended doing, because what I saw was red, bright red. You, you okay, Candy? Nothing that a, a new pair of nylons won't fix. Shoot the flashlight over the, this way a bit, Mallard. Uh. There. That's it. Now... 
Do you think I'm dreaming things up? Uh, what is it? Wait, I hold it up. Well, looks like some kind of a costume. Right. And look, if those aren't bloodstains, I'm a Labrador retriever. No, you're a candy matson. Those are bloodstains. How was your boy dressed when you found him? Torn slacks, sweater, shoes, no socks. This was most likely his costume, then. Yeah. Don't move around too much, Candy. I want to have a good look at the ground. Hey, what are you doing down there? Who's that? The police. Now get up here and don't try any tricks. That's all right, officer. This is Inspector Mallard. Homicide. Oh, sorry, Inspector. That's all right. Stay right where you are. We'll be right up. Now, this is a break, Candy. I want you to drive me to a phone. I'll leave the officer here to guard the place. You can go home. I've got work to do here, okay? Yeah, yeah, sure. And for once, we had dinner before you had a chance to date, break the date. This baby was hard to reconstruct. Was the guy knocked off out there at Land's End, or was he bumped off at his apartment, the killer driving way out to the beach and hiding the costume? Only time would tell. I went home, climbed into bed, and logged about eight hours, enough to give me fuel for the next day. In the morning, I went down to the brownstone. The shoppers were already swarming through the place. I spotted a floor walker and strolled over to him. Pardon me, sir. I, I said, pardon me, sir. I'm very busy, young lady. Make it as brief as possible. I... You do work here, don't you? Of course. You are the floor walker assigned to this section? That is correct. Come to the point, please. Of all the... Well, I've a good mind to report you. As you wish. As I said, I'm very busy. Now, what is it you wanted to know? The words are like gall in my mouth now, but where do I find Jack Frost? Right over there, in the back, two aisles over. Thank you. Not at all. Very much. All the high-handed characters, people like that make me steam. I was getting up a full head of dander, but it simmered out before I had a chance to boil over. Because as I rounded a corner, I saw Frosty Boy, or Rembrandt, if you choose, up on his platform with the cutest little blonde kid sitting in his lap. Well, well, well. Look who we have here. A great big boy. Hello there, son. Oh, Jack Frost. What is your name? Topper. Topper. My, what a fine name. How old are you, Topper? Five and a half. Five and a half. Well, you must go to school, Topper. Which one? Garfield. Garfield. That's a good school. Now, tell me, uh, what would you like to have me tell Santa Claus to bring you for Christmas, Topper? An electric train and a baseball bat. And I like to be in the seals for Lefty Old Duel. Well, I'll see what I can do to arrange that, Topper. I'll tell Santa Claus. Bye now. Goodbye, and thank you, and Merry Christmas. I hope you can make the boy's wish come true. Old Duel could use him. Candy, oh, I'm so glad you're here, Doug. Duck around into the back room for a moment. I've got to talk to you. Aren't you working, Frosty Boy? i got ten minutes off every hour. I'll take the break now. Right around there, Candy. Okay. I'll see you in a moment. What's the matter, Rembrandt? Even under those icicles, you look warm under the collar. Here, look at this. Every now and then, one of these moppets toddles up to me with a Christmas letter in its hand. A little red-headed girl handed me this about half an hour ago. I've been shaking ever since. Let me see. Dear Jack Frost, a word to the wise is sufficient. When you take your lunch hour, keep on going. Don't come back. Otherwise, you'll meet the same fate as your predecessor. Hmm. Just about what I expected. Candy, you mean to say that you're deliberately using me as a sacrificial lamb? By no means, Ducky. Go ahead, take your lunch. Then do as the note says. Keep on going. As a matter of fact, why don't you take off now? I'll meet you at your place in about an hour. That's the best news I've heard since Nelson's victory at Trafalgar. I whipped upstairs, reported to Prentice Burke, got my first day's check, and on my way out told his secretary she'd better get Burke some smelling salt. Then I went back down on the floor again. Sure enough, there was my boy, the floor walker. I wanted to have a few more words with him. Oh, you again. If you don't mind. I was just up to see Miss Myra Fisher. She wasn't in. Have you seen her down here? No, and what's more, I won't see her all day. She phoned saying she was feeling ill. Most inconsiderate, I must say, during the holiday rush. Yes, I must say. Uh, could you give me her address? She's a friend of mine. I've got to see her. Her address? Well, yes. I write it down here on one of my cards for you. 
Myra Fisher, 227F, Union Street. There. Thank you. You're so kind. <laughs> I had all the ammunition I wanted. A check signed by Burke and a card written by the floor walker. His name was Simon Liggett. With that, I ducked into a phone booth and called Mallard. Homicide, Mallard speaking. Good boy. This is Candy. What did you find out at Land's End last night? A couple of very juicy footprints. They give us nothing. Did you make any casts of them? Why, sure. Mind if I borrow a couple of them for a few hours, Mallard? Well, I don't see how it will hurt. Sure, okay. Thanks, Mallory, dear. I'll be by in a moment. And uh, I want to borrow you, too. I stopped by the Hall of Justice, got the cast of the footprints, shoved Mallory into the car, and then picked up Rembrandt. The thing was only a hunch, but my hunches have paid off, so I never ignore them. First, we went out to an address on Fifth Avenue near Clement. We got in the back door and went to work. Nothing made sense there. So we drove over to Reseda Way in the marina. Again, we got in and did some sleuthing. This time, we hit the jackpot. A pair of shoes in the closet matched the casts we had brought with us. Rembrandt, go out in the kitchen and and see if this place has any ketchup. I'm not hungry, Dub, but I'll look. What are you up to, Candy? We've got enough to swing a case here. I'm working for a voluntary confession, Mallard. Tell me, what was the position that the the Jack Frost was in when you found him dead? In a chair, like that one. His head slumped down on his chest. Good. Here's the concept, Doug. When are you putting it on? You. What? Without the burner relish, Ducky. Sit down there, will you, Ember? <sighs> now, just go limp and let your head hang down. That's it. Now for a little seasoning. Oh, Candy, you're smearing me with this sticky stuff. Oh, no, for the sake of art. Hold still. There. How does he look, Mallard? Why, all the... Candy, it looks like the same guy, the real thing. Good. Now, Rembrandt, you just sit like that. Don't move. Mallard, you duck into that closet over there and I'll hide in here. We've got a good view of the front door from both places, okay? Okay. There are times, Candy, when I admit I admire your genius. Genius, genius. Come on, let's hide. golden shafts of sun splashing in through the window from the ocean slowly turned pink, then purple, and into twilight. The minutes ticked on. Once... (coughs) Bless you, but quiet, though, Rembrandt. You'll muss up your ketchup. Five minutes. Ten. Then we heard muffled footsteps coming down the hall and a key inserted in the lock of the apartment door. Old fool, I killed. No, no. Okay, buddy, oh. that'll be about enough. What? Oh, no. You... Get him, Mallard. He's ducking. I'll get him. <laughs> nice tackle, Mallard. All right, Mac. You're going to remain peaceful, or do I have to give you a little tap? No, no. I'll be quiet. You got me? I did it. I did it to the both of them. I killed them. I, I killed them. I killed both of them. Both of them? Yeah. Look behind the sofa. The sofa. The girl. The Jack Frost. The sofa. The sofa. Wait a minute, Mallard. I, I had to do it. Oh. I couldn't. Oh. But then they were going to do it. Oh, Mallard. It. More trouble, Candy? I killed both of them. I'm glad I yes. An old that friend of mine. Job was the late Myra Fisher. The whole thing was jealousy. Not the jealousy of a man for a woman, but the jealousy of a man for a job. Simon Liggett had been with the Brownstone for almost 20 years. He'd worked himself up from the stock boy to a place where he'd been promised the job of head of advertising and promotion. He almost got it. Except at the last moment, Prentice Burke gave the position to Myra Fisher. That had only been two weeks before. He knew that Myra was on a probationary term, so he did everything he could to undermine her. Little things like changing ad copy, sending out false stories to newspapers. He figured that if he could keep the store without a Santa Claus helper, he'd break Myra's back and get the job by the first of the year. He paid a visit to the first Jack Frost and tried to bribe him into quitting. 
but the guy would have none of it. There was a struggle. Liggett lost his head and whipped out a gun and shot him. He was still in his costume. So Liggett stripped him, put some old clothes on him, drove out to Land's End and ditched his costume. Then he felt sure there would be no Jack Frost the next day. But that's when Myra met me and I talked Rembrandt into taking over. By this time, Liggett was in a frenzy and would stop at nothing. He trailed Myra and Burke to Myra's home, killed her, took her body over to his place and ditched it behind the sofa. The next morning, he wrote a note to Rembrandt and gave it to one of the little girls waiting in line to see him. Fear and envy were taking their toll on the poor guy's mind. I wanted to compare the handwriting, so I had Burke write me a check and Leggett write Myers' address on a card. Also, we had the footprint cast. Between the two, everything pointed toward Liggett. That's when I staged my little parlor charade with Rembrandt playing the part of a corpse. The sight, with Rembrandt's resemblance to the dead Jack Frost, would shatter anybody into a confession. But Christmas, in spite of everything, is a lovely time of year. And there is a Santa Claus. <laughs> Three of them, for me, as a matter of fact. Mr. Prentice Burke, who sent me a very nice check for my efforts. Rembrandt Watson, who, out of sheer love for the job, went back to playing Jack Frost for all the kids at the Brownstone. And last but not least, Inspector Ray Mallard. He gave me a Christmas sock, right on my mouth, just where any well-placed Christmas sock should go. Listen again next week at this same time for excitement and adventure. Just dial Candy Matson and a Merry Christmas to you all. Yukon two eight two zero nine. Heard tonight were Helen Klebe as Myra Fisher, Lou Tobin as Prentice Burke, and John Grover as Simon Liggett. Jack Thomas plays the role of Rembrandt Watson, and Henry Leff is heard as Inspector Mallard. The program stars Natalie Masters as Candy, and is written and produced by Monty Masters. Sound effects were created by Bill Brownell and Jay Rendon. Eloise Rowan is heard at the organ. The characters in tonight's story are entirely fictitious, with the exception of the part of Topper, which was played by himself. Any resemblance to actual people is purely coincidental. The program came to you from San Francisco. Dudley Manlove speaking. You are tuned for the stars on NBC. That was me, lady. Who's you? Freeze, mister. Don't turn around and don't move a muscle. Because if you even breathe, I'll blow you right through the wall. Mr. and Mrs. North, starring Joseph Curtin and Alice Frost. Listen as Pam and Jerry solve the mystery, Death in the Dark. While the Norths are peacefully asleep in their Greenwich Village apartment... Two men are working feverishly in a warehouse on the east side just before dawn. One of them holds a flashlight, while the other applies a large metal bar to the hinges of a heavy black safe. Coming, kid. You'll be popping in a minute. Need any help? No, I can make it all by myself. There she goes. I'll give me that can opener. The spring are good. It won't take much longer, will it, Lenny? I mean... Take it easy, kid. Can't rush this kind of a job. Uh, put some of those tools away if you want to keep your hands busy. I'll be through in about ten seconds. What's the matter? I thought I heard somebody coming. Uh, but being so jumpy, that was me. No, it wasn't. It's the watchman. He's coming. Quick. Douse the light. I'll get over by that door and smack him as he comes in. Got a belly, ain't you? Yeah. I'll give it to him good. Watch it now. He's coming. Who's in there? Come on, answer me. Who's in there? I'm warning you now. If there's anybody in here, I'm gonna... Oh. Okay, kid. Now we have to work fast. 
Get this box out of here and take it down to the car. There's dough in it. What about him? Never mind the watchman. Just do like I tell you. Get the dough out. I'll clean up around here and meet you downstairs in five minutes. Okay, okay. I'll be waiting for you in the car. Yeah, sure. You little punk. Never take him on the job again. Oh. My head. Well, stay where you are, mister. Keep your mouth shut. I don't like watchmen. You... You were in here all the time. I said to keep your mouth shut. You won't get away with this. You won't get out of here alive. I won't. I'll get out of here alive, all right. Only you're going out in a basket. Homicide, Lieutenant Wigan speaking. No, no, not yet, Sarge. Oh, not a thing. Yeah, Mr. and Mrs. North are in my office. Okay, I'll get back to you later. Uh, that murder last night has got the whole department in an uproar. That watchman's murder on the east side? Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. They dropped it in my lap at about 6 o'clock this morning, and I haven't been able to come up with a thing except this. Well, what's that, Bill? The murder weapon. The guy that cracked that safe last night used this on the watchman and then forgot to take it with him. What is it, Bill? A sash weight? No, no, it's part of a sectional jimmy. What in the world is a sectional jimmy? Well, have you ever seen one? Oh. oh. It's a tool that's made for burglars. It's like a like a crowbar, only it splits up into three sections so it can be carried in a grip without being seen. Huh. I never knew there were tools that were specially made for burglars. Oh, there's plenty of them. And they aren't easy to come by either. This one was made by a pro. Do, do you know who made it? Well, Pam, I'm not sure, but I, I got a pretty good idea. It's got the same markings and workmanship as a jimmy we picked up about two years ago. Belonged to a thug named Newsel. A safe cracker? Uh, one of the best. Well, then that should make things easy, Bill. If you know who made this jimmy, all you have to do is arrest him and you've got the murderer. Well, it isn't as easy as that, Pam. The man who made this jimmy didn't rob that safe last night. How do you know? Because I sent him to jail about six months ago. Well, then he's gotten out. Uh, that's it, Bill. Uh, this newsel man has broken out of prison. He couldn't have, Pam. Why not? Because I sent him up for murder. He was electrocuted the day before yesterday. Get away from that window, kid, and sit down, will you? I want to pay you off and send you home to your mother. I ain't got no mother. You know that, Lee. A joke, a joke. I was making a joke. What's the matter with you, kid? You got no sense of humor? Well, I don't know anymore. After what happened last night, oh, I Forget don't... it, Willie. It's all over. It's not all over for me, Lenny. Don't you understand? He's dead. The guy's dead. He won't walk no more. He won't speak to anybody. He won't ever see his family again. How do you know he's got one? I read it in the paper. He, he's got a sister. He's got two kids. Oh, will you shut up? I'm sick and tired of you whining all the time. I can't help it, Lenny. I can't help thinking about him. Poor old guy, I keep seeing him lying there. I can still hear him moaning when he went down. Why did you hit him so hard? I didn't. I just tapped him on the side of the head like I showed you this afternoon. <laughs> that was some tap. Paper says his skull was broken in two places. But I didn't do it, honest Lenny. You know I wouldn't kill anybody. I just wanted to be a big shot, go along with you on a big job. I didn't want to kill anybody. Frank, <laughs> you get off that one note and start picking up your money. You got 600 bucks coming to you. I don't want it. Don't you see? I'd go crazy if I had that door. I'd give myself up. Cut it out, Frankie. Give myself up. Yeah, that's what I do. What are you doing? You've got to behave, kid. <laughs> no, no more. Please, no more. All right, then. Hang on to yourself. You start cracking up, we'll both be in the soup. I'm sorry, Lenny. You ought to be. Remember, next time you start losing your head, I'll knock it right off. Darling, you do know where you're taking us, I presume. Why, of course, Jerry. I got the address of Bill. Whose address? Mrs. Newsel's. And who is Mrs. Newsel? Don't you remember, dear? The man who made that sectional Jimmy. Hmm? He's Mrs. Newsel? No, dear. He's the one who went to the electric chair. Mrs. Newsel is his widow. And what do you expect to find out from her? Oh, whatever we can, if she's willing to talk. And if she's real talky, she might tell us something about that jimmy that was used last night. How would she know? Well, her husband made it, didn't he? Maybe she knows who he sold it to. Hey, that's an idea. 
Only I doubt if Mrs. Newzo will do any talking to people like us. <sighs> oh, we don't have to be like us. So we can be two other people. Who? Two thugs from Detroit. Uh, we're safe crackers. And we need a new set of tools. Oh, so naturally we went to her. Naturally. Uh, come on, Jerry. We're in the market for a sectional jimmy. <laughs> All right, dear, that's enough ringing. If anybody's home, they certainly will. Oh. Yeah? What is it? Mrs. Nozzle? Who wants to know? You an insurance man? Oh, me? Huh. That's a good one. <laughs> Tell her who I am, Sadie. Tell her yourself. It was your idea coming here. Coming here for what? Look, honey, my name is Fegan. Muggsy Fegan. This is my tomato. <laughs> Pleased to meet you. What do you want? Well, ain't you going to leave us in or something? Your husband's an old buddy of mine. We've done time together. My husband is dead. Yeah, I know. We heard the sad news yesterday. And it happened so sudden. We didn't get a chance to send flowers. What do you want, mister? Um, we just done a hot job in Detroit. And we had to pull out fast. Uh, so we dropped our, um, our can openers in the ditch. What's that got to do with me? Well, we can't do nothing without no can opener, so we thought you might fix us up. Are you kidding? I don't handle any of that stuff. Don't you even have a couple of odds and ends lying around the house? Not a thing. I got rid of all my husband's junk a year ago. Where? Who, who'd you sell it to? Nobody. You must have sold it someplace, because one of them sectional jimmies was used on a job last night. Yeah, that warehouse job. On the east side... Where that watchman was killed? That's right. The police found a hunk of that jimmy right next to the body. How do you know? Uh, we get around. Well, start getting. You know too much for me. Now, wait a second, honey. The police get around too, you know. And if you ain't going to be friendly about this, I might just take a notion to call them Eat up it. and... it. Oh, look, baby, I got to know where we can find Eat you. Eat it, I said. <gasps> well, I... Oh. I didn't know you was going to say it with a gun. Come on, Sadie. Yeah. We'll get that Jimmy in the five and ten. Yeah? Hello? Lenny? Who's this? What are you so careful about? This is an old pal of yours, Flo Newsom. Well, how are you, Flo? Crying my eyes out. On account of the old man frying? Honey, you never get around to see me anymore, Lenny. Well, I've been kind of busy lately. So I heard. I understand you were kind of busy last night on the east side. Hmm? I want to see you, Lenny. When you coming over? What did you say about last night? You want me to talk about it on the phone? Well, no. Then when are you coming over? Right away. So, you think I'm in trouble, huh? Well, what do you think, Lenny? Did you ever hear of a guy named Muggsy Feagan? Mm, nope. Neither did I. That guy was a phony if I ever saw one. And so was that dame. Well, what are you worried about? They can't prove nothing about that, Jimmy. They can prove my husband made it. And if they start snooping around, they might find out I gave it to you. Who's going to tell them? You? I might. Ah. ah, you wouldn't do a thing like that, honey. After all, I'm an old flame of yours. You're an old flame of a lot of people. But you're the only one that counts, baby. Sure. I count up to about five grand, Lenny. What are you talking about? Five grand. That's what I want to keep my mouth shut. Your mouth can be shut for a lot less than that, baby. Is that a threat or a promise? How do you want to take it? In cash. I'm not talking about the money. I'm talking about you. If you don't watch your step, there'll be another funeral in the family. I think you're bluffing, Lenny. I'm not bluffing. You're asking for the moon. And you're going to pay it. This ain't just a safe-cracking job, Lenny. There's a murder rap that goes with it. Not for me, there ain't. The kid done the murder. I still say five grand. By tomorrow morning, 
or the phone start ringing. Okay, baby. You'll get it. You'll get just what you're looking for. Homicide, Lieutenant Wigan speaking. Hello, uh, Bill. Uh, this is us. Uh, we're in a phone booth uptown. Both of you? Pam, you're all over my shoe. Don't get in mind. I'm talking. Oh, uh, are you there, Bill? Uh, yes, ready and waiting. Uh, well, uh, you won't have to wait much longer. We've practically got the case all solved. Fine, fine. Where do I send the wagon? Oh, now, don't be facetious, Bill. You remember that Mrs. Newsom? Yes, roughly. Over there this afternoon. Get to the point. This is the point, Jerry. What is the point? That we were watching her apartment. Oh, and about a half hour ago, a big thug went in there and came out again. He stayed about 20 minutes, Bill. Jerry, please. And when he came out, he was plenty mad. But that isn't all, Bill. We followed him back to his apartment. And? Uh, well, there isn't any and yet. We called because we didn't know what to do. I'll tell you what to do. Go home. You're wasting your time, Pam. Just because you happen to see a thug go into somebody's apartment is no reason. it wasn't just somebody's apartment. It was hers. And if this thug is the one who used her crowbar... Jimmy. But what difference does it make as long as we know his name? It's Gorman, Bill. Lenny Gorman. That mean anything to you? No, but I'll check on it. Well, you don't sound very excited, Bill. Well, frankly, Pam, I, I'm not turning handsprings. Our leads, we just won't, we just won't call you anymore. Oh, now, Pam, I... Goodbye, Bill. Uh, uh, Pam! Pam, I... Uh, oh. Who is it? Me, Lenny. Frank. Wait a second. Okay, kid, come on in. What'd you call me for, Lenny? What's up? Sit down, kid. Well, what is it? Something's wrong, isn't there? They got a lead on us. They found out about something. Will you sit down? I'll tell you all about it. Well, go ahead and tell me. What are you waiting for? For you to calm down. Now, listen, kid. I know how you feel about what happened last night. If I was in your spot, it'd be the same way. It's a rough deal killing a man. What do you mean? Homicide. It's a rough deal. When you're young like you, you got a chance of beating a larceny rap, but all kinds of angles. Not with murder. They give you the seat for that, whether you're young or old. Lenny, what are you doing to me? What are you trying to tell me? I'm trying to give it to you gradual, kid, so you'll understand what I'm driving at. Now, you got work to do. Work? You want me for another job? Something like that. I won't do it. I'm all through to you here. I won't do you'll it. You'll have to do this job, kid, whether you want to or not. Unless you're ready to go to the chair... Why? What's happened? Somebody found out about you. Somebody that feels like talking to the cops. Who? A dame. Besides me, she's the only one in the world that knows you killed that watchman. You gotta take care of her before it's too late. I don't get you. Take care of her how? Show you how. With a brand new forty-five. Lenny, you're just kidding, ain't you? You don't really want me to kill Since somebody? You gotta kill this dame. She wants a million bucks for keeping her mouth shut, and you can't pay it. Don't you get me? She'll tip the cops. Why? What's she got against me? Nothing. That's just it. Nothing. If you don't cough up 5,000 bucks, she sends you to the chair. Just like that. I don't care. I don't care. Do you know what it's like, Frankie? When you're up there in the death house, I mean. You think you got it bad now. Wait till they start getting you ready for that chair. Getting you ready? Sure. They got to get you ready, kid. They got to shave your head and the hair and your legs. While they're doing it, there's a priest in your cell saying prayers. I don't want a priest. You will then, Frankie. You'll want a priest then more than ever. Because you'll know what you're going into. You'll know that there's something waiting for you at the end of that hall. And once you sit down in that, you're never going to get up again. You're never going to see nobody. You're never going to even breathe except that one last time when they give you the juice and it squeezes out of you. It hits you like a bomb, kid. If you wasn't strapped in that chair while you'd... Bounce all over the place. Lenny, Is that no. what you want, Frankie? Is that what you want to go through? No, no. All right, then. Take this gun and do like I tell you. Well, 
don't blame it on me, Jerry. Blame it on Bill. If he had had the decency to come over here when we called him, we wouldn't have to be doing this. Well, we don't have to do it anyhow, Pam. After all, there's nobody forcing us to sneak into Lenny's apartment. But I've got this window practically open now. Yeah, there she comes. Do you want to go first, or, or shall I? I- I'll go, dear. Just give me a boost. Right. Is it up? Fine. I-, I can make it now. Can you? I don't know why not. Yeah, there we are. Oh, I-, I can't see in here. Yeah, here, take my leather. Thanks, darling. See anything now? Not very much. Is this the living room or the bedroom? Yeah, I think it's both. Well, you, you look through the dresser, Jerry. All right. I'm going to try that closet. If this Lenny man robbed that safe last night, maybe we'll find the money. I haven't found any money yet. All I see in here is winter underwear. Well, the closet's practically empty. No. No, it isn't. Jerry, come here. I found something? I'll say I found something. Look at this. What is it? D- don't you see what it is? It's the other two pieces of that sectional jimmy. Now, if we can only prove that they all fit together... Oh, guys, what was that? That was me, lady. Who? Don't turn around. Just stay right where you are and don't move. Because if you even breathe, I'll blow you right through the wall. Come in, kid. Come on in. Thanks. So Lenny didn't come with the money himself. He sent you. Yes, ma'am. Well, that's a lucky thing he sent it with somebody, because I wasn't bluffing. No, ma'am. All right, son, where is it? Let me count it. Yes, ma'am, I got it right here in my pocket. Well, give it to me. Don't stand it. Put that gun down. I can't. I gotta do it. Don't be a sap, kid. If he told you... No, don't, don't come any nearer. I gotta do it. You don't? There ain't a reason in the world. Please don't say no more. Please. I don't want to hear you. I don't want to know you. But you just can't kill me. No, no more if you say another word. Stop it, kid. Don't put it. Hey, what's the idea of frisking us, Lenny? We ain't got no guns. Well, I'm just making sure, mister. When I find somebody going through my apartment, I like to be careful. Now, what's the idea? Uh... Uh, no idea. Uh, we just blew in from Detroit and we're looking for some burglar tools. In my closet? Mm. Come on, open up, sister. Ain't you the two phonies that was over to see Mrs. Noozle? Phonies? And you never heard of Muggsy Figgins? Luck wise, guy. Ain't got time for fooling around. Who are you? What's your racket? I'm telling you, safe cracking. Okay, you asked for it. Now come with me. Oh. Where are we going? Come with me, I said. I'll tell you all about it. Jerry's going to take us for a ride. No talking, see? Just open that front door and get a move on. Okay, okay, we're moving. Then move. Straight down the hall and out the back. Just a minute, Lenny. Huh? Oh. Here, I'll take that gun for you. Jerry. Yeah. Uh, stay where you are, Lenny. I'm a police officer. Bill, how'd you get here? Well, you told me where you were, didn't you? I pay attention to phone calls. But you weren't going to pay... Well, I happened to look up Lenny Gorman's record, and it interested me. Especially the part about safe cracking. What are you talking about? You ain't got nothing on me. Well, we have. Bill, he's got the other parts of that sectional Jimmy right in his closet. You're a cuckoo. Take it easy, Lenny. Mrs. Newsom might be able to give us some information about that. Yeah? I don't think Mrs. Newsom will do any talking. Well, we'll see about that. Come along, all of you. I sent some of my men over to her apartment, and I want to find out what they picked up. (gasps) Ah, now, easy now. Just try to take it easy, Mrs. Newsell. I'll get the doctor, Bill. No, 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 wait. The doctor's busy with that Frankie kid. Golly, what happened in here? That's what I'd like to know. You! You're the one that made him do it. You sent him here to kill me. Who? That Sherman kid, Frankie Sherman. You had the gun right up against me. No, no, Mrs. Newsom. You gotta get hold of yourself. Can't help it. I was so close, I thought I was dead. Well, what happened? The cops. They, they got him in the shoulder before he could pull the trigger. There was one of them at the door and another one on the fire escape. Riley, Haynes, where are you? In here with the kid. You want me, Lieutenant? No, no, stay where you are. I'll be in in a second. Well, we were just coming out anyway. The kid's going to be okay. Good. Yeah, I'm going to be fine. Why don't you finish me off and be done with it? Watch what you say, kid. They'll use it against what you. What do I care? They got enough against me now to put me in the Shut up, you sap. Quiet, you. Let the kid talk. What do you want me to say? 
I tried to kill her and I couldn't make it. Why, Frankie? Why did you try to kill Mrs. Newsom? Don't answer that. You got a right to have a lawyer. Keep out of this, Lenny. You can have a lawyer any time he wants one. What good is a lawyer? He can't do nothing for me, not where it hurts inside. Look, I killed a man. There ain't a lawyer in the world that can make him live again. You killed him? Last night in the warehouse, I killed a watch. Frankie! He was coming in while we were cracking the safe and I hit him with a blackjack. Well, I didn't have nothing to do with it. I wasn't anywhere near him. Weren't you? No. I was standing over by the safe. He's the one that killed him. You better study up on your law, Lenny. What are you talking about? You can't pull me in on a murder rap. I didn't even touch him. I'm not so sure about that, Lenny. What happened after Frankie killed the watchman? Nothing happened. We just grabbed the dough and beat it. Wait a second, Lenny. We didn't grab the dough. I took it down to the car myself. You came down later. I thought so. Who cares what you think? I do, Lenny, because I've been thinking the same thing myself. Now, according to the autopsy report, that watchman was killed with a heavy bar of steel, part of a sectional jimmy, not with an ordinary blackjack. Not with a blackjack? You mean I... I mean he was struck several times, heavy blows with a big steel bar. But I only hit him once. I only hit him on the side of the head. Lenny. What do you want? You did it, Lenny. You killed him yourself after I was out of there. You killed him and you made me think I did it. Go on, you're crazy. You did. You killed him. You almost got me to kill her. Look out. I won't look out, you lousy dog. Oh, Push hey, hey, stop it. Stop it. Now let me go. Let me took the wife out of him. Hands off, I said. <laughs> you don't have to get even with him, Frankie. The state will get even for you. Say, Pam. Uh, yes, dear? Whatever happened to that piggy bank I had up here on my dresser? Uh, um, uh, piggy bank? Now, you know I've been dropping quarters and halves into that thing for a long time. Oh, uh, well, uh, when did you miss it, Jerry? Right after we got finished with all that safe-cracking business last night. Oh. Say, hey, you didn't happen to get an idea and break into it, did you? Well, um... As a matter of fact, Jerry, when the laundry man came this morning... Oh, I see. Uh, but I was going to put the money back, dear. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's why I hid the bank. I didn't want you to discover it. Say I... no more, darling. I understand everything, except for one point. What? Well, that piggy bank doesn't open until the whole thing's full. How in the world did you get the money out? Oh, that was easy, Jerry. I used the sectional jimmy. <laughs> This is the United States Armed Forces Radio Service. Broadcasting Company presents Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Diamond Detective Agency, a corpse in every plot. Oh, Rick, that's awful. I know, Helen, but my sense of humor is out of gas. Oh, what's the matter? No business? Not for a week. If a client walked in now, I'd probably swear it was an hallucination and referred to Bellevue. Well, I've been trying to get you. He called here about five minutes ago, said it was important. I just got in the office. I'll give him a call. Am I going to see you tonight? You know it. Me and my empty wallet will be glad to stop over for dinner. Well, I'll have Francis fix something healthy. Tell him to cook some money. (laughs) I'll see you around seven, then. Don't forget to call Walt. Bye. Bye. An Irish eyes are smiling, sure it's by a morning Lieutenant Levinson, homicide. Oh, you want to talk to me, Fatty? Rick? How many people called you Fatty? Where the devil have you been? I called you at your apartment all morning. Uh, Helen just told me I slept late. Well, why didn't you answer your phone? Rent was due. Could have been a trap. Can you come down here? Well, if it's important, I can come down. 
But if a potential client gives up because he can't find me, I may have a crying jag all over your office. I'll stock up on hankies. I wouldn't ask you, Rick, but it is important, very. Well, don't sound like the last course of gloomy Sunday. I'll be there. Relax. I knew Walt was on the level because every time he thought something was important, he came on in a higher register and began to sound like a harp. Well, I closed the office, set the bear trap in front of the door in case of a client, and left a box lunch. I might be gone for a good while this time, and if I caught something, there was no sense to let it starve. The fifth precinct was 20 blocks away, so being a practical man who always regards that lonely feeling in his pocket as the sure makings of a pedestrian, I insulted a few well-meaning cab drivers, and 30 minutes later, I limped into the squad room of the fifth precinct police station. Yes? Is there something I can do for you? In my business, you have to be conditioned to anything. Nothing should surprise you. But in my business, like any other, there's always a first time for everything. And it looked like this was it. For over a year, I had been walking leisurely into the squad room of the 5th Precinct and smiling inside when I spotted a cop with a battering ram for a head and landing barges for feet. He was always the best straight man I'd ever run across, and his name was Sergeant Otis Lovelorn. But this day, dear old Otis was not to be found. Instead, sitting at his desk, looking up at me through a pair of thick horn-rimmed glasses, was something else. It pulled out a clean white handkerchief, removed the glasses, clouded them up with a quick breath that filled the room with the essence of sen-sen, and said, Well, where's Otis? You mean Sergeant Loveloon? He's been transferred. He's been what? Transferred. Who are you? Sergeant Andre Klum. Is there something I can do for you? Andre Klum? Sergeant Andre Klum. Sergeant Andre Klum. Uh, just one moment. Yeah? Where do you think you're going? Uh, look, uh, uh, Sonny, I'm going in to see the lieutenant. You'll have to wait until I find out if he can see you. Oh, he'll see me. He just called me. May I have your name, please? What? Citation. Mr. or Mrs. Hey, this may not be so bad after all. No? No. We're going to have fun, Andre. Are we? Yes, indeed. Now, call in to the lieutenant and tell him Mr. Diamond is coming in to see him. Yeah? The gentleman you were expecting, Mr. Diamond. He's getting introductions now? Send him in. Yes, sir. The lieutenant will see you, Mr. Diamond. Thank you, Sergeant Klum. And uh, something else, Mr. Diamond. Yes? Sergeant Loveloon warned me about you. And I can assure you right now that I have no intention of becoming the brunt of your obvious crude comedy. Sergeant Klum, I don't think there's much you can do about it. Oh, Walt, I want to go on record right now as saying don't. that I... Don't. I know. Well, what is that out there? The commissioner says he's one of the most valuable men on the force. But how could you put him in a cop's uniform? It's like dressing Rasputin and the Mother Hubbard. I miss Otis as much as you do, but strictly off the record, Sergeant Klum has relatives. Oh, I thought so. And scratching all the way in here. Otis moved over to the 11th precinct. Who's he working for now? Lieutenant Crawford. They've had a suicide watch on him all night. What's this Andre Klum supposed to be so good at? He's only been with us for a couple of days. I don't know. Well, if I keep thinking about him, I may have to be dipped in hot tar. You better tell me what you want to see me about. You may not like it, Rick. Oh? This is new? Remember Ralph Baxter? Sure. I sent him up while I was still on the force. Yeah. Well, you worked on that case for over a year, didn't you? You were in charge of the department. You know darn well I did. Rick, you knew Baxter's habits better than anyone on the force. Oh, now, Walt, Walt, what's it all, what's it all about? Is uh, Baxter loose? Very loose. Busted out at 8 o'clock this morning along with seven other guys. Oh, all got away clean? Every one of them. One of the best planned breaks I've ever heard about. Well, if Baxter was in on it, it had to be. He's a smart boy, Walt. One of the smartest. Yeah, well, the commissioner says we've got to pick him up before he does any damage. Just like that, huh? Just like that. I need someone who knows him so well he might have a chance of nailing him before the trouble breaks loose. And you know Baxter and trouble. How come you're in on this, Walt? Somebody already get killed? Truck driver. Oh, Baxter's an unhappy boy. He kills to make up for it. Really does a fancy job. You want to help me out? You're in trouble if they don't nail Baxter in a hurry? The commissioner is uh, relying on me. Okay, then. It's got to be official in case you have to make an arrest. Oh, now, wait a minute. Got to swear you in as a deputy. Uh -uh. Look, Rick, we've got to. I don't really care how you bring Baxter in and who gets the credit, but But what what would would the the commissioner commissioner say say if... uh... Uh, Yeah, I know, I know. I'm sorry, Walt. Every time I used to put on that badge, a book of rules and regulations went with it. 
I do it my way or not at all. But, but, Now, but... don't start running your motor. I don't want the credit. The department can have it. Besides, it's 20 to 1 in any man's book that I'll never even get close to Baxter. Well, you stand more chance than anyone else. Okay, then. You still don't have to worry about the credit. It's 50 to 1 that the newspapers will read. Private detective found with his head missing. Okay, Rick. Your way. Andre. Yes, Lieutenant? Andre. Yeah, some name. I beg your pardon? Uh, bring in all the information on Baxter and the seven other men who were in on the break. Yes, sir. Andre. Andre Klum. Yeah. Yeah, you are, Lieutenant. You want to look over this stuff, Rick? Yeah. I want to know how, how the break was pulled off. Maybe if we can get a line on who helped them, we can get it back to that way. A truck was used. Hmm. A Ford pickup that hauled garbage regularly. The large garbage cans were placed on the truck and taken off to a dump. The seven men in Baxter hid in the cans and were covered up with garbage. Oh. The men in the prison kitchen have all been questioned, but none will admit a thing. Well, thank you, Sergeant. Maybe you can tell us what happened after that, Sergeant. Several miles outside of the prison, the men got out of the cans. One man climbed up into the cab of the truck and ordered the driver to stop. He shot the driver, and the men climbed off the truck. Rolled it over a 44-foot hill. 44 feet? 44 feet, 9 inches, at the first point of impact where the truck went over. The hill, of course, varies at other spots. Of course. Two cars were waiting for the eight men. Tire tracks were found and casts made. A report on these casts should be in at any minute. Synchronize your watches, then, Rick. Tell me, Sergeant Klum, have you any idea who might have been driving the two cars? No. Turning your MIGs and your ray gun, you're through. Very amusing. Now, please, Rick, for the sake of my psychiatrist, don't start on Klum like you did on Otis. Might be a woman. Klum? Driving one of the cars. Oh. Baxter was a known woman hater. You don't say. I suppose the other seven guys got together with him and formed a club. Four of the seven men were known to have had women friends at one time or another. But only one woman remained loyal after the men were sent to prison. How do you know that? I remember things. He remembers things. Oh. She visited the prison many times to see Tony Leggetti, one of the escapees. Maybe you can remember the dates? The first time was right after Tony was sent up. Uh, November... All right, all right, Sergeant. Uh, what's the girl's name and uh, where does she live? Jean Lawrence, 1782 East 12th Street, Apartment C. Uh, no, B. Butterfingers. I'll take this list of histories on the seven guys. You going to check on the girl? Yes, and... Uh... Thank you, Sergeant Andre Klum. You've been a brick. I left Klum polishing his glasses with Walt looking sick. Dean Lawrence did live at 1782 East 12th, apartment B. So I looked up the landlady, a nice old reproduction of Whistler's mother with a hangover, Mrs. Shook by name. She was a little unhappy that I'd bothered her, but I finally sold her on the idea that she could shave any time, and aided by my best smile and the promise of a fast fifth, I finally got her to open the door to apartment B. There you are, lover. But I can tell you right now, Jeannie ain't in. Mm. Well, what's in this room? Bedroom. She didn't come home all day yesterday or last night. She didn't, huh? You know, I shouldn't be showing you around like this. <laughs> Except that you look like a real nice fella. And you're thirsty. Oh, go on. You see anyone else hanging around, say, in the last week? Yeah. Come to think of it... About a week ago, some dark fella started coming over to see Jeannie. Used too much hair oil. Greasy type. Think you'd recognize him? Hmm. You bring me that present, lover boy, and I could recognize a clove of garlic in an onion warehouse. <laughs> I'd make book on it. May I use the phone? Go right ahead, lover. Oh, uh, by the by, hundred proof, huh? Hundred proof. Homicide, Lieutenant Levinson. Walt, well, this is Rick. I'm up at the girl's apartment. Not here. But the landlady says she can identify some guy who's been hanging around here for the last week. So look up... Oh, hold the... it a minute, Rick. Something coming over the hot shot. Okay. Oh, uh, bottle and bond, is that right, dear? Oh, lovely, lovely. <laughs> lovely. Rick? Yeah? Get that landlady in here, then meet me out at the end of River Street, Pier 14. Something up? Sus came up. Someone didn't want it to. She hit bottom, the bricks in the sack must have torn it open. What? A dock worker spotted her floating near one of the pier pilings. Jean Lawrence? Yeah. I'll see you over there. Something happened to little Jeannie. I could hear... Found what... her floating in the river. Oh. Well, if we're going down to the station, can we stop off and get that present? Yeah. Bottled in bond, you promised. I grabbed the cab and took Mother McCray over to the 5th precinct, making one stop on the way for the promised present. 
I turned her over to the desk sergeant and took off for Pier 14 at the end of River Street. When I got there, I spotted the homicide prowl car and Walt standing near the ambulance. On the wooden floor of the pier, covered with a sheet, was the dead body of Gene Lawrence. The coroner had just finished his examination. Well, give me a full report as soon as I get to the lab, Lieutenant. Well, this is a rush, coroner. It always is. Well, hello, Rick. Hi, Charlie. Shot twice, then thrown in the drink. Yeah, nice, nice. Anything else? Book of matches in the coat pocket. Probably don't mean a thing. Lieutenant, we just got a report from the precinct. Oh, hello, Diamond. Oh, good afternoon, Clum. You're looking fine. Oh, you'll be kissing each other on the cheek in a minute. Oh, what about that report, Sergeant? The landlady Diamond brought in 22 minutes ago has just identified a picture in the morgue as a man who had been visiting Gene Lawrence for the past week. Anyone we know? William Nash, alias William Barnes, uh, alias Bootleg Barnes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, five feet 11, black hair, brown eyes, slight scar. Uh... Oh, whoa, oh, hold it. What about his record? Uh, nine arrests, two convictions, robbery and assault. Uh, in the cafe business now at uh, Red Dot Inn. Yes, sir. Matches you found the girl, Walt? Yeah, red dot in. Let's take a run over there. Yes, Jess, what'll it be? William Nash, you around? No. Police. He still ain't around. He got an office? Well, I... Uh... He got an office. Yeah. Where is it? Top of those stairs. Down the hall, last door. Go around to the back of the bar, Clum. Yes, sir. Hey, now, wait a minute. You ain't supposed to come back here. See that he doesn't have any way to let Mr. Nash know we're coming up. Just go ahead and tend your bar. You guys want to get me in trouble? Not unless Nash is really in his office. Then you don't have to worry about trouble. You're in it. Let's go, Ray. Down the hall, he said. Last door. We both go? Yep. Fire escape down there. This way, Sergeant Clum covers him. Can uh, Clum shoot? I forgot to ask him. You get on there by the fire escape in case he gets past me. Who is it? Fire department. What? Yeah, we received a report that your cafe isn't properly equipped in case of fire. Are you nuts? I just had no extinguisher. William equipment. Nash? Yeah. Now, what the let's devil... Let's go. Huh? You heard him. Hey, what is this? Police, let's go. He's clean. All right, copy. You want to haul me in. What's the charge? Murder. Murder? Now, listen, Start you Start walking. Who's murdered? Gene Lawrence. Down the steps. I don't know any Gene Lawrence. Sure, sure. Everything all right, Lieutenant? Go upstairs and watch this guy's office. Yes, sir. You need a warrant for this, you know. I'll get one. I tell you, I don't know any Gene Lawrence. My friend, I know a little old lady who thinks you wear too much hair oil. She's going to make a very big liar out of you. <laughs> NBC is bringing you Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. All right, Sergeant, get the lineup going. Yes, sir. Henry Phipps. Henry Phipps, alias Henry Phipps. I've never alias seen Henry a lineup Henry before, lover. The man you identified earlier from the picture. See if you can pick him out. George Chalmers. No. Ain't him. Ain't him, neither. William Nash. William Nash. That's him. William Barnes. All right, hold him. You sure that's a man who was calling on Gene Lawrence? Yep, that's him. Why don't he use bay rum on his hair? Nash. Yeah? Yes, Lieutenant. Yeah, Lieutenant. You know Miss Gene Lawrence? I told you I don't, Lieutenant. <laughs> He sure is a lousy liar. All right, run him off. Step down. Hal Ennis. He killed Jeannie. We don't know. Yes, sir. He sure should use bay rum. Well, Walt and I and a couple of the boys took Nash downstairs and worked on her for about a half an hour before I got tired and decided to see what I could turn up myself. Nash still wouldn't admit he knew the dead girl, and we still weren't any closer to finding Ralph Baxter. I was pretty sure that Nash was connected with Baxter in some way, or he would have admitted knowing the girl and denied the killing. So I went back to the Red Dot Inn with a warrant to search Nash's office. Sergeant Andre Klum was guarding the door in the best prescribed manner. Legs spread, arms folded, 
back straight against the door. You're flat. Mm-hmm. What? Oh, oh, Diamond. I have absolutely no excuse. I, I'll understand if you report me to the lieutenant. Uh, no one could get by, could they? Not without waking me. Mm, then you did what you told to. You guarded the place. But there is no excuse for falling asleep on duty. Unless you get tired. Now, forget it. I got a warrant here. Let's give this officer going over. And that's exactly what we did. We took the place apart, piece by piece. And I have to go on record by saying that Clum really knew his business. He didn't miss a thing. This might be important, Diamond. What is it? Bills to William Nash from the garage. Let me see. Mm. Nick's Garage, 13th Street. Thousand mile service on both cars, 1490. Parking space rental on both cars, $25. Two cars. Mm, may not mean a thing. I'll check it anyway. Two cars were used in the escape, Diamond. Now, don't get excited. You stay here. I'll call you from the garage. I left Clum and went over to Nick's garage, looked up the owner, and he showed me the two cars, both sedans. 48 Chrysler and a new Hudson. Nick told me that both cars had been taken out the night before and returned early that morning. He said that Nash had driven one and the girl the other. So I put in a call to the Red Dot Inn and Sergeant Clum. Yes, the lab has two good casts of the tire prints. Well, put in a call to the lieutenant and tell him to get right down here with him. I hope you'll forgive me uh, being a little premature, but... You uh, already told him to come down. Uh, yes. Hmm. Tell me, Sergeant, you don't know anything about the fifth at higher layer, do you? One by uh, step up in one uh, and... Goodbye, uh... Sergeant. This is Nick Miller. Runs a garage. Hi, Lieutenant. Hello. How about the cars? Uh, this one and uh, that one. Hold this cast. I'll try the other one. Okay. Fit? No. Those tread prints on that cast supposed to fit the treads on one of these cars? We hope so. How about that one, Walt? Like a glove. Try your cast on that car. Uh-uh. Fits this one, Walt. Rick, both of the cars were used in the getaway. What happens now? Go back to headquarters and tell Nash we got him dead to rights. We'll sweat him till he cracks. I got a better idea. Turn him loose. What? Nash knows that it's only a matter of time until we turn up his evidence anyway. And he knows something else. He knows Ralph Baxter. He knows if he spills anything, Baxter will kill him, sure. But we'll promise him protection. Against Baxter? Baxter'd get him if it took ten years. Not if we get Baxter first. Nash probably knows where he's hiding out. Walt, even if Nash knows where Baxter is, he'd be a long time telling you. In the meantime, Baxter can cause a lot of trouble. All right, so I let Nash go. So what? Get a hold of the newspapers. Tell them to run a story that you've picked up Nash for questioning in the prison break. But that you had to release him because of insufficient evidence. You think Baxter will go after him? Well, he'd at least send some of his boys. I think the girl was knocked off because she got out of line. You can bet that Baxter won't want Nash around for a witness. Okay. Gee, you're kind of making Mr. Nash a sitting duck, ain't you? Oh, I guess you'd say that, Mr. Miller. Now, why don't you come on down to the station with us and answer a few routine questions? Uh, hey, I don't know nothing about this. That's what Mr. Nash said, but you can see what a liar he turned out to be. We went back to the precinct that the garage owner was held for questioning. In the meantime, two men were sent to the home of William Nash and the phone tapped. Two other men took their places on a stakeout at the Red Dot Inn, another pair at the garage. The garage owner was cleared of any suspicion and told to go back to work, but warned not to say anything. About four in the afternoon, a call came over the hot shot at the 5th Precinct. My name is Barton. I've just been robbed. Where are you calling from? I own the Rome Jewelry Store. Three men came in and tied us all up. They stole over $100,000 in gems. Anyone hurt? My clerk. He's still unconscious. All right. What's the address? Uh, corner of Wilmot and 21st Street. It looked like just a routine robbery at the time, so the robbery detail took over. Walt released Nash and called the papers. Around 4.30, Walt got a call from robbery. Levinson. Jennings, Walt. Those guys that held up the jewelry store over on Wilmot Street. The owner just identified one of the holdup men, Tony Lugetti. Oh, thanks. Rick, Tony Lugetti, one of the guys that busted out with Baxter, has been identified as one of the holdup men in the jewelry store. Now it starts. The gang had gotten away clean. No trace, except a cab driver who spotted a green sedan in front of the jewelry store. Three men in it. We waited. Levinson. Sullivan. Nash just got a phone call. 
Man said he wanted to see him for the payoff. Said to meet him at the place, Nash left the house, Fisher's tailing him. Right. Nash just left the house, got a call. Let's go. We piled into the squad car and headed across town in the direction of Nash's house. A newsboy on the corner yelled the planted news of Nash's arrest, and the car radio told us what Nash was doing. Suspect just went into garage. We're parked across the street. Instructions. I'm about two blocks away. If he gets in his car, let me know. He's coming out, turning north on Chestnut. See him? There he is, Walt. We've got him, Jennings. We'll tail him. We followed Nash until he hit the outskirts of town. He drove for another good half hour, then pulled into a roadside eating place with a motel off to the left. Uh, this looks like it. Yeah, yeah. Drive past. We'll swing back. Nash is going into the diner. We'll walk up. Attention, all units. I'm at a roadside diner. The stop a while motel near it. Suspect just went into diner. All units proceed with caution. And a whole bunch might be in that motel. Mm-hmm. Hope the boys get here before things start popping. You said it. We can't go in. Hey, there's uh, Nash at the counter. See anyone else? Not from here. Let's walk over to the other side. Hey, Walt. What? Over there by the gas pump. Green sedan. You think it might be the robbery car? Uh, nobody in it. Look. Two guys coming out of the restroom. Yeah. And one of them, Tony Leggetti. Baxter's boys. I got a hunch Baxter's around. I got Tony's going in the diner. He's going in to pick up Nash. Probably going to take him for a ride. Let's take this guy before Lugetti comes out. He hears us. He's turning around. Police. He's going for a gun. You knocked him cold. Nice tackle, Rick. Vassar, 28. Here's his gun. I'll dump him in the car. Here come some of the boys. I'll wave them off. You get in the back of the car. Okay, I'll get in with you. I wonder where Baxter is. Can you look out that back window without being seen? Yeah, yeah. Two more prowl cars pulled up. Mm, the boys in the diner don't spot them. Nothing yet? No, no. Hey, here they come. The Gideon Nash? Yeah, holy cow, the whole bunch. Is Baxter with them? Yeah, and one, two, five others. They've spotted the cars. They're headed for this car. You go out that side, I'll go out this. You're boxed up, Baxter. Look out, Rick! Two of them. Two of them down. Baxter's heading around back. Rick, don't go after Malone, you crazy! Now he tells me. Stop, Baxter! You get him, Rick. Yeah, but just barely. That was my last shot. How was the dinner? Oh, if I'd eaten any more, I'd, uh, I'd need a new belt. <laughs> you got to tell me what you did all day and why you were so late? Mm, went for a long walk in the park. Oh, that's what I love about you. Gone all day. Come in smelling like a shooting gallery until you tell me you went for a walk in the park. Oh, no. I'll get it. Yes? Oh, Rick, you gonna give me a routine or do you want to hear about Baxter? Oh, Harold Applenocker's tired. Let's have it. Well, Getty's dying in the hospital. Two of the other boys died on the way. The guy you tackled is singing all over the place and Baxter will have a quiet funeral tomorrow. The others we got locked up. Your boys all right? One of them got it in the leg. Otherwise, okay. You were right about the girl. Baxter killed her because he was afraid she'd talk. Seems she had a beef and walked out. Baxter got worried. Nash was to get his tonight, just like you figured. Okay, Walt, thanks. I'll talk to you tomorrow. And thanks, Rick. Sure. Well? Well? Wanting to know if his boys were all right. Now, Rick, you've been doing something exciting, and I want to know about oh, it. Honest, baby, the park's very dull uh, in the afternoon. Want to go stir up some action in it now? Good move. Rick, why do you lie to me? No. Mm. Oh. All right, come on. Oh, wait, 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 wait. We're forgetting something. I got to sing a song first. Oh, Rick, now that you've brought it up, I want to go to the park. Well, this will only take a few seconds. You just pucker up and hold. 
Well, 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 look who's here. I haven't seen you in many a year. If I knew you were coming, I'd have baked the cake. Baked the cake, baked the cake. If I knew you were coming, I'd have baked the cake. How'd you do, how'd you do, how'd you do? Had you dropped me a letter, I'd have hired a band. Grandest band in the land. Had you dropped me a letter, I'd have hired a band. And spread the welcome mat for you. Now I don't know where you came from, cause I don't know where you've been. But it really doesn't matter. Grab a chair and fill your platter and dig, dig, dig right in. If I knew you were coming, I'd have baked the cake, hired a band. Goodness sake, if I knew you were coming, I'd have baked the cake. How'd you do? How'd you do? How'd you do? Now I don't know where you came from. Cause I don't know where you've been But it really doesn't matter Grab a chair and fill your platter And dig, dig, dig right in If I knew you were coming I'd have baked a cake Hired a band Goodness sake, if I knew you were coming I'd have baked a cake How'd you do, how'd you do, how'd you do Oh, how'd you do, how'd you do, how do you do Miles, still puckered? Mm-hmm Think you can hold it till we get to the pie? Mm -hmm. You see, if you're patient, I always make it up to you. You have just heard Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Lieutenant Levinson was played by Ed Begley. Also in the cast were Virginia Del Valle and Wilms Herbert. Music was under the direction of Frank Worth. Tonight's show was written by Blake Edwards, and the entire production was under the direction of Jack Johnstone. Dick Powell currently may be seen in the motion picture version of the best-selling novel, Mrs. Mike. Richard Diamond's Private Detective will next be heard two weeks from tonight. Check your local newspaper for the time of broadcast. Listen next week at this hour for Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell, Soldier of Fortune. Remember, at this time next week, it's Dangerous Assignment on NBC. This is Eddie King inviting you to be with us two weeks from tonight when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. For all the family, try Father Knows Best tomorrow on NBC. Time now for Rocky Jordan. Not far from the mosque Sultan Hassan in Cairo stands the Cafe Tambourine run by Rocky Jordan. The Cafe Tambourine, crowded with forgotten men. Alive with the babble of many languages. For this is Cairo, where modern adventure and intrigue unfold against a backdrop of antiquity. Tonight's story, Portrait of Rocky. It was the stifling sort of night when you expect people to stay at home and out of trouble. Later on, it got a lot hotter. I wasn't exactly done in oil, but I was plenty burned up. The night air out of the desert was thick and depressing, and the windmill fan and the tambourine made it even worse. At 11 o'clock, I sent the help home, figuring to close up early. The only trouble was a couple of customers. One was over in a corner nursing some cognac, a big shaggy specimen, dark eyes, gray showing in his beard. Might have been American once. The other one was easier. He hung onto the bar and let you know about himself. Ah. ah I tell you, right to Mount I've signed it to his nose. Oh, I get the idea. You and Montgomery, like that, huh? Yeah, just let me tell you a week before October what I've signed. I'm standing in a tank. See? How about finishing it off, huh? Closing time. Oh, wait a minute, Governor. I haven't told you. Hey. Hey, hey now. Catch an eye full of that bloke, would you? Oh, the beard over there? Staring at me, he is. 
Why does he get off staring at me like that? Oh, take it easy. It's me he's looking at. You, me, what's the difference? He does it every night. Why well, does he get too fast? Hey, put down that bottle. A man's got a right to his privacy, ain't it? Let go, me. I said take it easy. I'll take him and we both his eyes for All him. All right, Orsi, you asked for it. Let go, me. Out you go. Come on. Oh, I'd wipe the floor with you, too. Good night, Orsi. Pleasant dreams. <laughs> Don't bother to come back until your tank's empty. <laughs> Don't worry, Governor. I ain't bad for the last couple of drinks, remember? What's in my tail What's in my tail oh, <laughs> What's so funny? All of it? Anger, drink, man? Yeah, well, you're next, you know. I'm closing, do you mind? Ambition is funny, too. Hatred? Well, sort of. And love? <laughs> That's the most humorous of all. Look, philosopher. Sit down, sit down, Jordan. Have a nightcap with me. Thanks. I'm having a cold shower alone. Just a friendly little cognac. You know, friendship isn't so funny. Look, pal, what's it all about? Who is he? The Australian? Yes. You heard him, a buddy of Montgomery's. Tell me, Jordan. I told you, I don't know. No, you don't, do you? Now, let me lock up, huh? Jordan, would you like to make ten pounds? That's all I have. How? Find out about him. Uh-uh. Please, Jordan, I need your help. I must find out. Will you tell me why? I wish I could tell you, Mr. Jordan. It's just a... a feeling. That man... I don't know. Then skip it. Doesn't make sense anyway. The guy's been in here once, and you've been in three or four times. Only every night you stare at me. Oh, that. You have a face, that's all. But don't most people? Most people only have... License plates. Here. Here, I'll show you. Pencil. You know, there's something in your eyes that belongs to you. One ear is a little larger. Well, that's it. You're an artist, eh? You draw pictures of everybody you meet? A mouth that's for chewing instead of advertising. Yes, yes, I'm an artist. Jeffrey James. Jeffrey, not Jesse. You've never heard of me, have you? Well, don't let it worry you. Renoir, Michelangelo, and Rembrandt, that's all I know. Here. Here, keep it. A souvenir. Ah. It's not bad. You sure you won't reconsider? About checking on the Australian? I don't like trouble unless I know what it is. Yeah. You're smarter than I thought you were, Jordan. Thanks for the picture, Mr. James. Yes. Good night. Well, he hunched his shoulders and shuffled out the door. I watched him until his dirty white suit rounded the mosque at the corner of Bengeza. The street was empty, except for the night. Then I heard a motor start across the alley. Against the low yellow moon, I could see it moving. It was one of those army surplus jeeps that are all over the world. It kept its lights off, and it slowly rounded the same corner, tailing Jeffrey James. Exactly one minute later, before I'd barely started to get the place cleaned up for the night... I heard something else. Hey! Hey, Australia! Ah, where, where, where? Still open for business, eh, Governor? Uh, come in here, will you? I want to talk. Ha. Ain't that a coincidence now? There was something I forgot to say myself. Huh? This loop! Well, it figured I made my mistake when I thought he was drunk. He wasn't. Neither were his brass knuckles. I came floating back to life maybe half an hour later. I was alone on the floor. The door was open and all the bugs in Egypt were holding a filibuster around the bar light. Everything else seemed to be okay. Nothing was missing. The cash register was still full. I still had my wallet. Yeah, nothing was missing except one thing. That pencil sketch the artist had drawn. The pencil sketch of me. I'd been rolled before for a wallet or a wristwatch, but never so someone could steal a pencil sketch of me by some down-and-out artist. But I never did like getting rolled, no matter what the reason. Well, I finally got my cold shower and tried for some sleep. I was awakened way too early by someone banging on the front door of the tambourine. It was Captain Sam Sabaya, Cairo Police. Good morning, Jordan. Sam, I'm not entertaining. What's the idea? A small matter. Well, let's save it till later. One moment. A beggar saw a man in your cafe last night. Eh? That unusual? An Australian talking to you at the bar. Sure, name's Bertie. 
Short, shifty eyes, seersucker suit. Why? Your memory's rather sharp, Jordan. It ought to be. Got a little noisy. I threw him out. A few minutes later, he came back with some brass knuckles. I took the count. And you did not notify the police? You want me to call you every time somebody gets rough in my cafe? Jordan, this is more serious than you think. The man you call Bertie was just found back of the tambourine. He's dead. What'd you find on him, Sam? Very little. Why? Did he take something from you last night? Uh, no money. Only a picture. P what kind of a picture? A pencil sketch of me. Uh, <laughs> of you, Jordan? Are you suggesting that a picture of you is motivation for murder? All I'm saying is he knocked me out, took it from me, and it's gone now. Mm -hmm. Well, perhaps when this Bertie sobered up and got another look at your picture... Okay, have your laugh, Sam. But think about it. I have much more important things to occupy my mind. Come on, Jordan. We had a look at Bertie. That didn't help my morning any. And Sam kept asking the same questions that always kept leading back to the missing pencil sketch of me. So when Sam left, I decided to dig a little. The artist, Jeffrey James, figured to be information please, so I tried to run him down. A couple of art stores knew nothing about him, so I put in a phone call to somebody named Tuga Bey, Egyptian art critic on one of the newspapers. Yes, this is Tuga Bey. I'm uh, trying to locate a guy named Jeffrey James. He's a... Uh... Jeffrey James. I'm afraid I do not know. Uh, he's an artist. Oh, that James. An, an artist, you say. <laughs> bah, bad. No style. Uh, look, I'll read about it in your column. All I want to know is where he lives. Well, he used to have a studio at number 16, Street of Many Moses, but I don't Thanks. know. Thanks. I didn't have any trouble finding it. It was down a dusty, narrow street full of flies and herb smells and peddlers. And up some outside steps to the top floor of number 16, Street of Many Moses... A peddler was doing a sales job and a very sleek young lady standing in the doorway. Madame, wait! Do not shut the door. I have the samples, many samples. Please, no, no, go Brushes, away. Brushes, postcards, neckties, snake balls. Take your foot out of the door. Sample for every human need. Oh, Effendi, for you too, a man, I sell something. No, I'm not buying. Brushes I got. Oh, careful, mother. My foot is still there. You heard the lady, brush. Effendi. Go on, Impshi, beat it. Oh, but Effendi, if you would but look, it's <sighs> Thank you, sir. Yeah, skip it. Now, now you go away, too, please. I want to come in. No, please, no. I'm looking for Mr. James. So? I'm Rocky Jordan. I'd like to see him. But, but your name means nothing to me. Mr. James is not here. Where is he? And, and the studio is so dirty. It's so poor. That's it... all right. He told me he wasn't selling like Renoir. He... He said what? Oh, never mind. Oh, wait. You know... Uh... Wait, I must cover the paintings. What's, uh... What's the matter with them? Only that... They're of me. You're his model? Yes. Oh. This morning, I, I came to work on time, but... How do I know I can trust you? Well, you don't, but, uh... He says I got a nice face. Yes, I can see that for myself. Come on, tell me. What is it? This morning, I found a note. I, I have it here. Jeannie, I'll not need you this morning. I may never need you again. Stay here. You'll hear from me once more. Well? His bed wasn't slept in. Uh, what do you know about him? I've been modeling for Mr. James for almost a year, but I know so little about him. He He's such a strange man, so so alone, so tragic. Yeah, he thinks he's a failure, but he's got some friends, some enemies, something. No, no, there's just me. I, I'm like a daughter to him. Uh, a guy in a Jeep and an Australian. You ever seen them? Why, no, I don't think so. Okay, then I'll call the police. The police know. Why not? Well, it, if, if something's wrong, don't you understand? It, it would only be worse for him. Yeah, I see, all right. I see nothing. Please, please, for my sake, have faith in him. I just need you to help, Rocky. Well, what's your suggestion? Wait with me, please. It's only hot outside. You could draw the blinds to the window, and it's cool here. I'm not so bad to wait with, am I? Some other time, sister. I'll see you later. Hey, hey, you toothbrush. Oh, Effendi, get away, Effendi, get away. Keyhole boy, huh? <laughs> yes. Look at what you are looking at. The rod, artillery, pistol of Listen, brush boy. Brushes? Oh, a disguise, Effendi. 
Now we are vamoosing before she sees us. Okay, okay, quit shoving. Uh, hurry, please. This way. This way, Effendi. This way for a little ride with me. Oh, so that's it. You drive a jeep. All the modern appliances, Effendi. Uh, in, please. In. Where are we going? You do not ask questions. This is a caper. You know all the words, don't you? Hmm. On the shortwave radio, I am listening to Sam Spade. I know my stuff. So beware. Well, now I heard everything. Uh, permit me to present myself. Ali Ben Seamus. Seamus? Egypt must have her national character. Seamus. I am calling myself the private eye of the desert. All right, what's it all about? Why have you been following me? Well, if you please, uh, tail and plant. Last night you were following the artist, James. Why? Oh, but uh, I lost him. Uh, that is why I follow you. So you don't know where he is? Oh, no, Effendi. Some lessons I have not learned so well yet. Uh, you're not good at a lot of things. Oh, all I am trying to do is uh, to, to raise business. I find a caper, I get myself a commission. Uh, doing what? Well, that is the only thing I do not know. Look, Buster, spit out the sand. Who hired you? Where are you taking me? Uh, your name is Jordan Effendi, and I think maybe you will hire me. Uh, I already got a dishwasher. No jokes, please. We are going into the Royal Galleries, room 12, left wall. You will hire me. Now, uh, out, please. Sure. Well, somebody else is here, too. Look behind you. <laughs> Look behind you. Even Sam Spade is not falling for that one. Uh, have it your own way, but I happen to recognize Captain Sabaya of the Cairo Police. Uh, 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 goodbye, Effendi. Hey! Well, Jordan, who is your hasty friend? Oh, he's a nut, Sam. If you want to crack him, you better get going. I have done enough chasing for a hot day. The one I want is you. Me? Why? A few more routine questions. Okay, just stay with me. Come on. Uh, Jordan, where are you going? Into the Royal Galleries to get you some answers. I grabbed Sam's arm and pulled him into the Royal Galleries. It was all crazy, but I had to take a look at what had been in the Seamus' mind. He'd said, room 12, left wall. I found it all right. It wasn't the same sketch Jeffrey James had drawn last night. This one was fancier, but it had the same lines, the same style. Underneath, a little bronze plate said, portrait of a gentleman. Original sketch by Renoir. Worth 5,000 pounds. Only I knew better. Why? Because it was a picture of me. Rocky Jordan. You are listening to Portrait of Rocky, tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan. Today we salute San Francisco CBS station on the occasion of the change of the call letters from KQW to KCBS. For the best entertainment on the air... For the nation's favorite personalities, remember, it is now KCBS at 740 on the radio dial in San Francisco and the Bay Area. Now we return you to Cairo and tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan, Portrait of Rocky. Well, there I was, framed very nicely in the art gallery. A pencil sketch of me valued at a few thousand pounds, done by Renoir. Well, somebody had themselves a deal, selling phony pictures by old art masters and collecting a fancy buck for them. But who? The artist who drew them? The Australian who stole the sketch from me and ended up dead? The model or Ali Ben Seamus? There are a lot of people in the play... But as we stood there in front of the picture in the gallery, Sam Sabaya kept looking at me, because he was interested in finding a murderer. Mm, yes, Jordan, it, it might be you. There, there is a certain resemblance. I tell you, it is me. If you could see that fast sketch James did of me last but night... But art is not one of my specialties, Jordan. Murder is. Now, who killed the Australian? Oh, how should I know? How should anyone else know? <laughs> I, I will search for the others you speak of, but I would not want to lose you, George. Look, Sam, look here at the nose. The ears, one's bigger, see? What are you trying to prove, George? That this artist you want to help is some kind of a forger, a crook? 
Uh, that's the hard part. Well, anyway, Georgian, it is not likely the Royal Gallery would accept a fraud, is it? This uh, Renoir is on loan from Mrs. Baldwin Wentworth. She's very important, very skillful, very rich. Okay, I'll see her myself. Why, Jordan? I am the police. Don't you understand? It's my face. She can look at my face. <laughs> yes, your face. The police can hardly protect her from that. <laughs> Mrs. Baldwin Wentworth lived in a private pyramid with a view of the Nile. She was maybe ten years older than she tried to look. When I got there, she was pouring tea for a, a slob in a fez. It was Tuga Bay, the art critic I talked to on the phone that morning. Yes, yes, we talked on the telephone, didn't we? You were looking for that fellow James. Dreadful sense of color. James? James? Never heard of him. Who is he? Uh, sugar and milk, Mr. Jordan? Yeah, thanks. I'd like a slice of lemon. May I ask why it was you wished to find him? Really? I don't particularly care who he is. You needn't bother telling me. Oh, he's frightfully hot. I uh, wanted him to paint me a mural, Mr. Bay, that's all. Oh, yes, yes, of course, that's it. A restaurateur, you say you are. Uh, I own a place. Oh, people eat so much, don't they? But it would be nice, wouldn't it? One of those lovely panoramic things over your bar, I suppose. With simply acres of female flesh. Bad for the digestion, though, I should think. Uh, Mrs. Wentworth, about your Renoir. You were saying you bought it here in Cairo just a day or two ago. Did I? Oh, but of course I must have. How much did you pay for it? Oh, uh, um, oh, blast, how should I know? Was it five pounds? That's what uh, I printed in my article. There you are, young man. Newspapers never lie. Isn't it just possible that your Renoir isn't real? That you threw away over $20,000 on a phony? That's a ridiculous notion. I'm an expert, Mr. Jordan. And took her here. He's frightfully keen. The picture is perfectly genuine. Defined of the season. Mrs. Wentworth, take a look at me. Oh? You've studied the drawing. It could be my photograph. What? It's me. Look at me. Don't you see it in my face? Really, young man. All I can see in your face is my desire to be 25 years younger. <laughs> there, now. That's the nicest thing I've said all day. Thank you, Mrs. Wentworth. I wish you were. Goodbye. Oh, Jordan. Jordan, wait a moment. Yes, Mr. Bay? Um, about that picture. What about it? You said it was genuine. And I am certain it is. I have staked my reputation as a critic on the authenticity of that Renoir. Then we haven't anything to talk about. No way, Jordan. You interest me. Tell me. Does Jeffrey James have any connection with this, uh, this impossible theory of yours? Nothing much, except that he drew my picture and sold it to Mrs. Wentworth for 5,000 pounds. That is preposterous. Is it? Why don't you ask Jeffrey James? I most certainly shall. And immediately, Jordan. Tuga Bay moved out fast. And next I went looking for the agent who'd sold the Renoir. Only he'd taken off the day before to visit the Louvre in Paris. I got around, talked to a lot of people, but they all thought I was nuts. And an hour later, I began to think so myself. I headed back for the tambourine about sunset, was just crossing the street in front of my place when a little jeep whirled around the corner and I jumped for the curb. Oh, I offended Jordan. I find you. Uh, Ali, the Seamus. Where you been? Well, that I have come to tell you. I am convinced the life of a private eye is a bomb racket. All right, come off the spade routine, Ali. I'm not buying. Oh, but this you should know, Effendi. There is a murdered man. I discovered him a short time ago lying in an alley back of the street of Many Moses. You discovered who? The art critic, Tugabe. Tugabe is dead? Yes, Effendi. He had been shot only a short time. Come on, let's go. Where, Effendi? Back to Tugabe. Now, start it up, Ali. As you wish, Effendi. And now, uh, suppose you start at the beginning and tell me everything you know. But there is nothing you do not know yourself. You're avoiding the police too much, Ali. Why? Oh, please, you are touching a sore point, Mr. Jordan. All right, let's have it. Even in Cairo, the eye must be legit. Oh, no license? Natural intelligence, they admit I have. Uh, but I am handicapped. How so? M mirror vision. Say that again. Oh, please, it is not good for my ego... The world I see backwards. Only a few people are so afflicted with mirror vision, and I am one. Yeah. Something's beginning to add up. What did you say, Athendi? You're the only one who looked at the Renoir and said it was me. That is true. Nobody else could see the resemblance, because that drawing is wrong side, too. 
Like I see myself when I shave every day. Like the guy who drew it. Uh, like he what, Effendi? Jeffrey James sat in my tambourine night after night, staring at me in a bar mirror. That is it. He studies you. He is making a sketch. He sells it as a master for big money. He made another for me in the tambourine freehand. Oh, yes. Evidence against him. A mistake. So when he falls into the hands of the Australian, James must kill him. No, I don't need a diagram. I put Tuga Bay on the artist trail today. So James had to kill him, too. Ah, so, I think, Jordan, we have got our man. Ali Ben Seamus parked his jeep a couple of blocks from where he discovered the body of Tuga Bay. A crowd of natives was milling around the spot, so we knew the police were there, too. I didn't want to talk to them just yet. Not till I paid Jeffrey James a visit. So I headed on foot for his studio. And the eye of the desert flapped along behind like a, a boy scout on his first snipe hunt. It was dark by now, and the street of many Moses didn't look quite so shabby. We groped up the rickety steps, and Jeannie answered my knock. Mr. Jordan, what do you want? A word with your artist friend, Jeffrey James. But I told you he's gone. I still haven't heard from him. I, I'm so worried. Why? Well, so many strange things are happening. Yeah, like the murder of Tuga Bay. Mr. Jordan, no. no. What are you doing? Getting a look at these pictures you covered up this morning. Please, I... Yeah, have a look, Ali. They're not all pictures of Jeannie. Renoir's, Monet's, Gauguin's, all phonies by Jeffrey James. Right, Jeannie? Why, yes, but, but what does it matter? It adds up, Effendi. Now we know this girl is covering up for the artist. You're right, Ali. I don't understand. What is this all about? Well, it's simple, Jeannie. Your boss has been playing people like Mrs. Wentworth for suckers, selling his own stuff as originals of masters, then killing when anybody got in his way. Oh, no, this can't be. Jeffrey's like a father. He couldn't harm anyone. Yeah. Where is he, Jeannie? I don't know. Now, please go. Let them stay, Jeannie. Jeffrey. It is the artist. Watch him, Mr. Jordan. Calm yourself, my boy. It's as Jeannie says, I would harm no one. Yeah, we've got a different idea, James. Yes, I know. I heard everything. You've made a great mistake, Mr. Jordan. Oh, yeah? Like spotting these masterpieces as phonies you drew yourself? Is that a mistake? Not at all. For many years I've known that I wasn't a creator. So what better could I do than imitate the work of great artists? Sure, and then sell them as originals. Mr. Jordan, do you think I would represent my feeble efforts as the work of masters? There's a picture hanging in the Royal Gallery, says you would. One moment. Let me show you something. What is this, F.N.D.? Just watch him, Molly. We'll move this Renoir over under the light. Now, with my mat knife, I will scrape off the name of Renoir. Now, step over here, Mr. Jordan. Read what is underneath. Imitation of Renoir by Jeffrey James, 1947. Now you realize I couldn't possibly have represented the sketch as anything but my own. Ah, oh, you're clear, Jeffrey. Sorry I didn't get it right the first time. So, Mr. Jordan... Why don't we forget this whole affair? That's not so easy. Somebody sold that picture hanging in the Royal Galleries as a genuine article, and two people were killed because of it. The police want to know why. Are the police necessary? Yeah. Very well, Mr. Jordan. Let us go to them. I will confess to the murders. Jeffrey, what are you saying? Quiet, Jeannie, my dear. It's the best way. So, Effendi, uh, Geoffrey James is the killer. We have apprehended him. No, Ali, but you'll get your badge. We have the killer. Please, Mr. Jordan, let's say no more. The cover-up's the other way around, isn't it, Mr. James? If you look in Jeannie's room, I'll bet you'll find the 5,000 pounds for that picture. Wait. Recently, I've been aware of many things. But for Jeannie's sake... You'd do anything for her, wouldn't you? Even after she's made a sucker out of you. Mr. Jordan... Try it this way. Jeannie knows how you feel about her, so she gets away with plenty. She and Tuga Bay hatch up this idea of selling your imitations as originals. When you start getting wise, they put the Australian on your trail. You learn too much. He was killed. Not by Jeannie. What difference does it make? Then Ali here scratched around too much. Things begin falling apart. So Jeannie decided to get rid of Tuga Bay and keep all the money for herself. Oh, it's all so easy. You take the blame, Jeffrey. You're the sucker. Please let her go, Mr. Jordan. She and I will go away together. No, Jeffrey. And... Only I will go away. Effendi, she has a gun. Yes, and there are enough bullets to kill all of you. Please, Jeannie, my darling. Shut up. I'll do it quickly. Why do you cringe, Jeffrey? Effendi, Jordan, what do we do now? You're a detective, Ali, you tell me. Oh, yes. Sam Spade, he would think quickly. 
He would move in. Allie, no. So you're the first. She swung around, but he kept coming, and she fired on him point blank. That was my chance. Before she could swing back, I had her by the wrist, and the gun dropped. Jeannie scratched me up a little, but she knew she was through. And all this time, Jeffrey James stood as though in a stupor. Well, as usual, Sam Sabaya was moving around a couple of steps behind me, and the gunshot brought him quick. Jordan! All right, here's your killer, Sam. She just tried it again. Yeah. Greco, Hamud, take everyone into custody at once. At once, Lieutenant. Uh, lay off the artist. He's okay. I will get a full statement at headquarters from everyone. Uh, Jordan, who, who, who is this? Ali Ben Seamus. She only creased him. He's coming out of it. Ben Sh- is this the, the, the pest who is always hounding me for a detective's license? Yeah. And I think he won his color, Sam. Oh, wait. Uh, Fendi, I, I did not do so well. I fear capers are not for me. Yeah, think again, Ali. I got an idea you'll get your license now. Can it be, Fendi, that I will be a real private eye? How about it, Sam? Hmm? Uh, oh, uh, well, Jordan, uh, if, if what you... Uh, Perhaps. Oh, so? Now, when the telephone rings, I will say, Ali Ben Seamus, the license number 34687. Oh, but uh, now I am tired. Sure. Do you know what your friend Sam Spade would say in a case like this? What, if Indy? Good night, sweetheart. It's CBS again at the same time next week for another story of adventure and intrigue when we take you back to Cairo in the Cafe Tambourine run by Rocky Jordan. Jack Moyles plays the title role with night story by Jackson Gillis and edited by Gomer Cool and Larry Roman. Rocky Jordan is produced and directed by Cliff Howell with original music by Richard Arundt. Larry Thor speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. I don't want to, Blackie, but I will. It's probably John Blake. He phoned just before you got here and said he was coming right up. Well, anyhow, I arrived in time to open the door, anyhow. This is Boston Blackie's apartment. Oh, uh, oh, yes, yes, it is. You're John Blake? Yes, I am. Well, uh, come in. Oh, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm Mary Wesley. How do you do? Well, Mr. Blake, you must have... Have something awfully important on your mind. You didn't waste much time getting here. I do have something important on my mind. You're Boston Blackie? I'm Boston Blackie. Now that we all know each other, suppose we all sit down. Thank you. Uh, well, maybe you'd like to talk to Blackie alone, Mr. Blake. No, Miss Wesley. In fact, I'm glad you're here. I would like a witness to what I have to say. <laughs> a witness, huh? It sounds like you have serious business, Mr. Blake. I have, Blackie. Suppose we get right down to it? I'm ready. Perhaps I'd better begin by asking you a question. I'm a student of crime. Question mark? No, of course not. It will explain the reason for my question. I want to know this, Blackie. Why is a murderer always caught? Well, that's not a very hard question. That's not very hard to answer, at least. A killer is caught because he makes a mistake. 
isn't there such a thing as a killer who doesn't make a mistake? I doubt it. Sooner or later, something happens that links him to the crime and sends him to the chair. I would like to argue that point. Not with me. There just isn't any argument that you could offer that would make any sense. Well, let me put it this way, then. I won't tell you when. I won't tell you where. I'm going to murder a man named Thomas Evers. I defy you to prove that I did it. And now, back to Dick Calmer as Boston Blackie. Enemy to those who make him an enemy. Friend to those who have no friend. What number are you calling? Edgeworth 96451, operator. Mr. Thomas Evers. One moment, please. Okay. Seem to have dialed the wrong number, sir. I'll try it for you. Thank you. Hello? Hello, Tom. Yeah? Who's this? This is Bill. Oh, hello, Bill. How are you? Fine. Say, how about lunch today? Sure. What time? Well, you name it. Well, I'll be busy till about 1. How about one thirty? Good. Meet me at my office, huh? Sure. Oh, say, Bill, what time is it now? My watch has stopped. Let's see. It's exactly 8.30. Thanks. Well, I'll see you about one time. Tom, what's the matter? Tom! Blanky, will you get out of my office? Or will I have to throw you out? And you too, Miss Wesley. Get out of here. Well, You've got to Faraday. listen to us, Inspector. In fact, you should have done something about it when I called you last night. Why did you wait till now? Yeah, before I do anything about that silly thing, I'll wait 20 years. Look, let me tell you once more, and maybe you'll understand. I already understand. You've told me so many times, I can tell it to you. Last night, a man named John Blake came to your apartment and said he was going to kill someone. All right. At least you've got that straight. Okay. So now you get straight. Out of here. Oh, really, Inspector? I think Mr. Blake was serious. I'm sure he was, Faraday. Will you grow up? Can't you see that... Look, Faraday, at first I took it the same way you're taking it now. But the more I thought of it, the more I believe this guy Blake meant what he said. Well, uh, stop thinking about it. Anybody with sense at all should know a guy isn't going to telegraph a murder he hasn't committed yet. But he had a reason for doing it, Faraday. It was a sort of a, well, you know, a sort of a challenge to me. He said he could kill this man, and I'd never been able to... I'd never be able to prove it. Oh, Blackie, your stories get worse every day. I suppose now you're going to tell me this fellow, Blake, even gave you the name of the man he's going to kill, huh? Yes, he did. He said he was going to kill Thomas Evers. That's all. Now, get out of here, will you? And you too, Miss Wesley. But, Inspector Faraday, I think you... I said get out of here, and I meant get out. Thomas Evers is probably as healthy as you are. Healthier, now... Oh, wait a minute. Yeah? A flash just came in on the teletype, Inspector. A man's been shot to death. His brother identified the body. The dead man's name was Thomas Evers. The body's still right where you found it, Rollins? Yes, Inspector. Everything's just as it was when we when we found, except uh, we put the telephone receiver back on the hook. He was shot while he was talking to someone on the phone, huh? Yes, Blackie, that's how we got the first report of the murder. The fellow he was talking to called the central police station. I bet I know something. What, Mary? The man on the phone had something to do with killing Mr. Evers. I don't think so, Miss Wesley. The man on the phone was Bill Johnson, member of the city council. Oh, dear. Anyhow, it was a nice try, Mary. Well, while you two are making nice tries, I'm going to look around for a few nice clues. I've got men searching the house and grounds now, Inspector. Good. We already know this much. The shot that killed Evers was fired through that window. There's a footprint in the mud just below it. Yeah? Let's have a look at it. Yes, that's a good idea, Faraday. Uh, but I have a better one, Blackie. You and Miss Wesley stay in the house. Thanks, Faraday. Come on, Mary. The inspector has invited us to look at that footprint. Right? Oh, thank you very much, Inspector. Ah, oh, what's the use? Come on. Rawlins, did you find out what time Bill Johnson was talking to us? Yes, we know the exact time the shot was fired. 8.30 this morning. Well, it's going to be interesting to hear what kind of a phony alibi John Blake is going to have for his whereabouts at 8.30 this morning. You still think that crackpot Blake killed Evans? He said he would, Faraday, and Evans is dead. Just a coincidence, that's all. But what a fatal one for Evans. Uh, Sergeant Rollins, where's the footprint you found? Uh, right here, Miss Wesley, behind these bushes here. 
Hey. That's a plenty clear one. Yeah. The an odd mark on the heel, too. Look. A metal tap made that funny-looking indentation, I'd say. Uh, have a plastic cast made of that footprint, Rollins. Right. Blackie, look what I found over here. What is it? What are you staring at, Miss Wesley? Haven't you ever seen a pile of leaves before? Yes, I have, Inspector, but there's a gun in this leaf pile. A gun, Mary? Yes, Wesley. Yes. It is a gun. Don't touch it, anybody. Maybe the murder gun. Rollins. Yes, sir? We'll take this gun down to headquarters and test it for fingerprints. Sure. Now, careful how you handle it. Now, we'll run that down to headquarters and send a man out here to make a plaster impression on that footprint. I think I'll go see Eva's brothers, Faraday. I'd like to have a talk with him. Uh, he's got trouble enough now without you. Come on, Rollins. Mary, John Blake said he would kill Tom Evers. I said he couldn't get away with it. He kept his word. Now I've got to keep mine. <laughs> Somebody told me and asked me to come up here. My name is John Blake. Oh, Blake, huh? Well, I'm Tom Ever's brother. Oh. Get in here. No, let go of me. I'll let go of you when I'm through with you. Get it out here. After I've cut you up, I'll cut it out. Stop it. I haven't done any. You killed my brother, and I'm going to have to kill you. No, don't I. No, please. Maybe the cops will let you get away with this, but I won't. No. Please. Uh, please. Come on, get up! I'm not through with you yet. Come on, get up! Who's there? Oh. What do you want? Uh, I want to talk to Tom Everett's brother. You hear? I'm Tom Everett's brother. Come in. Thanks. Oh, we're not alone, are we? Well, almost. I, I just about killed him, I guess. I wanted to. He killed my brother. That's why I used a pretext to get him up here. Blake was my brother's only enemy. Why did he hate your brother? Blake was mixed up in a swindle once. And Tom produced the evidence that sent Blake to jail. Well, there's evidence down at police headquarters that's going to send Blake to jail again. Only this time, he's going to sit his sentence out in the electric chair. <laughs> I don't care what there is, Rollins. I don't want to be disturbed for another half hour. Yes, sir. All right, now. Where were we, Blackie? You were just about to shove John Blake here, kill Tom Everett. That's what the evidence proves. You'd better be awfully sure, Inspector. I'm waiting to hear your evidence, Inspector. It'll be most interesting. It will be, Blake. Well, let's have it, Barney. All right, Blackie. I'll show you how we do things at police headquarters when we don't have any interfering uh, help from you. The great Boston Blackie. Poof. Come on, Faraday. Let's have less poof and more proof. All right, Blackie. Listen to this. You listen too, Blake. Uh, in case you want to know why you're going to be behind bars in a few minutes. Here's item one that proves you killed Tom Evans. We have your fingerprints on file. From the time you went to jail on that swindle rap. But he's going to jail for more than a swindle rap this time. Huh? He certainly is, Blackie. We found his fingerprints on the gun Miss Wesley discovered in that pile of leaves. It was the murder gun, Inspector? Yes, it was the murder gun, all right. But that isn't all. It's Blake's gun. My gun? How do you know? It's registered in your name. I follow everything right through, Blake. Faraday, you're wonderful. Now follow through with enough evidence to convict this guy and let's go home. Yes, you need still more proof, I think. I don't need any more proof, but I have it. The footprint we found outside the window. Blake, your foot matches perfectly the plaster impression we made of it. Well, are you just going to sit there, or do you want to say something before I, uh, before I make a formal charge against you? Yes, I'll say something, Inspector. You can't arrest me. Oh, yes, I can. Look at the evidence I have. Sorry to disappoint you, but you can't arrest me. Your evidence is no good. No good? Do you deny that you own this gun? No, it's mine, all right. You deny that we found your fingerprints on it? No, the prints are mine. And you deny that it is your footprint we found outside the window? No, it's my footprint, all right. Then why do you say I can't arrest you? At what time this morning was Tom killed? That, uh... 8.30. Don't be too disheartened, Inspector Faraday. 
that at 8.30 this morning, I was at a police station 25 miles from Tom's house, and I can prove this. What? Uh-oh. Say there's something like this. You're lying, Blake. I am not lying. It's Precinct 89. I'll phone the desk sergeant there. He'll tell you I was talking to him before 8.30 this morning, and I was still talking to him when the flash about Tom's murder came in. Oh, uh, don't worry. I'll check. And I'll bet my check will prove you're lying. I'll take that bet, Faraday. Huh? Hey, look, Blackie, whose side are you on? I have proof this guy murdered Evers. Maybe you do, Faraday. I'm afraid Blake's alibi will throw out your evidence. But, Blackie, how could he be in police headquarters 25 miles from the scene of the crime and still kill Evers as he promised he would? I don't know, Faraday. Maybe Blake never had everything he wanted in life, but right now he's getting away with murder. <laughs> And now, back to Boston Blackie. John Blake has committed what even Blackie has to admit looks like the perfect crime. Evidence shows that Blake was at the scene of Evers' murder, yet Blake has been able to prove he was 25 miles away when Evers was killed. What bothers Blackie most of all, however, is that Blake told him beforehand that he was going to kill Evers and get away with it. And Blackie has just admitted that Blake is doing just that. As we return to our story, Blackie and his friend Mary Wesley are in her apartment, playing a game of darts. Um, Three hundred. I'll be a dart champion if I keep this up. Uh, That was good, wasn't it? Eight hundred. And another bullseye. Blackie, for a total of 1300 just try to be fat. Not now, Mary. You're the champ for the time being. What's the matter? Don't you know? Yes, I suppose I do, but you can't solve every case. Some time or other, there has to be one that's too much for you, though. It isn't the case itself that's bothering me, Mary. It's the fact that Blake warned me beforehand that he was going to kill others and get away with it. Now he's done it. He was in that police station at the time Evers was shot. Blackie, you're sure the police had the time of the murder right? Positive. Mr. Evers was shot at exactly 8.30, and Mr. Blake was in that police station 25 miles away at exactly 8.30? Exactly, both times. Well, then let's just forget the whole thing and play dark. Mary, I I, I just can't get this case off my mind. Why bother about it, darling? Because I can't help it. Do you know what the only two possible solutions of this thing are? What? Either Blake did not kill Evers, which I doubt, or he's committed the perfect crime, which I won't admit. Now, look, Blanky, either get out of my office or tell me how to break Blake's alibi. Faraday, he really was at Precinct 89 at the exact time of Evers' killing, wasn't he? He sure was. That's definite. Well, Faraday, it looks as if we'll have to turn to Mary Wesley to show how this was done. Mary Wesley? Mind if I use your phone? Thanks. What what do you mean, Miss Wesley will show us how it was done? Listen, Inspector, and learn. Hello? Hello, Mary. How are you? Oh, fine, (laughs) Blackie. Want to talk to an old friend of yours? Sure. Just a minute. Here, Faraday. You talk to her. What for? Never mind what for. Just talk to her. I don't want to. Don't be shy, Faraday. Maybe Mary is a girl, but you'll just be talking to her over the phone. Give me that receiver. That's better. Hello, Miss Wesley. Hello, Inspector. What's this all about? Oh, nothing, nothing. I just haven't had a chance to talk to you over the phone. Oh! Miss Wesley! Miss Wesley, what's the matter? Miss Wesley! What's wrong, Faraday? Miss Wesley's been shot! Oh, all right, Blackie. <laughs> Laugh your head off if you want to. You too, Miss Wesley. But you scared the daylights out of me. I don't see anything funny about it. Well, Inspector Faraday, I'm glad you felt so badly about my being dead. Now, that's very complimentary. <laughs> now, Faraday, don't ever deny you have a soft place in your heart for Mary. Yeah, well, you must have a soft place in your brain pulling a stunt like this on me. What pulling this stunt proved, Faraday, was the weak place in Blake's plan to commit a perfect crime. Yeah. I'll start explaining. How do you explain Blake's footprint in the mud under the window of the murder room? 
The same way I'm going to explain this footprint, Faraday. What footprint? I'll show you. Uncover that wooden box on the floor, Mary. Oh, right. That's just what I want. Hey, what's that? A box full of mud? And look what's in the mud, Faraday. A footprint. My footprint. Made not by me, but by Mary, wearing one of my shoes. And there was a lot of room in it, too. And room for improvement in Blake's murder plan, too. I get it. The real killer was wearing Blake's shoes. That proves how Blake could be at Precinct 89, 25 miles from the murder scene, and still make it look as if he killed Evers. But why would he want it to look as if he killed Evers? He could prove he was 25 miles away, and our evidence against him would be no good. Well, what about the murder gun? I'll show you. Where's the gun you fired, Mary? Right here on the table. Thanks. Yeah. All right, Faraday. Where was I at the time you heard the shot you thought killed Mary? In my office. All right. Look closely at this pistol. Yeah? Whose is it? Well, it's yours, isn't it? It's mine. And a lab test will show it. It has my fingerprints on it. Not Mary's. How come? I put my fingerprints on it when I gave it to Mary. Yeah. And she fired it with gloves on, and carefully, too. So she wouldn't smear my prints. Blake did that, too. Of course, I know what I've done. I've shown how Blake could be 25 miles from the scene of Evers' murder and still load you with evidence that he committed the crime. You've done more than that, Blackie. You've proved somebody else killed Evers. I don't have a single bit of evidence to lead me to the real killer. No, Faraday, you don't. All you have is Blake. What good is he now? He didn't kill Evers. No, he didn't. But he knows who killed Evers. And he knew when Evers was going to be killed. So what? So Blake is the tie-up to the real killer. Now what we have to do is to find something to use for rope. Hi, Mr. Blake. Looking at ties? Not so loud, Mike. Pretend you're looking at ties, too. Look, Blake, all I want to look at is the rest of the dough that's coming to me for the job I did this morning. I have it with me. Don't worry. Well, you followed into the store? Ah. Uh, well, I wasn't either. I keep looking at these ties. Drop your hand below the counter and I'll give you the money. Okay. Gives. Here. Hmm. Feels like a big while, all right. It is. I kept my promise. Now you keep yours. The job we did was perfect. Now get out of my life and stay out. Hi, Inspector Faraday. Oh, come in, Jerry. Sure, I don't care how I waste my time. Hey, where are the guys from the other newspapers? My editor says you've got a hot announcement to make. I do, Jerry. But I only asked you down. I thought I'd give you a scoop. Now, what kind of a scoop can you give me, Faraday? You on the trail of Everest Killer? Better than that, Jerry. Yeah, I know. Police are making progress in the mysterious murder of Tom Evers. Expect the rest shortly. Better than that, too, Jerry. <laughs> well, let's see. In that case... Police get tip from Underworld. I'm really going to give you something this time. Hold on to your hat, kid. Now, don't jolt me too hard, Inspector. I like this hat. My hands are busy with this pencil and paper. Well, uh, see how you can handle this. It's page one stuff, and that's exactly where I want it. On the front page. Hey, what are you doing, Inspector? Resigning from the force? Uh, you better resign, and fast, if you don't get this to your paper fast. Hmm? There's been a break in the Tom Evers murder case. The police are looking for a professional gunman as the killer of Tom Evers. And we're going to nab him... Within three hours. Because we know his name. Holy mackerel, Inspector. You on the level? I'm on the level. And so is that announcement. Now, scram out of here and see that it gets on paper. You bet, Inspector. Thanks a lot. Boy, what a scoop. How's <laughs> nice going, Faraday? Uh, I'm glad you liked it, Blanky. Well, that ought to bring the real killer out in the open, huh? Certainly should, Faraday. And if that smug look doesn't come off your face, the fact that this was my idea will come out into the open, too. Blanky, we don't get out of this basement hole pretty soon. I'm going to feel like a gopher. Save your right if you can't stand it down here, Faraday. Next time, try to get in on the ground floor of a murder. This won't happen to you. Now, look, it's bad enough down here without your bad jokes. 
Will you, will you, I'm please? sorry, Faraday. The telephone lines are Rollins still open? It better be. I'll see. Hello, Rollins. I'm still here, Inspector. The call to Blake hasn't come through yet. No? Well, maybe it never will. I just had a horrible thought, Faraday. Maybe something's wrong with our equipment. We haven't really tapped Blake's telephone line. Uh, the equipment's all right. I think it's your idea that's not so good. Or Blake's accomplice is smarter than we figured he'd be. Uh-oh. Here's a call on Blake's line. You listen in, Blakey. I'm listening. Rollins. Rollins, you all set? All set, Inspector. As soon as a call comes in, the phone company will trace it for us and we'll hop right down. Good, good. The call's complete, Barney. Hello? Hello, Blake. Why are you calling me? You're good for nothing, double crosser. You know why. Hey, how you fool? That notice in the paper was a fake. There was nothing fake about it. You spilled it a cop. I didn't. You did. And I'm going to get you like I got ever. Only I'm not going to kill for you this time. I'm going to kill for myself. You idiot. Mike, hang up before the police trace this call. What's the difference? They know who I am. You ratted on me. Hello? 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 Oh, you... It's all over, Faraday. Blake hung up. Did the call last long enough to be traced? Rollins. The phone company trace it okay? You bet, Inspector. It came from a building at 111 Echo Road. Good. Radio to squad cars 81 and 39 to close in fast and get our man. If they close in too fast, they'll run over him, Inspector. They're only a couple of blocks away. Swell. I'll be right there. Now get going. Right. It's finished, Blanky. We'll have the guy who killed Evers. Good work, Faraday. Now let's go upstairs, grab Blake, and tell him the phony news in the paper was bad news for him. <laughs> Sure, Blackie. You can go in and see Blake if you want to. He's in cell six. Thanks, Rowan. I won't be in there long. Right through this door. I know. I've been through it many times myself. <laughs> Ain't it the truth? Hello, Blake. Well, you seem to be pretty good spirits for a man who's going to the electric chair. I may be to get, you know. After all, I didn't actually kill Evers. But you engineered the plan to murder him. Not jealous, are you? It was a good plan, don't you think? A great plan, Blake. Except for one thing. It didn't work. It worked until that fool Mike thought I'd double-crossed him. Yes. You know what that proves, don't you? What? The point I made when you wanted to argue with me that a killer can commit a crime without making a mistake. What mistake did I make? You forgot the human element, Blake. When Mike thought you double-crossed him, he spilled the whole thing to the police to get even. Yes. I suppose I did lose our little argument, Blake. You're going to lose more than an argument, Blake. You're going to lose your life. <laughs>
once again it's time to walk down Baker Street with its swirling fog, its passing hansom cabs, and bustling London life. Hello, this is Ben Wright, welcoming you to two more new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce. At the end of each broadcast, the announcer says, Tonight's episode was written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher. Both men, although they are no longer with us, were married. Dennis Green's widow, Mary Green, lives in New York and is still active in theater and dance. And Phyllis White, Anthony Boucher's widow, lives in San Francisco and makes numerous guest appearances at Mystery Club gatherings and at the meetings of the Baker Street Irregulars. Well, tonight it is my pleasure to present Phyllis White, who will tell you a little about what her husband and Dennis Green did for the Sherlock Holmes radio series. Phyllis? I've been asked to give an account how it happened that my husband got involved with the Sherlock Holmes show. Well, the way his career developed was not according to any underlying plan. Whenever he turned a corner and moved into a new field, it was brought about by chance. And this was a good example of that. He was at the time a mystery reviewer for the San Francisco Chronicle. Well, this time he went over to the book department office, got his books and his mail, and found among the mail an invitation to a cocktail party. It was in honor of Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce, who had come to San Francisco to do a war bond promotion. The party was going on right then, so he could quite easily have learned about it too late. But he trotted right over, and aside from meeting Rathbone and Bruce, there were other people who had come along from the radio program. There was Glenn Hall Taylor, who was the producer, and there was Dennis Green, who was one of the writers. He was writing in collaboration with Leslie Charteris. Well, as it turned out, the Greens were staying on a little longer in the Bay Area. My husband invited them to come over to Berkeley and have dinner with us and see his Sherlock Holmes collection. Well, they they went back to Hollywood, and not long after, it turned out that the program was in need of a new writer. Dennis suggested Boucher. Well, it turned out that it... uh, mesh just beautifully as a collaboration. Here was a a noble project working with gifted colleagues, something that they could all feel affection for and respect and a lot of fun along the way, too. Thank you, Phyllis. And now, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson in Colonel Warburton's Madness. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invites you to listen to Dr. Watson as he tells us about another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. And you know what I wish I could share with you sometime? a bottle of Petri California Sherry. Have you ever tasted Petri Sherry? It's just perfect before dinner. Why, that Petri Sherry can change the usual before-dinner low into a special event, and that's a fact. Just look at the clear color of Petri Sherry. It's a deep, rich amber, clear and cheerful-looking. And wait till you taste it. That's when you find out for sure just how good a wine can be. That's when you find out just what I mean when I say that The flavor of Petri Sherry comes right from the heart of the grape. Try Petri Sherry by itself. Or with hors d'oeuvres or canopies or whatever you call those little cocktail sandwiches. And say, if you like your sherry dry, well then Petri California Pale Dry Sherry is the sherry for you. Just be sure the label says Petri, the proudest name in the history of American wines. And now let's look in on our old friend, Dr. Watson. Doctor? I'm out here on the patio, Mr. Bartell. Come out and join me. 
Quiet, Winnie. Quiet down, down, Monty. I see the welcoming committee's here. <laughs> this little scoundrel. They begin to think they own this patio. Scoop them off the chair, Mr. Bartell, and settle yourself down. All right, off you go, boy. Off you go. Go on, off you go. That's it, my boy. As a matter of fact, it's rather appropriate that the puppies should be here tonight. As in the story that I'm going to tell you, a dog played a most prominent part. A dog? What kind of a dog, Doctor? Now, 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 my boy, don't get me anticipating my story. For once, I'm going to start at the beginning. Which was? On a summer morning in 1890, not long after my marriage. I'd gone back to my private practice, you know, and Sherlock Holmes was living alone in our old Baker Street rooms. Well, you still saw him, I suppose. Indeed I did, Mr. Bartell. In fact, occasionally I even persuaded him to forego his bohemian habits so far as to visit my wife and me. But to get back to my story, I'd been exceptionally busy that summer, and consequence was feeling rather, shall we say, nervy and, and run down. So much so that Mary, oh, <laughs> Mrs. Watson, persuaded me to take a fortnight's holiday. We went down to the charming little village of Taplow on the lower reaches of the River Thames. But, as so often happens, the best laid schemes of mice and men gang up to glare. I guess the holiday backfired on you, Doctor, and you found yourself involved in a mystery. Maybe a mystery calling for the aid of your old friend Sherlock Holmes? Quite correct, Mr. Bartell. We'd only been down there a couple of days when the trouble began. In fact, the whole thing became so involved that I thought the best thing to do was to put the whole strange story in a letter to Sherlock Holmes. This I did. And I can imagine how he chuckled when he read my news. Dear old Watson, seems to be a little out of his depth. My dear Holmes, I need your help. Or at least your advice. Two days down here and I've become involved in a most unusual problem. It began this morning when Mary and I were out for an after breakfast stroll. The sun was shining, the birds were singing, and there seemed every indication of it being a happy... You know, Mary, I've always thought up to now that Barney was rather a silly word. <laughs> I still do, John, dear. Nevertheless, it's the only possible word that describes a day like this adequately. Very well, dear, it's Barney. Personally, I'm so happy to see you relaxing that I don't care what the weather's like. You've been working much too hard. Yes, it's been a busy year. Yes, and last year Sherlock Holmes monopolized most of your time. At least I've got you to myself for once. <laughs> you dear little thing, you... You've always been rather jealous of my association with Holmes, haven't you? Not jealous, dear, but I must confess his influence on you wasn't entirely for the good. He had a habit of keeping you out all night. Well, you should be used to that, dear. After all, it happens often enough in my practice. True, John, but on those occasions I know where you are and don't worry about you. And again, you've copied so many of Mr. Holmes' eccentricities. Hmm? Keeping your tobacco in a Persian slipper, for instance. <laughs> and Oh, John, look down. Do you see that woman walking across the field towards us? Yes, well, what's the matter? Do you know her? I'm not sure, but I think it's Ellen Warburton. I believe she does live somewhere near here. And who is Ellen Warburton? An old friend of mine. She's frightfully clever and advanced. She's interested in women's suffrage and all sorts of things. Oh, sounds dreadful. Imagine giving women the right to vote. Their place is in the home. It is Ellen. 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 Ellen Warburton. Oh, how are you? Mary. Mary Watson. Very nice to see you again. I'm Mary Watson now. This is my husband. How do you do, Miss Robertson? How do you? Uh, how do you do? Mary, I'd heard that you'd married. Aren't you a medical detective or something, Mr. Watson? <laughs> Not quite, dear. Uh, see... I hold the degree of Doctor of Medicine from the University of London, madam. But he's helped the great Sherlock Holmes on many of his cases. So that's how I've heard of him then. Do you mind if I walk with you a little way? Of course not, Ellen. Come along. Uh, do you live near here, Miss Robertson? About four miles away, Doctor, at Chevy Grange. I'm a glorified housekeeper for my uncle, Colonel Warburton. Oh, dear, that sounds rather dull for you. As a matter of fact, the state of my uncle's health at the present moment makes it anything but dull for me. That's why I asked if I might walk with you for a way. Well, what's the matter with him, Ellen? He's going mad. Before my eyes. And I can do nothing to help him. Mad? Come now, Mr. Warburton, surely you... Doctor, I'm not an hysterical girl. In fact, I regard myself as something of a scientist. I studied physics for a number of years at Bristol University. And I tell you that my uncle is going insane. What are the symptoms? Most of the time, he's perfectly normal. But when these attacks are on him, he gets in the most frightful rages and says the strangest things. He's even complained of hearing a shrill, piping whistle that comes out of nowhere. I can't hear it, nor can anyone else. 
But Uncle gets into the most dreadful state. I wonder, would you have a look at him for me, Dr. Watson? Well, I don't... Of course, feel... John will do everything he can. Thank you so much. Then supposing you both come over for... So, my dear Holmes, at seven o'clock this evening, we found ourselves approaching Chevy Grange. It was rather a forbidding-looking place, covering a little more than an acre, I should say. As we stood waiting for admittance, I must confess that I was not entirely... Oh. Gloomy-looking place, isn't it, Mary? It is a little forbidding, John, dear. Oh, dear. What's that? Sounds like a tom-tom. Someone singing a weird chant. It seems to be coming from the direction of that barn over there. It doesn't seem quite appropriate, dear, does it? I mean, not in the heart of Buckinghamshire. Why not knock on the door again, John? Yes, it's all right, I will. Perhaps they didn't hear us. Oh, oh, they did. Who is it? Oh, it's Guess. It's Dr. and Mrs. Watson, my good man. Acker's the name, sir. Come in, please. The colonel's expecting you, sir. He's in the study. This way, sir. By the way, Hacker, as we were waiting outside the front door, we heard a strange chant, and it sounded as if someone was beating a, a tom-tom. Oh, that's her. That was Miss Narda. You'll be hearing more of her. Promising beginning. Let's see what happened next. This uh, very unpleasant fellow Hacker showed us into the study where we met Colonel Warburton. First, it was hard to believe that he was a sick man. He looked well enough, and his conversation was sprightly. Spent most of his army life in Africa as military governor in a Zulu district. And the African spears and other trophies that lined his study walls bore mute evidence to his past life. He encouraged me to tell him some of my own army experiences. Oh, dear. Poor fellow. It was really rather clever. There I was, Colonel Warburton, on the howler of this wretched elephant. The river was a raging torrent, and I couldn't get the confounded animal to budge. Well, <laughs> I'm a pretty strong swimmer, you know. Won several cups of swimming, as a matter of fact. Of course, I was a much younger man then. Uh, and John, I... dear. Yes, ma'am? You interrupted Colonel Warburton's story. Oh, sorry. I thought this little incident would be interesting. Uh, uh, do go on, Colonel. Yes, uh, Your story was so interesting. Sorry. You were telling us that you were intercepted by an African drum code message. Oh, yes, yes. Well, I, I don't want to sound conceited, but I... I doubt if there was another Englishman in the world who could have told you what those particular drum beats meant. Oh, I don't doubt that, Colonel Warburton. Well, I'd spent a good number of years studying the native customs. I spotted the code right away. It meant that an uprising was planned to start throughout the whole province at noon the next day. Of course, I... Uh... There it is again. The devilish whistle. And you hear it, Dr. Watson? Mrs. Watson? I can hear nothing, sir. Nor can I. Of course not. No one could hear it but me. Now, 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 Colonel Warburton, don't get so excited, it's sir. It's black magic, that's what it is. Oh, really, it's a black oh, you magic. you must realize that the powers of jungle witchcraft are completely unknown in this country, Dr. Watson. But I know of them, and I can think of many people who might wish to employ them against me. Come in, come in. Oh, oh it's you, Nada. Great Scott, she's, she's... She's very beautiful. Nada, I want you to meet some friends of Ellen's. Dr. and Mrs. Watson. I am very pleased to meet both of you. How do you do? How do you do, Miss uh, Nada? Nada's father was a Chaga jeweler, one of the greatest Zulu chieftains I ever had the privilege of knowing. He did me the rare honor to swear blood brotherhood. So when the missionary sent Nada to England to complete her education, I insisted that she spend her first few months here under my wing. I... Listen. What is it, Colonel? That whistle again. For heaven's sake, say that you heard it this time. Please say that you did. I didn't hear a thing, sir. Well, I did. And I know where that sound came from. Now, now, put down that spear at once, will you, Colonel Warburton? The devils are trying to kill me. I'll kill them first. No, no, no. Don't throw it, sir. Don't throw it. Someone's opening the door. Uncle! It's Ellen. Great Scott. The spear missed her by an inch. Uncle, what is it? Whistle. I heard it again, Ellen. And I'm going to find where it came from. I'm... Poor Uncle. Of course, you heard no sound. Nothing, Ellen. What can we do to help him, Dr. Watson? Well, it's hard to say, Miss Warburton. I'm not sure that medical help's what she needs. Uh, he seems perfectly sane and lucid, except for these strange outbursts. But we must do something. I propose to, madam. As soon as I get back to the inn, I think I'll write to my old friend Sherlock Holmes and ask his advice. There's a problem. 
I can't feel that the man should be committed to an asylum, and yet obviously when these attacks are on him, he's as mad as a hatter. <laughs> well, fascinating problem, and one that calls for speedy action. I think a telegram to my friend Watson might help to clarify some aspects of the case. Yes. Let's see, uh, Dr. John H. Watson, Red Lion Inn, Taplow Bucks. I suggest that you ascertain one... One important fact, does the Warburton household have a dog? <laughs> Telegraph reply, Holmes. Oh, my soul, Mary, that's a cryptic answer to my letter. Yes, dear, it is. I'm afraid Ellen will be disappointed. She's coming over to join us for lunch to see if you have any news. Well, what on earth can dogs have to do with the case? I can't possibly. Ma- Here's Helen now. Good morning, Ellen. Hello, Mary. Good morning, Doctor. Good morning, good morning. I suppose it's too early to have received any reply from Mr. Holmes. Well, as a matter of fact, I, I just got this telegram from him. You can read it if you like. I can't see it. It makes much sense, Mr. Holmes. But that's extraordinary. I did have a little dog. He was killed a week ago. But it didn't occur to me to tell you about it yesterday. Oh, that's amazing. How could Mr. Holmes have known about uh, it? It's very little that Holmes doesn't know, my dear. How was your dog killed, Miss Warburton? I found him in the grounds with his head smashed in by a stone. Oh, how dreadful. Who do you think did it? It might have been a poacher. And then again, it might have been... Your uncle? It's possible. When he's in those rages, I don't think he knows what he's doing. That's very important. I think I shall go and send Holmes a telegram at once. Don't wait lunch for me. Why did we have to walk over to the station, John, dear? To see if there was an answer at the station telegraph office to the wire that I sent home. Oh, it's only 4.30, dear. It's hardly possible for him to have answered as quickly as that. In any case, they delivered the telegram to the hotel, you know. Well, it was a nice walk, my dear. Hello, there's a, a train in the station now. I wonder where it's from. Why don't you ask that porter, dear? It's not a bad idea. Uh, porter, eh? what train is this? Oh, it's the London train, sir. Right on time. Next stop, ready... Not many people getting off here, are there? Great Scott, <laughs> look who's here. Oh, dear, it's Mr. Holmes. And he's got a dog on a leash. Oh, Holmes. Watson, my dear fellow, how are you? This is Watson. How nice to see you again. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Oh, I'm Holmes. I'm delighted you're here, old fellow. We walked over to the station to see if you'd answered my telegram, and <laughs> here you are in person. <laughs> it occurred to me that I could be down here in the same time that it would take a telegram to reach you. And I decided that a day or two in the country would make a pleasant change. Apart from the fact that Colonel Warburton's problem interests me enormously. Why on earth did you bring a dog? I thought that this was a case in which a dog would be of invaluable assistance. Oh, be careful, John. Yes, look out, old chap. I, uh, I think it would be safer not to pat him. I picked him up in the Mile End Road for a couple of florins, and I fear he's a dog that should have remained in London. A singularly unattractive nature seems to have been entirely ruined by an hour's train ride. <laughs> Unpleasant brute, isn't he? By the way, Holmes, what do you make of the case from my letters? Well, I should prefer to reserve my judgment until I've met the colonel. However, I will about say one opinion. Oh, what's that? To paraphrase a proverb, don't disbelieve all you don't hear. I can't think why someone doesn't answer. They can't all be out. Now, while we're waiting, I think I'll tie the dog up to this tree here. I don't want my arrival to too much commotion. Quiet! Quiet! Well, don't you think perhaps we could try the door, John? Yes, yeah, certainly. It's a good idea. Hello, hello. It's unlocked. Then let's go in, old fellow. Let's go in. Colonel Warburton? Colonel Warburton? Ellen? Uh, Ellen? What was the name of that, that butler fellow? Hacker. Yes, of course, that's it, Hacker. Uh, Hacker! Hacker! We appear to be in an empty house. The dog! Oh, fool that I am, I shouldn't have left him here. Come on! Ah. Oh. We're too late. Oh, the poor dog. He's been killed. Yes, poor brute. Stabbed to death by one of the colonel's spears. That proves it, Holmes. The man is mad. I think not, Watson. I think it proves that Colonel Warburton is a great deal more sane than some of the members of his household.
You'll hear the rest of Dr. Watson's story in just a few seconds. Time for me to remind you that there's one secret every smart woman knows. Simply, good wine makes good food taste better. And by good wine, naturally, I mean Petri wine. Try a Petri wine with your dinner. If you want a wonderful red wine, try Petri California Burgundy. If you want a perfect white wine, try Petri California Sauterne. In fact, try them both. You'll agree, I'm sure, that next to your good cooking, nothing can do more for a meal than a glass of good wine. A glass of Petri wine. And now back to tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure, the story of Colonel Warburton's madness. Holmes, why are we heading for this barn? Seems to me we should be back in the house. Why, old chap? Found the house empty. Besides, I thought I heard. Shh, shh, shh. What is it? Listen. It's the same sound that Mary and I heard yesterday. Oh, once more, it's coming from the barn. Come on, Watson. But quietly. window here. It's that Zulu girl, Nada. She's beating a drum and chanting. Who's the man with her? It's Colonel Warburton. No, it isn't. It's that servant fellow, Hacker. What in thunder is he doing here? Apparently assisting Miss Nada in some of her uh, African mysticism. It's black magic they're dabbling with, just as the Colonel said. Let's go in and catch him right here. No, no. Stay quiet. We'll talk to them soon enough. The moment I feel it's a uh, much more urgent that we find Colonel Warburton. Come on. Well, there's the Colonel, pacing up and down in front of the house with Mary and his, and his niece, Miss Warburton. We shouldn't have left the women alone with him, you know. The man's dangerous. I don't think the women have been in any danger, Watson. Where have you been? Oh, well, Holmes and I decided we'd do uh, take a little walk. It proved very interesting. Uh, Miss Warburton, uh, this is Mr. Sherlock Holmes. How do you do, Mr. Holmes? I'm so glad you're here. How do you do, Miss Warburton? And this is Colonel Warburton, Mr. Sherlock, Sherlock Holmes. Holmes, eh? I suppose you think I killed your wretched dog. Well, I might have done it. When I hear that whistle, something seems to snap in my brain. I might have killed it. Why doesn't your doctor friend certify me as insane? Send me where I belong before I do any worse, damn it. Poor man. Isn't there anything you can do for him, Mr. Holmes? I most certainly will try to, Miss Warburton. What's no fellow? I wonder if you'll follow the colonel and give him a sedative. I'm afraid he has quite an ordeal before mm. him. Of course I will, Holmes. Miss Warburton, where were you when my dog was killed? Down in the greenhouse. As soon as I heard the poor animal yelping, I ran up to the house. I see. Mr. Holmes, you are going to be able to help the colonel, aren't you? I'm convinced of it, Mrs. Watson. That is why I brought a dog with me from London. But now that he's dead, I... I must obtain another one before I can proceed further with the case. Now, I wonder where on earth I can find Dorothy. Well, look, look, huh? down by the gate, there's a little girl walking with the dark. That's Sarah Entwistle, the daughter of our neighbours. Sarah, eh? Oh, excuse me, will you, just a moment. Sarah! Sarah! Yes? Uh, oh, Sarah. Uh, Sarah, my dear, what a, uh, what a pretty dog you have there. What's his name? It's a her. Her name's Boojum. What's your name? <laughs> Holmes. Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock? <laughs> That's a funny name. Yes, yes, it is, isn't it? Uh, look here, Sarah. Uh, here's a nice, shiny half-crown for you. Why are you giving me money? Well, because I love dogs, and I, I want to borrow, uh, what did you call him? Boojum. Boojum, oh, yes, yes. I want to borrow Boojum for half an hour. Why? Well, I, I want to uh, I want to play with her, Sarah. You can play with her here. She's awfully friendly. <laughs> well, you see, I, I, I really want to take her for a nice walk. Why? She's just had one. Now, look here, Sarah. It's a beautifully shiny half-crown. Mummy's told me I mustn't take money from strangers. But I'm not a stranger. I'm a friend of Colonel Warburton. Having trouble, Mr. Holmes? Yes, I am, Mrs. Watson. You see, I, I want to give Sarah half a crown for borrowing Boojum for a short while, but she, well, she doesn't want to do it. Sarah, does Boojum like bones? Oh, <laughs> yes. Loves them. We've got a lot of bones up at the house we'd like to give her. Have they got plenty of meat on them? Mm, plenty. She can have a wonderful feast, and then we'll bring her back in half an hour. All right. Go on, Boojum. Now, promise you'll bring her back in half an oh, hour. Oh, we promise. Yes, Sarah. 
And, and, and Sarah, what about the, uh, uh, what about the half crown? Well, I'll take it home and ask Mummy if I may keep it. Good. Goodbye. Goodbye. And take care of Bujum. <laughs> oh, she's a sweet little girl. Mr. Holmes, you're not going to expose Boojum to any danger, are you? None, Mrs. Watson. Otherwise, I shouldn't have borrowed her. I'm convinced that Boojum will give us the clue to what appears to be Colonel Warburton's madness. Now, let me see. We're all here. Miss Warburton, the Colonel, Miss Nada, Hacker, and the dog Boojum. Yes. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I propose to conduct an experiment before I conduct it, I should like to point out the chronology of the events in this case. First, Miss Nader arrived here. Mr. Holmes, you're not suggesting... Uh, uh, please that... let me finish, Miss Nader. First, Miss Nader arrived here. Second, the colonel first heard the mysterious whistle. Third, your dog was killed, Miss Warburton. Fourth, the whistling set in in dead earnest. Uh, the colonel Warburton and Miss Warburton. Doesn't that pattern suggest anything to you? No, I... Can't say that it does, Mr. Holmes. I don't see what you're driving at. Well, more do I, Holmes. We should be more explicit. Very well, then I will. I shall uh, now conduct my experiment. I want you all to watch Colonel Warburton and the dog Boojum. Excuse me while I turn my back. Now. Oh. There it is again. That whistle. Oh, no! The dog heard it, too. Yeah. Great, son, oh. Holmes. What does it mean? It means that this wooden whistle in my hand is the answer to the mystery. The sound made by this cunningly designed instrument is above the normal range of pitch. You see, the colonel has hypersensitive ears. But the dog heard it. Perhaps I should have said the normal human range of pitch. Then do you suppose someone has deliberately been trying to drive the colonel mad? Of course, Mary. That's why the dogs were murdered. Whoever it was knew that a dog would give the game away. And it's not hard to guess who that someone is. Nada, this started when you came here. Is this your gratitude for the colonel's kindness to you? Endangering his sanity with your evil black magic? That is not true. Uh, one moment, please, Miss Warburton. Miss Nutter. Yes, Mr. Holmes. Dr. Watson and I watched you in the barn some three quarters of an hour ago with Hacker. Were you engaged in practicing any form of black magic? No, no. I was praying to my old gods to save the colonel's sanity. What were you doing there, Hacker? Don't tell me you were praying to old gods, too. Oh, I used to be a chapel-going man, sir, but I don't know. No harm in trying something new, I always say. In any case, why should Miss Nada wish to persecute the colonel? It might be for some tribal revenge. Oh, but that's ridiculous, Alan. Her father and I were sworn blood brothers. Exactly, sir. No, it should be obvious. Who had a motive for making the colonel appear mad? His niece and heiress. What do you mean? She has studied physics, you will remember, and so could know about supersonic research. Possibly she was afraid the colonel might leave his estate to Miss Nada. And so wished him to appear insane and thereby invalidate a new will. Why? In any case, I found this whistle in a drawer in your room, Miss Warburton. Ellen! Ellen, how could you? I did it for your sake, to save you from Nada. She's just an adventuress, only you won't see it. Colonel Warburton, what action do you wish me to take regarding your niece, Miss Warburton? My niece? I have no niece, Mr. Holmes. Come, Nada, my dear. <laughs> An amazing case, Holmes. Mary, wasn't it clever the way Holmes solved it? It was very interesting, dear. I was quite enthralled. Oh, now I think I shall return to London and let you two finish your holiday in peace. Before you do that, Mr. Holmes, there's one thing we should do. What, Mary? Boojum. <laughs> we promised, you know. Oh, yes, yes, of course, of course. I think the three of us might walk her home. But before we do that, I suggest we rummage through the kitchen. The kitchen? What on earth for? Bones, dear. Exactly. And bones with plenty of meat on them. Say, Doctor, that was a swell story. And look, uh, you mean there really is a whistle that only dogs can hear? I thought you'd ask me that question, so I've got one of those whistles to show you. There. Well, there's nothing unusual about it. Blow it, Doctor. Well, listen, Mr. Bartell, if, if I want you to come quickly, I don't just have to whistle. All I have to say is, would anybody like a glass of Petri wine? And, hey, hey, presto, there you are. <laughs> well, can you blame me? I know a good wine when I hear it. And Petri wine sure is good wine. It ought to be. The Petri family's been making wine for generations. As you know, ever since they started the Petri business, way back in the 1800s, that business has always been family-owned and operated. 
So just think of all the experience the Petri family's gained. They've been able to hand on down from father to son, from father to son, all they've ever learned about the art of turning luscious California grapes into fragrant, delicious wine. So whenever you're choosing a wine, a wine to serve before dinner, with dinner, or at any time, you can't go wrong with a Petri wine. Because Petri took time to bring you good wine. Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure is written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and is based on an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Engineer's Thumb. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. Oh, the Petri family took the time to bring you such good wine. So when you eat and when you cook, remember Petri wine. To make good food taste better, remember... Pet, Pet, Petri wine. This is Harry Bartell saying good night for the Petri family. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. I remember one instance when um, the uh, culprit was not Willie. It was really Dennis's fault. He'd be naughty about putting an in-joke in the script. Holmes and Watson had to meet someone at a hotel... And he gave the hotel a name which was recognized by all the former denizens of London as that of a house of ill repute. Well, there were various comments about that, and Edna said, oh, but it's a very high-class one. Order was restored, and the rehearsal continued. Um, they read on. Holmes and Watson were making their way through the fog to this rendezvous until Watson exclaimed, there it is now. I see the red light. Edna used to permit a certain amount of this, but she would uh, clamp down firmly because it was a tight schedule. This is Ben Wright. Phyllis White and I will return shortly with another new adventure of Sherlock Holmes. We return again to Phyllis White, who had some more delightful information about the Sherlock Holmes radio broadcasts. Phyllis? Rathbone and Bruce were making films, and they had just one day off per week for the radio work. They received the scripts a couple of days early to look over if they had time, and they would turn up at the studio early the afternoon of broadcast day. And the first reading would be... Um, rather slow and broken up as there was discussion and maybe a few changes. Then there would be a reading for timing to fit to the exact number of minutes available. It was more likely to be too long than too short. Edna would flip over a few pages and knock out a couple of words here and a couple on another page, and it would miraculously come out exact to the minute. And so they went through the rest of the afternoon as they... Tempo and pressure increased and the show sharpened up. At the end of the afternoon, they went on the air for the eastern United States. Then there was a couple of hours break, and everybody would go out to dinner. Then they would come back and do it all over again for the West Coast. I feel very thankful now that these live and ephemeral shows were captured on disc and that they could now reach a new audience. Now, please join Phyllis and I as we listen to The Iron Box. This episode from the life of Sherlock Holmes will be transmitted to our men and women overseas by shortwave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service.
Petri Wine brings you Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce and the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invite you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. Well, this is it, New Year's Eve, and I wish you could be here with us this evening so we could toast each other with a glass of Petri California Port. As you know, Port wine has long been a favorite wine for celebrating a happy occasion. That's because Port is a wine rich in tradition, and you couldn't ask for a more delicious Port than Petri Port. Petri Port is a deep, glowing red color, beautiful to look at and wonderful to taste with a hearty, full flavor that's right from the heart of the grape. And when you serve Petri Port to your friends tonight, or, or any time, remember you can serve it proudly, because the name Petri is the proudest name in the history of American wine. And now I'm sure Dr. Watson's waiting for us, so let's drop in and see him. 